features Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. It's five o'clock in New York City, and the big neon signs light up the dark office that overlooks Broadway on the corner of 53rd Street. Behind a second-hand mahogany desk, relaxing in a swivel chair, is the leading figure of the Diamond Detective Agency, combination stockholder, office boy, and clue chaser. He is Richard Diamond, and his mind is on a lovely redhead named Helen Asher as she sits on a couch talking about things he likes to hear. At this moment, however, another scene is taking place in the wealthy district of Long Island. A long black convertible is just pulling up to an old English mansion, and a curvaceous blonde steps from the car. She is met at the door by her brother. Well, good evening, my dear sister. You're looking simply ravishing. How would you know the difference? Oh, drop dead. You disgusting excuse for a man. Why don't you sober up for five minutes and take a look at yourself? I did once. Oh, by the way, our dear stepfather would like to see you in the study. Tell him to go I to... already did. Now it's your turn. I don't want to. Now get out of my way, Chris. Mm, suit yourself. But Murray Lang's in there with him. Murray? Hmm? Did I start your heart going pity pat? Oh, shut up. <laughs> you better go in and protect your money, darling. <clears throat> Bye, jailbird. Sot. I don't care what your plans are. They can send my daughter, and that's enough for me to put a stop to them. You're not going to put a stop to anything. You can't intimidate me, Lang. You're just a cheap, no good gangster, and your methods are too well known to frighten me. Come in! Oh, hello, Liz. Hello, Murray. I'm glad you're here, Elizabeth. Mr. Lang and I were just discussing your future. I'm surprised you put up with it this long, Murray. Come on, let's leave my dear stepfather until he simmers down. Elizabeth, I want to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. Let's go, Murray. Listen to what he has to say. Maybe you'll get a laugh out of it. Well, what is it? I've just been talking with Lang about your intention to marry him. I have advised him that if such a thing were to take place, it would result in the most serious of consequences. Is that all? No, that is not all. When you got into your trouble with the police, my dear stepdaughter, you were paroled in my custody. If I should report to the board that you had violated the terms of your probation, you would most certainly go to prison. Why, you... What's the matter? Aren't you satisfied with the salary you collect for taking care of Mother's estate? How dare you, you little... Sit down. You look bigger behind a desk. Well, just yell and scream all you want to. After Monday, you better start looking for another source of income. You know very well it's not the money. But your greasy boyfriend here would certainly like to get his hands on it. Look, you, I don't give a hang if you are a midget. I'm not going to stand here and listen to you. Murray. No, baby, I won't take it. I'll wring his scrawny little neck. Go on, lad, go on. It would give me the greatest of pleasure to call the police and have you locked up. I'll fix it so you won't have a head to call anyone with. Murray, leave him alone. Can't you see that's what he wants? Yes, well, Mr. Lang. Come on, Liz, let's get some fresh air. I want to say one more thing. Just remember, Father, my probation expires Monday. After that, you won't control any part of my income, so you better start getting packed. And if I report you to the probation board in the morning... I wouldn't. If you do that, you'll not only stop being my guardian, but you'll stop breathing. Get out. Get out, both of you. Come on, Murray. Try to intimidate me. I'll make them both sorry. Detective. Detectives. Private detectives, yes, yes. Yes. Ah, here's one. Full page ad. Must be doing very well. Richard Diamond, private detective. If you've got a case, share it with me. Richard Diamond. Seven, seven, Mr. Diamond? That's right. I want to hire you for a few days. Oh, you saw the ad. Well, it just so happens I'm available. I can't tell you much over the phone, too many extensions in the house, but it's about my daughter. I'm afraid she's going to get herself into some serious trouble. Well, how old is she? Twenty. Tell her to wait a year. My name is Chase, Ralph Chase. I live at 82 Maple Drive, Sands Point. Will you come out this evening? A hundred dollars a day and dibs on the icebox. I'll see you about eight. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. What was that all about, Rick? I oh, got a job, baby. When do you start? Oh, yes, you're right. No, Rick. You can start it in the morning. You can't break another one tonight. Now, come on, Helen, baby. A job's a job. And a date's a date. I won't let you break this one. Your car downstairs? Yes, but I can drive myself home. Please, Rick. You promised you wouldn't break another one. Keys in it? Yeah, look. I want to hire you to protect me for this evening. Hmm. I've been receiving mysterious phone calls, and I'm in fear of my life. Really? You've got to take the job. 
old friends come first. I'll have to get home and shave before I start working. You mean you'll take it? After 12.30. Bye, baby. You beast. Oh, you must be getting tired from driving that big car around all day. Grab a cab, honey. It'll give you some rest. I'll take good care of your car. What? Want a buck for the cab? Huh? No, no. On second thought, you only live about 25 blocks. Walk will do you good. Rick. Deep breathing all the way up Fifth Avenue. Nothing like it. Bye, baby. Oh! On the way to the car, I thought about Helen, the most wonderful girl in the world. Money, looks, but she had one bad fault. She wanted to get married. I got into the big sedan and headed for my apartment. I'd been up late the night before with a blonde singer, and I was feeling tired. Funny how things change. My nights in college were just as busy, but at one o'clock the next afternoon, I was out playing football. I faced facts pretty well, so when I got home, I took a nap. I slept until seven and got up and dressed. I drove Helen's car out to Long Island, and at eight o'clock sharp, I was ringing the doorbell of the Chase Mansion. It was a big house, all right. If they built another one like it, Long Island would sink. Well, to someone at me chamber door. My name's Chris. Boo. Blow your booze some other direction. Your breath would wither a lung. My alcoholic exhalations are composed of the finest ingredients. You must have a weak stomach. Look, if you'll just stagger out of the way, I'd like to see Mr. Chase. Dead or alive? What? Nothing. I was just thinking out loud. Well, go right ahead. And after your talk with my stepfather, you can find me in the bar. <laughs> You'll probably wind up like I am. That's a sweet thought. Where can I find your stepfather? Probably in the library, lying in my money. I left him leaning against the front door, gagging on the fresh air. I wandered down a long hallway and a big sitting room, furnished with enough antiques to make the Metropolitan Museum give up in shame. There was something about the place. A heavy quietness, like a bar of gold in a dark room. shot had come from up ahead, and I tried a couple of doors before I found the room. Mr. Chase! Mr. Chase! In here! In here! Mr. Chase? Yes, yes. Come in and shut the door. I looked over at Ralph Chase crouching behind a desk. He got up slowly, all five feet of him. And I tagged him for a guy who would give a thousand dollars for every inch you could put on his legs. He looked like he could afford to be a mile high. The tall French windows were open at the back of the room, and you could still smell burning cordite. Someone tried to shoot me from the garden. Yeah, I heard the shot. You must be Diamond. That's right. Don't you think you better shut the French doors and pull the drapes before someone takes another shot? Yes, yes, very good idea. Uh, you pull the dime, the shade diamond. Hey, you can start earning your money right now. You're a little excited, but I'll start to work. All right. Uh, be careful, he might still be out there. Well, I doubt it. I can't see anyone out here. Oh, he just missed me. You can see where the bullet hit the wall. I jumped and hid behind the desk. Didn't you hear him on the porch? No, he must have stood in the soft grass that surrounds the garden. That's a good ten feet from the house. You're lucky he didn't move in closer. He probably wouldn't have missed. Got any idea who it was? Of course. It was Murray Lang. Murray Lang? The gambler? Yes. Do you know him? Well, I used to be on the force. Set him up six years ago on a larceny rap. Then you know what he's like. He was in the house this afternoon. We had an argument and he threatened me. An argument with your daughter? Yes, about my daughter. How do you know? Well, you told me she was getting herself into trouble. She couldn't have picked a better playmate than Lang to get there with. Father, we heard a shot. Not really. Oh, let's go. He's not dead. My stepchildren, Mr. Diamond. Oh, well, lovely. I'm quite alive, so you can both stop looking so unhappy. Does it show? Come on, sis. Let's find the guy who fired that shot. I want to give him a few pointers. Where's Murray Lang, Miss Chase? Yes, he's the man you want. I'm sure he Don't tried... be absurd. Murray left three hours ago. What are you, a cop? Does it show? You're wearing too much cologne. Come on, Chris. <laughs> oh, she's nice. That's Elizabeth. The boy's her brother, Chris. I'd hate to draw straws. I married their mother and raised those two brats after she died. The courts appointed me executor of this state. They don't like you handling their money, is that it? Yes. Since they've been old enough to ask for 50 cents to go to a movie, they've condemned me for watching their interests. You, uh, you said you were worried about your stepdaughter. 
Tell me about it. I'll make it brief. Hate long explanations. Elizabeth got into some trouble with the police. Hit and run. She'd been drinking. The man died. Liz was sentenced to a year in Folsom. But I got her off on probation. Oh, what do you want me to do? Drive around with her and spoil her aim? Monday the probation expires. She says she is then going to marry this hoodlum, Murray Lang. And you don't want that because you think he's after her money? Exactly. When she marries, the will reads that I shall, as executor, turn over half of the estate to Elizabeth. What about Christopher? He looked irresponsible when he was born. His mother left instructions that he should not receive his share until he is 35. That's another eight years. Well, your uh, stepdaughter's old enough to know what she's doing. I can't see how you can stop her. That's what I want you to do. And if I do, you'd be in a pretty good spot. What do you mean, Mr. Diamond? You continue as executor. I can understand you thinking something like that, but believe me, as much as I dislike my stepchildren, I wish to keep them in line for their late mother's sake. Oh. Well, Mr. Chase, I'll I'll take a look around outside. Maybe I can come up with something that'll point out the would-be killer. If it was Lang, you can stop worrying uh, about Elizabeth. Sing Sing doesn't boast a wedding chapel. I went out through the French doors and started looking around on the soft grass that bordered the garden. I had a fat hunch, so I stopped looking and started wandering. I was halfway through the rose bed when I spotted them. It was Elizabeth and a man. In the darkness, I couldn't make him out, but Murray Lang was my best guess. They went up a narrow path to one of those Chinese pagodas at the far end of the garden... And I stepped up close enough to give my ears a workout. It was Lang, all right. I don't care what you think. I didn't take a shot at the old man. Then who did? He's got a policeman in there now, and he's going to start trouble. Let him. I'm clean. If it was that lushed-up brother of yours. Chris hates him, but he'd never try to kill him. Well, then stop hounding me. Maybe you took a shot at the old boy. Murray! Well, you got a good reason. I'm tired trying to buck the whole Chase household. If you love me, let's take off tonight and get married. Tell the old man to go to the devil. You can certainly wait till Monday. Yeah, but he won't. He's going to cause some kind of trouble and get you tossed into Folsom. He's not going to give up all that money just because you're through with your probation. He probably cooked up that shooting to, just to get the cops here. Oh, Murray, what's going to happen to us? Oh, ask your stepfather. He's been doing your thinking for you. I don't have to. We'll get married Monday. Okay. I'm staying clear of this place till then. But what if there's more trouble? I haven't got anyone to turn to. You worry about it, baby. I got a police record that makes yours look like a merit badge. I was too good a target in the moonlight, so I started back up the walk to the house. As I passed a hedge, I noticed a funny-looking plant that was shoving its way out of the foliage. I'm sorry I did that. It was the Johnny Jump-Up variety. Black... <laughs> The guy on the other end of the sap gave it to me right over the eyes, and I went down like a crapshooter making a pass. I rolled over and watched the moon melt and run down in my eyes. Something warm and sticky spread over my face and turned the night red. Yeah, I was bleeding again. I guess I showed signs of recovering, so he started all over. This time, he used his foot in my side. Oh. Oh. Oh, a couple more kicks in the ribs and in the right place, and he could have whipped up a fast course of Nola. I felt tired, so I rolled up in an old rose bush and went to sleep. When you finally start coming around, it's like swimming your way out of an acre of mud. If you've taken enough beatings before, you diagnose things in a hurry. The pain in your head is where you got sapped. The ache in your ribs is where he booted you. And the thought in your mind is, oh, it's something about an eye for an eye if you've got one left. I sat up slowly and looked around. No one in sight. My watch said 10 o'clock. I'd been out for an hour and I was feeling lonely until I started to get up. I made it to one knee and looked down at the best reason I could think of for staying home nights. It was Murray Lang, and you couldn't blame him for staring. He wasn't impolite, just dead. Something on the walk beside him gleamed in the moonlight. I took out my handkerchief and scooped it up. It was a little nickel-plated thirty-two. You could still smell the fresh powder in the barrel. I put it in my pocket and stumbled back to the house. Chris opened the door. Well... You shouldn't drink so much. I never get so loaded I look like that. Well, try it sometime. It might be an improvement. Boo. I... I told you once before not to do that. 
Now, tell me, where were you ten minutes ago? I was in the bar. Who was with you? Red and green midgets. Now, let go of my collar. Okay. Where's the phone? In the hall. Hey, what's going on? Who beat you up? Nobody. I always bleed like this on warm nights. Huh? Big pores. Homicide, Sergeant Otis talking. Who taught you how? Did you sit up nights with a parrot? Oh, very funny. Only one guy could think up a lousy joke like that. What do you want, Diamond? A picture of you. I'm going to show some doctors that mercy killing has its points. Now, let me speak to the lieutenant. Comic. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Hello, Walt. This is Diamond. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me get the bicarbonate. What's the matter? I get stomach trouble every time you call. Go ahead. All right. I got a killing for you. I know it. I know it. Why can't you be a good boy and stop finding corpses? I'm out at Sands Point, 82 Maple Drive. I think I've got the murder weapon in my pocket. Who's dead? An old friend, Murray Lang, and you better step on it. There's a drunk staggering around the place, and he's liable to spot the body and put it in a cold shower to sober it up. Oh, all right. We'll be right out. Hold the fort. So Mr. Lang's dead. Hmm? You better stop sneaking up on people, Buster. And you'd better stop telling me what to do in my own house, Mr. Diamond. You sobered up pretty quick. I heard what you said about finding the murder weapon. May I see it? No. It stays in my pocket until homicide gets here. Whose gun is it? It's a 40-pound broadsword. Now stop trying to look like a Chicago muscle man or I'll start oh, slapping you... Oh, there you are, Diamond. I've been looking for you. I... Wait, Scott, what happened to your face? Someone was giving away hints. Please, did you have something to do with this? <laughs> Hardly. Mr. Diamond has a decided advantage over me. He has muscles. I'll be in the bar. What's happened? Where's Elizabeth? I don't know, but her boyfriend's got troubles. He, he can't explain the hole in this chest. Lang? What do you mean? He's out in the garden. Someone shot him. Is he dead? Well, if he's not, he's trying awful hard. Well, then we'd better call the police. That's been taken care of. What kind of a gun do you own, Mr. Chase? You don't see... No, I don't. I just dig around till I come up with something. What kind of a gun do you own? Why, you're 45... Now, wait a minute, Diamond. If you've got any ideas about this murder, you'd better wait until the police get here. Now, look, Chase, I've been insulted in your house, had the air let out of my ego by your beautiful stepdaughter, and beat up in your garden. That's a full night's work, and now I'm on my own time. Where can I find Elizabeth? I don't know. She may be up in her room. Oh, where is it? End of the hall, head of the stairs, first door. Thanks. Beginning to rain. What about Lang's body? Well, if he catches cold, call me. I went down the long hallway to the foot of a massive staircase. The only light was the one burning in the room I just left. I looked over at my sh over my shoulder and saw Mr. Chase framed in its dim glow, watching me. In that moment, I thought who Chase reminded me of: a triangle hat, his hand in his vest, and Napoleon had a twin. I went up the stairs two at a time. Yes? Pardon me for barging in, but some guy in the garden just beat all the bashfulness out of me. How dare you? You get out of my room. You better put on something a little warmer, honey. That thing would start a Harry Carey epidemic in Boston. What do you want? Yeah. What did you do after Lang left you in the garden? What? Big ears. I overheard everything you said. I see someone pushed your face around. It's an improvement. Did Murray catch you eavesdropping? Well, if he did, he won't have much time to gloat. What do you mean? If you've done anything to Murray... Aren't you getting Murray... ready for bed a little early? I don't know what you want. I don't have to answer any of your ridiculous questions. Now, if you don't turn around and get out of here... What's the matter, baby? The drawer empty? Hmm. Lose something? No. Maybe this is it. Where did you get that gun? It was lying in the garden beside your boyfriend's body. Beside... That's it, lover. Now sit down and relax. As Murray did. Like Jimmy Fiddler's gossip column. Didn't you hear anything after Murray left you? Oh, no. I was crying. I ran back to the house and came up here. Is there another way back to the house besides the path that Murray took? It's one that leads to those outside doors. I, I came right to my room. Please leave me alone. This is your gun, isn't it? Yes, but I didn't do it. I didn't. Murray and I were going to be married Monday. Ballistics will probably show it's the one that did the job. You better tell me everything you know. I don't know anything. I didn't shoot Murray. Someone stole my gun from the drawer. Oh, please find out who did it. If they hold me, I'll go to prison anyway. Please, Mr. Diamond, please. It's going to be tough if this is the gun. I'm pretty sure it is. You could still smell the powder when I... The powder. What's the matter, Mr. Diamond? Huh? Oh. Oh, nothing, nothing. Look, uh... 
You stay in your room. Maybe I can do you some good. I promise you'll stay here. Sure. I'm not going anyplace. Ah, and try and snap out of it. Sometimes you keep losing until there's nothing left to play with. It breaks the jinx. I went downstairs and started looking for Chase. As I passed the doors leading to the garden, I stopped cold. A flash of lightning turned the garden flat white. Someone was standing over what was left of Murray Lang. Well, like the view? Oh, Diamond. I was just looking at the body. I talked with your daughter. She says the gun that killed Lang was hers. What? Claims they had an argument, but won't admit she shot him. Oh, no, I can't believe it. Certainly she had no reason, unless... Unless what? Well, unless she found out Lang was just after her money. Well, that's, uh, that's possible. Anyway, if she did do it, I still can't figure who worked me over. Maybe it was Lang. You told me yourself he didn't like you. Maybe it was Elizabeth. Oh, no. It would have to be somebody very strong. She might have kicked you, but never could she have hit you hard enough to crack your head open like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me, when does Elizabeth come into her money? Why, at the end of the probation. The court set it aside until she was cleared of all charges. Who gets it if she goes to prison? Well, I'm the sole executor of the state, but she's not going to jail. She didn't do this thing. I'll get the best counsel in the country. I'm sure you will. Uh, tell me something, Chase. It's pretty obvious that my face got pushed around, but uh, how did you know my ribs got the same treatment? What? It doesn't show. It just hurts. Why, I... Uh, well, you told me. Uh -uh. What are you getting at, Diamond? You'd have to reach pretty high to sap me, but if you were mad enough, you could make it. This is absurd. I'm going inside. And when I get grouchy, it's better to listen. I'm liable to use you to make the flowers grow. Go ahead, Mr. Diamond. I'm listening. Well, everybody in this house has some sort of motive for killing. With Elizabeth, it could be the old story of a woman scorned. With your lushed-up stepson, he could want to put the blame on his sister so he'd get more than his share of the estate. And we certainly know you stand to profit if Elizabeth goes to prison... Because you retain custody of the family fortune. I'm getting wet, Mr. Diamond. Everybody's story's weak, but only one of them doesn't stand up. You said earlier this evening someone tried to shoot you from outside your library. Of course they did. You have the shot and saw the bullet hole. That's right, I did. But you told me he was standing outside the room by a good ten feet. Nothing to say, Chase? You're trying to catch me up in something. Oh, you are so right. Now, when I walked into that room, I could still smell burning cordite. To smell fresh gunpowder like that, the gun would have have to have been fired outside the room. You staged it, so I'd think someone was trying to kill you. Is that all, Mr. Diamond? Outside of the slip you made about kicking me in the ribs. Now, let's go inside. I don't think so, Diamond. Oh. Oh, that the forty-five you were telling me about? Yes. Go ahead, make a try for it. I'm going to show you how it works. You kill Lang with your stepdaughter's gun, and you're going to collect the money if she goes to prison. Oh, you're a slob. My stepdaughter could easily kill two men tonight. Now, you're in a spot. You can't shoot me with that forty-five and make it look like the same person killed Lang, too. So you've got to get the thirty-two in my pocket. Give me Elizabeth's gun, Diamond. You try and get it, Chase. Why, you... Rick! Rick, are you out there? You better give it up, Chase. That's the law. He eats little men like you. Rick! Stay right there, Diamond. Another killing won't matter if you try and stop me. For Pete's sake, if you're out there, Rick, answer me. I'm getting soaked. Just keep your mouth closed, Diamond. I'm getting out of here. You'll never make a chase. They'll pick you up inside of an hour. Not if you're too dead to tell them. Yes, that's it. If I kill you, I'll eat at least have a You should watch your step, Chase. Keep your head down, Pat. Somebody's mad. Shut up, Otis, and get out from under that bench. Rick! Over here, Walt. What's going on, Rick? Who's doing all the shooting? Oh, we took turns. He was just going to kill me when he tripped over the body of his first victim. I used this thirty-two in my pocket, shot him twice. He's dead, Lieutenant. Give me my baking soda, Otis. Hey, yeah, Lieutenant. Don't look so unhappy, Rick. He was going to kill you. Oh, I'm not unhappy. I I'm just sore that I didn't have time to take the gun out of my pocket. I ruined a darn good coat. <laughs> The three of us went back in the house, and Otis took Christopher up to bed so he could sleep it off. Walt listened to the story as I told it to Elizabeth. She cried a little and thanked me with her eyes. Walt went downstairs to clean things up, and I sat by her bed and until she went to sleep. She didn't even wake up when I kissed her goodbye. <laughs> oh, I guess it was better that way. 
I said goodbye to Walt and Otis and headed for 975 Park Avenue. I was late. And my face could use a mile of bandage. I hoped Helen wouldn't mind. Yes? Oh, my goodness. Hello, Francis. Tell Miss Asher I brought a car back. Oh, how bad a wreck was it, sir? Give me a glass of the backbone, will you, Francis? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. And Miss Asher's in the study. Ah, oh, thank you. Goodness. Thank you. Hi. Well, it's about... Oh, Rick, not again. Mm-hmm. Your poor little face. Yeah, my poor little face. Well, you just stretch out on the couch and I'll get you a nice tall drink. Francis is already on his way. Oh. Feel better? Yeah. Oh, yes. Got a pillow? I'll hold your head up. How's this? Mm-hmm. Like some music to go with it? Sure. Turn on the radio. You comfortable? Mm-hmm. How about you? Uh-huh. That music sounds like San Francisco. Remember the top of the mark? Yeah, fun too. <laughs> Mind if I turn off the light? The glow from the fire is enough. You're cute. Better? Much. The snow is snowing, the wind is blowing, but I can weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Mm -hmm. Me. I can't remember a worse December. Just watch those icicles fall. What do I care if icicles fall? I've got my love to keep me warm. I like your singing, too. Off with my overcoat, off with my glove. I need no overcoat, I'm burning with love. My heart's on fire, the flame grows higher. So I will weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Oh, that was nice. Hey, why did you turn the radio on? This is nicer. Come here, Rick. Oh, honey. Honey, you're reading my mind. Here's your drink, Mr. Diamond. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You have just heard the fourth of a new series, Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Betty Moran, Jay Novello, Jack Edwards, and Tal Avery. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Even here in America, we're liable to have a few misconceptions about freedom. Many of us regard it as an outright gift with no strings attached. Well, that isn't quite so. All of us have received a heritage of liberty, a legacy of freedom forged in other days. Remember that the liberty you enjoy is a precious legacy, a legacy that can be lost through disuse. Don't ignore freedom. Work at it. For freedom is everybody's job. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. My name's Diamond, and I'm in business for a very simple reason. I like money. Oh, sure, I could do better, but I don't believe in straining myself. I might make a few bucks more, but so what? You work harder, your back gets weaker, and you take that extra couple of bucks and spend it for a brace to keep you from folding in the middle. No, I got a little one-room office that leans out over Broadway, and I'm very happy. Sometimes I get a case that lasts a week, a hundred bucks a day in expenses, and I make enough to pay the rent. Take my girl Helen Asher to dinner a couple of times and rest my feet on the desk like a prosperous businessman. I'm in partnership with a shill called Human Nature. And with him on my side, it just figures that people are going to get in trouble. Like the character who's ringing the doorbell of an apartment on the east side. He's built just right for more trouble than he can handle. Well. Hello, Mrs. Moran. You say that like you're really glad to see me. I'll let you know as soon as we can talk business. Did you bring a rubber hose along? Why? Are you going to be hard to get along with? This time, yes. Where's your husband? He went out. I tried to convince him the window was the quickest way to the street, but he's old-fashioned. He took the elevator. You're drunk. You can't get a vet out of me. Want a drink? Just get the 500. I don't want to be around when your old man gets back. You couldn't afford that, could you? No, and I don't think you could either, baby. Now let's stop playing games, Mrs. Moran. I've got a big, fat surprise for you, Mac. Keep it in small bills. That's not funny. That's your surprise. Yeah? Yeah. You don't get the money. You get something else. Stop yelling. You'll have the whole building up here in a minute. They'll be up anyway, Mac. A gunshot makes people curious. Now, wait a minute. You don't have to pull a gun. I don't have to do anything. And I'm breaking myself of one habit right now. I'm through paying your dirty blackmail. Now, you know I got my orders. If I don't collect, someone else will be around. Come on, give me the gun. Sure. A piece at a time. I need a drink. Well, here's to nothing, Betty, old girl. Extra, extra, read all about it. Matt Grayson shot to death in blackmail plot. Socialite Betty Moran kills gangster, then takes own life. Read all about it, paper. I can't. Oh, paper, mister? Yeah. Hey, uh, the chair. Oh, thanks. Wealthy wife of William Moran kills... Well, I have to call Mr. Moran. No sense to lose a good source of income. Yeah, come in. Mr. Diamond? Over here. This clothesline, I I couldn't see you. Do you always do your laundry in your office? Free soap. Pull up a chair, Mr. Uh, Moran. Uh, William Moran. Oh. Mm. Nice pair of argyles. One of my old clients. Sends them down from Sing Sing. Have you read the morning papers, Mr. Diamond? I haven't had time. Took some throw rugs down to the laundry mat before I started on the socks. My wife died last night. What did you eat for breakfast? Why, uh... Pancakes and eggs? Why? You must eat a whole pig when you're not in mourning. How did she die? She was shot to death. Could she get two people for a pyramid club? She was being blackmailed. It's usually the other way around. The victim shoots the blackmailer. She did that. His name was Mac Grayson. Hmm? I want you to find the other man behind this blackmail ring. Oh, what makes you think there was more than one? I received an anonymous phone call this morning. It was from a man who said he was a friend of Mac Grayson. He made it perfectly clear that he was going to continue with the blackmail. You uh, know what they had on your wife? She was a very wealthy woman, Mr. Diamond. Before she married me, she was rather... uh, wild. Well, they get that way sometimes. There were some letters. Why don't you go to the police? As far as they're concerned, the case is closed. They say it's a murder and a suicide, and that's that. 
But I want to get the people who drove my wife to suicide. Okay, Mr. Moran, but if you want me to try and dig up your blackmailers, my fee is rather high. I want to start sending my laundry out. Money is no object. That's the nicest thing you could have said. A hundred dollars a day and a fifth of plasma. Plasma, Mr. Diamond? A hundred proof. I never know what I'm going to run into in a case like this. I may bleed a little. You can reach me at Evergreen 45021. I'll write you a check. Here, uh, use my pen. It's getting an inferiority complex. Do you know anything more about this man who called you this morning? No, only that he said he was a friend of Mac Grayson's. Oh, there you are, Mr. Diamond. This should be enough of a retainer. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, that's all you know? I'm sorry I can't be of more help. Oh, you've been a brick. I'll get the rest from Homicide. Thank you and goodbye, Mr. Moran. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond, and good luck. Oh, I'm sorry I knocked down some of your washing. Uh, there. Well, I'll be hearing from you. Well, that's the way it goes. One minute you're washing socks, and the next you've got enough money to stake out a claim on every night spot from Mott Street to Harlem. Unless a particular blackmail ring likes to kill private detectives. I had a hunch the assignment might run into overtime, so I put in a call to a lovely redhead named Helen Asher. Francis, the butler, answered, and I told him to pass the word along that I might be late for my date. I hung up before Helen could get on the pipe and start screaming at me like a wounded eagle. I locked the office, went down to 5th Precinct, and an old friend, Lieutenant Levinson. He was in charge of the homicide detail and could tell me about the late Mrs. Moran and her victim. When I walked in, Sergeant Otis was polishing his billy. Hello, Otis. The lieutenant in? Well, Richard Diamond, the all-American gumshoe. Oh, you're just jealous because that club you've got is a better shape than your head. Lieutenant, Diamond's out here. Okay, send them in. Tell me, Shamus... How does one get to be a great big private detective? Saving box tops? Well, you have to observe things, Otis, my boy. For instance, one look at your shirt, and I can tell you've been eating well for a week. Why don't you either get it cleaned or stick it in a pressure cooker? Hello, Walt. Now, wait a minute, Rick. If you've got a body somewhere, take it to another precinct. Well, I'm a little short right now, but maybe I can dig one up. <laughs> what yeah, that? that was a swell one. Is this just a social visit or am I a dreamer? It's about the Moran suicide. You handle it? Uh-huh. One of the neighbors called us. They're both deader than Otis on a double date. What about the Grayson guy she knocked off? Cheap thug. Couple of convictions. He... Oh, don't tell me Moran's been to you with that blackmail story. Yeah, yeah. He seems to think Grayson was working with someone. Rick, that guy pestered us all morning, but there's no proof of blackmail or anything else, except two people got killed. Give me a quick rundown. I don't know why you're interested. I think Moran drummed up the blackmail theory just to cover that his wife was running around with another man. Well, I'm interested because Moran gave me a fat 200 bucks in advance to get me in the spirit of the thing. Well, if you want to be bored, here are the photographs of the deal. Here's Mac Grayson. Mm. Bullet entered his chest just below the 10th rib. Gun was a 32. Same one that the Moran dame used on herself. Enough powder burns on his shirt to show that she was standing pretty close when she gave it to him. She'd have to be not to miss him. Ah, uh, you can see she was lying about ten feet from Grayson near the bar. Huh? Probably needed a stiff shot before she knocked herself off. That's the highball glass on the floor near her head. And that's the thirty-two she used, about six inches from her right hand, and only her prints on it. Powder burns on the girl? Sure, all over her temple. We did the paraffin test on her hand, too. She fired the gun all right. Did uh, Grayson have any friends? We never tied him up with anyone except an old wino that hangs out on Skid Row, dump called the Parry Club. Name's Wilbur Truitt. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Now, yeah. Well, thanks, Walt. Now, look, the dame killed the guy and then shot herself. What more do you want? I'll let you know. Now, wait a minute. I know that gleam in your eye. I always get a sour stomach from it. If you've got something, you'd better tell me. Oh, you're a cynic, Walt. Have you, uh, have you talked to this Wilbur Truitt? We questioned him this morning. Got a tail on him? Sure, but he won't take us anywhere. Now, what are you cooking up? Well, maybe you think there's something to Moran's blackmail story. Oh, don't be an idiot. And what are you tailing Truett for? Because I can't take a chance. Blackmail's a federal rap, and if Moran keeps stirring up trouble, I want to be able to prove he's nuts. Now, you look here. I want to know what's on your mind. I'll send you a letter. Oh. Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant? Get me my bicarbonate. And shut up. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> I went through the squad room and out into the hall. I used the payphone by the door and put in a fast call to my client, William Moran. I had a hunch that Moran's $200 retainer in my pocket gave him an A priority on it. Yes? Mr. Moran. That's right. Now, this is Diamond, Mr. Moran. Uh -huh. I've got a lead on someone who knew Mac Grayson. Well, that's fine, Mr. Diamond. Who is it? 
Well, a guy who hangs out on Skid Row named Wilbur Truitt. Ever heard of him? No. Oh. Well, he might have been the one who phoned you this morning. I, I think I'll go down and find out. Good, good. You'll keep in touch, won't you? Oh, as long as I'm on the case. Goodbye, Mr. Moran. <laughs> I left the 5th Precinct and headed for Skid Row. If you've never seen the street, it's a liberal education in the misery of human beings. Even the sun winds up with a hangover if it shines on the place too long. The Parrot Club was a cellar with a low ceiling and a drink of wine for 10 cents a glass. The smell of stale alcohol was so strong that if you opened the, opened the door to air the place out, the walls would probably cave in. I found Will Truitt sitting at the bar with a dirty towel around his neck. He held the towel and the glass of wine in one hand, and with the other he pulled the towel, lifting his hand and the glass up to his mouth. <sighs> you must have been an engineer. I learned this little stunt in grammar school, bucko. I started missing my mouth 30 years ago, so I used this towel as a sort of alcohol pulley. It cuts down the element of risk. Hate to spill a drop. You know a guy named Grayson? It's the shakes, bucko. I am completely exhausted after a night of revelry, and my hand waves like it was flagging down a caravan of whiskey trucks. Look, friend... But uh... after one or two pick-me-ups, I am perfectly capable of lifting the glass by myself. And come nightfall, I'm in excellent condition to entertain my little friends. Oh, swell. Most cowards let the little fellows frighten them, and they end up in Bellevue, but... I liked them. They worried me at first, but when they found out how much I drank, they began to show the strain, and the shoe was on the other foot, so to speak. Oh, no. They tried to frighten me the first night, but I just kept right on with one bottle after another, and it finally drove them to drink. Now my DTs have hallucinations. We are rapidly building up a thriving community. What? What were you saying, bucko? Uh, something about the evils of self-indulgence, but I've forgotten now. Good. In that case, I will let you buy me a drink. Oh, sure. Waiter, bring the bottle. You just gave me cold chills. If I lick your hand, it's only a sign of fond endearment. Okay. Now, uh, do you know a guy named Grayson? I knew there was a catch. Are you a cop? No. In that case, I trust you. Besides, you are holding that lovely bottle. What about Grayson? First, a small glass of truth serum. First, Grayson. I can't stand to look, so I will turn my back on the bottle and tell you what I know. Mr. Mac Grayson, a very unsavory character who reached a sudden demise last evening dealt in smutty pass and made them pay off by milking his victims. He has only one friend, a Mr. Leo Fink. Now, please, I'm beginning to spit out wads of cotton. Where does this Fink live? Oh, you are indeed a heartless rogue. I was once. You aren't by any chance a spy from the Purity League? You get the bottle when I find out where Leo Fink lives. 11-22nd Avenue now, please. Yeah. No. Here you are. Don't struggle with the cork, bucko. I have just acquired the strength of an uncropped Samson. And as I gaze upon this ruby goblet, I am reminded of the fact that you are not the first to come seeking the whereabouts of one Leo Fink. Huh? Play it back in English. Ah, a thug with the disagreeable habit of twisting my ascot. Approached me not ten minutes before you came in seeking the same information. Did you give it to him? I had to. One more pull on my tie, and dissipation would have been a thing of the past. Thanks, Wilbur. Here, buy yourself another jug. Oh, bless you. And good morrow, cousin. Here's to my love. Oh, true apothecary. Thy drugs are quick. Thus, with a kiss, I die. I left Wilbur with his first love and walked out on the street. I grabbed a cab and headed for Leo Fink's address. All the way over, I kept thinking how wonderful fresh air really was. When we finally got there, I paid off the cabbie and looked at my watch. It was 4.30 and the city was turning soft and mellow as the sun started giving up behind the tall buildings. 
I got that lousy feeling again when I looked across the street. A prowl car was parked at the curb, and it looked like Homicide's private limousine. Something was wrong. I went up to Fink's apartment in a hurry. Yeah? Ah, what do you want, Shamus? Well, good afternoon, Sergeant. I'm taking the census. How long ago did you die, sir? Very funny, Diamond. Otis, who is that? Diamond, who else? I didn't ask for a quick quiz on well-known personalities. Let him in. Yeah, Lieutenant. Shame on you, Otis. You'll never make an Eagle Scout. Hello, Rick. What do you want? I'll bet he's dead. You'll bet who's dead? You know who's dead. Sure, I know who's dead. Who do you think is dead? The guy I came up here to see. Well, who did you come up to see? Well, I think it's the guy who's dead. Don't you know? No, I ask you. Well, I'm telling you. You told me nothing. Look, why are you up here? Because I'm looking for a guy. What guy? I think it's the guy who's dead. Who's dead? Oh, he's on third. Don't you know? I think I know, Lieutenant. You shut up. Of course I know. Well, all right, all right. If you're going to hold out on your old pal. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did we get into this thing? Otis! Here's your bicarbonate. All mixed. All right, now let's start again. Walt, who's dead? Oh, let's not have two bodies up here. The guy's name is Fink. Leo Fink. Uh, Why did you say that in the first place? Because I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. Walt! Lieutenant Levinson. Now, what are you doing up here? Oh, I came up to see Leo Fink, that's all. Well, he's in the other room. If he spills anything, don't believe it. He's been dead for ten minutes. That's too bad. He knew Mac Grayson. Yeah, how did you find out? That sweet old gentleman you sent me over to, Wilbur Truitt. Oh, you got something out of him, huh? What else did he tell you? Nothing, but we uh, struck up quite a friendship. I'm going to go back over and see what another bottle of wine will do to his memory. I'd better haul him in. Oh, don't do it, Walt. Don't do it. I can find out things a lot quicker. Shh. I got a system. Okay, but keep me posted. I've got to clean up here. How did Fink get it? Two bullets in the head. No idea who gave it to him. They used a Luger, I think. Hey, have you questioned Otis? Oh, go on. Get out of here. Walt, tell me, did you check the prints on that highball glass next to Mrs. Moran to find out whether they were from her right or left hand? Now, what difference does it make? I'll let you know. Now, you wait a minute. Now, I can't. I'm behind schedule now. Bye. Oh, Otis! I went downstairs in a hurry and started back to Skid Row and Wilbur Truitt. I turned a corner and had a quick change of heart. That's far enough, Shamus. Wow. Well, well, look what I picked up. All right. Get into this alley. Now, why don't you put that cannon away? It shows up like a pair of gums at a dentist convention. Turn around and get going. I can run if it would help. Take your time. You haven't got too much of it left. Stop nudging. You got a coal barrel. Don't you like it? No, but it helps. A lesson in the manly art of self-defense. Next time, don't get so close with a gun. Well, what do you know? A Luger. Okay, so so I'm a Butterfingers. You got the gun now. What are you going to do? I got a mean streak, and it shows up when someone tries to kill me. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and if you don't answer them... You'll wish you'd picked on an octopus. Now, get up! Oh, you're a big one. Now, who sent you after me? I don't know. Who sent you after me? Honest, I don't know. Now, wait, wait a second. All right, the guy told me on the phone his name was Jones. Sure, first name's John. Now, wait, wait. I, I know it's a phony, but he was recommended. You get paid for your work, don't you? Yeah, but this one I collect after the job. Where? I thought you'd gotten over that stubborn streak. Okay. Uh, uh, the 8 o'clock ferry to Staten Island. He's going to slip me two bills. And you don't know his right name? No. Did you know Mac Grayson? Well, I heard of him, but I never met him. Are you as handy with a thirty-two as you are with that Luger? Huh? Forget it. Next question. Who killed Leo Fink? Oh, that's a pretty big one. Okay, I'll word it differently. Who killed Leo Fink? I'll take the beating. Yeah. Well, I got a hunch this Luger of yours will check with ballistics. Come on. Homicide's still up in Fink's apartment. Nuts! What did you say? Okay. I hustled Louie up to Walt and left him handcuffed to Sergeant Otis. They deserved each other. Louie said he was going to be paid off at 8 o'clock, and my watch said it was a quarter after 7. That gave me 45 minutes to check at Homicide and still catch the ferry to Staten Island. The fingerprint man at the 5th precinct put the prints from the highball glass under a microscope and told me what I wanted to know. My hunch had been right. So I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was paying for my ticket at the ferry landing. 
A thick, wet fog was beginning to roll in off the river, and by 8 o'clock it was hard to even see your watch. Someone was playing a piano in the lounge as the ferry began to move slowly across the river. I didn't know who I was looking for, but I figured if there was going to be a payoff, it would be outside. I leaned against the rail and took out a cigarette. Got the match, mister? Huh? Yeah, yeah, right here. Thanks. Lousy night. Yeah. He wasn't my man. When he struck the match, I could see his dirty work clothes and his factory badge. I started down the other side of the boat. Finding a killer in that fog was like looking for your car keys in a mine shaft. I reached the bow of the boat, and right then I knew I was about to score. I get a tight feeling in my stomach when I start closing in on danger. I spotted the dark outline at the rail, so I pulled my hat down and walked up beside him. He was hunched over with his arms resting on the rail. Terrible night. Mm Mm-hmm. Be awful if you had to find someone in this fog. Not if he found you first. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like the name Louis Osgood. Have you heard of it? I like the name Moran. William Moran. Who are you? Just an employee. Diamond. Hey, you get a gold star. Well, what do you want? Uh, Have you found the blackmailers? Now, stop playing Alice in Wonderland. I just pushed around your hired gun at Louis Osgood. He had enough to say to put you away for a long time. He couldn't have. He didn't know Didn't know your name? Who murdered your wife? You or Louis Osgood? Why do you say murder? The police said it was suicide. Well, I got news for you, Buster. Homicide just changed its mind. I checked and found out that the highball glass near her head was covered with prints from her right hand. What does that prove? It proves that to take her own life, she'd have to have fingers a foot long. The prints on the gun were also from her right hand. You're going to tell me that your wife shot herself while holding a highball glass in the same hand? That's not my problem, Mr. Diamond. Well, I think it is. If Louis Osgood didn't shoot her, that leaves just one suspect, you. Now, let's take a walk back to the cabin. I want to keep an eye on you for homicide. All right. This is where I leave you, Mr. Diamond. Hey, come here! I hadn't thought he'd make a break, but as long as he had a gun and knew how to use it, I could understand why he did. I got my gun out and took off after him. I expected him to go over the side and in the fog, and he'd have a good chance. But when a guy gets cornered, he does funny things. I never would have spotted him, but he threw open a door and framed himself in the light from the inside. I must have caught him because I saw him start to fold and stagger through the door. I took my time getting there. A wounded man with a gun can get pretty mean sometimes. The door swung back and forth with the motion of the boat, and I could hear the sound of the engines. He'd gone down in the engine room, so I dropped to my knees and went in after him. A long, polished ladder led down to the big diesels below, and I knew I'd hit him with the first shot because there was a bright red trail of blood leading down the ladder and behind the churning machinery. Moran! Oh, Moran, come on out! You can't get out of here. Come and get me, Diamond. I don't like being slapped around, and I'm going to see that you get yours. He was somewhere off to my left and keeping himself hidden. A catwalk circled the engine room, so I pulled an old stunt. I took a wrench off the wall and tossed it down the metal ladder. I watched for his gun flashes, and when I spotted his position, I got down on my stomach and crawled along the catwalk until I was directly over his head. He was sitting in a lot of blood. And he didn't look like he had long to go. Come on, Diamond. I know you're down here. Surprise. Look at the birdie. What? Don't try it. Sorry, Moran, but this just wasn't your night. You want to tell me about it? I shot my wife. I came in just after she shot Grayson. And she was standing at the bar with her back to me, mixing a drink. She dropped the gun by Grayson's body, so I picked it up and shot her. Wiped my prints off and put hers on it. Why did you do it? I hated her. She had money. I found some letters and turned them over to Mac Grayson, the well-known blackmailer. I wanted him to drive her crazy until she drank herself into a sanitarium, and then I'd have her money. I never guessed she'd kill Grayson, but when I did, I saw a chance to kill her and make it look like suicide. You should never have called me. The police were satisfied. I had to find Leo Fink. He knew I'd hired Grayson... And he was going to blackmail me. So when I dug up the little wino that knew Fink, you hired Louis Osgood to bump Fink and me. Is that right? Hey. Hey, Moran. Oh, well, it was a dull conversation anyway. Lousy night. The 
captain came and helped me carry him up to the deck. Back at the ferry landing, I called Walt Levinson and told him the whole story. I didn't wait around. I just hung up in the middle of his lecture on good behavior and started walking. A stiff breeze was kicking up and pushing the fog back where it came from. After a good round of murder, a guy likes to relax. And I knew just the place to curl up and get my fur brushed. I grabbed a cab and headed for 975 Park Avenue. And the only girl in the world who looked better than her $10 million bank account. Good evening, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Francis. Is Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the library. Thanks. Get me a glass of milk, will you, Francis? Milk? Oh, yes, sir. Right away. Hey, that's a B-flat. Rick, where have you been? Sailing, sailing over the bounding main. Move over. You were supposed to have been here at 8 o'clock. Oh, what's an hour if you tack it on to the end of the evening? Well, I'm glad you've been keeping out of trouble. I can't stand it when you wander in all beat up. Mm, you smell nice. What kind of cologne is that? Gunpowder, 38. What? Oh, nothing. What's this you were playing? Oh, a new song. Again. You were just dandy. Well, you know I don't play well. I just pick. You should be glad you don't play the guitar with those beautiful nails you'd saw it in half. <laughs> You're ridiculous. Whoops. Oh, that wasn't a B-flat. Rick. Mm hmm. Who do you love? I won't tell. Rick? I love you, baby. Then let's get married. Uh, hey, these are pretty good lyrics. Now stop that. Again. This couldn't happen again. I hate you. This is that once in a lifetime. This is that moment divine. You never sing when I want you to. What's more, this never happened before, though I have waited a lifetime for such as you to suddenly be mine. No comment? No. Mine to hold as I'm holding you now and yet never to part. Mine, too. Hey, what's the matter? Uh, don't go. You want to sing? Go ahead. Well, what did you have in mind? I won't tell. You're not being original. That's my line. Well, I'm mad. And come here, come here. No. Come here, huh? Mm -hmm. Helen. Mm -hmm. Still mad? No. Mm. Well, let's get you mad again. It's so much fun making up. <laughs> Mine again. What's the name of the song again? <laughs> uh, it never happens again. I'm mad. Oh, good. No. Ricky. Here's your milk, Mr. Diamond. Oh, my goodness, you never warned me. just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Tal Avery, Herbert Butterfield, and Jack Petruzzi. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. Now NBC brings you a three-way cavalcade of grand comedy with Phil Harris and Alice Fay, Fred Allen and Henry Morgan, all following in fast succession over most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. My name's Diamond. 
and I'm known along the big street as a guy who manages to keep his nose pretty clean and still make a few bucks while I'm doing it. Oh, sure, it gets a little grimy, but you've got to expect that. I'm a shamus, private eye, gumshoe. To the guy who hasn't ever been worried because he tripped over a corpse in his breakfast nook, I'm known as a private detective. And to some guys, I'm known by a lot of other names. Not the kind you'd find in a book on manners and social usages. But there are times when you might turn up on your desk calendar under the heading of what I must do today. Who hires me? How do I make a living? Well, maybe this will give you an idea. Fred, why don't you eat your toast? It's getting cold. Why don't you stop worrying about the temperature of my breakfast? I'm trying to read the paper. Did anyone ever tell you how charming it is to have breakfast with you every morning? Yeah. My ulcers. I'd like to go shopping today. Will you leave me some money? Fred, did you hear me? Mary, I'm reading. Well, stop reading and listen to me for a minute. I need some new summer clothes and I want to go shopping today. Here. Here's ten bucks. Buy yourself a bathing suit. Oh, that's very funny. Hmm? I need more than ten dollars. I want five hundred. What kind of a bathing suit are you going to buy, Mink? I'm not going to buy a bathing suit. I need some new clothes. Will you put down that paper and listen to me? Well, I see you made Jimmy Cello's column again, my darling. What? What prominent socialite is fighting with her wealthy husband and crying on the shoulder of a big-time playboy after the arguments? Is that... That's supposed to be me? Can you remember five minutes in the past five years when we haven't been fighting? Are you accusing me of running around with some playboy? Running around is right. I expect one of you to be the first to do a four-minute mile. How dare you? How dare me? Why, you lushed-up little tramp. Tramp? Yeah, tramp. Everybody in town knows you're seeing Lauren Oliver. All right, so I've been seeing him. We're... We're just friends. Well, that kind of friendship is grounds for divorce in this state. Why, you dirty... I'm sick of this whole rotten mess. And I'm going to do something about it. You're going to do something about it? Why, you conceited, pompous... You're going to do something, are you? Well, you better hurry up because I've got some ideas of my own. Uh, yeah? Lorne. Yeah, yeah, Mary? I've got to talk to you. What time is 10 it? Ten o'clock. Well, it's still the middle of the night. Call me back this later. This can't wait. Fred found an item about us in Jimmy Cello's column this morning. He stormed out of here like he was going to kill somebody. Well, you're just a gal who can recognize the symptoms. Well, that's a nasty line. What do you want at 10 in the morning, Longfellow? Look, honey, I'll take care of Cello, and if that husband of yours gets out of line, I'll take care of him, too. You see what I mean? If things like that didn't happen, I'd be out of business. I'll lay you eight to five that before three o'clock this afternoon, one of those charming people will be walking into my office begging for help. Yeah? Rick? Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Hi. You gonna take me out tonight? Sure, sure. I'll be over later. We'll have a quiet evening. No, no. I want to go dancing tonight. If you don't take me, I'll throw a tantrum. But, baby, I don't have the cash. I'm tapped this week. Well, if you won't let me take, you'll borrow it from friends told me yourself he was good in a pinch. Yeah, but he's already black and blue from those three lunches at Lindy's. Besides, he's not only your butler, but he's a darn good businessman. He wants security. Well, I'll give it to him. He's already got my badge, my book on the ten best ways to sneak through transoms, complete with illustrations, and my gun. Haven't you got something else? Yeah, but I'm saving the right eye in case of an emergency. Keyholes, you know. Look, honey, let's go take in a quiet movie. Well, and... I want to get dressed up and go to a nightclub. Summer. The flowers are blooming and the fox has left his lair. His what? Oh, I've been hibernating all winter and I want to get out into some nice smoke-filled dance floor. Why, Helen. Why, Helen, nothing. Please, Rick. Now, hold it. Someone's knocking at my chamber door. Come in. Mr. Diamond? Yeah, I'll pull up a chair. I'll be right with you. Who is it? I'm afraid to look. I haven't paid the light bill. This is a detective agency, isn't it? You, sir, have just won yourself a new economy home size murder sampler, complete with a matching set of bodies. Me? No. I haven't got time to listen to your bright remarks, Diamond. I want to hire you. What did he say? He doesn't like my bright remarks. You won't even admit they're bright. What else? Oh, something about wanting to... Uh... Something about what? Uh, uh, what was that last statement, sir? It sounded rather cozy. I said I wanted to hire you. What? I'll call you later, baby. Bye. Uh, wait, wait a minute. I, I... Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Sears... Mr. Sears, what can I do for you? I want you to follow my wife. 
Will I like the view? She's running around with another man. Well, if they're just running around, don't worry about it. It's when they get tired and slow down that things start to pop. There was a veiled article in Jimmy Cello's column this morning about my wife and this man. Yeah, I know Cello. So do I, but I'm not interested in Cello at the moment. Well, what do you want? Enough on your wife so you can get a divorce? Yes. Oh, well, that, that comes kind of high. I don't like cases like this, and I usually turn them down. If you want me to swallow my pride, it'll take a $200 retainer and a 100 a day in expenses. I'll write your check. Oh, oh just like that, huh? I am quite wealthy. Hmm. That's why I want the divorce, Mr. Diamond. There you are. Yes, sir. There I am. Now, what's the man's name that your wife is uh, seeing? His name is Lorne Oliver. Well, this is turning into a family gathering. You know him? Sure. Runs the Monarch Club. That's right. What's your wife's name, and we're going to get a look at her. Mary Sears. You can see her tonight at the stork. We'll be there for dinner, 9 o'clock. I'll be there. Oh, uh, incidentally, that uh, comes under the heading of expenses, in case you have a short memory. I have a good memory, Mr. Diamond. You can send me the bill. Oh. Address and phone number? 45 East 65th Street. 45 East 65. Evergreen 41793. E 41793. Now I've got to be going. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Sears. Yeah? What do you hang up on me for? Uh, honey, this is because you always give me an argument. You never want to go anywhere. I'm getting tired of shows and hot dogs. I want to go dancing. What? And I don't mean Roseland. I want to go to the stork. I'm a growing boy, and I like to see the bright lights and throw my money around. But, Rick, you... you I'll certainly... pick you up at 8.30, and this time, don't wear slacks. <laughs> You're an idiot. Bye, idiot. Yes, that's the way it goes, just as I told you. The word private in front of detective means you're married to all the troubles in the world, and that includes everything. So if a guy turns up who's unhappy with his wife, you listen to him howl, and if he's got enough money, you take the job. It's for better or for worse. And until Mr. Sears came in, it was decidedly one-sided. I'd teach cooking to a bunch of headhunters for a fee like the one he'd given me. When I looked at his $200 check, I started getting that big man complex again. So I closed the office and went back to my flat. We'd probably be up late, and Helen always had some extracurricular activities after we'd get back to her place. You know, roasting marshmallows, fast game of canasta, or an exciting round of image on the living room rug. Anyway, I always got home pretty late in the a.m., so I spent the rest of the afternoon taking a nap. At 6 o'clock, I got up and dressed, and at 8.30, I picked up Helen. Wow. And at 9 o'clock, we were sitting at the Stark Club bar, right on schedule. Rick, when are you going to ask for a table? Well, honey, the drinks come past to here. But I want to dance. Oh, no, no, no. I mustn't overdo it, lover. No. How do you know? Maybe some mountain climber will ask you on a 20-mile hike tomorrow. Think of your feet. I am. I want to move them around that dance floor. Oh, Rick, I know you. You do something, you do it all the way. Yeah, let's nick. Oh, now you stop that. You're on a job, and you don't want to go in there because you've got to watch somebody. Well, Helen Asher, how are you, darling? Well, hello, Lauren. How have you been? Oh, couldn't be better. Why don't you ever stop over to my club? I'd like to show you around. She just brought a seeing eye dog. Oh, hello, Diamond. You two know each other, don't you? Yes. How did we make such a grisly mistake, Oliver? I don't know. I tried taking penicillin for it, but it didn't do much good. Well, it probably helped out in the other things. Why don't you try hanging yourself? Really? You always did think you were a pretty funny man, didn't you, Diamond? <laughs> It's easy being a comic. You just find an idiot for an audience. How do you like the performance? Stinks. Pardon me, Helen, but I see some people I know. You'll excuse me, won't you, Diamond? Oh, sure, yes. But the next time you drop around, bring some airwick, huh? Rick, even if you don't like him, you shouldn't say those things. It's liable to start a fight. Oh, uh, he wouldn't take a swing at a midget if he was riding an elephant. I wonder who his friends are. They don't seem to be too glad to see him. That name's Sears. Is that who you're watching? Yeah, the wife. I don't know whether I approve or not. She's very attractive. Isn't she, though? Rick! This is business, baby. Business. I'm only drooling because I haven't had anything to eat since this morning. Well, then let's get a table. You've seen her. You've observed what she's doing. Now let's get something to eat. Now, wait a minute. Here comes somebody else I know. Where? Standing at the check room. The little man? Yeah, here he comes. Who is he? Name's Cello. Oh. Jimmy Cello. Writes a gossip column. I read it all the time. Yeah? Uh, hello, Jimmy. Well, well, well. 
Well, well, the Broadway Shamus. Who's the uh, lovely redhead, Diamond? Helen, meet James Cello, but be careful what you say. Jimmy, Helen Asher. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Cello. How do you do? Is this an item, Rick? If I don't get us a table soon, she's going to make me give back her sorority picture. Oh, uh, <laughs> speaking of tables, I see some people I know. Uh, nice meeting you, Miss Asher. Thank you. Goodbye, Diamond. Bye, Jimmy. Rick, he's going over to see his table. Hello, Walter. Hi, doll. Hi. Well, well, good evening. What do you want, Cello? Oh, I just dropped by to see how the happy little family was getting along. Well, just drop away. Nobody asked you to stop by. Yeah, why don't you do that and take Oliver here with you? Nobody asked him to stop by Fred, either. keep your voice down. This is my table, and I don't like a lot of crumbs lying all uh, over it. Who's oh. a crumb? Come on, Lorne. I guess Mr. Sears has forgotten a few things. I haven't forgotten a thing, Cello. When you print one thing in that lying sheet of yours, and I'll have you sued for life. Listen, Sears, if I did print anything, they'd put you away so far, they'd have to pipe air into you. Oh, do go on, Mr. Cello. This is getting interesting. You'd better get out of here, Cello. No, no, no. Go on, Cello. What have you got an old money bag? He's a lying, dirty gossip monger. He doesn't have a thing. Wait a minute. I don't like that. Why don't you ask your husband about North Africa sometime, Mrs. Sears? Just a minute. Stop it. All right, now pick yourself up and get out of here, Cello. Maybe you're right. I've got a column to get out. It'll be all about you, Sears, in big time. Go on, get out. How about me? You gonna throw me out, too? You can bet your life I am. I'm getting out of here. You stay right where you are. Don't talk that way to Mary. I'll talk any way I like to my wife. Lauren, maybe you'd better leave. Here come the waiters. Now it's I'm gonna push his fat slob's face in. Yeah? Yeah. Come on, Lauren. All right, all right. Come on, break it up. Break it up. Come on. Hey, waiter, give me a hand. Come on, you. Take your hands off me, Diamond. Now calm down, Mr. Sears. I'll kill that slob. Oliver, you shut up or I'll. Pull your pants up over your head and shove you in a glass like a breadstick. I don't like people meddling in my affairs, Diamond. You're fired. I'm what? You heard me. Now take your filthy hands off me. Ah, uh, well, they were lily white before I palmed that check of yours this morning. You can have it back. Here, eat it. What? I... I'll have you in jail for this, Diamond. Why? It isn't every day you get to eat a $200 check. Oh, Rick, let's get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, baby, but that's what happens when you go to work for a hyena like Sears. You think he's a nice guy because he laughs so much. But you find out later it's only because he chewed your leg off. We left Sears still spitting out pieces of the check I'd shoved down his throat and headed for Helen's apartment. I was sore. When I get hot under the collar, I don't make for good company. So I dropped her off with a kiss and went back to my flat and climbed in the sack. I smoked a dozen cigarettes before I got to sleep. And when I finally did, it must have been with a big smile on my face. All night, I kept dreaming that Lauren Oliver and Fred Sears were beating themselves to death with hot paper sacks. Sunshine Market. Locks popovers are specialty. Now you stop clowning and get over here right away. Walt? Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, wow. Well. Where are you? I'm in your office. Yeah? Well, if any clients come in, give them a good sales talk. Tell them how many people you've killed or something. There's a guy in your office now. Prospect? Depends on what you're talking about. I think his name is Fritz Sears. Uh, tell him to go home. He canned me last night. I don't think he'll listen. All right, all right. So he's sore. He's got a right to be. acting like an idiot, Walt. You know I didn't have anything to do with it. I know you didn't, but we find the stiff in your office and we get a report that he fired you last night that you had a fight with him. I gotta tell the commissioner something, Rick. Tell him Sergeant Otis is teething. Now you stop that. No, what do you know about the killing? The coroner just left. He said that Sears had been dead about eight hours. The cleaning woman found him at nine this morning and called us. Mm, that puts the time of the murder around 1 a.m. We found this clenched in the dead man's hand. What is it? An article torn out of the morning papers. Here, read it. Ah, oh, Jimmy Cello's column. Read it. All right, I will. Don't yell at me. Ah, Fred Sears, wealthy import-export man, is having troubles. He's finding it hard to explain about his past doings in North Africa, and at the same time, he's finding it just as hard to explain his wife's interest in the local playboy, nightclub owner, Lauren Oliver. Yeah. He got so mad at the Stark Club... Oh, I was there, I was there. He got so mad at the Stark Club last night that he took a poke at your columnist and then tried to beat up Lauren Oliver. 
Will this lead to a rematch between Oliver and Sears? We're having a whole bunch of them picked up. Walt, Walt, before you do that, give me a couple of hours, will you? Try to dig up your killer? I can't. You know what we've got to do. It's routine. Well, the commissioner's already having fits every time he hears my name. Now, look, Rick. Walt, I got a business to protect. And if he finds out the stiff was killed in my office, he'll probably haul in my license. Yeah. One hour, Rick. That's oh. all I can give you. I got a job, too. Oh, thanks, Walt. I suppose you've got an alibi for one o'clock? Call Helen. We were toasting marshmallows. Well, I had three good suspects. Lauren Oliver, Cello, the columnist, and Mrs. Sears. One of the three was built just right for the electric chair. An hour isn't much time to dig up a killer, so I grabbed a cab and headed for Lauren Oliver's office in the back of his club. Yeah, come in. How are you, Oliver? Oh, what do you want, Diamond? Not particular about who comes into my club. Oh, I'm surprised you can operate with that kind of policy. People probably see you in here every night. I think I'll have you thrown out. Where were you at one o'clock this morning? None of your business. Herman. Yeah, boss? Come in here and show a guy out of my office. Oh, we get rough, huh? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll let you tell the cops who knocked off Fred Sears. Hey, this is the guy, boss? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you say someone knocked off Fred Sears? That's right, but don't start crying about it. It makes me feel so helpless. I'll tell my story to the cops. They'll get a lot tougher than I will. You won't get tough at all, Mac. Oh, stop flexing, Herman. You'll snap your girdle. Well, I guess it doesn't make much difference as long as Sears is dead. I was with his wife from about 12 o'clock to... to, Well, it was a long time after one. Where were you all that time? At my place. And I'll take a walk, Shamus. You got my alibi. One more question. Did you go out at all? Yeah, I went out and got the late papers. So what? I like to read. Okay, okay. You don't mind if I stop by and see Mrs. Sears, do you? No, go ahead. I'll see you later. Oh, Herman. Yeah? You can let the air out now. Your muscles are lovely. Well, Oliver had a good story if it checked. So that left me with two more stops. Cello's newspaper office was the closest, so I grabbed another cab, and ten minutes later, I was sitting at his desk. Oh, you don't think I had anything to do with it, do you, Diamond? Where were you at one this morning? I was covering a party at Richard Gray's. I was with friends from about 11 o'clock till after three. You can check. Go on, check. Look, Poison Pin, Sears had your column from the late edition clenched in his hand. He, he did, huh? Well, you don't think if I was going to kill a man, I'd leave anything like that around? I don't know. Well, now, obviously, someone is trying to make it look like I did it. Have you talked with Oliver and Sears' wife? Oliver's got an alibi, and I'm headed for Mrs. Sears' place right now. You know the address? Yes, yeah. 45 East 65th. But Mrs. Sears couldn't kill her husband. I know her too well. No? Well, yeah. thanks, Cello. I'll check your alibi. If it stands up, then I'll have to really go to work on Mrs. Sears. <laughs> even better up close. What's on your mind? You mean right this minute? Well, aren't you nice? Don't crowd me, though. I can keep up a pretty good average in this league. I'd say about a thousand. Mm-hmm. May I come in? I think so. If you keep talking. I like to hear nice things. Well, you deserve them. But I can think of some nice things to say about a panther. We'll talk about my family some other time. Can I buy you a drink? It's a little early, unless you got some milk. Milk? Where's your husband? Oh, you know about him, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. This looked as though it might work into quite a friendship. Where is he? I haven't seen him since last night. Why? Is he a friend of yours? He's been using my office. Oh? Yeah. yeah he died there last night. What? Everybody is so surprised. But, uh, how? Who did it? That's what I'm trying to find out, lover. Where were you at 1 a.m.? That's none of your business. Okay, let the law drag it out of you. Goodbye, dear. Uh, wait a minute. All right, I'll tell you. I was with a man named Oliver, Lauren Oliver. Oh, for how long? From about 12 o'clock to, well, much later. That's what Oliver says. Did you go out at all? Just to get the papers. That checks with Oliver's story, too. Did you go out alone? Why, uh... uh, No, I I went with Lauren. He says he went out alone. Oh, well, yes, yes, he did. I thought you said you went out with him. Well, that was later. Lauren was the one that went out to get the papers. Okay, what time is it? Oh... About two. When you both went out or when Lauren went out to get the papers by himself? Uh, when Lauren went out. Oh, yes. Now, now I see. Well, I, I'll, I'll see you later. I'll come back again. Oh, I'll do that after you get over crying for your late husband. I'll keep my emotions down to a minimum. I'll bet you will. 
I left her standing in the middle of the room, looking after me like a vegetarian with an eye on a green salad. I closed the door and started down the hall for the elevators. For some reason, I never seem to get where I'm going. Hello. Hmm? <coughs> now, while you're still tuned in, Diamond, I'll give us some advice. Stay away from Mrs. Sears. Now, I want you to be sure and get the point. <coughs> Come on, snap out of it. Uh, I'll go away. Come on, you don't look so good. Uh, it matches the way I feel. Oh, here's a new line. Where am I, Walt? In Mrs. Sears' apartment. Hello, handsome. She heard the scuffle in the hall, came out, found you, and called me. Swell. Who did it? I didn't see him, but his voice sounded like a thug that Lauren Oliver keeps around, a patty cake with. Oh, that was probably Herman. Lauren is so jealous. Well, your hour is up, and now I'm going to haul them all in, including this Herman. Oh, do you know Herman, Walt? Sure, Herman Sharp. Got a record a mile long. Uh, Walt, if a guy wanted to hire a killer, where would he go? You know all the stoolies as well as I do. Yeah. Mrs. Sears, what was the fight about last night at the stork? Oh, a columnist named, named Cello threatened my husband that he was going to print something in his paper. He said something about North Africa, and Fred hit him. North Africa? This is really getting mixed up. Was your husband ever in North Africa? Yes, during the war. He was a captain in the army. Walt, can you get me this Herman Sharp's address? He's the boy I want. Sure, but I'm coming along. Have your boys pick up Cello, Oliver, and take them both down to the station along with Mrs. Sears here. Well, well, you don't think I had anything to do with it, do you? I've known Jimmy Cello a long time. About five years ago, he used to run around with a little dancer named Mary Carroll. Sure he did. I'm Mary Carroll, but I broke up with him when I met Fred. Yeah, well, you'll see him at the station can pick up where you left off. Come on, Walt. We went down fast and climbed into the prowl car. Walt put in a call and got Herman's address over the two-way radio. Twenty minutes later, we were standing in front of Herman's door. It was an old apartment house on the lower east side. I started for the door, but Walt had other ideas. Rick, we can't go in there. Why not? Because I haven't got a search warrant. Well, you got to go in if you want to crack this case. Not without a search warrant. Search warrant for what? To go in. What do you want to go in for? I don't want to go in. You do. Do what? Go in. Well, go ahead. I haven't got a warrant. What are you looking for? Herman Sharp. He's probably in there. He is? Sure. Well, what are we waiting for? Oh, what did I do that for? For that. What? Herman Sharp. Oh. Ah, is he dead? Yeah, been shot. What are you looking at? Newspaper on the floor. This morning's. Oh. Cello's column's missing. Been torn out. Then Herman's your killer. Swell. Who killed Herman? Don't you know? I'm not going to start that again. Walt, go on back to the station. I'm going to check something and make a phone call. I'll be down in half an hour and point out your killer. Calm down, calm down, this everybody. This is ridiculous. I want my lawyer. You'll get one later. Relax, Oliver. They can't hold it much longer. How do you feel, Mary? I don't like this any more than you do. Well, good afternoon. And happy Father's Day. Oh. Rick, where the devil have you been? Made a phone call to Washington, Walt. Mrs. Sears, did you know that your husband had a dishonorable discharge from the Army? Why, no. You knew it, didn't you, Cello? That's right, but I kept it quiet. He got it for running a black market. What's this got to do with the death of Sears? Oliver, you told me you went out to get the papers last night. That's right. What time was it? Uh, a little after two. You know what time the late edition comes out. How about you, Mrs. Sears? Uh, what Lorn says is correct. How about it, Lorne? Were you the one to go out and get the papers? Uh, yes. Uh, then, Mrs. Sears, why did you tell me this afternoon that you also went out to get the papers? Well, I... Mary, don't say anything. You don't have to. The stories don't check, so you couldn't have been together last night. Look, Diamond, what is this... Oh, gun? now you look, Oliver. You're both liars. But that doesn't make either one of you the killer. Oh, but Rick, Cello's alibi checks right down the line. Sure it does, because he was at that party. But the killer wasn't. Oh, we know that. He couldn't have been. Yeah, but the man who hired the killer to knock off Sears was. What are you talking about, Diamond? Oliver, where was your hired gun if last night? You mean Herman? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. He was with me until 6 o'clock, then he left. Walt, when you find Herman's gun, ballistics will probably say that it was the one that did the job on Sears. Herman? Yeah. Cello, you hired Herman to kill Sears, and then you killed Herman. What? <laughs> You're out of your mind. I didn't even know this Herman. We found the newspaper next to Herman's body. It had your column torn out of it. That doesn't pin anything on me. It just shows you that Herman probably stuck that article in Sears' hand after tearing it out of a newspaper. That's you. That's what you wanted to make it look like. You knew Herman. You knew about the clipping, so you killed him and tore the column out of this morning's newspaper. 
Of course I knew about the clipping. You told me about it this morning in my office. That's right. But you were the only one I told about it. You couldn't convict Jack the Ripper on that kind of evidence. I'm afraid he's right, Rick. Hello. What time does the late edition come out? About two o'clock. Walt, what time is Sears killed? Around one. Say. Yeah, yeah. The killer couldn't have gotten hold of that column at one o'clock. The papers weren't even out on the street. Well, then how did he do it? Only one man could have gotten that column before 1 a.m., the man who wrote it. Jimmy. He oh. tore it out of the galley sheets. The proofs that are made up before the paper goes to press. Cello hired Herman, gave him the clippings, and then went to the party. Oh, you're doing great, Diamond. Keep it up. You're still in love with Mary Sears. You were jealous of Oliver, so you hired Oliver's boy Herman, figuring the cops would pin Sears' murder on Oliver. How am I doing? You're a good liar and a rotten detective. You knew I'd go to see Mary Sears, so you sent Herman to beat me up and make it look like Oliver was behind it. What? You tried to frame Oliver all along the line. Why, you cheap little scandal snooper. I'll fix it so you don't frame anybody. Wait a minute. All right, break it up. Come on, break it down. Break it up. Hey, Walt. What is it, Rick? Bye. Good evening, Mr. Diamond. Uh, evening, Francis. Miss Asherin? Yes, sir. She's in the library. She's a little tired from last night. I think she's taking a nap. Well, I'll walk on my tippy toes. How about a glass of warm milk, Francis? I'm a little tired, too. Uh, yes, sir. Right away, sir. Well, look at the little baby. Mm-hmm. Oh, hasn't he ran? Poor little tired baby. The evening breeze caressed the trees tenderly. Oh, Rick. The trembling trees embrace the breeze tenderly. Hello, baby. Don't stop. All right. Close your really eyes. Then you and I came wandering by. Oh. Wonderful. And lost in a sigh were we. Ricky. The shore was kissed by sea and mist tenderly. Ricky. I can't forget how two hearts met breathlessly. Ricky, come here. Your arms opened wide and closed me inside. Ricky, come here. Uh, what is it, dear? Just this. Mm. Here's your milk, mister. Oh, my goodness. Now, this time I refuse to blush. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, High Aberback, Joan Banks, Parley Bear, and Sidney Miller. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. I'm Diamond. When have you got any idea how much trouble a private detective can get into sometimes? Well, if you happen to have an office at Broadway and 53rd Street and the sign painted on your door reads Diamond Detective Agency... 
You're a setup for more trouble than a guy who goes bear hunting with a switch. I know, because I've got that office and the sign painted on the door. Sure, I've got a lot of idle time, and I use it up sitting around with my feet on the desk, waiting. But idle time can be as dangerous as a rattlesnake taking a sun bath. It's just the preliminary, the lull before the storm. You might wait an hour, a day, or maybe even a week. But the quiet minutes keep multiplying, and sooner or later, things come to a head. Like one day last week. I'd been working on an extra long lull that didn't look like it was going anywhere. But in another part of town, a union meeting was taking place. It was going to keep me jumping around like a hungry flea at a dog show. I wanted to talk to you men. It's time that we did something. The Laborers' Assistance League is already functioning in a great number of factories in this city. And it's getting a stronger foothold all across the country. It continues to expand and gain power because it operates best where there's growing unrest and discontent within the factories. Now, they cause trouble and make it look like the union's not doing a good job for the worker. I know for a fact that four or five men can sit in on a union meeting and cause enough trouble to make it look like the whole union is wrong. Now, this union is getting along fine. He's really out to make trouble tonight. Yeah, if he keeps it up, this is going to be a tough union to crack. He won't keep it up. We're going to take care of him. Oh, what good will that do? His brother Phil will be in from California next week. We can shut his brother up, too. Are you sure he planned this thing with his brother? Yeah. When he gets in from California, he's bringing enough information to put us out of business. Well, that just gives us a week. He's talked too long. Let's break this meeting up. He's doing just that. Yeah? Well, how do we know you're not talking through your hat? Well, now, look, you all know me. I gripe as much as the next guy. But I know for a fact that this league is not only working like that all over the country... But now it's beginning to move in on our factories and our unions. Yeah, but how do we know it's such a bad thing? There are a bunch of racketeers. And if you don't believe me, you come to this meeting next week and I'll give you the proof you want. I don't believe Well, I guess you're right. He promised them proof in a week and that's what his brother gets in. Don't worry about it. When he gets the package, he won't be able to give anybody anything. <laughs> rest of the dinner dishes, will you? Oh, sure, honey. Here, Mama, let me wash them. You talk to Tom for a minute. He's going to another meeting tonight. Oh, meetings, meetings. Always meetings. Oh, Tom, you're working too hard. Nah, don't worry, Mama. Phil will be home tomorrow. You help me. Oh, this is not a good business, Tom. The phone call, the threats. Come on, Tom, tell Mama. I, I, I can't, Mama. It'll all be over soon. Now, come on. We'll help Marge. I told you to go sit down and relax. <laughs> you sound like I was getting to be an old lady. You take the dish towel, and we'll both do them, huh? <laughs> yeah, honey. <laughs> Your wife thinks I'm getting too old to wash dishes. Just you wait until she has a daughter-in-law. I think Mama's hinting. Oh. <laughs> Mama, shame on you. You give us the time to get the son first, then there's plenty of time for a daughter-in-law. Well, I had you and Phil by the time I was 18. Marge is 22, and you've been married over a year now. <laughs> Mama, if you're so set on me raising a family, why don't you talk it over with Marge? Maybe you two can think up something. We'll let you know. Well, you do that, will you? <laughs> you better hurry up, Tom. You'll be late for the meeting. All right, Mama. Oh, I'll get it. No, 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 no. You say goodbye to your lovely wife. Why, thank you, Mama. You know, before your father died, I only had time to raise two screaming roughnecks, but now... I plan to be the grandmother of at least five more. <laughs> How about it, honey? Think we ought to make Mama happy? This is a conspiracy. <laughs> Who do you think's going to get left with all the work? Uh, maybe just three, then. Huh? Silly. I love big families. Oh, I thought so. <laughs> Smooching when you ought to be on your way to the meeting. Can a guy even smooch with his own wife? <laughs> Who was at the door, Mama? Oh, the mailman. He left our special delivery package for you, Tom. It's in the living room. For me? Yeah. Must be from Philip. It's from California. Oh, I must be sending some stuff on ahead. Well, why don't you open it, Mama? Maybe it's something for you, too. Oh, the women have dishes to wash. It's addressed to you. If you don't want to open it now, so leave it till tomorrow. Now, go on. Get out of my kitchen. You know go. you're sounding more like a mother-in-law every day. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'll open it. <laughs> you know, maybe it'd make you happier if you knew that Marge and I decided on five kids. Children are not kids. 
kids are goats. Well, you never know. Tom, a John Wagner called you earlier. A Wagner? What do you want? He didn't say. Hmm. Who's the package from? Oh, that's from Phil, all right. I know it's a surprise because he sent it to me at the shop first and then they sent it on here. wonder why I didn't get it at the shop. Well, what is it? Just a second, Mama. Wrapped up pretty tight. Oh, it's sure heavy. Diamond Detective Agency, murder soft, cheap. We eliminate the middleman. Oh, by George, that was a good one. Is this Lieutenant Levinson, the homicide kingpin? Yeah. Rick, get down here, will you? What's up, lover? Something pretty nasty. Well, tell Otis to stop leaving his bubble gum under the seats. No kidding, Rick. This is something that you ought to know about. Well, stop sounding like an auctioneer at a mortuary and tell me what it is. You know the Waxmans? Mama Waxman? Yeah. Sure, had dinner over there last week, took Helen. What's happened, Walt? Last night, someone sent Tom Waxman a box with a bomb in it. What? I knew you were a friend of the family, and I've got to talk with you. Come down here, will you? You know it. I closed the office and grabbed a cab for Walt's precinct. All the way over, I kept thinking about Mama Waxman and her two sons. I'd known the whole family when I used to be on the force. Tom, who used to sing first tenor at the synagogue, had gotten hit in the throat with a baseball. And Catter Weinberg asked me to take over for him, so I sang that day in Tom's place. Mama Waxman heard me and asked me over later for the best dinner I'd ever eaten. We'd been friends ever since. The cab dropped me off at the station, and I went in fast. Sergeant Otis was sitting at his desk reading the police gazette. Hello, Otis. Stop panting. They're just pictures. Oh, it's the comic gum show. Go on in, Diamond. The lieutenant expects you. Oh, thanks, Sergeant. Oh, by the way, when are you going to get a haircut? You're beginning to look like Rasputin with a Tony. Uh... Hello, Walt. Sit down. I got a real headache. How much damage did the bomb do? Plenty. Killed Tom and put his wife and mother in the hospital. Mama Waxman's pretty bad. Oh, that's awful. Any line on the killer? Yeah, that's why I got this headache. We're, uh, holding Phil Waxman, Tom's brother. Holding Phil? Are you crazy? Those two kids were inseparable. Tom's wife said that the box the bomb came in was from Phil. She heard Tom say so before he opened it. Well, she could have been mistaken. Someone could have copied Phil's handwriting. The story's got more holes in it than a fishnet. The package was sent from California, Rick. That's where Phil was. He got in this morning and we picked him up at the train. Uh, what does he say? I thought at first he was going to say plenty, but then some guy comes in and says that he's his lawyer. After the guy left, Phil shut up like a clam. He denies the crime, doesn't he? Oh, sure, but that's all. Can't get anything else out of him. Who was this guy who claimed to be his lawyer? I got it right here. Name is John Wagner. Ah. Uh. You check on him? Yeah, he's a lawyer, all right. But we can't find an address on him. Moved his offices about three weeks ago. Can I uh, talk to Phil? Won't do you any good. But if you want to have Otis take you over to the tombs. I won't have to hold Otis's hand, will I? Oh, go on. Get out of here. Somebody to see you, Waxman. All right, Diamonds, you got five minutes. How are you going to keep track, Otis? On my fingers. Well, that'll only get you up to 13. I'll scream if I need you. Uh... How are you, Phil? You're in on a tough rap. Yeah. You want to tell me about it? I've told the police everything I'm going to. Who was the lawyer who came in to see you? Just a lawyer. John Wagner? Just a lawyer. Look, uh, what were you doing in California? Now, Phil, I know you didn't send that bomb. Why don't you open up and get yourself free? I've said all I'm going to say. Now, get out of here, Diamond. Oh, it's like that, huh? Yeah, it's like that. Oh, come on. Go on, get out. Okay, okay. But don't forget your mother. You don't want to let her down. I'm going over to the hospital and see her now. Hey, Otis, let me out of here. Richard, how's my big policeman? Fine, Mama. Did you know that one of my wonderful sons is dead? Did you know that, Richard? Yes, Mama. Now, you take it easy or the doctor won't let me stay. They killed my Tom because what he said was the truth. 
And that's why they are bad. Because they don't let people tell the truth. Who, Mama? My boy Phil knows. He will tell everything about them, and then they will be arrested. Sure, Mama, but who does Phil know about? I just saw him, and he won't tell me. Mama. I, I feel so sleepy. I, I, I'm tired. Mama. You'll have to leave now, Mr. Diamond. Is she asleep, nurse? Yes, we gave her an injection before you got here. Oh. Well, then may I see Mrs. Tom Waxman? For a minute, yes. She's in this next room. She isn't as serious as Mrs. Waxman, but she has to rest. I'll give you a minute with her. Marge? Yes? Who is... Rick? Oh, oh no, no, come on. you got to help me out. I'm the guy that's supposed to make people laugh. I'm the cornball with the bad line of chatter, remember? I can't help it. I'm sorry, they they gave me something to make me sleep, and things don't make too much sense. Look, dear, I want to help Mama, and I want to help you, too. But the nurse will only let me stay a minute. The police are holding Phil. I just came from seeing him. Did he tell you anything? Nothing. I made a mistake and told the police that the bomb had arrived in a package from Phil. I didn't think... They can't believe Phil would ever do a thing like that. He was helping Tom. Mama said Phil knows who did it. He doesn't know. He just knows who's behind it. I'm pretty sure I know, too. Who, Marge? Tom's been making speeches against an organization that call themselves the Laborers' Assistance League. I've heard of them. King-size bunco game. Yeah. Phil's been in California. He joined the league and... Found out a lot of things about it. He used to write Tom once a week. Your time's up, Mr. Diamond. You'll have to leave. Uh, just a second. Marge, did Tom tell anybody what his brother was doing? I don't know. There was a man named John Wagner that called Tom all the time. John Wagner? He's a lawyer. Please, Mr. Diamond. Uh, did he tell any of the men who work in the shop with him? Yes, I think so. Mr. Diamond, I'll have to call the doctor. Please, nurse. This may mean another man's life. Marge, who did he tell? Well, I, I can only remember one person, Ralph Pryor. Pryor. Mama used to fix Tom and Ralph dinner after work sometimes, but he, he, he was Tom's closest friend. Okay, Marge. Now you take it easy, and I'll see what I can do. Please, Rick, find the men who did this. Yes. Well, I'll try. All right, nurse. I shouldn't have let you stay this long. What would I have to do to get you to take care of me? Have an accident. Well, I'll see what I can come up with. Bye. I left the hospital and walked out on the street. One of those sidewalk photographers snapped my picture and handed me a card in the case I wanted to send him two bits for the print. I threw the card away and headed for the factory where Tom had been working. The superintendent took me down and introduced me to the new foreman of the shop. Yeah, pretty rough about Tom. That's an understatement. Tommy, when did you take over Tom's job as foreman? This morning. How long have you worked for this shop? About three years. Why, are you a cop? I might be. You know a guy named Ralph Pryor? Sure, that's him. Right over about that there third lady. Want me to call him over? No, I think I can make it under my own power. Hey, uh, you Ralph Pryor? Yeah. You knew Tom Waxman pretty well, didn't you? Yeah. Well, don't cry on the machinery. It'll rust. Who are you? What do you want? Name's Diamond. Let's say I'm a friend of the family. Well, good for you. What are you snooping for? I've got an erector set. I just love machinery. Well, don't get too close to this machine or it'll take your arm off. As long as it's not the one I count my money with. How long have you worked here? None of your business. Where were you during the war? Same answer. Well, thanks, Mr. Pryor. You've been grand. Hey, Foreman. Yeah? Did you talk to Pryor? Yeah, he's the quiet type. So how does the mail come in here? From the mail room. Ask a silly question. No, I mean, who brings it in? Well, no special one. Foreman usually sends someone after it. Do you remember a package coming here for Tom yesterday or the day before? No, if there'd been one, Tom would have seen it. 
He was the foreman then. Where can I find the mailroom? Up the hall to head the stairs. Thanks. Sure is too bad about Tom. You said that. Say, didn't I know you all back in Little Rock, Arkansas? No. I'm from Malvern. Uh, I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> I went up and talked to the mailroom clerk, and he was a little more help. There had been a package for Tom. He told me that he'd sent it down along with some other mail, but he couldn't remember who'd picked it up. I was beginning to get warm, and I knew it. So I slipped into a phone booth and put in a fast call to Lieutenant Levinson. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me talk to the lieutenant. Oh, it's you, Diamond. Why don't you stop playing like a detective? Why don't you buy the lieutenant a necktie for his birthday, a fuzzy green one? Think he'd like that? Sure. And if the clerk hasn't ever seen a fuzzy green one before, just show him your tongue. Now, put the lieutenant on. Uh, lieutenant Levinson. What? Did you find out anything about that bomb? Oh, yeah, Rick. It was dynamite. Highest grade. But I don't see how it could come all the way from California through the mails without the caps blowing the whole thing up. Uh, neither do I. Do me a favor, will you? Pick up a Ralph Pryor. He works at the same shop that Tom Waxman did. What can I hold him on? Just picking him up. Pick him up for questioning. Since when do you need an excuse? Now, you wait a minute. If you know something about this I've case, just I'll... got a hunch. Pick the guy up, and I'll be down in a little while and tell you all about it. I hung up on Walt just as he was getting around to the words you could censor and headed back to the factory. I waited around outside for about ten minutes, and then, sure enough, a prowl car pulled up, and two boys in blue got out and went in. In a couple of minutes, they came back outside, only this time they had company. Ralph Pryor. I waited until they pulled away, and then I hailed a cab and headed for the 5th Precinct myself. Oh, where have you been? Snooping, Walt. I just saw your boys pick up Pryor at the factory. Thanks. Now, would you kindly tell me what you wanted him picked up for? Oh, it's a long shot, Walt. I found out he knew what Tom's brother was doing in California. What was he doing? Getting some information on a racket that's been trying to muscle in on Tom's local union. In California? Yeah, they're operating all over the country. You've heard of them. Labor's Assistance League. Oh, those leeches. Well, I still don't see what this has got to do with Pryor. Well, I think that bomb was sent from the factory here in New York. And I found out a little while ago that in order to get hold of that package, the killer would have to be working in Tom's shop. You think Pryor did it? I'll tell you better when I see if anyone comes down to get him out. Well? Well, what? Well, what are we going to do? Sit here and look at each other? Well, that's a pretty ghastly thought. How about a fast game of canasta? Oh, you know, it's a lousy two-handed game. Well, I'm just trying to help. We could play jacks, but twosies throw me. Yeah, what is it, Otis? Uh, the lawyer, John Wagner's out here. He says he wants to see the guy we just picked up. Fast word? Ralph Pryor? Yeah. He says he represents some kind of laborer's assistance league or something. Said that Pryor's a member. All right. Let him see him. Okay, Lieutenant. John Wagner, that lawyer who came in to see Phil Waxman this morning, is back again, Rick. Well, it's time oh. to see Pryor. Yeah? <laughs> well... What are you looking so smug about? Looks like the hunch is going to pay off. You mean this lawyer is tied in with the killing? Well, I'm not sure, but I think so. Tom Waxman was making speeches against the Assistance League. Now a lawyer from the League shows up to help the only guy who knew what Tom was up to and worked in the same shop with him. Now I suppose you want me to hold the lawyer. No, Walt, why? How do I know? That's what I asked you. Why, am I supposed to know everything? Lock him up if you want to. What for? He's not guilty. How do you know he's not guilty? Because you had me pick up Ralph Pryor. Well, let him go, too. Let him go where? With his lawyer. I thought you wanted me to lock up the lawyer. Well, that was your idea. What was? Locking up the lawyer. I don't want to lock up the lawyer. Well, let him go. He's not in. Pryor is. Well, let him go. Who? Phil Waxman. How did he get in here? I don't know. You put him in. Of course I put him in. Now, why should I let him out? I don't know. I ask you. Ask me what? Why you put him in. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant? Empty the jails and throw this idiot out of my office. Thanks, Walt. Bye. I went out in the squad room and spotted the lawyer just as Otis started back into Walt's office with a glass of bicarbonate. He was a little guy, dressed neatly in a Hamburg, blue suit and spats. I made sure that he was my man and I went out in front of the precinct to wait. I hung around for about half an hour until he finally came out and then I started the tale. He grabbed a cab and so did I. We went across town and I watched him as he got out and went into a big building on 38th Street. I went in after him. We rode the same elevator to the eighth floor. We both got out. I made like I was looking for a room number, and he went in the door with a sign on it reading Continental Shipping, offices in New York, California, and London. I got close to the door and could hear a phone being dialed. I'd have given my eye teeth, complete with the fillings, to have heard what the conversation was about. Yes, yes, I just went down to see him. 
He'll be released in an hour. I've got him passage on the tramp steamer. When they release him, he'll meet me at a place I picked and I'll give him the ticket. I'll tell him the police are up to something and he'll have to get out of the country. Now, don't worry about that. He'll never get there. The captain of the ship is being paid to see that he doesn't. All right. Yes, everything is going as well as can be expected. Oh, one more thing. A friend of Waxman's, a private detective, is following me. One of our men took his picture coming out of the hospital after seeing Waxman's mother. Yes, well, don't worry about it. I can take care of him when the time comes. All right, goodbye. I waited until he came out of the building and the hunt was on again. I grabbed another cab and it took my last three bucks chasing him to a little waterfront dive on Canal Street. I followed him in and watched him sit down in a booth at the back of the room. I made like an unhealthy patron and took a table near the door where I could watch. An hour later, a guy walked in and headed for the lawyer's booth. He was Ralph Pryor. He talked with the lawyer for a minute, then took an envelope from him and got up. He went out, and I went after him. If I was right, he was my killer. And the lawyer could wait. Uh, Ralph. Huh? I want to talk to you. I thought I told you to stop snooping. Bad right here. Let's step in this alley. For what? Get in the alley. Hey, hey. What do you think, you're shoving around? You're just full of questions. You know, mister, you're not so big that you can't end up with a busted head. Now, let me go. I guess you better understand something. Oh. Get the point? Oh, you dirty... You don't want to play, huh? Oh. Oh. Maybe you haven't guessed it, but I'm mad. I'm going to kick you from one end of this alley to the other until you tell me who sent that bomb to Tom Waxman. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. The state might slap my wrist, but I don't like losing good friends. Oh, my nose. You should see Mama Waxman. She looks a lot worse, but she's got a lot more troubles. She lost a son. Oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can't take any more. Ah, sure you can. Sure. Just think about something else. Tom Waxman, maybe, or his wife and mother. Want to tell me? Okay. No. Please. Wait a minute. I, uh... All right, I did it. I did it. Leave me alone, will you? You picked up a dummy box sent from California to the factory and you planted a bomb in it. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because Brother Phil had evidence enough to smear the league? You know a lot, don't you? Sure, Tom was going to present the evidence in front of his union. And the league sent an empty box from California addressed with Phil's forged handwriting. And I went up to the mailroom and picked up the box and put the bomb in it and sent it to Tom's house. You do it for the league? Yeah, I did it for them. Who's the boss of the league? Uh, well, I, I... Come on, come on. All right. It's... <laughs> oh, Oh, you'll never know. Wow. Mr. John Wagner, complete with Derringer. I hope you noticed the error of his ways, Mr. Diamond. He talked too much. You've got a funny way of keeping clients out of trouble. I'm glad you noticed. I'm going to do the same for you. Won't you need a retainer? No, this one's on the house, so to speak. I think you're going to get one anyway. That cop at the end of the alley with a riot gun doesn't look like he's hunting golfers. That is a very stale attempt at throwing me off guard. Anyone that would be stupid enough to try a worn-out stunt like that deserves to die. You'll make it easy for me. Okay, suit yourself. Fire when ready, Gridley. What do you think? <laughs> Thanks, Walt. You arrived in the nick. Nick pick. A big azunt. Why can't you get mixed up with a wife beating or something? The taxpayers are getting tired of seeing their streets cluttered up with a lot of bodies. Why don't you yell at me? How did you find me? I knew something was up, so when Ralph Pryor was released, I tailed him. I saw you tailing Pryor, I saw the lawyer tailing you, so I tailed the lawyer. Well, if you'd had an eight-piece band, you'd have had a parade. Oh, nuts. Oh, what's the matter, Walt? You, you'd have had to shoot him. He was going to kill me. Oh, I'm not worried about that. Well, what is it? I forgot to bring my bicarbonate along. Oh. Well, the wagon came and created Pryor and the lawyer off to the morgue. When we got back to the station, Walt put in a call to the feds and told them to check the uh, Labor's Assistance League in California and pick up the guys who sent the package through the mails. Using the mails like that can be a tough rap. And three weeks later, the government closed in. They picked up the big wheel and threw the whole bunch away from 10 to 20. Tom's brother, Phil, was released, and he went in front of Tom's union and gave them the evidence he'd collected while he was with the league. Needless to say, the league wasn't represented that night or any night after that. 
About three weeks after Mama Waxman came home from the hospital, she invited me over for one of her famous dinners. I brought Helen, and her butler Francis came along to help with the serving. Hi, oh, Mama, I'm stuffed. Well, Richard, you didn't finish up the cheesecake. Can't make it, honey. I can't move. Oh, the Helen's a good girl. She ate everything in front of her. You know what? You two should get married. <laughs> her appetite is the best argument against getting married I can think of. Keep working on him, Mama. <laughs> all right. Now, let's all go into the front room. If I know my big policeman, he still likes to stretch out on the couch. Huh? You are so right. <laughs> <sighs> Here, let me help you, Mama. Oh. Thank you, Richard. Uh, there's Francis. Oh, he's been making some coffee. Oh, he's been such a help. Before the accident, it was nothing to serve supper. You sit right here, honey. All right. Thank you. Oh, I won't have to eat another thing for a week. Here's the coffee, Mrs. Rexman. Uh, Francis, you must call me Mama, like the rest. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Mama. Did you have enough to eat also, Francis? It was simply wonderful. You know, someday if Miss Asher doesn't mind, I'd like to stop by and, well, just swap recipes, as it were. Well, mm-hmm. I think that would be wonderful, Francis. Why don't you do that? <laughs> I'll give you some fine ones, Francis. Where's Phil tonight, Mama? He had to go to our union meeting. He's going to work in Tom shop. He also asked me to thank you for singing at the funeral. Glad to do it, Mama. Richard, we always wondered where you learned to sing in Yiddish. Well, I used to pound a beat on the Lower East Side. Oh. Well, would you do me a big favor, Richard? Sure, dear. I'm feeling a little sad about my boy tonight. Would you sing something for me? Uh, this song he liked you to sing. Oh, huh? I'm a little full of dinner, Mama. Please, oh, 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 yes, sir. Please, Mr. Diamond. Well, <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> Mimi, Mimi. A Yiddish medal. Da fa Yiddish a boy. Pretty good for a shaker, so, Mama. Oh, fine. Du schön am Edel, in es darf sein, a soi. What does it mean? Don't tell her, Mama. <laughs> well, in the toy re is geschwitten, in es oi is du swablitten, a Yiddish medal. Da fayir is a boy. Hi, 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 cousin Kale Mazelta. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful, Richard. You know, you would make a fine canter. Well, thank you, Mama. How did you like it, Francis? Ha! As a cousin, Mr. Gitten, this was it. What? Francis. What did he say, Mama? <laughs> he said, as a canter, you would make a fine dishwasher. <laughs> you have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Hey, Eddie. Eddie, you mind if I butt in for a minute? Not at all, Dick. Thanks. I just wanted to tell the people that next week our show is going to be on at a different time and a different day. The day will be Saturdays instead of Sundays. And would you please look in your newspapers for the time? Thanks, Dick. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Diamond will come to you next Saturday at a new time. Be sure to check your newspaper for the hour. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is WOR New York. Seven o'clock by Lon Jean. The world's most honored watch. Product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and more than 1,200 leading retail stores from coast to coast present that immortal character created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Starring John Stanley. (laughs) This week's story, The Adventure of the Uddington Witch. Holmes! Yes, Watson? You say you saw a shadow dart into this forest after the murder? I did, Watson. And it was an extraordinary shadow indeed. What do you mean? I saw what was apparently a witch, Watson. A witch? Precisely. The Black Witch of Uddington. 
The local townsfolk say she still prowls this forest. Well, good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Harris. And what adventure are you working on tonight, Doctor? One of the strangest and weirdest in my memoir. Holmes and I always referred to it as the adventure of the Uddington Witch. The adventure of the Uddington Witch. Sounds like something to raise the goose flesh, Doctor. Indeed it is, Mr. Harris. But first, Mr. Harris, I know you have something to say about Clippercraft clothes. Indeed I do. The day you wear your new Clippercraft suit for the first time, your friends are likely to wonder whether you came into an unexpected fortune. Your suit will fit as perfectly and feel as comfortable as if it were custom-made. The rich-looking fabrics will give you long, dependable service. If your admiring friends wonder about your Clippercraft suit costing only $40 or $45, suggest that they drop into the independent store in your community that sells Clippercraft. This store is one of more than 1,200 of America's finest stores from coast to coast that combine their enormous purchasing power to keep your dollar from losing weight. That's why Clippercraft can offer you beautifully tailored worsted suits at an unbelievably low $45. Right now, your Clippercraft store can show you one in your favorite style and color. See his selection of top coats and overcoats, too. And see for yourself how true it is that Clippercraft values can't be beat. Compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, what's this adventure of the Uddington Witch all about? Well, Mr. Harris. It took place in 99, as I recall. Holmes and I were taking our ease at Baker Street one evening when we received an urgent and certainly a bizarre telegram. It came from Uddington, a town in the Shire of Lanark, in the lowlands of Scotland. And it was from a Lord Dunbar, master of Heathercliff Manor. It begged Holmes to come to the manor with all possible speed, stating that a witch had spirited away his mother in the dark of night. A witch? Exactly, Mr. Holmes. A witch. Naturally, Holmes's curiosity was immediately aroused, and we resolved to take the noon train the following day. But little did we know, as we read the telegram, that tragic events were already in the making at Uddington on that very same evening. It began with Lord Dunbar in his study. Who's there? Who's there? Bruce? Hester? Why in blazes don't you answer? The minute I lock my door, someone has to disturb me. Well, what do you... <gasps> you! I! I, Lord Dunbar! I! The Black Witch of Uddington! I come to bring me the death and the witch's Dunbar! No! No! <laughs> Yes, I was in bed when it came. Positively ghastly, too. Seemed to come from Uncle Andrew's study. Oh, yes, Bruce. Please hurry. Something's wrong. Terribly wrong. Come on, Aunt Hester. Let's have a look. Here's the study. Uncle Andrew. Uncle Andrew. Oh, Bruce, there's no answer. Then we'd better look in. The door's open. Like... Good Lord. The witch's revenge. Andrew. Andrew. Oh! Ah, oh, it's you, home. I was wondering when you were coming back to the compartment. Our train is due in Eddington very shortly. Unfortunately, my dear Watson, we're too late to help Lord Dunbar. Too late? What do you mean? I've just seen a copy of a Newcastle newspaper sort of aboard at the last station. Lord Dunbar was murdered early this morning. What? Foully murdered, Watson. Found dead in his study with a steel spike driven through his heart. A spike? Good law. Does this method of murder suggest anything to you, Watson? Why, why no, Holmes. I can't say it does. And you're not up on your lord of demons and witches, my dear fellow. It so happens that the witches, as recently as 200 years ago, 
were believed to have tortured and stabbed their victims with pins, needles, and sometimes small spikes. Good heavens! It may also interest you to know, Watson, that the history of Lord Dunbar's antecedents gives this macabre affair a rather grim and yet fascinating twist. What do you mean? An ancestor of Lord Dunbar's in the late 17th century was one of Whitstam's most mortal enemies. As Chief Justice of the highest court here in the Scottish Lowlands, he hanged many a witch at Gallow Lee, or tied them to a stake on the sands until the tide came up to end their misery. Oh, Holmes, you're not suggesting that this is some kind of witch's revenge? I'm suggesting nothing, Watson, until I have a look at Heathercliff Manor and its remaining inhabitants. <laughs> Chief Driver. Aye, sir. When shall we arrive at Heathercliff Manor? If you look sharp yonder, you'll see the lights of the accursed house just beyond that wood. You think it has some sort of curse, then? Aye, as sure as my name is Angus Tavish. It's surely haunted by the black ones. You see that wood now? Yes. What about it, Tavish? It was there that the Chief Justice, Lord William Dunbar, burned the famous witch, Isabella Whitburn. The safety stole a treasure chest of his and hid it somewhere in the wood. She was his cook, you see, and dealt in the black magic. It was there... Among those trees, the witches meet for the Sabbath on Rumor's Day. Aye, but you'll never catch Angus Tavis taking the wood road for the black witch of Arrington roams. I'm driving you the long way around the moor. <laughs> I can't say I blame him, Holmes. It's the juice of dark in among those trees, I must say. <coughs> Good Lord, what's that? <laughs> it's the witch, the cursed witch. Is she screaming and carrying on again? Tavish, quick, drive us through the wood road. Uh, no, 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 sir. There's no a fiver in it for you if you do. Uh, I wouldn't take that road even if you gave me the treasure. Just the black witch fallen very bad. Come on, Watson. Let's get out of this carriage. Holmes, what on earth are you going to do? Quick, Watson, follow me. Run, man, run. If luck's with us, perhaps we can beard this witch in her den. <laughs> Yes, and you almost winged me with that revolver. Oh, my, my, my dear fellow, you know, I... Oh, dash it all, I'm sorry. The truth is, I, I, I'm in a terrible sweat. I, I've been running through this foul wood, expecting every every shadow under every tree to lead to the attack. Heard any more of that screaming and tackling, Watson? Oh, that confounded witch must have retired for the night, Holmes. Hmm. Strange. Very strange. We've covered every foot of this wood. It's only a few hundred feet in every direction. Yet no sign of our cackling friend. Well, I might say, Holmes, I'd be just as happy if I never see her. Even the Black Witch of Addington, with all her magical powers, couldn't vanish into thin air so fast. And that maniacal cackling seemed to come from this grove of oak trees here. Well, I'd say it came from Hades, Holmes. The deuce, it sounds as though she were being tortured and burned at some stake. Yes, a terrifying effect, Watson, and well calculated to keep the curious away. Come, Watson. Where, where to now, Holmes? Suppose we go to the house and meet its occupant. I take it you are Bruce Lennox, nephew to the deceased. Yes, Mr. Holmes, I am. And you have no idea what a relief it is to have you and Dr. Watson here. I, I knew my uncle had written you and... Quite. I might add, we arrived in a most unorthodox manner. It was a small wood in the rear of the house. Yes, I heard the most terrifying cackling and screaming there, Mr. Lennox. Couldn't find a trace of the dashed witch. I know. Frankly, gentlemen, I admire you for your courage. I count myself as brave as any man and not addicted to superstition. But I, for one, never had the nerve to enter that wood at night. Well, I can't say I blame you much. Now then, Mr. Glenick, a question or two. Yes, Mr. Holmes? Have the official police been here? Yes, this morning. But the local constable found nothing. Conducted only a hurried investigation. I am afraid he is as much frightened by the legend as anyone else. Perhaps, but at the moment I'm not interested in legends, but in facts. This chain of tragedy, I understand, began with the dis disappearance of your great aunt. Yes, Lord Dunbar's mother. She disappeared from her room a few nights ago, and she's heard nothing of her since. You think, then, that she was taken by this, this black witch of Uddington? I don't know, Mr. Holmes. She might have just wandered off. My great aunt Emily, well, she was, shall we say, somewhat eccentric. In what way, Mr. Glennie? Oh, she kept muttering to herself, living in the past. Definitely unbalanced, Dr. Watson, but as far as I know, completely harmless. I see. Now then, are there any servants here at the manor? Only two. 
The rest have been frightened off. Who are these two? Cook and the gardener. And Lady Dunbar, where is she? I should like to talk to her. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, but I should not advise it now. Lady Dunbar is in her room, indisposed. The, the shock. Well, you understand. Quite. And now, Mr. Glenick, we should like to examine the body of your late uncle, Lord Dunbar. Good Lord, Holmes. What a ghastly sight. No wonder young Glenick excused himself the moment he showed us to the study here. A sharp spike driven directly into Lord Dunbar's heart. Yes. And with considerable strength, I might add, Watson. Hello, what's this? What's what, Holmes? There seems to be some fresh soil on the lower part of this fatal spike. Fresh soil? Quite. And observe, Watson, the peculiar shape of this spike. Long and narrow. And the remnant of a bit of string attached to the spike head. Well, I can't say I consider all this significant, Holmes. You know, I... Oh, come in. And Mary Whitburn, the cook. Yes? Mr. Glennick roused me from my bed to prepare a hot supper for you. You'll find it in the dining room when you've a mind to eat it. Thank you, Mary. We'll be along presently. As you wish, sir. Hmm. Rather peculiar coincidence, don't you think, Watson? You mean Holmes? I mean this cook, Mary Whitburn, bears the same family name as the Isabella Isabella Whitburn, the Black Witch of Addington. By Jove, Holmes, you're right. A remarkably ugly woman, too, is that... Mole on her cheek? Ah, yes, Watson, that mole on her cheek. Another peculiar coincidence. What do you mean? In the days when witchcraft was its heyday, Watson, every witch bore what was called a witch's mark. And usually, it was a mole. Holmes, you mean this cook, Mary Whitburn, might be the... It's a bit too early to draw any conclusion as yet, my dear Watson. But come, let's have a look at the garden. The garden? What for? I should like to examine the flower bed. Aha, uh-huh. look here, Watson. Holmes, what are you... Just as I surmised, note these spikes connected by string. The gardener uses them to take off these flower beds. By Jove, the spike used to kill Lord Dunbar is very similar to this. And it had fresh soil on it. Precisely, my dear Watson. The murder spike was undoubtedly taken from the garden. Perhaps we should have a talk with the gardener here at our earliest opportunity. <laughs> Holmes, good Lord, what is... A scream, Watson, and it came from the house this time. It sounded like a creature in torment. Holmes, look on the second floor of the house. The light's just gone out in that corner room there. Quick, Watson, follow me to the house. I'm afraid the black witch of Addington has struck again. How come such expensive-looking suits cost only 40 and $45? Well, that's what you may ask when you see the new Clippercraft suit, especially when you examine the careful tailoring details and run your fingers over the long wearing fabric. But it's no secret that the Clippercraft plan makes these remarkable values possible. And it doesn't take a certified public accountant to know how much money is saved for millions of family budgets when 1,200 of this country's finest independent stores from coast to coast concentrate their huge purchasing power. Yes, you'll have to agree, Clippercraft pure worsted suits our tremendous values at only $45. And be sure to see the new Clippercraft zipper top coat that's sweeping the country. A smart, lightweight coat that becomes a warm, cold-weather coat when you zip in the lining. It's an all-weather sensation. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, top coats, and overcoats. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now, let's return to our story, Dr. Watts. Well, Mr. Harris, we raced back to the house... Ran upstairs toward the corner bedroom whence that agonizing scream had come. It was there we found Lady Dunbar lying across the bed with a spike through her heart. The witch, the black witch of Huddington Holmes, she. It has been that again. Yes, and with the apparent intention of exterminating the entire family. I. 
Uh-huh. What is it, Holmes? Here on the floor. Observe, Watson. Oh, it seems to be a bit of bark. It is indeed, Watson, an important detail of this hideous conspiracy. <laughs> Holmes, listen. Yes, the witch again, Watson. Here, over here by the window. You know, Holmes, Holmes, there she is, running across the lawn. You can see her there in the moonlight. Yes. Now she's vaulting the fence with considerable agility, I must say. <laughs> Now she's plunging into the wood. Quick, Watson, after her. And have your service revolver ready. By Jove, I, I don't understand this. Hmm? Watson, you don't understand what? Why, we've followed that infernal creature into this grove of trees. We've, we've scoured every foot of it. And yet she's, she's vanished again. Hmm, yes. Holmes, you're not even listening to me. What the deuce are you staring at? That large oak tree, Watson. A magnificent specimen, is it not? Note the huge trunk split toward its base. Obviously a dead tree struck by lightning many years ago. Oh, dash it, Holmes. I'm not interested in botany at this moment. My feet are soaked from the night dew on this uh, blasted undergrowth here. And furthermore, we've, we've got some sort of black witch to contend with. Our... Exactly, Watson. Suppose we drop in at the gardener's cottage on our way back to the manor. I trust you observed it was situated... On the very edge of this wood. Hmm. No answer, Watson. As for the lights on, Holmes, perhaps the gardener's roaming around somewhere. Yes, perhaps. Suppose we try the door. Yes. Uh -huh. It's unlocked. Come up. <laughs> Everything seems to be quite an order here, Holmes. Yes, quite. I hope oh, someone's coming. Yes. And I fear we're in the rather embarrassing position of being intruders, Watson. What are you doing in my cottage? You are the gardener, I presume. Aye, I'm McCready. And I've no stomach for strangers coming into my house. Who be you? My name is Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. This is Dr. Watson. <laughs> we, we, we just found the light on. And the door was unlocked, and so we... Aye. Aye, the cook told me you'd come on this witch's night. She's in a cursed house, and you'd best be off when she comes. We are grateful for your advice, MacReady, but we are not ready to depart as yet. I presume you know that Lady Dunbar has been murdered. Aye, and the old lady, and her son, Lord Dunbar, before her. And the end is not yet, Mark Mac... What is it, Mr. Holmes? Why do you stare at my coat so steady? I note that there's a small blood stain on your left sleeve. My dear McCready. Eh? I trust you can explain it to our mutual satisfaction. Why, yes. I, I, you see, Mr. Holmes, I, I killed a weasel. It was a week ago, I think. A bit of blood fell on my sleeve, no doubt. Oh, yes. No doubt. Holmes. Dr. Watson. Oh, Holmes, it's Bruce Glennick. Sweetie, have you seen it? Oh, there you are, both of you. Mr. Holmes, my aunt, Betty Dunbar, she's, she's been murdered by the witch. The black witch. Yes, Mr. Glennick, we're aware of that. You've just come from the house? Yes. Yes, I was awake in my sleep, heard a loud scream, and then I... Suppose we go back to the manor, Mr. Glennick, at once. Yes? Why? What? I should like to have a few words with your cook, Mary Whitburn. Young Glennick told us the cook's room was down this corridor, Holmes. Yes, Watson. A very interesting young fellow, Bruce Glennick. He should do something about his tailor. Eh? His tailor? Pleasure, Holmes, what are you talking about? His suit, Watson, and specifically that area of his trousers from his knees to his boots. I can't say I noticed anything, Holmes. Didn't you, Watson? Then you haven't used your eyes. The rest of his suit was well creased, but that area was out of crease, unpressed. Well, what of it? Logic, Watson, logic. The most important indication of... Hello, here's Mary Whitburn's room. And the door's ajar. <coughs> Hello, are you there? No answer. Suppose we go in, Watson. Holmes, look at this room. Yes, from every indication, our good cook with a witch's mark and the witch's name has packed and left in the utmost haste. Rather strange, isn't it, Holmes? On the contrary, Watson, it's quite logical. <laughs> By Joe, Holmes, uh, uh, the witch again. Yes, and this time, Watson, the chase draws near to a close. This time, if all goes well, I hope to meet this hideous witch face to face. Come, Watson, back into that grove of trees. Holmes, that 
infernal cackling has stopped. It has indeed. But the moon has emerged and we shall be able to see it. Uh -huh. Here we are. Here's that giant oak tree again, what seemed the one killed by lightning. What about it? The lightning split it at the trunk. Note this aperture here. Uh, I still don't see why you're so interested in this confounded oak tree. Patience, Watson, patience. I'm willing to wager this tree trunk is hollow. If you'll put your hand through the aperture and tell oh, me... Oh, very well, Holmes, I'll do that. You know, but all this is rather silly. <coughs> Holmes! What is it, Watson? I... I felt something. Well? Speak up, man, what? It's something cold. It's soft. <laughs> like a human body? Yes. One side, Watson, let me look into that trunk. Uh-huh. There is a body stuffed into this tree trunk, Watson. Good Lord. The body of a woman, an old woman, and undoubtedly the lady, elder Lady Dunbar, Lord Dunbar's mother, and first victim of the Black Witch of Addington. You know, Holmes, this is diabolical. Devilish. Yes, Watson, we're dealing with a highly distorted and cruelly twisted mentality here. I... Watson. Yes, Holmes? Note the way the roots of this tree are curled upward and the earth upturned. Yes, but... Uh, I'm willing to wager that when the lightning struck this oak, it created a natural cavity under the base of the tree. Holmes, what are you driving at? The final answer to this weird adventure. Come, Watson, we'll go back to the gardener's cottage and get an axe. And in a very short time, this great oak should reveal its secret. <laughs> We'll stop here where we can observe that oak tree. Yes, but Holmes, you said we were going after an axe. A subterfuge, my dear Watson, to deceive our quarry. We'll wait until that tree reveals the secret of the man who's been posing as the Black Witch of Addington. The man, Holmes? You mean the Black Witch is a he? Precisely, Watson. And to be even more explicit, I'm able to name the hideous murderer. Holmes, who is it? Quiet, Watson. Look at the aperture in that tree. <sighs> by Jove, Holmes. It's a hand. Someone's crawling out from within the tree. Yes. You have your revolver ready, Watson? Yes, yes, I do. There he comes out of that tree. Holmes, it's Bruce Glenick. Hold, Glenick, stop in your tracks. Come on, Watson. <coughs> Holmes, he's still running. Far away, Watson, he'll shoot to kill if necessary. <coughs> Good shot, Watson. You winged him in the leg. How is he, Watson? Uh, he's unconscious at the moment, Holmes. Uh, the pain, you know. But it's nothing serious, just a flesh wound. He'll come around in a minute. Hmm. Holmes, how did you know that the witch was a man? Elementary, my dear Watson. It needed a man's strength to drive those fiendish murder spikes so deep. And it needed the agility of a young man to hurdle a four-foot fence with skirts on, as we saw the witch do. Yes, but how did you know it was young Glenick here? Yeah. It could be no one else than Glenick. You remember he told us that he never entered this wood... That he was in bed at the time of Lady Dunbar's murder? Yes. Obviously, he lied. The fact that the crease was missing in his trousers from the knee to his boots was proof of that. The only way he could have lost that crease was running through high brush soaked with night dew. And the only high brush in the area is among these trees. By Jove, Holmes, you're right. He couldn't have lost a crease up to his knees by merely running across a lawn. But how you knew the witch, uh, her young Glenick here, was using that hollow oak tree as a hideaway... Again, it... an elementary observation, Watson... We pursued the witch and lost him twice in a small area of trees. He couldn't have simply vanished among the trees. Therefore, he must have been inside one of them. The bit of bark we found in Lady Dunbar's room was oak. I see. And after that, it was merely a case of looking for a hollow oak tree large enough to... Exactly, Watson. This tree is unique in that respect. Furthermore, Bruce Gennick tried to divert suspicion to MacReady, the gardener, by using the garden spikes as murder weapons. Yes, but that blood stain on MacReady's sleeve... Quite legitimate, Watson. The stain was old and dry, and its dark red color indicated that it had been on his sleeve for some days. He no doubt did kill a weasel, as he said. And the cook, Mary Whitman? Merely a terrified servant with a name fairly common to this vicinity, and an unfortunate mole. I can't say I blame her for leaving uh, post haste. Uh, ah, uh, our uh, friend Denick is coming around. Yes, so he is. Holmes, why should young Glenick uh, murder the members of his family, one by one? I think we may find the answer to that, my dear Watson, when we execute our original errand and chop down that accursed oak tree. Almost to it, MacReady. Hey, Mr. Holmes. There she goes. Uh. What's 
Watson, have a look down that deep hole at the base. Good Lord, Holmes. There's a great natural cavity there. It's the hiding place of Bruce Glennett. There's the witch's costume that he used. Exactly. Glennett had merely to enter the hollow tree trunk and slide down to the natural cavern formed by the upturned roots below. Holmes, look. There's an old chest down there with a the cover raised. And it's filled with money, with jewels. Yes, Watson, the chest of the original black witch, Isabella Whitburn, stole from her master, the Chief Justice, Lord William Dunbar. And then she hid it here in this tree, back in the 17th century. Precisely. She died with her secret, and Bruce Glenick discovered it. And there you have the motive for his fiendish deeds, Watson. He intended to murder his family one by one so that he would finally remain sole heir of Hibbert's Manor. And then he could claim the treasure for himself. Exactly. But there's a grim and appropriate end to this witch's tale, Watson. Bruce Jennick is exposed, but he'll still suffer a witch's fate on the end of a good, stout Scottish rope. Well, Dr. Watson, that, that was an exciting adventure. Seems to me I'll be hearing screams and cackling in my sleep for the rest of my days. Yes, Mr. Harris. Even now, I occasionally see that shadowy figure racing across the lawn toward that dark wood. I must say, however, that the case left no after effects on Holmes. He had the ready faculty of forgetting one adventure and plunging immediately into another. And what is next week's story, Dr. Watson? It's called The Logic of Murder. And it concerns an expert on evasions of the law and a grotesque new theory developed by a gentleman who had performed 6,000 autopsies. Well, Dr. Watson, we'll be waiting eagerly to hear your adventure with Mr. Holmes about the logic of murder. The makers of Clippercraft clothes and more than 1,200 stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detectives, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the program is produced and directed by Basil Lockridge. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by George Feldman. This week's story was written by Max Ehrlich, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Logic of Murder. Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Whisperer. The Whisperer. Slade. Speaking. Are you ready? Already. What are my instructions? Presenting The Whisperer, starring Carlton Young. The Whisperer, a brilliant man who, losing his voice in an accident which crushed his vocal cords, worked his way deep within the crime syndicate to help destroy it from within. To the underworld, his familiar rattling hiss is the voice of authority, to be obeyed without question. Then a miracle of surgery performed by Dr. Benjamin Lee restored his natural voice, enabling him to resume his real identity. Now, as Philip Gault, aggressive young attorney, he skirts the thin edges of death, living his dual role. For as the whisperer, he sets in motion the forces of the syndicate in Central City. Then, as Philip Gault uses his knowledge to fight the organized network of crime, which seeks to control the fate of millions in cities and towns across the nation. Now, in 
Dr. Lee's office, we find Ellen Norris, the doctor's nurse and the only other person besides the doctor who knows of Phil's dual identity, watching anxiously as Phil, speaking in the voice of the whisperer, makes his report to a superior in the syndicate. What does it mean, Phil? You mean specifically? I don't know. It's designed to set something in motion right now. Someone's murder. When the syndicate gives that kind of an order, it usually is, means at least one murder. And you had to pass the instructions on. Just another indication how the syndicate works, Ellen. One hand never knows what the other hand is doing. This Slade is probably from out of town. He has his instructions already. All he was waiting for was the word to start. I had to give it to him. Every other time, Phil, you had a lead of some kind to help. You knew who the victim was, you knew what was going to happen, and, and you could do something about it. But now... Yes, I... What are you doing, Phil? The only lead I have is the telephone number where I reached Slade. But how are you... The phone company won't give it to me, but the police can get the address. Lieutenant Denver? Mm-hmm. Excuse me, honey. A uh, homicide, please. I have an idea the lieutenant's already suspicious of your extra-legal activities, Phil. How long... Uh, hi, Lieutenant... Need a favor. Uh-huh. I've got a phone number. I need the address. Cheshire, 1789. That's right. Uh, no, it's just a little checking on a client. Yeah, I'm at Ellen's office. Thanks. Oh, he must be in a good mood. The lieutenant's plenty smart, Ellen. He knows I wouldn't want the address for any reason that might kick back. Little does he know. In this case, what he doesn't know might save him some grief. If you can stop whatever it is from happening. Yes, if... Uh, sweetheart, uh -huh. it's kind of late, and I'm going to be on the move pretty soon. How's about meeting you later for supper? You can get a sandwich now, maybe take a show or something, and then I'll join you. Mm -mm. Well, it's past dinner time already, and you haven't had anything to eat since lunch. I know. I'm starving. Well, then... And every time I have an appointment with you for dinner, it's always delayed anywhere from three to five hours. Well, you see what I mean? The best thing right now is for you to grab a bite and meet me later. Consequently, since I'm a creature of habit... I've got myself into the habit of irregular dinner hours. Well, now's your chance to get regular. I'm staying with you. But don't you... No buts. I'd be wondering about what was happening all the time. Ruin my digestion. I'm with you, lover. No, wait a minute. Hello? Oh, yes. Hello, Lieutenant. Uh-huh. Yes, I know where that is. Uh-huh. Well, thanks. I'll split my fee with you on this case. Got the address? Yes. You're not very happy about it. Well, it isn't a house. It isn't listed under any name. It's the Lyceum Theater. A pay station backstage. Oh? Coming? With you, lover. Oh, look what's playing, Phil. Romeo and Juliet. Oh, well, that would be a nice way to spend an evening in the theater. Maybe it'll be more entertaining backstage. Not that I don't think you're brilliant, darling, but just how are you going to get any information if that phone was a pay station? Seems to me this job's just about hopeless. Just about hopeless for the somebody on the other end, too, Ellen. We've got to try. Here we are. Let me do the talking. Don't I always? What can I do for you? Hello, old timer. We're looking for someone. I figured that. Who? A fellow by the name of Slade. Slade? That's right. Don't know any Slade. Not connected with the company? Nope. Can anybody come off the street and use that pay phone on the wall over there? Nope. Anybody use it in the last half hour? Nope. Oh, say, wait a minute. Yeah, there, there was somebody come along with Judy. Hung around the phone right around 7.30. When it rang, he answered it. Guess was for him, all right. I see. You say he came in with Judy? Uh-huh. Can we speak to her? Well, if you want to wait around, you probably can. He went out about five minutes ago. Went out? With the man who answered the phone? A minute after. She asked me which way he went, and she went out. Kind of in a hurry, too. And she's due on the stage in about 15 minutes. If she don't get back quick, they'll probably have to use her understudy. I see. Uh, you don't know where she went, do you, old-timer? Well, she lives across the street and down a block. Hathaway's. Hathaway's? Second-hand furniture store. Her uncle owns it. Living quarters upstairs. She lives there now to be near the theater. Thanks. Uh, but she ain't there. Oh? Leastways, she's not answering the phone there. Doville, the director, called and got no answer. Oh, well, thanks. Let's go, Ellen. Hello? 
Hathaway's. Hathaway. Oh, here it is. How do you do? Mr. Hathaway? Vladimir Hathaway, at your service. Uh, we're looking for a young lady by the name of Judy. Oh, why, Judy is at the theater down the street. She's appearing in Romeo and Juliet. But I don't think you'll be able to speak to her, not until she's off stage. Well, she's not there. She came home. She does live here. Why, of course. Uh, Judy's my niece. Of course she lives here, uh, upstairs. Uh, but she isn't home. I'd know if she were. Uh, she left here almost an hour ago. And didn't come back? Uh, no, no, of course not. Oh. Quite a shop you have here. Uh, thank you. Uh, could I interest you in some furniture? I, I have a dining room set that's almost new right over no, here. No, thanks. A lounge chair, most comfortable thing in the world. Well, we'll think of you when we set up housekeeping. Oh, I, I thought you were... Married? Not yet. Uh, Judy has a friend by the name of Slade, hasn't she? Slade? Why, uh, n not that I know of. You know anybody by that name? Uh, no, no, I... Well, I don't think we can do any good here, Ellen. Is something wrong with Judy? For a loving uncle, you finally came around to getting concerned. I don't know if anything's wrong. But if anything is wrong, I would like to know. We're trying to reach a fellow by the name of Slade, and Judy apparently knows him. Oh, I see. Perhaps uh, one of her active friends. I don't know them all. It's hard to keep them. For... Phil. I heard it. I, I beg pardon? That was a shot. Where's the stairway to the upstairs? A shot? That's right. Where is it? I, I am a little hard of hearing... But what kind of shot you... Pistol, if I'm not hard of hearing, where's the stairs? But if it's a shot... Stop stalling, Hathaway. Ellen, try that door. Here, Phil. Yes, through that door and up the stairs to the right. It was a shot, Phil. I know. Through here, Ellen. <laughs> I did it. I did it. Phil, on the floor. I see him. Phil? He's dead. I shot him. Better let me have the gun, Judy. I shot him. Slade? I, I shot him. All right, you shot him. Is his name Slade? Yes. Better give me the gun, Judy. No. Come on, Judy. No. What is it? What's happened? Judy, where's Dave? Stay away. All of you, get back. You can't run away. Stay back or I'll shoot. Quick after her. Locked. Come on, Hathaway, a little help here. Come on, let's go. Now, let's try this one. It's locked, too. Any other way out, Hathaway? What? Any other way out? Uh, yes, uh, through that back door, but it opens on an alleyway. Oh, it and... doesn't matter. She's gone by this time. What's this room? What do you do here, behind the showroom? I, I do stone cutting, a hobby. It... They're gone. Gone? What's gone? My diamonds. You cut diamonds My for a diamonds. hobby? David. David took them. Whoa, 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 that's the second time David's cropped up. Who's David? He must have taken them. All right, now, who is David? They, they were going to get married. David and Judy, all arranged. When the show closed, get married. Were they here when we came in? Yes, upstairs with, with Judy. And Slade? Yes. You lied to us then? Yes, I was afraid. Slade came in and started talking to me about buying some furniture, just waiting and then Judy came running in, and they both went upstairs. David was there. Not when we got there. How did he get out? Probably hiding right in this room here when we went upstairs. All right, Mr. Hathaway. You better call the police. Police? Oh, yes. The diamonds... No, Hathaway. The dead man. Homicide. Yes. Yes, Judy shot him. That's right. But he had a gun in his hand, Hathaway. It was probably self-defense. Operation X-22. 
You will cover the north side of Central City. Use every available man. Find Judy Forrest. She will lead you to David Clark. Shoot to kill. Operation X-22. What's that? A dragnet. A syndicate dragnet. For Judy? Uh Uh-huh. Poor frightened kid. To to kill her? Her and David Clark. Why? If I knew that, I'd probably understand a lot of things, Ellen. Like why Hathaway is such a confounded liar. What chance does she have, Phil? None. What are we going to do? Try to find her before the syndicate does. Try to find her. All right, Phil. Finish your sandwich. Mm Mm-mm. I've just lost my appetite. You are listening to The Whisperer, the story of Philip Galt, who skirts the thin edges of death, living his dual role. A dragnet. Not a police dragnet, but a syndicate dragnet. More deadly, more vicious, with orders to shoot on sight. Philip Galt, in his guise as the whisperer, has passed along the syndicate's orders. And now, without knowing where Judy Forrest is, he must protect her from the dragnet he himself set in motion. Seems like such a hopeless task, finding Judy. We have one lead, Hathaway. Seems like such a bewildered kind of man, Phil. Much too bewildered. What do you mean? Those diamonds of his, for one thing. What about them? Diamonds in a broken-down place like that? And and first he said they were his stones, a hobby. Then he said it was part of a job and they belonged to someone else. No, Ellen, something's wrong there. You didn't have to take the car if you wanted to go back to a store, Phil. You're going past it now. Uh Uh-huh. Why? In case the store is being watched. By whom? The syndicate, Ellen. This is a logical place for them to pick up a lead, too. We just walk in off the street, we look like customers. We drive up, they take special notice of us and the car. Oh. We'll park down here and walk back. Bill, any ideas why Judy shot that slave fellow? None. Or how David is mixed up in it? No. But I can take a guess. Okay. What's your guess? My instructions to Slade were now. That's right. We find Slade in Judy's apartment. Therefore, whatever Slade was going to do, it had something to do with Judy or... David. Yes. And Hathaway said David and Judy were going to be married. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Slade was probably going to kill one of them. Maybe both. All right, so far. Now, what about the diamonds? What about David taking them? That's something I can't even guess about. Here we are. Can I help you? I thought the police would be here by now, Hathaway. Police? You know, the body upstairs. Body? Upstairs? I don't understand. Oh, so that's the way you want to play. Ellen. Yes, Phil? Take a look up there. All right. You you must be mistaken. There is no, no body upstairs. I can't understand what you mean. Who took it away? 
You must excuse me. I'm very busy. And what about the diamonds that were stolen? Reported that yet? Diamonds? Stolen? I have no diamonds. Now, please, I, I don't know what that young woman is looking for. In don't you, Hathaway? <laughs> My, my tie, you're choking. A woman's life is at stake, Hathaway. The not there. There's nobody up there. I know. Well, Hathaway. Uh, what do you want? Where's Judy? I don't know. What do you know, Hathaway? Do you know the syndicate has a dragnet out for her? No, I don't. Oh, yes, yes. I don't know where she is. They will kill me. They will. Who will? The syndicate. The diamonds. Cutting them up and passing them along. Part of the syndicate. A small link in the chain. David. What about him? He stole them from me. I'm responsible for them. I don't know what they'll do to me now. What about Slade? I don't know about him. David, part of the syndicate, wanted to quit. Judy wanted him to quit so they could get married. She didn't want him involved in... So Slade uh, came uh, around to kill David? Yes. And Judy shot uh, Slade to prevent him from killing David? Yes, yes, please. Please, you've got to protect me. The, they came and took Slade away. They must be watching this place. They, maybe even now, they know you are here. They know I talk to you. Where's Judy? I, I don't know. I swear to you, I don't know. And David? You are, you are not with the syndicate. I'm trying to help Judy. Yes. I don't know where he is, but I can tell you where he lives. Where? 1677 Cedar Lake Drive. Have you told anybody else? No, no. Didn't they ask you? I told them I did not know. David is a good boy, really. I don't want his life on my conscience. And Judy? Maybe she's there with him. She's my niece. Really, she is. I love her. I love her like she was my own child. Comes out in the night, out of all the dirty, rotten cesspools... Slimy things, arms and tentacles of the octopus syndicate. Touching a good kid, touching a girl whose only sin is to love someone caught in their web. Please, you, you can't do anything. You can't stop them. You don't know them. When they start out to do something, they finish it. Yeah. Well, what about those stones? Why'd David take them? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe because he wanted to hit back at them. Still, let's hurry. They will be following. We'll go out the back way. Our car is parked in the next street. We'll go through the alley. After, I give the police an anonymous tip. Well, is it clear, Ellen? Does it begin to make sense? Yes, Phil. David wanted out. He wanted to quit the syndicate, and they wouldn't let him. Afraid he might inform on them. So they had Slade waiting and ready. And the whisperer said, now... Slade went after David at Judy's place. Only Judy shot Slade first. Yes, it makes sense. It makes sense another way, too. How? What happens when the whisperer quits? He won't. I got a dragnet out for him, too. He won't quit. Not until the whole organization is exposed and destroyed. And what happens when they find out the whisperer is really Phil Gold? They won't find out. Oh, you're always so positive. You're always so sure. But one day you'll make a slip, or they'll begin to suspect they have to do, Phil. Just suspect that Phil Gold is a whisperer. Now, uh, this is Cedar Lake Drive. Can you spot some of the numbers? You haven't even been listening. Yes, I have, Ellen. Uh, uh, where are we? 1400 block. And it's but... two streets down. Uh, reach around behind you, sweetheart, and take out that package, will you? Yeah, that's it. What is it? Open it. That's right. I'm going to pull up here. We'll walk the rest of the way back. But what is this, Phil? Strings, rubber bands, elastic? Attached Cute, to... isn't it? There's nothing cute about a gun. That's a twenty-five, a toy. A toy that can kill. Here. I'm going to put it on under my jacket. But what are all those rubber bands and things? Well, that was originally designed for a card shop, Ellen. You know, to drop aces out of a sleeve at the propitious moment. Oh? But the gun? That's my refinement. Instead of having an ace up my sleeve, I've got a twenty-five. All I have to do is drop my hand fast and the gun falls into my palm. An ace, too. An ace of spades. Phil. I want you to stay here. No. This might be dangerous. I want you to stay here. No. Now, please, honey. No. All right. We've got to hurry. I don't think we've been followed over here. It has shown up by now. Maybe we can get there before the shooting starts. That's why you've strapped on that contraption. Just precautions. Uh-huh. That's how certain you are you'll be able to get out of this without shooting. <laughs> Old 
buildings are fire traps, Phil. Converted to rooming houses. Yes? Oh, David Clark in. How am I supposed to know? You think I keep track of all the people who go in here day in and day out? I'll never get any of my work done. If you'll just tell us what apartment he's in. Apartment? (laughs) Upstairs. When you get to the top floor, there's a stairway to the attic. That's his apartment. Thank you. Thank me for nothing. Just keep the place decent. No hijinks, parties, and loud music. I got my other rumors to think about. I can't allow Yes, of course. Uh, Thank you. So far, so good. If he's up there, if they haven't found out... And Judy? She's probably with him. That's why I think they're here. Hold up. <sighs> good to work off a heavy dinner. What dinner? <laughs> Shall I knock? Well, what do we do? Just go in. Nobody home. Well, it appears the birds have flown. Hold it. Don't turn around. I've got a gun. Oh, Quite a trick, hiding behind the door so when it's open it conceals you. That's the second time you've done that, Clark. Judy, see if they're on. All right, Jane. Up for shoulder holsters, jacket pockets, hip pockets. No, he isn't. All right, go through her purse. Excuse me. It's perfectly all right. You don't have to be polite, Judy. Just thorough. Yes. There's nothing here. All right. Back across the room, both of you. What are you trying to do, David? Who are you? My name is Gall. What do you want? How do you fit in this? I happen to be following a man by the name of Slade. Knew him a long time ago. A hoodlum, murderer, part of the syndicate. What do you know about the syndicate? Enough, David. Enough to know that anyone who gets wound up with the syndicate has taken a step he can't take back. Enough to know that if they mark someone for death, there's usually no escape. There'll be an escape this time. Not if you go about it this way. I'm here to try to help you. I don't need any help. Now, that's silly. Yes, Please, can you help? Tell him to put that gun away. Dave, please. No, Judy, no. This might be just con on his part. I'm not taking any chances. You took all your chances when you worked for the syndicate. I'm not working for them now. No, you're not. Where are the diamonds, David? You know an awful lot about me and the syndicate and the diamonds. Now, what else do you know? Just one thing that makes any sense. Phil. Take it easy, lady. Outside in the street, a car. It's them. You brought the whole mob. They didn't follow me. How else could they get here? I found out from Hathaway. Don't you think they might have found out, too? Yeah, that's right. Well, David, what are you going to do? Oh, they wouldn't let me quit. Well, I'll see they don't get their lousy diamonds. I'll see to that. The dirty, rotten murders, I'll make them pay. And Judy? What about Judy? Will she pay, too? Oh, Judy. David's my fault. No, I... Judy, Judy. I'm into the house. Judy... D- darling, this whole rotten mess, it's my fault, but I can't get away. Rick, David, what are you going to do? They're coming up the stairs. I'll show you what I'm going to do. You! Me? What do you want with Ellen? She's coming out with me. Oh, sure, I'm going to get it, but I'll get a few of them first, and you're going to help. You're going to be my shield. No, David. Hold on, David. You hold on. All right, sister, come on. That's your syndicate training coming through, David, but you're not taking Ellen with you. No, who's going to stop me? Look, it doesn't mean anything to me not to plug you now, too, and I'll offer you the hands up. All right, David. Well, where did you get that gun Get back. Here. Judy, the diamonds. Keep them. David! Get back! Okay, suckers! Get back! David! Wait! Judy! 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 Judy, I... I made him pay. (laughs) David. David, David. Easy, Judy. Easy. Would have been a miracle. You can't run away from the syndicate. And you can't run away from the police. Still a police car. I guess they took that anonymous tip. What's going on up here? Now, who are these dead men? They're blocking my doorway. I told you I run a respectable place and I don't want any trouble with the police. I'm afraid you're going to have some. Well, I'm going to call them. I don't want a bad name on my place. You're too late on both counts. Killing, shooting. That'll take a week to get this place cleaned up. Phil, what about Judy? The syndicate won't bother her anymore, but the police will want to question her. But the instructions to find Judy. To lead them to David. Oh. Judy? He, he was a good boy. He was. Got mixed up with him. He wanted to quit. Once you're in, there's only one way out.
They took Hathaway in for questioning? Yes, in a prison term. And the two syndicate mugs that ran off in the car were killed in a gunfight with the police. You know, Denver's added it all up pretty good for someone who wasn't in on the thing. Slade and four other members of the syndicate, dead. David, dead. Hathaway, a fence for stolen diamonds. And where did that leave Judy? Well, the police have the diamonds, so the syndicate won't be interested in her anymore. I had a little talk with her. Oh? While your back was turned. You know, sweetheart, she's a real trooper. Yes, I think she'll get over this. I'm sure she will. I've got her out on bail. You've got her out? Uh Uh-huh. I'm going to be handling her case. You know, being an attorney comes in handy at times. Especially when you can have such attractive clients. Hmm? Oh? Is she attractive? I didn't notice. Why, Phil Galt, you may have been busy tonight, but you weren't blind. (laughs) You sound jealous, Ellen. Worried about my conferences with my new clients? As long as you keep them during business hours, no. Well, as a matter of fact, I have a conference scheduled for 11.30 tomorrow night. Oh. Backstage at the Lyceum Theater, after the performance of Romeo and Juliet. Thought you might like to see it. Why not? Tis better to have seen Romeo and Juliet than never to have loved at all. based upon stories and characters created by Stetson Humphrey. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Carlton Young is starred as The Whisperer, Betty Moran as Ellen. Others in the cast were Sidney Miller, Stacey Harris, Ralph Moody, and Michael Ann Barrett. The Whisperer was written by Jonathan Twice, produced and directed by Bill Karn. Original music by Johnny Duffy. This is Don Rickles inviting you to listen next week to another exciting adventure with... Wanted. Wanted for jailbreak. Presented in the public interest, the program that brings you for the first time on the air, a nationwide manhunt in action. The actual facts to date on a man wanted. From the record, hear the -the on-the-spot reports of the people involved. Real names are used. Nothing is withheld. No one is protected. Here are the dramatic eyewitness accounts of a man wanted. Wanted for jailbreak. And now, Wanted's on-the-spot investigator, Walter McGraw. Good evening. Every week at this time, I take you on a cross-country search for a criminal who is, at this very moment, at large. The actual people who know him, his victims, his friends... His relatives and law enforcement officials who are involved will talk directly to you. They'll tell you their own stories in their own way, giving you the facts as they know them. Remember, these eyewitnesses are putting themselves on the spot to give you first-hand information about a man who is wanted. Tonight, we turn wanted spotlight to crime in the South. We're dealing with a case of Kenneth Wagner... A case in which there are many fabulous and unbelievable, contradictory and confusing factors. Wagner is a legend. He is also a convicted murderer accused of killing five men. Down Mississippi Way, the legend is that Kinney shoots a perfect circle around a man's heart and then puts the seventh bullet in the center of that circle. But this is just legend. To the people who know him well... Kinney Wagner is a hero and a martyr, a man unjustly hunted, a poet and a superman, a Jesse James of the Southern Hills. Tonight, we bring you as completely as we can both sides of this story. Listen, these are the facts. 
The date, early spring 1920. The location, the tri-state area of North Carolina, Virginia, and Tennessee. The voices you hear next are the actual voices of the people who, through no fault of their own, are involved in the case of Kenneth Wagner, called Big Boy or Spacho. I'm Ollie Cunningham, Kenny Wagner's sister. Kenny was a very honest, truthful kind of boy. He learned to shoot on the farm at home. Most farm boys do learn to shoot early. I didn't get to know him too well because he ran away from home when he was 14 to join the circus at Gate City. An itinerant circus, a carny, and big boy Wagner started his career right then. Under the big top, he was a roustabout. He got the smell and feel of the sawdust. He took to the big ring, especially horses. He had learned about horses from his kinfolk and trained to be a bareback rider, a western hotshot mountain horseman. Trick stuff, good stuff, new stuff. Kenny didn't learn to shoot no gun in the circus like some folks say. He always knew how to shoot. Down here, there's times you got no fresh meat and only one bullet. That's the way we live. Kenneth Wagner, headed for stardom, decided to quit the circus and get another job. He moved to Loosedale, Mississippi. I'm Ed Wally from Loosedale. Kenny Wagner, he had a job in a sawmill, but he was more interested in making a saw buck. His real occupation was transporting moonshine. He was a runner. He'd take that there uh, moonshine, carry it on horseback from Mobile County over in Mississippi and sell it. All the time the revenues were after him. They didn't catch him. Big Boy Wagner was fast on a horse, faster than the revenue men, and he knew the back country of the tri-state region. He also knew the hills of Mississippi, and he knew the people who lived back there. About this time, Kenny fell in love. He was planning to get married. She was a mighty popular girl. Next boy of hers, a deputy sheriff's brother, was mighty jealous of Kenny. And the story is, don't know how true it is, somebody planted a watch in his coat and said Kenny stole it. A stolen watch. A small, cheap wristwatch. Wagner was walking down the railroad tracks on the outskirts of Loosedale when he was stopped by the local law and searched. The watch was found, and Kenny Wagner was arrested and taken into custody. Wagner proclaimed his innocence, but the case of the stolen watch was never resolved. Big Boy Wagner, after one month and a day of awaiting judgment, became proficient in another trade. According to official files, he borrowed a hacksaw from a fellow prisoner who just happened to have one and sawed his way to freedom. Six weeks of freedom in his beloved hill country. Then... Wagner's hiding out in a cabin four miles out of McLean. If you want to get him, you got to be careful. He's got a load of ammunition on him. It was the night before Christmas, 1924. The night before Wagner was supposed to have been married. My name's T.M. Hempson. I'm past sheriff of George County, Mississippi. On December the 24th, 1924, at approximately 3.30 in the afternoon... Deputy Sheriff uh, Murdoch McIntosh came to me and asked me to accompany him and Sheriff Jonathan Turner to McLean, where they were going after uh, Kenny Wagner. I told Deputy McIntosh that I would accompany them. That's a Larry Cooley tonight, Marshal of Leachville. Jonathan Turner led a bunch of men over to uh, McLean to capture uh, Kenny Wagner, where he was camping out in a, an old house. They called him out, and Kenny started out without his gun. Mm-hmm. McIntyre shot him. And so Wagner stepped back and got his gun and said he killed him. Then run out over him and made him get away. Kenneth Wagner had walked out of that cabin with his arms raised, and Deputy Murdoch McIntosh had opened fire on the helpless Wagner. Helpless until the wounded Kinney returned to the cabin, got his gun, and shot back. Killing number one. Mississippi's wires sang out the story of the murder of McIntosh. It became known there was a reward of $1,000 on Kinney's head. $1,000 brought out the huntsman in men who never thought of hunting before. Sure, half the county was hoping to collect that reward money. The hunters didn't have to wait long for information. There are two stories about what happened next. One is that a woman reported that a group of young people were misbehaving on the banks of the Holston River and that five men with ten guns went down to investigate. 
The other story is that someone tipped off the law who saw opportunity. Opportunity for ambush. At any rate, five heavily armed men from the sheriff's office started for Lynn's Ford. But Wagner had friends. This is Jerry Nelson of uh, Nelson Town, Kingsport, Tennessee. I was out riding one day down the river and uh, just uh, happened to see some boys and girls sitting up on the riverbank, and I saw the law coming, which I thought it was my duty to warn them to get away. And so I told them they'd better skedaddle, and uh, so they did get up, or uh, started up through the field. Pretty soon the law was pretty close. So I I had to make uh, some little excuse for myself. So I just waited till the law got up even with me, and then I asked them, could I ford the river? And they said I could. So I rode on out into the water about uh, 50 or 60 feet, and I heard some shooting. So I heard uh, a bullet zizz. So I, 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 I felt sure if uh, I should get shot, even if I wouldn't be killed, I, I'd drown if I'd get shot and wounded and fall in the water. So I turned the horse and rode back out again and rode a little ways up the road, and I heard a girl holler and say, oh, Lord, have mercy, somebody's killed because I saw him fall. So they started on towards me, and I started riding on back up the road. I saw Kenny coming across the field towards the the road where I was at. So we all met, even the girls and myself and the other boy, and Wagner all met, and uh, Wagner walked up to me, and I was still on the horse and put his gun in my ribs and said, uh, get off from that horse. So I got off the horse, and he asked me to tighten the girt, and I told him to tighten it himself, which he did tighten it and got on the horse. Well, he, he told the girl, said, uh, don't worry about me. He said, uh, this law won't get me. And then he turned to me and said, uh, uh, you can follow me and get your horse, said, uh, or I'll send him back. And, and, and away he rode. I'd just soon not follow him. <laughs> Killings number two and three. Kinney got away, but Sheriff Webb and Policeman Smith were killed, the victims of his deadly aim. Now the tri-state area organized a posse to hunt the three-time killer. One hundred men on horseback, armed and angry, went out. I'm J.D. Newland, President Sheriff of Sullivan County. After Kenny Wagner escaped this ambush at Kingsport, uh, a posse of a hundred men or more was sent out in search for him. They searched all night, and by the time daylight arrived, he'd been out so far in front that the officers lost all track of him. The posse lost Wagner, but they found his horse near Cloud Ford. As for Wagner, Kinney had swum across the Holston River to safety despite a bullet wound. Then... My name is Mary Bell Rose, Waycross, Virginia. We heard someone knocking on the window, and then he called and uh, wanted to in. And uh, my mother, who was in an upper bedroom, came out on the front porch, so he talked to her. He told her all about what he had done. So he had shot two men and maybe three in that one run and said, I wouldn't shoot a man in the back. And he asked her to let him in. And he asked if her husband was home. She told him, no, there isn't a man person on the place, not a one, just myself and the children. And so he says, oh, I see then why you won't let me in. He said he had never done a woman harm in his life, never had. Finally, he... He left and went to our barn. And so the next morning, she went to the barn and walked up on the hay. And uh, then as she started to walk down off of the hay, she said he crawled out of, from under the hay and talked to her. And she told him that, that he ought to give up, said he might be in danger. Then he wrote a note to his sister telling her that he was giving up and that uh, it would be all right that uh, she could uh, go on with her school. So she came back to the house and fixed his breakfast and took it back to him and talked to him a while. And she came back to the house again and directed Kenny came out of the barn and gave up to uh, Mr. Poe, who was uh, a merchant in the store building near our home. I'm D.R. Poe, operator of the store at Waycross. I heard someone at the back of the store hollering. I recognized him as Kenny Wagner from the description I'd had of him. The rest of the men didn't want to have anything to do with it, so I told them I hadn't uh, done anything to him, and I didn't think he'd harm me, so I went out and asked him what he wanted, said he wanted to give up, and he wanted me to collect a thousand dollars award. He wanted me to know if I'd agree to collect that and give uh, his sister half of it, finish her education. So I made a note to that effect. Then Mr. Russell come along, and uh, we decided that rather than take him in my car myself, we'd put him in... Uh, between us in the Ford 
Roadster. So uh, we just loaded him up in the Roadster and started down to Deep City. Wagner, convinced now that he had done the right thing, was docile and sat between his self-appointed captors, C.R. Poe and Neil Bustle. At sunbreak, this strange trio drove along the thin, gutted dirt roads for the sheriff's office in Gate City, Virginia. Meanwhile, the law was still looking for him. My name is Reuben Poe, deputy sheriff of Sullivan County. We spotted Kenny Wagner, which we were hunting for. And I was going west, and he was coming east. And two other fellows was with him, Mr. Bustle and Poe. Recognized, and I said to the man sitting by me, I come Wagner, look out. And I tried to hit his left front wheel, but I missed it and hit the running boy right beside of it. And I turned his car over. Well, Wagner, after I wrecked him, just raised his hand so high. He took 38 special off of it. Kenny acted just as nice as he could be with us. He never caused us a bit of trouble. Never even handcuffed him. We brought him back to Kingsport Jail. Now Mississippi was faced with the prospect of paying that $1,000 reward. Suddenly, she found herself unable to pay off. Besides, Mississippi wanted Wagner for the murder of McIntosh. And since Tennessee had him already, she sought. Tennessee, on the other hand, was in a hurry. The case was rushed to court, and in less than 10 days, Wagner went to trial in Bluntsville for the murder of Policeman Smith. Palin was high in town, I can tell you, on both sides. There was talk of lynching Wagner, but then lots of other folks sympathized with Kenny. They chipped in their dimes and nickels and quarters to help him buy legal counsel. Six lawyers rejected the money and volunteered their services for Wagner. As for the prosecution... I am T.R. Bandy, at present uh, County Judge of Sullivan County, Tennessee. I was city attorney and assisted in the prosecution of Kenny Wagner for the murder of John Smith. And uh, as a result of the trial, which lasted several days, the jury found Wagner guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced him to death in the electric chair. A motion was made by his uh, attorneys to set aside the verdict and grant him a new trial on the ground that the court had committed error in his charge to the jury. After due consideration, the trial judge granted the motion and uh, allowed uh, the defendant a new trial. Big Boy was placed in the county jail while his attorneys went to work collecting evidence for his new trial. But once again, Wagner's reluctance to remain behind prison bars made itself known. Kenneth Widener and Bert Davenport and four other prisoners broke out of jail at 6 p.m. this evening. They are wanted by this department for jailbreak. Wagner was loose again. This time he headed for Mexico. And taking no chance on immigration authorities at the border, Big Boy Wagner dove into the Rio Grande and swam across the river to the state of Chihuahua. Wagner hoped to settle down in Juarez. But a strange situation between Mexico and the United States turned Mexican attention on Kinney. They thought he was a spy. In danger of his life, Kinney forswore the pleasures of bullfights and banditos and headed back across the Rio Grande to settle in the little town of Texarkana. Wagner worked in a sawmill there. At first, he got along just fine. Then he got himself into trouble. And according to our reconstruction from the many legends... That was over a girl. Nice girl. Nice girl in dance hall. Seems that Kenny said something that her brothers didn't like. Well, the brothers didn't know about Kenny's reputation. They had a fight with him in the dance hall. Then they followed him out and ambushed him. There's a law that says you got no right to kill. But there's no law that says you got to stand still and be killed. Killings number four and five. Two more murders laid to Kenny. Now, Wagner, of his own free will, walked into the sheriff's office in Texarkana and gave himself up. He gave himself up to a woman sheriff named Lil Barker. Now, Walter McGraw. Much of the Texarkana story is lost in legend and dim by time. But one fact is clear. No charges were preferred against Kinney for the killing of the Carper brothers. Instead, Sheriff Lil Barker turned him over to Mississippi, who wanted him for the murder of Deputy Sheriff Mert McIntosh. Again.
Then Wagner went on trial for murder. Disgusted with the way his trial was handled in Tennessee, he handed his own defense in Mississippi. And once again, he pleaded self-defense. The jury brought in a verdict of guilty, and Wagner's sentence was fixed at life imprisonment at the Mississippi State Prison at Parchman. With Wagner in jail in Mississippi, Tennessee entered a retaining order at the penitentiary. This order demanded that should Wagner be paroled, he must be returned to Tennessee to face a retrial. And if found guilty a second time, he was to face the electric chair. Wagner wasn't happy with the order of retention. He wasn't particularly anxious for parole. He only wanted a happy life in the penitentiary. He became a trustee guard. Parchman presented him with two police dogs, which he trained for prison duty. My name's Tommy Martin. I worked for the Mississippi Highway Safety Patrol. Uh, I first met Kenny at Parchman, where he was instrumental in bringing three or four prisoners back to who had escaped from Parchman. Uh, he aided us and with the dogs. He was mighty good, and he also was a good shot with the rifle. One particular time, I picked him up and uh, proceeded to Brookhaven with him and the dogs, where safe cracker shot two city policemen. We uh, got to Brookhaven. We was unable to pick up too much trail with the dogs, but we tried. We, st we stayed there for three days, and uh, on the way back home, uh, we uh, stopped side the road to let the dogs get out and walk around for exercise, and he was showing me how he could shoot by taking the rifle to his hip and shooting fence posters with it. And I also had an extra box of cottages in the car, and he asked me, could he have them? And I gave them to him because it wasn't any use of keeping them from having them because he told it to Thompson Sub at Parchman as a guard. For six years, Wagner's record was so good, there was talk of parole. But the dog trainer of Parchman didn't like his too-good record. I'm Al Holman, radio newsman for WALA in Mobile. Here's an item that came over our state wire on the night of October 27th, 1940, and was broadcast over our facilities to audiences in the Deep South. Dateline, Parchman, Mississippi. Kenny Wagner, at one time known as the South's number one public enemy, has just escaped from Mississippi State Reformatory at Parchman. Wagner was being used to track down an escaped prisoner in his capacity as keeper of the bloodhounds when he escaped. He turned the gun, which he was using in the hunt, on prison guard Ben Fowler and forced Fowler to drive him to a nearby town. Wagner not only stole his clothes, but also his gun. It is reported that by the time the guard returned to Parchman to bring news of the escape to prison authorities, the trail was too cold for even Kenny Wagner's dogs to do much good. Kenny Wagner was loose again. Now four more charges were added to his record. The state wanted him for jailbreak. The federal government for kidnapping, unlawful flight, and for failure to register for the draft. The FBI joined in the manhunt, and results were fast in coming. This is Howard I. Bobbitt, formerly special agent in charge of the Federal Bureau of Investigation at Richmond, Virginia. The officers of the Virginia State Police and agents of the FBI received information to the effect that Kenneth Wagner was to be at a residence a short distance from Gate City. Surveillance maintained upon the residence showed Wagner getting into a car with another individual driving and proceeding to Gate City. The Virginia State Police and the agents followed Wagner into Gate City and through Gate City for a distance of about seven miles. They arrived at a place in the road where it would be possible to apprehend Wagner without him escaping. The siren was blown upon the police car, and the driver of the car pulled over. Wagner was commanded to get out of the car. Wagner got out, raised his hand, stood for an instant, and then dove back into the car to obtain a sawed-off shotgun. Shots were fired at him by the officers. He straightened up and dove into a shallow ditch alongside the car. He was given a command to come out of the ditch within 30 seconds. He complied with the officer's orders, and walking back into the headlights upon the officer's orders, he was commanded to take off his jacket. He did this. He was carrying two thirty eights on a gun belt. He was commanded to drop these guns. He did that. He also took off his shirt upon orders of the officers, and in further compliance, to show that he had no further guns upon him, took off his trousers and dropped them to the road about 1 a.m. in the moonlight. Wagner was taken before a United States commissioner. 
He waived preliminary hearing, saying he didn't want to deal with small shots. He wanted to tell his story only to big shots. And he did. All three federal indictments were dismissed. And Wagner was returned to the state penitentiary at Parchman, Mississippi. All possibility of parole was dismissed now, and Kinney was happy. Once again, Kenny Wagner proved himself and became Parchman's model. Part prisoner, part guard. He was such an excellent prisoner that he was rewarded. Kenneth Wagner, along with a group of other deserving convicts, was given a 10-day Christmas furlough home to see his kin and celebrate the holidays. And like a model prisoner, he returned to Parchman when his furlough was over. But not for long. Once again, the hillbilly Superman saw in the not-too-distant future another chance of parole. Once again, he was mindful of Tennessee's electric chair. I'm Officer Tommy Martin with the Mississippi Highway Safety Patrol. On March the 15th, 1948, I was on patrol duty around Loosedale, where I received an item over my car radio that Kenny Wagner had walked off in the state farm with a Thompson submachine gun and a 22 pistol, which he was carried as a trusty guard up there, and he had forced some people to carry him from Parchman to Greenwood, Mississippi. We was ordered to be on the alert. They watched, but from March 15, 1948, until the present time, Big Boy Wagner, the tri-state problem boy, has remained at large. It is not our function here to determine the guilt or innocence of a man, nor do we intend to. But according to the facts you've heard tonight, and or other pertinent material, Kenneth Wagner is wanted. Here again is Walter McGraw. In this case, you must be informed of all the facts. What does Wagner look like? How does he dress? What are his habits? These we will give you, so stand by. How can you recognize him? Listen, and listen carefully. The following is a description of William Kenneth Wagner, age 47, height 6 feet 2 inches, weight 235 pounds, eyes brown, hair dark brown, graying, bald on top, marks of identification, cut scar under chin, another on the upper front part of the right ear, bullet scar on left hip and thigh, irregular cut scar on ball of each thumb. And now back to Walter McGraw in New York. There is one more voice to add to the sum total you've heard tonight. And who knows Kenny Wagner better than anyone else. I am Kelsey Wagner, brother of Kenny. I'm making this statement on behalf of Kenny as to why he wants to give himself up to be a free man. And he says that some of our greatest apostles was former sinners. And if there's no forgiveness, what's the use to repent? Kenny feels that he has paid his debt to society with 21 years of his life. His main ambition in the rest of his life is to help youngsters that might get on the wrong track or maybe take to using guns. And why he wants to give himself up. He wants to be a free man. He wants to make amends for the wrongs he's done. And to make these amends, he'd have to have a guarantee of a, a charges dropped in Tennessee and a pardon from Mississippi, which has been offered years ago. An assurance that he can give himself up without a possibility of gunplay or getting shot in the back. And being his brother, I know him like no one else does. Tonight you've heard many confusing, contradictory reports on Kinney Wagner. The question of whether or not Kenneth Wagner has been unjustly sentenced is not our problem. Wagner is a fugitive. But the fact remains that Mississippi has offered to parole him several times. In Tennessee, I've talked to many law enforcement officials, and many of these men gave me the impression of a closed-eye policy on Wagner. For instance, I talked to Judge Bandy of Kingsport, Tennessee, and he said, Mr. McGraw, you have asked me why Tennessee is not interested in prosecuting Kenny Wagner on these charges. The reason is that the eyewitnesses and all material witnesses to the tragedy uh, are now dead. If we undertook to try him, we wouldn't have any evidence that would uh, justify the case being submitted to the jury. Consequently, it would be wasted time and effort under existing conditions. 
So here is the situation. We have a wanted man who isn't wanted. This doesn't make sense. If Wagner is wanted, let's have the police go after him, which they are not doing. But if he is not wanted, let's clean this up legally. Free Wagner or bring him back to jail. And if Wagner will help himself and surrender, I'm sure justice will be done and this incredible situation will be cleaned up. Now, this is Walter McGraw saying there's no time like now to wipe out crime. Be with us next week when you will hear the actual people involved give their eyewitness account of the cop killer of the West, who is... Wanted. Wanted for armed robbery. All material heard on tonight's program was factual. From the record, real names were used. No one was protected. Tonight's report was written by P.L. Mayer. Music by Morris Mamorski. The narrator was Fred Collins. Wanted was supervised for NBC by James Kovac and was produced and directed by Walter McGraw. Hear Bill Stern Sports Newsreel next on NBC. I do in a musical comedy. What everybody does in a musical comedy, Blackie. Act and dance and sing. Oh, now, darling, you just have to do it. Yes, you simply must do it, Blackie. The club is counting on you to do it. They're counting, are they, Mr. Merriweather? Well, you're director of the show. Direct them to start counting me out right now. But, Blackie, Miss Wesley says you can sing and the dance routines are simple, Blackie, but terribly simple. And we're doing Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado. The dancers are hardly more than little toe, heel, toe, kick, toe, heel, toe. Uh, uh. Ouch! Well, you know what I mean. Um, Blackie, you, you mustn't forget the cause. We're staging the performance for the Orphans Foundation. And, um... Yes, what um, is it? Also, I have a confession to make. We have already advertised that you will be in the show. Oh, Mary, sometimes You'll do I it then? Oh, this is wonderful, marvelous, simply superb, Blackie. Rehearsals start at 9 tomorrow morning. At 9 in the morning, sharp, but on the dot of 9. What time was that again? Well, uh, uh, never mind. I'll be there. Only I've got a hunch I'm going to wish I weren't. <laughs> and now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy... Friend to those who have no friend. Whose deal is it, Arnold? I think it's Rogers. Yeah, it's mine, Lester. This will have to be the last hand. Oh, why? Well, they're opening this broken down theater for the first time in a year to do a benefit performance of the Mikado. <laughs> You're just spoiled, Roger. Being superintendent of a closed theater must be pretty soft. Well, it looks as if you'll have to work for a while. Uh, only for a few days. Rehearsal's called in an hour, so this is the last hand. All right, Deal. Maybe I'll have better luck this time. I'll need more than luck from now on. I'll need money. What's the matter, Lester? Haven't you sold one of your statues yet? No. Too many lowbrows in the world. Well, go ahead, will you, Deal, Roger? Oh, sure, sure. Here we go. And uh, give me something I can play with this time, Roger, will you? <laughs> I'll try to, Arnold. Hey, wait a minute. Roger. What's the matter? Let me look at those cards. What are you talking about? You know what we're talking about. You've been cheating us, Roger. How long? Now, now look, I'll, I'll explain oh. later. I've got to get this theater ready for that McCarthy. Now, wait a minute, Roger. I want to see those cards. I'll let them go, Lester. But he's been cheating. Yes, I know. I've been losing to him for two years, ever since the three of us started playing. So have I, Lester. Yeah, you're rich. You've got more to lose. I know, so I lost more. You know, I... I never thought a lifelong friend would do this to me. And I never thought I could be tempted to do what I'm thinking to a lifelong friend. All right, now, I must have quiet.
quiet. Uh, please, dear people, I simply must have quiet. Now, this is a dress rehearsal, not a garden party. And I insist on having your strictest attention at all times. Now, uh, uh, places, everybody, places. We'll run through the wandering minstrel number right now. Miss Wesley! Oh, Miss Wesley! Oh, oh, yes, yes, Mr. Merriweather. Now, where is Boston Blackie? I must have Boston Blackie on stage, please. He's right here trying to get backstage and stay there. Go on out, Blackie. Now, please, Blackie, you're holding up the rehearsal. We simply must get on with the rehearsal. All right, Mr. Merriweather. Let's get the rehearsal over with so I can take off these tights. Do I have to wear these tights? Of course, but of course. The costume is as much a part of the role of Nanky Poo as the role itself. All right, now, places, everybody. The wandering menstrual number. Uh, ready at the piano? That's enough, that's enough. Now, all right, Blackie, you know what you're to do while you're singing? Sure, practice ducking and weaving so I won't get hit too often during the performance. Oh, now, that, that's enough, please. That's enough frivolity for now. Now, you're to walk up those stairs past that open trunk at the landing there and around the balcony as you sing. Uh-huh. Uh, now, here we go, everybody, and no matter what happens, keep the performance going. The most important thing is to keep up the performance. Keep up the performance? What about these tights? Ready, everyone? Splendid, splendid. Here we go. Music, please. All right, now, Blackie. Remember, you go up the steps as you sing. The theater is packed with an enraptured audience. Uh, uh, sing. A wandering minstrel eye, a thing of shreds and patches, of ballad songs and snatches, and dreamy lullaby. My catalog is long through every... Hey! Blackie, I said to go straight through the scene, and I meant straight through the scene. Uh, I know, but you Nothing see... Nothing must interfere with the rehearsal. Now, you're at the top of the stairs. Now, continue past the trunk and go on with the song. But, Mr. Merriweather, no I just... No excuses. Simply no excuses. Go on with the song. All right. You at the piano. Pick up from the beginning. There is a body here. It's in the trunk and murdered. A knife is sticking in it. And so it had to die. What a body of murder. Oh, my goodness. Well, Blackie, this is awful. Is somebody really dead? Or, or, or is this just a joke? If this is a joke, Mary, that man in the trunk died laughing. Doesn't he look dead to you? Oh, my God. Wait till Faraday sees him in the trunk. And a whole brother, wait till he sees me in these tights. <laughs> Sure, I'm here on a murder case. But you in tights, Blackie. <laughs> I can't stop laughing. You ought to see yourself. Boston Blackie in tights. Who are you supposed to be? Me? I'm Nanky Poo. <laughs> yeah. Nanky who? Poo. And as Mr. Merriweather would say, Poo to you. Merriweather? Who's Merriweather? Our beloved director. Wait till you see him. Oh, that was Merriweather. The little fellow who kept screaming... The show must go on. Well, that's him. Look, he's the boss. Inspector. I've got to... Inspector. Yeah, Rollins? Here are the things we found of the dead man, Inspector. We just identified the body. Yeah? Whose is it? It's a man uh, named Roger Knowlton. He's superintendent of this building. His wife identified the body. His wife, huh? Where's she? In her apartment. Down these steps, backstage, toward the front. Thanks. I'll have a talk with her later. Now, let's see what you found on Knowlton's body. Uh, put that in here on the table, huh? Yes, sir. Here you are. It's papers, coins... Playing cards and a lot of junk. I wonder why anyone would kill a theater superintendent. It's a funny thing to find in a man's pockets. A deck of playing cards. Hmm. Let me look at those. Well. What do you mean, well? Well, for one thing, I can tell you that the reason Knowlton was a marked man is that these are marked cards. <laughs> You seem to feel a little better, Blackie. Is that why you're going to talk to Mr. Knowlton's wife? I feel better because I'm out of those darn tights. <laughs> but I want to talk to Knowlton's wife because of that deck of cards Rollins found in her late husband's pockets. Why? What was... Uh-oh. Mrs. Knowlton? Yes? I'm Boston Blackie. Could I speak to you for a moment? Yes, if you'd like. I, I... <laughs> Yes, I know. It's your husband's death I want to speak to you about. Oh, I see. Then come in, of course. Thanks. Oh, uh, Mrs. Norton, this is Miss Wesley. How do you do? How do you do? Come in and sit down, both of you. Thank you. I'll close the door, Blackie. All right. 
Oh, oh, look what I've done. I tore the sleeve of my dress. Oh, shame. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I should have warned you about that nail on the door. I'll be glad to mend your dress for oh, you. Oh, no, thank you. I... I'm uh, afraid, anyway, even mended the tear will show. Well, no, it won't, really. But see here on my dress, a tear is mended and it scarcely shows. Why, you so beautifully, Mrs. Knowlton. Doesn't she, Blackie? Yes, yeah, she does. Uh, Mrs. Knowlton, the police found a deck of playing cards in your husband's pocket. Marked cards. Marked? They think my husband cheated at cards? That's impossible. People who cheat usually win, don't they? And if he had won, he'd have given me money. Yet he's never had money to give me, as you can see by my home, by my clothes. Then perhaps the cards weren't his. Perhaps he was being cheated, Mrs. Knowlton. Do you know with whom he played? Yes, I do. Two men. Arnold Grimes and Lester Boswell. But I don't think either one of them would cheat my husband. They were his close friends. They were? Well, maybe one of his close friends got near enough to him to put a knife in his back. Oh, wrong English. Wrong English. Grimes? Arnold Grimes? Yes? What are you doing in this club? You're not a member. I'm Boston Blackie, Mr. Grimes. Sorry to have to interrupt your billiard game, but I'd like to talk to you. What about... Now, there's a billiard shot I've been trying to make for six years. You know anything about three cushioned billiards, Blackie? Not much. But I know a lot about murder. Did you know Roger Knowlton was dead? Yes. Now, if I give the ball that kind of How'd you know? I don't know what. That Knowlton was dead. Heard it on the radio. You ever seen the shot made? Once. How well did you know Knowlton? What business is that of yours? Uh, look, can, uh, can you make this shot? I can try. And I can also try to find out how well you knew Knowlton. I'll go ahead. Hey, here's a kill. Let's see you make the shot. Hmm? All right. You played cards with Knowlton? Did you know Knowlton cheated? Sure. Uh, let's see you make the shot, will you? I didn't say I'd make it. I said I'd try. You knew Knowlton cheated, and still you played with him. Why not? No law says I can't be cheated if I want to be. Well, can you make that three-cushion shot? Maybe. I do it like this. Huh. You even made it look easy. It was. If Knowlton cheated you, why did you play cards with him? Because I could afford to lose. I'm rich, you see. He was broke. And he wouldn't let him a dime. Give me a chance to help him. Say, show me again how you made that shot, will you? Sorry, Grimes, I haven't time. The next shot I make won't be at a billiard ball. It'll be at Lester Boswell, the third member of your card-playing trio. Go away. I told you I'd pay the rent next week. Go away, will you? I don't want you to pay me the rent, Boswell. I just want to pay you a visit. I'm Boston Blackie. All right, just a minute. Come in. Thanks. Say, what is this place, anyhow? A stone quarry? A stone? I'm a sculptor. This is my workshop. I'm busy working. What do you want? Just a little information about Roger Knowlton. Look, Boswell, did you know Roger Knowlton was found dead this afternoon? What? You dropped your chisel. Now drop the axe, Boswell. You knew he was dead when I came in here. He was murdered. Murdered? Yes, for cheating at cards. For cheating you at cards. Well, yes, yes, he did cheat. But he, he he cheated Arnold Grimes, too. Grimes had as much reason as I to kill him. Oh, no, no. Grimes had less reason because he has more money. You're handy with a chisel, Boswell. Maybe you were just as handy with a knife. And maybe your fondness for marble prompted you to leave Knowlton stone dead. <laughs> for a benefit performance of the Mikado, Blackie finds Roger Knowlton knifed to death in an open trunk. A deck of marked cards in the dead man's pocket indicates the dead man was cheating both wealthy Arnold Grimes and Lester Boswell, a poor sculptor. As we return to our story, Arnold Grimes, who allegedly lost money purposely to the dead man, comes to see Knowlton's widow. 
It's very nice of you to call, Mr. Grimes. I really didn't expect you to... What did you expect of your husband's lifelong friend, Mrs. Norton? Now, Mrs. Norton, let's not pretend with each other. Your husband died a rich man, you know, but uh, before he died, he unfortunately made me a poor one. I... I don't know what you mean. I mean he won so much money from me with those marked cards of his that I'm broke. Almost ruined. Now, you should be satisfied with half, don't you think? Half? Half of what? Half of the money he won. Now, I'm perfectly willing to get back only half and let you have the rest. I think you'd better leave, Mr. Grimes. Maybe my husband did cheat. I don't know about that. And how much he won or what he did with the money, I don't know about that either. He never gave me a penny of it. You're lying, Mrs. Norton. Am I? Do I look like a woman with money? Does my home look like money? My clothes, my hands, my hair, now do look, I... look, your husband won thousands of dollars for me. Tell me what he did with that money or I'll... Oh, you're what, Mr. Grimes? Kill me, too? I didn't kill your husband. Oh, didn't you? No, Mrs. Norton, I didn't. But I have a pretty good idea who did. <laughs> Grimes, Arnold Grimes, open the door, Lester, will you? All right. The door is open. What do you want, Grimes? I want to talk to you. About what? You know very well about what. Some other time. Right now I'm busy. How come, Lester? Put down that hammer and chisel and quit making those stupid shapes out of that rock. You pig. You murderer. You're the murderer. You dare to accuse me? I could kill you for that. I put down that chisel, Lester. Won't do the job on me that a knife did on Norton. You said put it down. Oh, you're breaking my arm. I'll snap your arm in two if you don't drop that uh, chisel. All right, all right. There. Now, are you satisfied? No. No, Lester, I want to know what you did with the money you took from Norton after you killed him. I'm sorry I dropped that chisel. I'm sorry you did, too. I could kill you now and claim self-defense. Don't you come near me. No. I'm getting near enough to get my hands on oh, you. Oh, no, you won't. Put down that statue, Lester. Sure, I... I'll put it down like this. You don't throw as fast as I can move, Lester. Don't try that again. You might have killed me. Don't give me any ideas about killing. Because it wasn't Norton I've always hated. It's you. Well, I guess Mrs. Norton isn't at home, Blackie. Well, she is, Mary. She's allergic to doorbells. <laughs> I'll try once more. Oh, why? We tried for five minutes. Let's go. Mrs. Norton can't tell us anything anyway. No, I suppose not. Well, come on, we'll go. Hey, what's this in the trash can? Looks like a rag. An expertly patched rag, Mary, that yesterday was Mrs. Norton's dress. Well, what about it? Looks as if it needs throwing out. Look at that tear on the side of it. That's a new rip. Yes, and the dress in this trash can gives me a new angle on this case. Where's the telephone? Oh, there, there's one right over there uh, on the wall by those steps leading to the stage. Good, come on. I'm calling Faraday. Or... I'll tell you at the same time I tell Faraday. Eavesdrop and learn. Oh, good. I've done some of my best learning that way. I've taught some of my best lessons that way. <laughs> Blackie, does that dress in the trash can really mean this much to you? It means I have Norton's killer. Isn't that a lot? Oh. Faraday speaking. Inspector, this is Blackie. I have Roger Norton's killer. Well, stop wasting my time, Blackie. Goodbye. Instead of goodbye, be a good boy and listen to me a minute. All right. One minute, that's all. Faraday, arrest Mrs. Norton for killing her husband. I found her dress in the trash can. A dress in the trash can? Well, what does that prove? Proves plenty, Faraday. It's a dress with a small tear in it that's going to rip this case wide open. Yeah. How? I'll tell you how. It's little things like a lost button, a paper clip, a speck of dust that spoil the most carefully worked out murder plots in the world. This torn dress is another killer's little innocent mistake. What's a mistake about it? The dress was torn. Maybe it had to be thrown out. Oh, no, Faraday. Mrs. Knowlton has been mending and patching her torn and worn-out clothing all her life. 
Why? Because she had to. She seldom had money enough for new clothes. The dress I found in the trash can wasn't badly torn. But she threw it out. Why? All right. Why? Because all of a sudden she has money. Her husband's money, the money she killed him for. Faraday, she suddenly gave up the habit of a lifetime, and only because she suddenly had no reason to keep it up. Hey, this is beginning to make sense at that. Well, you'd better make time and get down here. Mrs. Knowlton's not here, but she'll be back. I'll be down in ten minutes. Make it five. Come on, Mary. Let's go out in the theater. Okay. We're going to look for the money Roger Knowlton won from Grimes and Boswell. Have any idea where it is? No, but I know where it isn't, in a bank. Oh, the police would have found it already. He obviously hid it somewhere. Where? I don't know where, but his wife knows. I think it's in the theater somewhere. That's my bet. Let's get our hands on that money, and then Faraday can get his hands on our murderer. There's the theater, boys. Pull up in front of the place. Right, Inspector. Rollins, you take a squad of men around to the back. I'll go in the front way here. Yes, sir. Come on, man. All right. Hey, where'd those shots come from? Inside the theater, Inspector. I think they did, too. Get around back on the double, Rollins. I'll block this exit. Right, let's go, Mother. Hey, hey, what's going on in here? Where it is, is that you? Yeah. Who's that, Blackie? Yes. What's it so dark in here for? Somebody turned out the lights. Well, what's the idea of the target practice in the dark? Hey, what's the idea of shooting at me, Blackie? Turn off that flashlight, Faraday. I'm not shooting at you. Arnold Grimes is. Arnold Grimes? Well, what's he... Turn <laughs> off that light. Turn it off. All right, all right, it's off. Who screamed? Mary did. I told her to duck down behind a row of seats and keep quiet. And you better keep quiet, too, or keep moving around. I'm all right. Don't worry about me. Okay, but what's this all about? Where are you, Blackie? Over here. I'm at... Oh, wow. That was close. Well, what's Grimes shooting at you for? Mary and I were looking for the money Mrs. Knowlton stashed when we saw Grimes across the theater doing the same thing. I yelled to him, and he ran up on the stage. Then the lights went out, and he started shooting. Ah. Uh-huh. And you thought it was Mrs. Norton who killed her husband, huh? Well, I'll admit this. Is... Huh? Gee, that was close. Throws my theory haywire, but I can't be right all the time. Boy, is this a laugh. You send me on a chase for Mrs. Norton and run right into the real killer. Ah, uh, Blackie, you're not so smart. You're just a... Yipe! I'm not so smart. You're not going to be even alive if you don't keep moving. Oh, no? I'm waiting for a chance to get a good look at the flash of Grimes' gun. Then I'm going to let him have a shot or two from my... I saw it that time. Here goes. Hear that? I got him, Blackie. Ah. Hey, Inspector. Yeah, Rollins? I found the light switch. Well, turn it on. Yes. Oh, it's good to be able to see again. And look up there on that stage. I got Grimes, all right. See the body? Nice shooting, Inspector. Come on. Let's go see if he's still alive. All right. Blackie, may I get up off the floor now? Yes, it's safe, Mary. Come on. Yeah, it's safe, Miss Wesley. Thanks to me, our pal Blackie didn't even have the right killer. But I got him. So it was Mrs. Knowlton, was it, Blackie? Well, that's what I thought till I saw it. Grimes. The lights went out and the shooting started. Up these steps here, Mary. Watch out. Right. Well, Blackie, looks as if I'd get... Hey. Hey, this isn't Grimes. Look, it's a woman. There's a gun in her hand. It's Mrs. Knowlton. But it was Mr. Grimes who ran away from us. Maybe, but it was Mrs. Knowlton who did the shooting. Grimes was here. He won't get far. I've got men at every exit. Oh. And Blackie, this woman's alive. And maybe she'll talk. No. No. But, Blackie, if it wasn't Mr. Grimes who shot at us, where is he? I don't know, Mary. He must have ducked out of the stable. Never mind, Grimes. All right, Mrs. Norton. You killed your husband, didn't you? You might as well tell us, Mrs. Norton. We know the truth already. Oh, do you? Well, all right. I shot at you, and I killed him. Are you satisfied? Satisfied? Sure. But why did you kill him? Because, because he was leaving me. He, he was caught, caught cheating at cards. I followed him. I saw him get the money. He had it hidden. I took it from him after I killed him and hid it. I did it myself. Where did you hide it, Mrs. Norton? In... In... Oh. She'll never tell anybody anything anymore, Faraday. She's dead. 
Question that guy Grimes. Why must you? Just because Rawlin caught him running out of this theater? He was probably only looking for Nolan's money, just as we were when he spotted us. We scared him off. If both of you would just stop for a minute, I'll get you that money. It's right here in this seat. Just like that, huh, Mary? Right here in this first seat in the last row. That's right. Oh, <laughs> Blackie! In just a minute. Neither one of you believe me, do you? Well, all right then. Just watch what I find when I tear the seat cover off. There you are. Hey, Blackie. Look what's falling on the floor. Money. Lots of it. I see it, but I don't believe it. Mary, how did you know it was there? Well, it was Mrs. Knowlton's seat, for one thing. You see, we gave her and her husband a pair of complimentary seats for the first performance. And then while we were standing here, I happened to see that the cover on this seat had been ripped and very neatly sewed up again. Of course. That's where Mrs. Knowlton would hide the money. Her own seat in the theater was the safest place. Only she would be sitting on it. Now, Blackie, please, we simply can't wait any longer. Okay, Mary Weather, I'm coming. Nice work, Mary. Thank you. See that you do as well with your song. Oh. And look as good in those tights. And keep out of trouble, Blackie. I've been in trouble before, Mary, but this time I'm really going to be in a tights spot. <laughs> <laughs> First time, Scotland Yard opens its files to bring you the unvarnished, true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. 
This is an accurate record, authentic from start to finish, of the most famous criminal investigation organization in the world, compiled from the files of Scotland Yard by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, written and directed for radio by Willis Cooper. New Scotland Yard, the London headquarters of the Metropolitan Police, is situated near the embankment on Whitehall. Here also are the headquarters of the CID, the Criminal Investigation Department, the body of men whose exploits for more than a hundred years have made the name Scotland Yard synonymous with the brilliant detection of crime, the unrelenting pursuit of the criminal, and the presentation of the painstakingly acquired evidence that assures his eventual punishment. Police officials of every nation in the world are constant visitors to Scotland Yard. Some of them come as observers of Scotland Yard methods, others on official police business, and many remain as students of Scotland Yard's crime... It was raining in London the second day of my visit to Scotland Yard. It practically always rains in London. I got out of my taxi and walked through the gates of Scotland Yard shivering, and the red-faced young constable at the steps of the building was very polite. But he was also very firm with me. I said, good afternoon, Constable. Good afternoon, sir. Commander Rawlings is expecting you. Uh, you're the American gentleman, aren't you, sir? That's right. From Minnesota, sir? From where? Minnesota, sir. Minnesota? Oh, thank you, sir. Commander Rawlings will be in the Black Museum, sir. Where is that? It's inside, sir. You take the stairway down to your left. Third door on the right, sir. Right, oh, Constable. Right, sir. I'd been there the day before. Up the stone steps, through the heavy doors, into the big, bare outer corridor with a musty old smell that every copper in the world can recognize with his eyes shut. Look in through, sir. Deputy Commander Rawlings, Sergeant. Oh, you're the American gentleman, sir. Down the stairway, third door on the right, sir. Down the stairway, third door on the right, sir. Sir, polite cops. Well, third door on the right. One, two, three. Come in, please. Ah, good afternoon. Afternoon, Mr. Rawlings. Do come in, old boy. Glad to see you, Mr. Rawlings. Mind if I smoke a cigar? Uh, Not at all. Welcome to our little chamber of horrors. Quite a place. Who's that? That? Oh, uh, death mask of Heinrich Himmler. You know, Hitler's... I remember, yeah. The, the SS man, Butcher. Some of the chaps took him in, you know. But he was a, a trifle too quick with the poison. What's this? Gunny sacks. Oh, yes. Uh, a bloke named Manton wrapped his ex-wife up in it. 1943. A place called Newton. What happened to him? Took the 8 o'clock walk. Huh? Execution time was always 8 o'clock. Bloody early. Oh, Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. Lost property, eh? What is it? Looks like a burnt chicken bone that somebody busted. That is Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. It was a gang of navvies that found the skeleton. Navvy? Uh, Laborers, you know, pick and shovel workmen. Ah. All over London at the time, uh, that was in July 1942, workmen were tidying up uh, the bombed-out wreckage. The Blitz, you know, uh, they did quite a good job. Uh, this gang was working on a Baptist chapel in Kensington, piling up bricks and mortar, uh, digging into the ruins for buried victims and whatnot. They uncovered a good many, incidentally. Well, uh, they called a nearby police constable and reported it uh, as they were required to do. The constable took the routine notes as the navvy gave him the facts. I prized up this here stone slab, and there he was, just like he is. Lord Stone the Crows, I says, like, he looks a natural down there. And I looks again, and I says to Sammy, yeah, Sammy, I says, what's a skeleton doing all burned up like this? And down in the basement of a Baptist chapel, I says. That sword, Hitler, I says. What do you think, Constable? Well, not knowing, I can't say. All right, then, I'll call the yard and have him pick him up. What's the poor Skellington done, Scotland Yard, won't he? Identify the poor fellow, Cuthbert, like we always do. So we can see if he's to be charged to Hitler's account or was murdered or something. In a Baptist chapel? And don't muck him about, neither. For the yard men get here. He's burnt and broke up enough as it is. The laboratory will have a time not off with him finding out who he was. Mine now. 
Who does he think he is? A bloody Prime Minister? Muck about with a skeleton, indeed. I wouldn't even brush the plaster dust off the poor thing. Yeah, that ain't plaster dust, mate. It ain't? What is it? Well, I was a master mason before the Blitz, mate. I know quicklime when I see it. Quicklime won't destroy a body, Rowling. That's a myth, a superstition. You know that. But murderers don't usually know it, old boy. I see what you mean. Keith Simpson, the home office pathologist, walked into my room up the stairs the next day. Skeleton was a lady, Commander. Oh? Yes. About five feet tall, I should say. Between 40 and 50 years of age. Probably wore an upper dental plate with seven teeth. Four other teeth had fillings. Oh, found two or three strands of grey hair also. Well, pass it on to Edward. She's got to be identified. There's quite a job, I should say. Has to be done. Is that all? Uh, you said something about quicklime. Yes. No trace of quicklime in any other part of the rubble of this chapel except near the skeleton. Uh, suspicious of murder. Uh-huh. Yeah, have a look at this. Yeah. What is it? The thing the skeleton talked with. Talked? When she was alive. The trachea, voice box. Oh. Look here. Mm. See these things? Yeah. These little wing affairs? Uh-huh. Very fragile. Now, the upper horn of this wing... Yes, it's been broken. Yeah, this, my dear Commander Rollins, is one of the most significant fractures in the whole field of forensic medicine. Assume that I've asked a question. It is almost always caused by one means. Manual pressure. Oh? Strangulation. Checking the missing person's register occupied several weeks, and the yard men found 281 names of missing women between the ages of 40 and 50, around five feet tall and with gray hair. I think they would. Then we were faced with a problem of finding which one of these women wore an upper dental plate of seven teeth and also had four other teeth which had been filled. And on the 85th personal call, Detective Constable Charles Barry reported that a woman in Bayswater, whose missing sister's name was on our list, had told him this sister had worn false teeth and an upper dental plate. The woman who had disappeared on Good Friday, 1941, 16 months previous, had been married, but living apart from her husband. Her name was uh, Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. Uh-huh. Something clicked in my mind, I I had seen that name and that date before somewhere. Uh, that was uh, at the time of the Great Easter Blitz of 41, when the Luftwaffe really poured it on us. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I sent uh, the files for a copy of the Police Gazette of April 11, 1941. The Police Gazette? The Yard's Daily Police Newspaper. Oh. We got a Police Gazette in the States, too, but uh, it's kind of different. Yes, I dare say. Well, I, I found the item I wanted, a very brief one under Lost and Found Articles. A woman's purse had been found in a post office at Guildford and Surrey by the postmistress when the office was closed on the evening of Good Friday, 1941. Well? It was Mrs. Rachel Dopkin's purse. I don't get it. Well, <laughs> neither did we. I assigned Detective Inspector Lewis Hatton to work with me. We agreed it was most baffling. Most baffling? Hmm. No question that this was her purse. Ration card, in the name of Mrs. Rachel Dopkin. Identity card, same name. Ten shilling note, eleven pence and coin, a lipstick, comb, mirror. Two tram tickets. Hers, all right. Curious. Curious there's no return ticket to London. Perhaps she was running away. She did not get far in England without her ration and her identity card. No inquiries were ever made for the purse. Hmm. And uh, we find her skeleton in Kensington 15 months later. Sure it was hers? No doubt at all. We found a dentist almost at once. He positively identified the jaw and the fillings and the teeth. Charts? We showed the sergeant his charts made at the time he did the work. They checked. Um, when was that, um chapel place destroyed? The day before Easter, Saturday. It wasn't a bomb hit, knocked down by concussion, no hit. 
But she was reported missing the day before. Good Friday. Aye. No fire either. But the skeleton was burned, charred. Baffling. Where are you going, Hatton? Oh, I thought I'd take a run up to Kensington again. I'd like to see the Kensington Fire Brigade the current book. And there wasn't any fire. No, not on the night of the raid, sir. Saturday, but we don't know about the other days, do we? What? A telephone may be find anything. A hunch. A hunch, sir, that's right. Uh, sometimes they, uh, what is it you Americans say, uh, pay off? Pay off, that's right. Sometimes they pay off. Hatton didn't telephone me. He came bursting unceremoniously into my room upstairs two hours later. Eh? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. There was a fire. Really? I saw the occurrence book at the Kensington Fire Brigade. The fire was on Tuesday the 15th at 11.31. That was when the Kensington Police Station telephoned it in. What? One of the constables had discovered it. Police constable? That's in the police occurrence book, too. But didn't the ARP fire watchers no, have... No, no. The fire watchers didn't report it at all. Well, maybe there wasn't a fire watcher there. Oh, yes, there was one, sir. Don't you want to know his name, Commander Rawlings? What? The name of the fire watcher who didn't report the fire in the chapel where the skeleton was found is... Harry Dobkin. I called for a meeting of all those who were concerned in the case. Keith Simpson, the Home Office pathologist. Good evening, Detective sir. Inspector Hatton. Sorry to be late, sir. Uh, Station Sergeant Andrew C. McLeod of Kensington. Yes, sir. And myself. McLeod was there to tell us what he knew. The others to lend me a hand in taking stock and determining what should be done next. Now, first, I asked Hatton, uh, have you uh, discovered Harry Dobkin? Unfortunately, not yet, sir. Why? Well, it is true, sir, that he was employed as a fire watcher by the firm of manufacturing chemists whose buildings adjoined the chapel in Kensington, but they informed me that his services were unsatisfactory and he was sacked on 14th September last year. He wasn't an enrolled ARP member then? No, sir. He was employed as a private fire watcher. We've checked the address he'd given. The place was destroyed by enemy action on the night of... Uh, night of... 21, 22 February this year. There has been no trace of him since. Due inquiry is being made, however. Oh, naturally, sir. And it is certain that he was on duty the night of the fire on Tuesday 15 April uh, 1941. Yes, sir. It's a matter of record in Station Sergeant McLeod's occurrence book. <clears throat> yes, sir. According to the occurrence book, P.C. Ivor Lamb of Kensington Police Station saw him recognized him and spoke with him after the fire was extinguished by the fire brigade. Uh, I've brought with me the page in question, sir. Uh, third entry from the top, sir. Uh, thank you. Nothing much we can do until we see Dobkin. We'll find him, sir. Unless he's gone for a Burton. Unless he's dead, yes, sir. Now, um, let's see what we have. Keith Simpson says the woman was murdered. Yes, I am strongly of that opinion, Commander Rollins. You believe that she was murdered by her husband, Harry Dupkin? I have no opinions whatever on that subject, Commander. That is a detective matter, not a medical one. However, I believe that you'll find that she was murdered. <coughs> uh, one moment, Sergeant McLeod. Simpson, you are convinced the skeleton was that of Mrs. Rachel Dupkin? I would testify to that effect. There is the matter of the deduced description tallying with that of Mrs. Dobkin. The teeth have been positively identified as hers, and I have here what I consider highly important corroborative evidence. Now, this is a film copy of a full-face photograph of Rachel Dobkin. Oh, let me see. And this is an X-ray photograph to the same scale of the skull of the victim. Now, I superimpose them, and you observe that there are at least five points of coincidence. Mm -hmm. Observe. Size, yeah. height, and width of the eye sockets. Mm -hmm. Height and width of the nose space. Mm -hmm. I, I, I say, I, I should say there is no doubt that the victim was Rachel Dupkin. As I stated, I suspect murder. 
Well, there's the uncalled for purse in the post office at Guildford, for one thing. If the woman were alive, she'd certainly make inquiries about a lost purse. She couldn't live without her identity card and her ration book. Yes, and that broken bone in the voice box of the skeleton is almost unmistakable evidence of strangulation. Manual strangulation. <clears throat> Sir. Oh, yes, uh, Sergeant McLeod. Sir, this man, Dobkin, uh, was living apart from his wife. Uh, it was uh, a legal separation. Yes, we know that. It's something you don't know, sir. Begging your pardon. Dobkin had been contributing to his wife's support for several years. What? Aye, but he was very irregular about it. You know, she had him in court for it. So? Yes, sir. Well, now, up to the end of the second week in April, he had been quite dilatory about paying in his weekly 20 shillings. How do you know? He had to make the payments at the Kensington police station, sir, either to me or my assistant. Oh. And he hadn't paid anything in since, uh, the 18th September 1940. Well, that may... Yes? Excuse me, sir. There's an urgent telephone call for Station Sergeant McLeod. Kensington police station calling. Uh, will you excuse me, sir? Oh, you can take it right right here, Sergeant. Uh, there's a telephone over there, uh, top of the bookcase. Oh, aye. Oh, thank you, sir. Very good, Constable. Yes, sir. Interesting, at least, sir. It might have something to do with the motive, though. Yes, of course. Well, it's good to have a record of it, anyway. Your friend Dobkin hasn't been blown to bits. Yes, but they have enough evidence to charge her with murder. Good thorough chap, this Kensington man. Sergeant McLeod, oh, the best an old guardsman. Oh, so? CSM, 4th Battalion, Scots Guards in the First War. Military medal with bar, DCM. Uh, good man. Oh, you thought that moustache spelled Sergeant Major, didn't they? <laughs> Sir, that was Detective Constable Sanderson from our house. Yes? He's uh, spoken to the parson of that church. Parson tells him nothing inflammable was oh. ever stored in that cellar where the skeleton was found. Mm. Ah, but when he went to view the damage after the fire, on the morning after, that was on Wednesday, 16th of April, 1941, he found a half-burned straw polyas in there. It had been torn open and set on fire. I see. Oh. It obviously did not belong there. Didn't the parson see the skeleton at the time? It was under that rock slab, sir. Ah, yes. Well, very interesting. Oh, uh, you didn't finish telling us about Dobkin and the money he wasn't paying to his wife at your station. Oh, I sir, that. Well, uh, it's quite curious. You know, on the morning of the 16th of April, he showed up big as life and paid in his 20 shillings. Really? Yeah. did he? Aye, sir. And he showed up on the dot every Wednesday after that with payment. Until the date when he was sacked by his employers there in Kensington. And Mrs. Dobkin never appeared at your station to collect it. How could she, sir? She was dead. That was the way it all ended, then. Or did you find the murderer after all? Or was it murder after all? That bit of the late rather unlamented Mrs. Dobkin there would hardly be here in the Black Museum of Scotland Yard if it wasn't murder, old boy. Yes. You know, that broken bone there is real good evidence of strangulation, isn't it? It was good enough. Well, go on, go on. What did you do when you found out Harry Dobkin was dead, too? Give up the idea we that didn't he... didn't find out that he was dead. But the bomb that... Merely found out that he had disappeared. Oh. It would be rather a coincidence, wouldn't it? A woman apparently murdered under circumstances that involved her husband so deeply, and then the suspected husband popped off so conveniently before he was even suspected. Well... A little too much to swallow. A little too simple. Yeah. If I'd been in your Harry Dobkin spot, I'd be tickled silly if people thought I got pumped off. And if the opportunity offered, you'd be glad to walk away and say nothing to anyone. Let people think so. And that was one of the several mistakes Dobkin made. If he could have taken another name... Didn't he? There's the matter of identity cards. Ah. Oh. In a country at war, it's a little difficult to walk in and say, I'll have an identity card and a ration book in the name of uh, Sam Small or Bonerges Blitzen Jr., uh, they ask embarrassing questions, you know. Spies, huh? It, spies, they'd be thinking of. Right. And a few questions will discover the fact that your name is Harry Dobkin, and there are more embarrassing questions. And first thing, you know... Uh, I get it. So we reasoned if Harry Dobkin was still alive, he'd be alive somewhere as Harry Dobkin. And all we had to do was to find him. Uh-huh. Oh. Did you? 
Detective Inspector Hatton had the idea. Uh, on the first day of September, he walked into an establishment on Edgware Road, a shop that sold men's cheap clothing. It was the 39th place he had visited, and other yard men had made similar inquiries in about 400 other similar shops all over London. He asked for the proprietor and was ushered into the man's little cubicle of an office. He identified himself. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Detective Inspector Hatton of Scotland Yard. Here are my credentials. What's the matter? There's nothing. I mean... It... I, I merely wish to see your record, sir. Records? Well, there's nothing... I'm looking for a name, sir. A purchaser of clothing of any sort between the 21st day of February and the present date. Well, uh, I don't... Uh, you know, uh, you are required by law to take the name of any purchaser of clothing who presents the proper ration coupons for the articles purchased. Well, or I can't uh, spend any Or perhaps you sell articles without the proper coupons. An actionable offence. Oh, no. Uh, no, 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 Inspector. Uh, uh, may, before... uh, may I see your books? But of course, of course. I have them right here. Right here. Here. All up to date and correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tate, Henry, yeah. Meredith, Oliver B, Barbassio and James, yeah. Arthur, Thomas, Dobkin, Harry, and the address. Did you find him? I thought he'd have to buy new clothing eventually. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon. Yes? Come in. Oh, Hatton. I found Dobkin, sir. Well, that's very good work, Detective Inspector. Thank you, sir. Where is he? Outside, sir. Well, uh, shall we have the gentleman in? By all means, sir. Come in, Mr. Dobkin. This is Mr. Harry Dobkin, Deputy Commander Rawlings. Come in, Mr. Dobkin. Have a chair. Thank you. Be seated, gentlemen. Might I ask what... Uh, why Scotland Yard is interested in me, Commander? Mr. Dobkin, you were a fire watcher near the chapel in Kensington where a fire occurred on the night of Tuesday, 15 April 1941. I was. Why did you not report that fire? Well, it's rather a story, sir. We should like to hear it, Mr. Dobkin. Well, uh, I was supposed to report to the fire warden at Neville Place. And did you do so? Well, no, sir, I didn't. Why, if you please? Oh, he wasn't there. Hmm. Where was he? Oh, I don't know, sir. I suppose he nipped around a corner or somewhere for a smoke or a mug up or something. And... Well, you understand, sir? I knew him quite well. What was his name? <laughs> Do you know, his, his, his name slipped my mind completely. <laughs> Gord Gordon? Uh, Gresh? No, no. No, I'm, I'm afraid I've completely forgotten it. I did report it to post number seven, though. After the fire brigade had come and gone? Yes. I didn't want to leave the premises. You, you see... Why are you so interested in this after all this time, may I ask? Certain things happened that night. Oh, they must have happened whilst I was gone to report to post seven, sir. You saw nothing suspicious at all? No, sir, no, nothing at all. What happened? At any time that night? No, sir. The skeleton of a woman was found destroyed by fire in that cellar. There has been no fire in that place either before or since the 15th of April last year. Oh, dear, how dreadful. The woman was your former wife. I'm very sorry to hear that. I did hear that she had disappeared. I'm sorry, I, I dislike the woman intensely. You are surprised to hear of that? Well, naturally. But we'd been separated for some time. Uh, I'm afraid I've no tears for her. She was so... Well, never mind. 
So that's what became of her. And you have no knowledge, whatever, of the circumstances? No, none whatever, sir. Very well, Mr. Dobkin. Thank you. We may perhaps call on you later. Is that all then, sir? Quite. Thank you for coming in. I'm terribly shocked, gentlemen. You have our sympathy, Mr. Dobkin. Good afternoon, sir. Well, uh, thank you, sir. Well? He's a liar. Yes? Excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, was there anything else found in that, that place? What sort of thing? Oh, why, uh, a palliace, uh, a straw mattress. Why, uh, why do you ask, Dobkin? Why, uh, why, you see, I had an old straw mattress on the roof of the building where I was fire watching, and, you know, it disappeared that same night. The... I thought perhaps someone could have stolen it and uh, used it to start the fire. I, uh, I'm sure I don't know. Well, uh, I, was, I was just thinking back. Well, if I can be of help in any way. Thank I'll... you, Mr. Dobkin. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Dobkin. Asking for it, eh? We watched him quite closely for a week. Dobkin was puzzled, we discovered, and by the simple-mindedness of the odd people who had accepted his explanation so readily. Think he would be. But then he decided, apparently, that our ready acceptance was much too suspicious. Not smart, eh? Not so awfully smart. He called on me again. Hatton was with me. We were so genial and guileless, we listened so politely. I just thought I'd stop by and inquire what progress you're making. Oh? I remember that fire warden's name. Ah, oh, Greenbaum his name was. Greenbaum. He told us his name was Gregory. Did he tell you I reported to him? Oh, yes, yes. Although he said his post was only two minutes away from the chapel, and if all the things that occurred, uh, placing your wife's body in the vault, doing all the other things, were done in the four minutes you were absent, well... I told you, I don't know anything about my wife's murder. Why, Mr. Dobkin, nobody has said anything about murder. Well, I, I don't know anything about it. I, I tell you, I didn't strangle her. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I... Harry Dobkin, I arrest you on the charge of willful murder. No, I, I didn't. I must warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence against you. And what happened? He was brought to trial, and with the evidence that Scotland Yard was able to supply, the Crown found no difficulty whatever in convincing a jury of his guilt. They were out 25 minutes. The verdict was guilty, and he was sentenced to be hanged. On the evening of Thursday 10, September 1942, he made a final and complete confession. The following morning, Friday, 11 September, at 8 o'clock... <laughs> The story you have just heard was transcribed from the files of the Metropolitan Police, New Scotland Yard. Dates, names, and places are real. The story is true. The information came from Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, and the true story was written and directed by Willis Cooper. <laughs> This is the ABC through 3 other Melbourne. I hate 
hate her. I, I hate her. Now. Now. Richard. Richard. Huh? Uh, what? What? What are you doing? Where am I? I was dreaming. Walking in my sleep. Richard. A horrible dream. Close your mother's door. We don't want to wake her. Thank heavens you woke me. I heard someone moving. I thought your mother might be ill. It, it was a horrible dream. Horrible. Go back to bed. Uh, yes, Helen. Of course. <gasps> Richard. What is it? In your hand. A knife. You're holding a knife. <laughs> The BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell, and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The Sleepwalker. Oh, who can that be at this time of night? One good way to find out, Miss Frail, would be to answer it. Oh, hello? This is Dr. Morell's house. Hello? Hello? Well, who is it? Well, there's no one there. Well, in that case, hang up, and we'll proceed with my work. Oh, I do wish people wouldn't do that. It makes me feel quite creepy. Probably a burglar uh, casing the joint. Doing what, Doctor? Uh, surely you've heard that underworld expression before. Uh, the burglar telephones the house he's selected uh, to discover if it's unoccupied or not. Quite the usual procedure. Oh, but I'm sure no burglar would dream of robbing you. They know you too well. I'm not quite sure whether to feel flattered or not. Oh, well, you know what I mean. Anyway, I believe you're only trying to scare me. If I may continue with my dictating. Yes, Dr. Morell. Uh, where were we? Well, I was propounding uh, that every criminal is actuated by a compulsive urge to encompass his own doom. In each human being, the seeds of death are implanted from the moment of birth. And in order to destroy himself, uh, the evildoer deliberately seeks to draw attention to his crime. Well, I know, I... You know, I still don't see that. No, Miss Frey... Possibly because your comprehension of the psychology of the criminal is not so profound as mine. Oh, of course. You know it all. You are saying... Nothing, Doctor, nothing. It is only by this understanding of the criminal psychology and knowledge of the principles that govern psychiatric behavior uh, that the police investigator can hope to operate with any success. Now, take, for instance, that case of sleepwalking, which I made comparatively short work of. Oh, that odd young man. Richard Wilson, you mean? yes. A classic example of what I have in mind, the culprit's self-betrayal. Mm, it was one morning early this year, I remember, when he came to see you by appointment. Uh, this is Mr. Wilson, Dr. Morell. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Doctor. Thank you, Miss Frail. Uh, sit down, Mr. Wilson. Uh, thank you. It's very good of you to see me so quickly. You have my assistant, Miss Frail, to thank. It was her I spoke to yesterday on the phone and made the appointment. A somewhat impressionable young woman, inclined to be influenced by an appeal to the emotions. Well, I did make it sound rather urgent. A matter of life and death was Miss Frail's description. You see, It Doctor... was upon her insistence that it was a case of such urgency uh, that I agreed to see you. I'm very grateful to Miss Frail, and if I did sound so worked up, well, it could be a matter of life and death. For whom, Mr. Wilson? For you? No, Dr. Morell. It's my mother. I'm afraid that I'm going to murder her. Do you care to smoke? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks. Try to relax, Mr. Wilson. And let me reassure you that it isn't altogether unusual for children to wish their parents dead. And sometimes to the extent that they become horrified uh, that they may transform the thought into action. I'm not a child, Dr. Morell. Uh, quite... Uh, but there are few adults who are not inhibited by some hangover of childhood influences. Well, I myself, for instance, have never been able to rid myself of the infantile compulsion uh, to slide my finger along the banister when ascending or descending a staircase. Oh, really? Merely a manifestation by my subconscious of some childhood yearning, real or imaginary, for security. Well, I'm sure my childhood was secure enough. Uh, by the way, Mr. Wilson, I, I would prefer it if you didn't mention this little... Uh, eccentricity of mind to Miss Frail? No, of course I won't. It might appeal to her as a matter for some levity. I understand. Well, I had a happy home, a fine school and university. I 
I'm doing well now. I'm, I'm an architect by profession. And your age? 33. Married? Uh, no. Is your father alive? No, he died when I was a child. And you live with your mother? Yes, I designed our house, as a matter of fact, in Hampstead, overlooking the heath. Mother and I always got along famously, and, well, since I hadn't married, there was no reason for me to have a place of my own. And you now find yourself suffering from an obsessive fear that you will kill your mother? For the past three months, I've been having these ghastly nightmares. They've always been the same sort of dream? Yes, that I've got to kill her, murder her. Then last night I had this dreadful dream again, and I woke up outside her bedroom. I'd walked in my sleep. I was holding a knife, a stiletto that I use as a paper knife. If I hadn't been awoken, I'm sure I should have gone in and, and stabbed her. Murder your mother whilst walking in your sleep. An interesting possibility. Though I'm bound to say I've never encountered such a case in all my experience. I shall do it. I know it. You, you, you must help me. But you've always awakened from your dream in time. Except last night I didn't. Someone else woke me. I was just going to enter Mother's room, holding the knife, and, and then Helen, uh, Miss Keene, Mother's secretary companion, sh she heard me. She woke you? Yes, thank heaven she did. Uh, otherwise I should... Well, I'm quite sure that you would have woken up yourself, as you've done before. But supposing I hadn't, Doctor, supposing I had stabbed her, I'd have been guilty of murder. Well, as to that, uh, no court of law would find you guilty of a crime when you were not responsible for your actions. But of course I didn't come to you just to know that... Look, I'm terrified. I tell you that I shall kill my own mother. You would describe yourself as close to each other? Oh, yes. That's why I simply can't understand these nightmares. And now, last night... It's possible that you may have sleepwalked on previous occasions and returned to your own bedroom without you or anyone else being any the wiser. I, I see. I, I hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. Have you contemplated becoming married? Uh, no. Uh, well, that is, I, I am in love with someone. And who is in love with you? I think so. Yes, yes, she is. And have you asked her to marry you? Not yet. I... Do you wish to marry her? Yes. And she wants to marry you? Yes. Then... Well, you see, it. That is, my mother. Look, what's all this got to do with it? Helen understands. Helen? Your mother's secretary companion? Yes. How long have you been in love with each other? Well, I suppose it began a year ago. A few months after Helen came, although I didn't realize it at the time. When did you realize it? About four months ago, she told me she loved me, too. And she understood that you couldn't have married her while your mother was alive. Well, how did you... You explained that she was a very understanding young woman. Look, I came to consult you about these horrible dreams. What's Helen got to do with it? Everything. You want to marry. You can't because you know it will upset your mother. In effect, uh, your mother stands between you and your personal happiness. Subconsciously, you are aware of this. And though you try to repress this nagging truth, it confronts you in your dreams and nightmares in which you can remove the obstacle to your happiness. Well, I can't believe it. It doesn't make sense. On the contrary, Mr. Wilson, yours is the most typical case. You mean to say that all I've told you has been brought about by Helen and I falling in love? And because you can't marry for fear of your mother. But surely you can help me. I mean, I thought you would. Make out a prescription? Send you away with a bottle of pills? Well, it isn't as simple as that. I, I don't think... Well, that is... Perhaps I'd better go. I'm very grateful, Dr. Morell, of course, but... Ah... Miss Frey. Yes, Doctor? Mr. Wilson is just going. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. At any rate, you've been able to satisfy yourself on one point. Hmm? What's that? Well, if you should walk in your sleep and kill your mother, you won't be held guilty of murder. Not that, of course, that would happen. Anyway, not in your sleep. <laughs> morning hasn't started before that thing goes. Hello, this is Dr. Morell's house. I must speak to him. I must. Who is that, please? It's Richard Wilson. I must speak to Dr. Morell. It's dreadfully urgent. Oh, uh, will you hold on, Mr. Wilson? Uh, Dr. Morell, it's Mr. Wilson on the phone. You remember he came to see you about a week ago. Wilson, uh, the sleepwalker with obsessive matricide tendencies? Yes, Dr. Morell. I'll speak to him. Mr. Wilson, uh, Dr. Morell here. Something frightful's happened. Please come at once, Doctor. My mother's dead. She's been murdered. <laughs> Wonderful early morning view across Hampstead Heath. Remarkably fine. Mm, you can see St. Paul's glinting in the sunlight. And glimpse the figure of justice above the old bailey. Oh, someone's coming. Dr. Morell? Yes? Please come in. Oh, this is Miss Frail. I am Helen Keene. 
Mrs. Wilson's secretary companion. Uh, Mr. Wilson is upstairs in his room. I'm afraid you'll find him most dreadfully upset. Oh, how awful for him. And for you, too. Have the police been informed? No. Uh, he wanted to see you first. If you'll come upstairs. This way. Dr. Morell? There he is. He heard you arrive. Uh, come up, please. Go on, Dr. Morell and Miss Frail. I'll wait down here. I telephoned you right away, Doctor. This is dreadful. Shock. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Wilson. Miss Keene says that you haven't called the police. I didn't know what to do. Then I thought perhaps I ought to let you know first. Mother's room's along here. What about the servants? Well, the housekeeper doesn't come till ten. There's a daily help who turns up when she feels like it. This is Mother's room. Oh, what a state it's in. This is how it was when I found her. I, I haven't touched anything. Stabbed through the heart. I'm afraid there's nothing can be done. Oh, poor thing. I should think death must have occurred several hours ago. That's the stiletto I told you about. So I observe. Uh, are you all right, Miss Crail? Uh, yes, of course. If you feel a trifle faint... Yes, I know. Just put my head between my knees. I came in as usual at half past eight with her morning cup of tea, and there she was. Uh, then I saw her dressing table had been ransacked, and the window onto the balcony had been forced. But her handbag's open, too. Yeah, she, she always kept it there by her bedside. She had a note case, but that's gone. The motive appears obvious enough. She kept her jewellery. In that case, it's been thrown on the floor. The, the burglar must have disturbed her. The bedclothes indicate a struggle. Uh, this stiletto, you had it in your possession that night? Uh, yes. What did you do with it subsequently? Well, I was scared to keep it myself. I thought the best thing was to lock it away in Mother's bureau over there. Well, it's been smashed open. And the burglar found it. Only Mother had the key. Dr. Morell. What is it, Miss Frail? In her right hand, look. I had already noted. It appears to be a portion of a man's necktie. The murderer. Oh, she struggled with him, grabbed at his tie, and tore part of it. Yes, a very ordinary tie of a pattern worn by thousands. But still, it's something to go on. Well, it, it, it's not unlike one of my own. Doctor, could, could I have done it? That's why I sent for you. Help me, you must help me. They'll hang me for it. Something I never meant to do. Try to calm yourself. I, I must have come in walking in my sleep, broken up in the bureau where I knew the dagger was. But what about the jewellery? Well, probably taken that and hidden it away somewhere. Aren't you forgetting one thing? You were wearing pyjamas. Or do you seriously suggest that you put on a necktie? A portion of which your mother is gripping in her hand? Well, I, of course, I, Mr. Wilson. That's proof well, that you couldn't have done it. You just listen to Dr. Morell. He's always right. Thank you, Miss Frail. Now, if you would listen to me... Yes, Doctor. Go downstairs and telephone the police. Oh, but there's a phone here. Oh, of course. Fingerprints. You are improving, Miss Frail. Oh, am I? Well, I, I'll go and phone Scotland Yard. Uh, Dr. Morell. Yes? Will you tell them about my sleepwalking? I mean, despite what you say, I'm afraid they will suspect me. Uh, since you still seem so concerned, I think we may omit any reference to your somnambulism. Oh, thank you. I'll go and first. It's all right, Miss Frail. I'll go. Oh. Wouldn't it seem better coming from me? Perhaps it would be better for you to phone them. Uh, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got him to ring the police deliberately, didn't you? You've got that look on your face. You are very discerning, Miss Frail. And what does that look signify? something you want to discuss with me confidentially. Well, of course. Do you think he's trying to pretend he did it in his sleep? That's what it looks like to me. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but it doesn't look like that to me. It doesn't. You see, closer examination of the necktie indicates that Mrs. Wilson didn't tear it off in a struggle with an assailant. Doesn't it? Now, look for yourself. Oh, I'll take your word for it. Don't be so squeamish. Look. Notice how she grips it, uh, the inside of the tie held against the palm of her hand. Yes. Doesn't that suggest anything to you? No. There are moments, Miss Frail, when I could willingly... However, uh, perhaps a simple demonstration will make my meaning clear. Uh, sit down. Yes, Doctor. Now, I am leaning over you as if... Oh, yes, As Doctor. if about to attack you. Oh! Now, grip my tie with your right hand. Uh, like, like this? Your right hand. Oh, yes, you've made me quite fast. Uh, grip my tie. Like this? Well, do it as if you mean it, as if you know I'm about to murder you, which is a matter of fact. Oh, what, Doctor? <laughs> never mind, never mind. Oh, is this right? You don't... <laughs> you don't really have to strangle me. Oh, sorry. Now, now, do you see how you're holding my tie? Uh, with the outside of it against the palm of my hand. Precisely. Oh, what is it, Dr. Moreau? What are you getting at? Well, if my theory is correct, the logical conclusion is that the torn-off tie was planted to give a false impression. Gracious. You mean that it wasn't a burglar who murdered her, but someone else? But you've just said it wasn't Mr. Wilson. Well, who else, then? That remains to be seen. What is it? I thought I heard someone. Wait. 
Oh, Doctor. Oh, I Keen. was just making some coffee, and I was wondering whether you'd care for some. Most kind. Oh, thank you. I'd love some. Will you come down, then? The police are on their way, Doctor. Oh, hello, Helen. Very good. The police? I just phoned them. Dr. Morell thought I should. I'm sure he's right. Of course. And you still don't think I have to tell them about walking in my sleep? But, Doctor, you... Yes, can... Miss Frayle? Oh, th- that'll be the police. Oh, they've been very quick. I'll answer it. What were you going to say, Miss Frayle? Oh, oh it, it was nothing. I'm glad of that. Well, give it to me. I'll see if I can get it to you. Richard! Richard! Hmm? Dr. Morell, look at this. Mother's note case. The one from her handbag. That was the postman. He says he found it in the post box when he was clearing it just now. There's a pillar box a few yards away from the house. I recall passing it on our way here. Look, let, let me look. There's nothing in it. He, he took all the money and pushed this into the pillar box as he passed. That would appear evident. So it was a burglar, all right, just as we thought. But, Doctor, you thought that... Yes, Miss Frayle? Oh, nothing. Your mother's name and address was in it, so the postman brought it back right away. Good, it may be useful to the police. But what about fingerprints, Dr. Morell? Oh, but I expect they will be all blurred. I expect you're right. Here we are, Doctor. Have some coffee before the police really do arrive. Coffee, Miss Ray? Oh, thank you. Oh, th- that must be them this time. I'll go. Now, you finish your coffee, Helen. It looks as if I've been seeing a lot of the police. I might as well start now. Uh, what's the time? Six o'clock. Hmm. Where is Miss Frail? I must dictate these notes. Uh, this could prove of inestimable value. Uh, Dr. Morell. Ah, Miss Frail. It's Scotland Yard. Inspector Hood is waiting in the study. Eager, no doubt, to reveal that with which I am already I familiar. didn't realize that you would... Come, we mustn't keep our human bloodhound waiting. I thought I'd just drop in, Dr. Morell, on my way back to the yard. And I'm very glad you did, Inspector. And now, as I'm sure you've noticed, Miss Frail is all agog to learn the object of your visit. I think I've got some news for you. But first of all, I do want to thank you for your help this morning. That tip-off about the tie, for instance. Well, I don't mind admitting I I might not have spotted that. Well, I'm sure you would, Inspector. In any case, it was by no means conclusive, as I advised you at the time. Quite so. It merely seemed to indicate that Mrs. Wilson hadn't torn it from an assailant, as it appeared, but it had been planted to give that impression. I demonstrated with Dr. Morell that she would most certainly have gripped the tie differently. Have you arrived at the truth? Have you made an arrest? Hardly, Miss Frail. Oh, but surely, I, I mean, if you knew who committed the crime as well as Dr. Morell. Dr. Morell? Oh, I didn't realize you'd come to a doctor. But naturally, he realized who it was right from the start. Well, I'll be... Well, didn't you, Doctor? As usual, Miss Frail has given rein to her imagination, Inspector. I hadn't reached any conclusion this morning. Otherwise, I should, of course, have acquainted you accordingly. Oh, I'm sure you would have. Do say who it is. All right, Miss Frail, I'll get down to Casey's. If the doctor doesn't mind listening to what he already knows... The truth can never be too often repeated. Well, it was the tie, really. Once we realized it was a plant, all we had to do was to know who had planted it, then we'd be home and dry. Oh, who did plant now, it? Just coming to that. You must try to curb your impatience, Miss Frail. We scouted round the house and the garden. There were footprints and evidence of a ladder having been placed against the garden wall on the inside to look as if the burglar had got into the garden that way. It was all very cunning. The only mistake was they didn't go far enough. There were no signs of the ladder against the outside wall. Oh, goodness. Goodness had nothing to do with this, Miss Frail. Of course, it was an inside job. That disorder in the bedroom, all very realistically done. But but the note case in the pillar box. Ah, that was a master touch. I was wondering when you were coming to that. Yes, just the sort of thing a burglar would do. Grab the money, get rid of the note case in a pillar box he was passing. Then who was it who thought up all this? I talked with young Wilson, but he didn't give much away. Understandably, he seemed knocked over by the shock. It was the secretary companion, Miss Keene, who proved most helpful. Who's in love with Mr. Wilson. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Never mentioned it to me, either of them. Did you ask them? I didn't, as a matter of fact. Hardly seem to be the types to fall in love with each other. He's obviously wrapped up in his mother and... She's the practical, capable type. Absolute opposites. Ah, Inspector, that's where you're not such a good detective. Eh? Not when it comes to investigating the human heart. It's just those types who are completely different who fall in love. You think so? Mm Mm-hmm. The nervous young man and the girl all poised and self-assured. The tall woman and the short man, and vice versa. The vague, silly little feather brain and the suave, sardonic man of the world. Don't you agree, Dr. Morell? 
I can only say that I stand amazed at this revelation of your powers of perception. Yes, I was afraid that was all you would say. Anyway, whether they were in love or not, it's got no bearing on the case. No, Inspector? Not as it's turned out. Miss Keene was very frank. And as a result of what she said, the motive was obvious. Proceed, Inspector. Oh, this is absolutely enthralling. Well, as you know, Mrs. Wilson had been left plenty by her husband when he died. The money was invested in South America. I won't go into the details. She was devoted to her son and he to her, given him all he wanted. Education, travel, training to be an architect, all the trimmings. Then, suddenly, a few weeks ago, it happened. All her money went up the spout. She awoke one morning to find herself comparatively flat broke. Oh, poor woman. She didn't tell her son. It was he she was most concerned about. He'd only just got going as an architect, and without her financial backing, he was finished before he'd begun. So she decided there was only one thing left for her to do. Alive, she wasn't worth a penny. But she carried life policies to the tune of 20,000 pounds. You mean... That's it, Miss Frail. She was worth more to her son, dead. Oh, how dreadful. Isn't it, Dr. Morell? Hey, Doctor? Hmm? Quite dreadful. Of course, he would collect the lot. But, and this was vital, her policies carried a suicide clause. If Mrs. Wilson committed suicide... They wouldn't pay up a cent. A not unusual stipulation in a life insurance, quite. Oh, so she deliberately took her own life, but make it look as though she'd been murdered. That way her son would collect. I can't help admiring her. Inspector, uh, you communicated your conclusions to the son? Yes, I broke it to him gently. He didn't take it too well. And Miss Keene, she was also informed? She seemed more prepared for it, but then she knew of Mrs. Wilson's financial state. Oh, that poor, desperate woman plotting and scheming like that to kill herself and all for nothing. I should be moved to feel as you do if what the inspector just described to us happened to be true. What? Dr. Morell. Well, what do you mean, Doctor? I mean that Mrs. Wilson did not commit suicide. She was murdered. <laughs> There's a light in the front room. Where Mrs. Wilson used to like to sit. Come on. You wait here, driver. Yes, sir. There'll be a wireless car along any minute. Information room will have told them the drill. Yes, sir. Just tell them we've gone in, and I want them to wait outside the front door and keep their eyes peeled. Very good, sir. Let's hope the gate isn't locked. It's all right. Come on. Now, where's the bell push? It's so dark. Ah. It's quite chilly. Would you rather go back and wait in the car? Oh, no. No, I'm going to leave this for you to handle, Dr. Morell. I'll endeavor to be a credit to you. To think that if it hadn't been for you... I... I still can't get over it. The dead cunning of it. Inspector Hood, what brings you back again? Oh, hello, Dr. Morell. Miss Frail. Good evening. Sorry to disturb you like this. I should have thought you'd seen enough of this house for one day. Not quite, Mr. Wilson, I'm afraid. Oh, come on in. Thank you. What is there about all this to interest you, Dr. Morell? Inspector Hood has told you, of course. I have heard his version of the matter. Well, let's go into the front room. Helen's just gone upstairs. So the inspector's version doesn't add up with yours. Is that why you're here? Well, I thought we might have a quiet talk, Mr. Wilson. What have you found out? Something more about poor mother? When you realized her motive for taking her own life, uh, what was your reaction? Well, frankly, I couldn't believe it. I still find it difficult to accept the idea. We've been discussing it, Helen and I. It just doesn't seem like mother. Helen's told me how she made her swear not to tell me about losing her money. I'm afraid she realized that she was very wrong not to tell me, in, in spite of her promise. Why, well, it would have made it easier for us to marry, I... Mother might have been less difficult about it. No, I didn't know that you and Miss Keene were... Oh, well, I, I didn't mean to mention it, and you didn't ask me. You didn't ask me either, Inspector. Helen. Miss Keene. Good evening, Dr. Morell. Miss Frail. Good evening. Good evening, Miss Keene. I heard people arriving, so I came down. I didn't guess it was you. I've been telling Dr. Morell what you and I have been discussing. You mean my promise to your mother? I was just saying how it might have made it easier for you and I to get married. Yes, I heard you. But Dr. Morell... 
Surely you and Inspector Hood, not to mention Miss Frail, aren't here merely to inquire what Richard's reactions were when he knew that his mother committed suicide for his sake? Not altogether, Miss Keene. It would hardly require the three of you just for that. Plus the support of another police car which has just arrived. Oh. Helen. I noticed it on my way downstairs. You don't miss much, Miss Keene. Well, what is all this? Have you got police outside? It concerns the note case in the pillar box. Hmm? Uh, you will recall, Mr. Wilson, uh, that the postman returned it just after 10 o'clock this morning after he'd cleared the box. Uh, for your information, the first collection is at 8.30 a.m. Well, what of it? Well, the supposed bagler, who at first was presumed to have murdered your mother, apparently then threw the note case in the pillar box after leaving the house in the early hours. But we know now that there wasn't a burglar. Mother tried to make it look like that. There wasn't any burglar. Perfectly correct. But, Mr. Wilson, nor could it have been your mother who slipped the note case in the pillar box. Oh, what do you mean? Well, if she had, it must have been found at the time of the first collection at 8.30 a.m. Why, yes. She couldn't have placed it there after that, since by then she'd been dead for several hours. But of course, that must be right. Dead right, Mr. Wilson. Well, then who did put it there? The person whose fingerprints have been found on the note case. But... D and who was also listening outside your mother's room just before 10 o'clock this morning and overheard me inform Miss Frail that the torn-off necktie was a plant and who then hurried out to the pillar box in a last desperate effort to divert suspicion. The same person, Mr. Wilson, who, learning of your mother's financial crash, saw no future in marrying you unless you inherited the £20,000 insurance... Helen! You won't get me! Helen! Helen, come back! It's all right. You won't get very far. You can see from the window. <laughs> Helen! Helen! It was her all the time. Now, they've caught her. She's putting up a struggle, but they've got her all right. Oh, it's too horrible. I was watching her face, Dr. Murrell, while you were talking. She went absolutely white. I thought she was going to faint. It's usually Miss Frail who is so overcome. <sighs> Miss Frail! Miss Frail! She's passed out. I thought the excitement might prove too much for her. No doubt about it, Dr. Morell. The way you solved the sleepwalker case was out of this world. You are too kind, Miss Frail. I have encountered few criminals who went to such elaborate pains to cover up their tracks. Disposing of a new case in the pillar box, for instance... For all her ingenuity, she found herself driven by a subconscious compulsion to overplay her hand and so encompass her self-destruction. But surely she betrayed herself by her fingerprints on the note case. I call that just plain stupid. My dear Miss Frail, uh, did I never explain that to you? How do you mean? Well, naturally, her fingerprints were on the note case. She put them there when she took it from the postman. So they proved absolutely nothing at all. But what? Bluff, my dear Miss Frail. Bluff? Just bluff, yes. It had been a long day, remember. I wanted to force a confession out of her without wasting any time so that I could get back and proceed with my work in the laboratory, which was much more important in my estimation. But, Dr. Morell... Uh, that reminds me, Miss Frail, if I may continue with dictating these notes. Yes, Doctor. Uh, where were we? Well, I was observing uh, that every criminal is motivated by an inner compulsion to bring about his self-destruction. In order to achieve this act of self-betrayal, the evildoer cannot resist from drawing attention to his own crime. That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frey. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Helen Keane, Moira Lister, Richard Wilson, Hugh Burton, Inspector Hood, Philip Ray. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. listening next Saturday afternoon for another case for Dr. Morell, this time the blackmailer. Soldiers of the Press.
is a tale that should be put in scrapbooks and read in schoolrooms. A tale that should shame every civilian who has groused about the war and its sacrifices and hardships. It is a story of average men facing death or capture with all the odds against them. That editorial comment in the Cincinnati Post was inspired by Frank Hewlett's dramatic eyewitness account of the fall of that time. Frank Hewlett of United Press was the only regular correspondent who remained on the bomb-blasted Bullet Rake Peninsula until the very end of Baton's grim, dogged resistance. Here, then, is the personal story of Frank Hewlett, soldier of the press. They say that kids from Idaho are born with roving feet. I know I was. Pocatello is my hometown, and I got my first newspaper job on the Idaho State Journal. But even then, I had the Orient in mind. And as fast as my roving feet and newspaper jobs could carry me, I got there. For five years, I roamed the Pacific, looking for headline material and adventure. Then, in a few short weeks, I found more headline stories, more adventure, and more experience than a newspaper man ordinarily can hope for in a lifetime. It all began on a well-remembered Sunday, December 7th, 1941. I was in Manila, a member of the staff of the United Press Bureau there. Richard Wilson, our bureau manager, was away on a trip. Word had just reached us of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I got your message at home, Frank, and came right down. How bad is it? Doesn't look too good. The Japs apparently have handed Pearl Harbor an awful pasting. Details aren't quite clear yet. Any news from Wilson yet? I had a cable from him earlier. He's scheduled to fly in from Hong Kong. I've been trying to reach Hong Kong, but no luck. I have a phone call in now for Pan American to see what they know. Oh, this may be it now. You, Hewlett. Thanks. Hello? Yes, speaking. Oh, I see. They didn't get away? Oh, too bad. Well, do you think there's a chance that... I see. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Well, what's the word? Well, the clipper didn't get away. They're not sure just what did happen, but they say there's not much hope that anyone at Hong Kong will get away from there now. Well, brother, it looks like you inherited quite an assignment. It does, that. And I'll need the cooperation of all of you. You bet, Chief. Count on us, Frank. There's a big job ahead, and war is not exactly my dish, you know. I never happened to run into a war before. Well, overnight, I blossomed into a war correspondent. We had a good staff. And everyone pitched in to cover the biggest story any of us ever had encountered. To begin with, I had a lucky break. The United Press had a venerable old wireless transmitter in Manila. Not much to look at. Its power was low and its antenna was strung on bamboo poles. But by one of the queer, strange quirks of radio, its signal could be heard clearly by the UP listening post at Santiago, Chile. We kept it going for the first three weeks of the war, supplying news to New York headquarters frequently hours before the same news could be moved over regular communication channels. Hewlett's wife, Virginia Hewlett, played a major part in scoring one such beat. She had volunteered to help the overworked staff in High Commissioner Sayers' office. But Mrs. Hewlett shared her husband's instinct and enthusiasm for a big story. Manila, by December 27th, had been declared an open city in an effort to spare it further bombings. When swarms of Japanese bombers roared over the city, Mrs. Hewlett rushed to the U.P. Bureau to lend a hand. Hewlett had gone to the port area where the attack was heaviest. Yes, Frank? Sounds kind of lively out there. It is. They just got a church. Ready? Fire away. A 16th century church and school have just been smashed. I walked on ruined school books, torn tablets from children's desks, and examination papers which had been bomb-blasted from the elementary school. As I passed, three aged nuns were being escorted into the streets. The church is in flames. Lifeless bodies are being removed, and others are believe buried in the debris. A score of persons were killed at prayer. That's all for now. Oh, Frank, 
You've got a tremendous story here. We've got a tremendous story, honey. Take care of yourself. Be seeing you. Be seeing you. A few weeks later, the Japanese army closed in on Manila. Virginia Hewlett, still at her post in Commissioner Sayers' office, was in Manila proper. Hewlett was at the front with American and Filipino troops. We learned on New Year's Eve that the Japs had Manila and that MacArthur was withdrawing his forces to Bataan Peninsula. There was no time for anybody to lose. We knew bridges to the peninsula had been mined and were to be blown up as soon as the troops got across. My car and Tony, my native chauffeur, were waiting to get going. Ready now, please, boss? Plenty hurry. I know, Tony, but I've been trying to reach Mrs. Hewlett or to make sure she got out of the city all right. Hey, Hewlett, hold on, message for you. Here, this just came by courier. Oh, fine, thanks. Oh, uh, hold everything, Tony. This is probably for Mrs. Hewlett. Mrs. Hewlett, okay? Regret to inform you, Mrs. Hewlett failed to escape from Manila before the Japanese arrived. She be seeing us like she always say? Huh? Oh, yes, that's right, Tony. She'll be seeing us. Hey, for God's sake, step on it, Hewlett. Don't you know the bridge is to a tanner mine? They'll blow her on midnight. All right, Tony. Let's go. Hey, plenty hurry, huh, boss? Yeah, right you are, Tony. Well, just got across in time. Yeah, look at watch. After midnight. Happy New Year, boss. Yes. Happy New Year, Tony. Hewlett's was the last car to reach Patan. There he established contact with his headquarters office in New York by means of Navy radio and covered the 98-day siege of the peninsula from beginning to end. Bataan wasn't so bad the first two months. The men began to fight as seasoned, strong, carefree soldiers, talking about how they'd pay off the Japs when reinforcements arrived, for they believed that reinforcements would arrive. That was the beginning of the siege. At the end, every man had lost weight and was dragging himself by willpower alone into actions. They'd eaten every water buffalo on the peninsula. They'd eaten all the horses of the 26th Cavalry and most of the pack mules. They'd eaten stewed monkey, and still there wasn't enough food. Rations had been cut in half, and then cut again. Tea, coffee, sugar, and flour had disappeared. There were two slender meals a day. Plain rice for one meal, and rice with canned milk for the other. I've seen a soldier pay five pesos, the equivalent of two and a half dollars, for one cigarette. I've seen a group of them line up. And each man take a drag on a single cigarette. Some tried to smoke dried bark and leaves. And then the quinine began to give out. On April 9th, the army radio, the voice of freedom, made the grim announcement. The voice of freedom speaking, Batan has fallen. The Filipino and American troops on this war-ravaged, blood-stained peninsula have laid down their arms with their heads bloody but unbowed. Frank Hewlett was the only regular American press correspondent who remained on Bataan until the very end of resistance. He then withdrew with the defenders to Corregidor. It was a strange procession, that brave strafing by Japanese planes to stream across the treacherous five miles of water between Bataan and Corregidor. A ragtag fleet of every available boat... One bright spot in the tragic day was that the nurses were evacuated safely. One of them, Erlene Allen of Jacksonville, Illinois, I had known in Manila. She and her doctor fiancé, Captain Garnett Francis of Alexandria, Virginia, had been friends of my wife's and mine. Oh, Frank Hewlett. Oh. Oh, Gosh, it's so good to see you. It's good to see you, too, Erlene. Oh, now, take it easy now. Everything's okay. Of course, I... I'm sorry to be such a baby. Just seeing you standing there. I know, I know. What about Gary? Well, Gary and I were married, Frank, on Bataan two months ago. Good. We had to keep it a secret because I I would have had to resign and 
We wanted to stay together as long as possible. We said goodbye last night at the field hospital. Ah, oh, poor kid. It's tough. Gary's staying there, of course, for the other doctors to look after the patients. If only they'd let me stay, too. I know how you feel. Tell me, how about Virginia? Is she all right? Well, I'm not sure. You see, she couldn't get out of Manila before the Japs took over. Oh. She's still there. Virginia? In an internment camp? That's it. <laughs> and what a story she'll bring out with her. A tremendous story. I, I can hear her saying it. Tremendous. Oh, Frank. Well, you've got a tremendous story to handle right here and now yourself. A tale that should shame every civilian who has groused about this war and its sacrifices and hardships. That's what a newspaper editorial writer said of the dispatch Frank Hewlett sent back that night. Listen to it in Hewlett's own words. At the end, the Bataan army crumbled like the one horse shay. And I know why. <laughs> Yes, I know why. Because Americans and Filipinos had fought 15 days and 15 nights without pause, with dive bombers shrieking down on them in droves and heavy bombers pulverizing their rear. I know why. Because the Japs brought in long-range artillery that laid down terrific barrages. Because tanks were used unmercifully to dislodge our dug-in forces from their foxholes. Because the Japs brought in fresh, well-fed shock troops. The pick of the Mikado's armies. And our men were hungry. And tired and sick. I know why. In the last desperate showdown, the Battle of Bataan ended because the quinine pills ran out. There was ammunition aplenty. There was courage aplenty, too. But there was no quinine to fight that deadliest of our enemies, malaria. All the men fought well. Not even now was all the story known of the heroism and endurance of the Filipinos and Americans who fought so stoutly in jungle fastnesses and along the rugged coast. They had faith that was unconquerable. They were fighting for their people, and their country, and for freedom, and dignity, and pride. Bataan has fallen, but its spirit stands, a beacon to liberty-loving peoples of the world. Yes, that was a tremendous story, a story that won for Frank Hewlett the award of the National Headliners Club for Outstanding Individual Enterprise. When General Roy staged his daring bombing raids on Japanese positions in the Philippines during the siege of Corregidor, Hewlett returned with him to Australia to continue his assignment as war correspondent for the United Press. Today, his dispatches are datelined with Allied forces somewhere in New Guinea. Your local announcer will tell you when you may hear the story of another of the soldiers of the press who, like Frank Hewlett, are witnessing and reporting frontline action. Be sure to listen. And meanwhile, look for United Press News in your favorite newspaper. Listen for United Press News on the air. It is your guarantee of the world's best coverage of the world's biggest news. Stand by for crime. Hi, Chuck Morgan again. Did you ever participate in a full-scale revolution? Well, I had that dubious pleasure less than a month ago. And when I say pleasure, I use the word loosely. Anyway, I've made a good story, and I'd like to tell you about it. You see, Pappy Mansfield, owner of radio station KLP here in L.A., where a high-workers newscaster, is a showman of the first water. 
when he heard rumors that the Ramon Escobar faction in the tiny South American Republic of Parana was going to attempt to overthrow the Leopoldo de los Rios regime, he contacted the powerful 250,000-watt station in Paolo, Parana's capital city. And he set up a short wave deal whereby I could broadcast the show back to the United States. Then he bought tickets for Carol Curtis, my blonde secretary, and me on the Braniff Airlines. We left International Airport on a Sunday evening. And two days later, we're nearing our destination. Only a short while longer, Glamorpus, and we'll set down at the Francisco Airport in Paola. And I'll bet you'll be glad to get there. Oh, I don't do it. Kind of scares me. I don't know a thing about South America. You don't? Mm-mm. Why, Glamorpus. South America extends from about 12 degrees north of the equator to about 56 degrees south of the equator. Yes. It covers an area of 7,200,000 square miles and has a population of 100,195,000. Oh, get in. Ta-ta. Now I suppose you're going to tell me you also speak uh, Paranian or, or whatever that is. <laughs> Fiddle de dee, naturally. Well, speak some at me. Te amo mucho. Well, I'll be... Hmm. Oh, what does that mean, Chuck? Oh, come on. Now, don't be stupid. Everyone knows what te amo mucho means. Well, I don't. And I don't believe you do either. Huh? Oh, I think you're making it up. Fasten well... your safety belts, please. Uh-uh. Fasten your safety belts, please. Well, Glamour Puss, this looks like the end of the journey. Yeah, well, they must go to bed early around here. I can't see a thing below. That's because you're looking out of the wrong window, bird brain. Look over here. Oh, Chuck, it's like a fairy land. Isn't it? Oh, there must be millions of lights. Mm. I had no idea Paola would be so big. Well, what'd you expect? A backcountry settlement? Oh? Paola, my sweet, is one of the most modern cities in the world. As are most South Americans. Oh, oh, there's the airfield. See it? Yes. You all set? Uh-huh. Oh, I'm as set as I ever will be. But I'm still scared. <laughs> <laughs> Senor Chuck Morgan. Yes, that's right. You must be Pedro Falcon. I am sorry, senor. I am not Pedro Falcon. I am a member of the great and glorious forces of Ramon Escobar. Ramon Escobar? But I thought that we were going to... You North Americans think too slowly, senor Morgan. The revolt led by General Escobar was successfully accomplished yesterday. Oh, no. General Escobar now sits in the seat of power formerly occupied by that scoundrel, Leopoldo de los Rios. And you, senor Morgan, are his prisoner. The trouble with most Americans who travel abroad is that unthinkingly they're too sure of themselves. And unconsciously, Carol Curtis and I followed the pattern. We protested violently at being treated like criminals. We offered to show our credentials and we didn't get the chance. In less time than it took us to realize exactly what was happening, we were detoured around customs and forced into a curtained automobile, persuaded by a couple of blunt-nosed pistols pressed into our backs. Our captor, Senor Pancho Ortega, he said his name was, was polite but adamant. You will refrain from attempting to look from the automobile or in any way to attract attention. To do so would be most disastrous for both of you. I'm going to be pretty disastrous with you, my friend. Just wait until the United States Consulate finds out about this. <laughs> the United States Consulate, I can assure you, is not going to find out. No? Well, don't be too sure. Everyone in Piranha knows we're here tonight. We've had more publicity than your whole two-bit revolution. Precisely, Senor Morgan. That is why you are our prisoner. I don't get it. You will get it, as you say, in due time, Senor. We rode for about an hour, making a lot of turns and keeping at a moderate pace. Twice in the distance, we heard sounds of gunfire, which indicated that Raymond Escobar's coup wasn't so completely successful as our friend Pancho had wanted us to believe. After a while, the automobile made a final turn and slowed down. We bounced along a cobbled street for a short distance and then stopped. You will get out, please. Now, look here, friend. You've gone far enough. If you don't... Please, no talking. But if we can't talk, how are we going to... The same goes for you, senorita. Oh, all right. Pancho led the way through an unlighted doorway. We followed his two henchmen were directly behind us. One of them produced a flashlight which revealed a flight of rickety stairs. We all went up. At the top was a small landing and a door. Pancho opened the door. We followed him inside. 
someone snapped a light switch. It was a bare room, consisting of a table, two chairs, and a couch. A naked electric light bulb hanging from the ceiling gave the place a dismal, unlived-in look. There was one window. Very well, senora and senorita. You will wait here. What for? How long? Listen, you don't seem to realize how you're sticking your chin out on this deal. If you don't let me talk to the United States Consulate, Please, senor. I'm going to... May I suggest that you make yourself comfortable until I return? I feel. Carlos, come. Well, senor Morgan, we're in a fine mess. Oh, shut up. Relax, Glamopus. <laughs> Locked. That doesn't surprise me. Chuck, this window's got bars on the outside. Yeah, well, that isn't surprising either. We wouldn't have been left alone if there was a chance of getting out of here. Chuck, why were we taken prisoners? And why don't they let us see the American consulate? And what are we going to do? You asked those questions as though you expected me to come up with the answers. Well, you usually do have the answers. Uh. Oh, this is a heck of a time to conk on on me. <laughs> come on, hang on to that sense of humor, Glamour, because you may need it. If that's a sense of humor showing through, then I'm going to be grinning at my own funeral. Mm -hmm. Oh, say something nice to me, Chuck. I, I think I'm going to cry. Now, look, Lamarpus, get this. We're in a spot. And you start making matters worse by boiling up. Uh-oh. Well, back so soon, senor? I promise you only a short wait, remember? You will step this way, please. The room we followed Pancho into was a duplicate of the one we'd left. Only this one had more lights, more furniture and more people. The first person that caught my eye was a lovely raven-haired girl. She was sitting at a table directly beneath the electric light bulb. Beside her was a man. I looked at the man and felt goose pimples breaking out all over. Chuck! Yes, I see. Oh, he, he looks exactly like you. There is a slight resemblance. Slight resemblance? Why, he's a dead ringer. Buenas noches, señorita. Señor. Ah, so you notice it too, eh? It is most uncanny, no? Yes. I mean, Chuck, say so. I think our host wants to talk a while, Glamopus. You are quite right, Senor Morgan. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. I am Leopoldo de los Rios, President of the Republic of Parana. De los Rios? But I thought... We... You thought that my loyal follower, Pancho, was a member of the Ramon Escobar forces. Eh? Ah. Quite. Only by posing as such was he able to enter the airfield and drive you away as his... Uh, Guest. Guest. Yeah, that's a hot one. All right, Rios, what's the rest of the story? As you pointed out to my loyal supporter, Pancho, your arrival here received more publicity than our, uh, what was your expression, uh, two-bit revolution. Corny should have been the word. That's the trouble with you North Americans. You treat the revolution outside your own country so lightly. Nuts. You, you're amused. Hundreds of people were killed, and you are amused. No, oh, no, Mr. Rios. We didn't think it was funny at all, did we, Chuck? Keep quiet, Glamopus. All right, senor. You read about me coming down here in the paper, so what? And uh, saw your pictures. All right, okay. So there were pictures. Uh, please, senor Morgan. This belligerent attitude will get you nowhere. Put yourself in my position, in the position of any Paranian. There is talk of a revolution. You plan to broadcast it over your radio as though it were some sort of cheap spectacle. Thousands of people have been killed, and you make sport of it. All right. You said hundreds before, but never mind. You've got a point. I admit it. I apologize. Now, where do we go from here? Uh, for the moment, senor, you will go nowhere. It is I who am going. Well, that's okay with us. You go your way, we'll go ours. Uh, unfortunately, it will not be simple for you to go your way. You see, Senor Morgan, your thirst for publicity brought you much of it. Your picture was published and republished. And even I, Senor Morgan, could not fail to note the strong resemblance between us. All right, okay, so we're twins. Now what? Now, Senor Morgan, I will take your papers, all of your credentials, and escape from Parana. What? Uh, yes, Senor Morgan. It is an excellent plan I have. Well thought out, and it shall be well executed. You are out of your mind. Uh, no, no, no. Far from it. At the moment, I am the deposed leader of my country. The police and the military are systematically searching the city. The time is short. It is inevitable that they will find my hideout here. And when they do? Ramon Escobar, Senor Morgan, has issued a decree... I am to be shot on sight. Chuck, do you realize what that means? If he takes your you papers keep and... You quiet, Glamour Purse. Go ahead, Rios. I think you understand the situation, senor. Since you North Americans make so light of our small revolution, 
since you think it is so amusing to come down here and make a spectacle of what to us is a most serious affair, you should have your chance to be a, what is it you say, a sport about the whole thing? I think I get what you're driving at, senor. You're going to take my credentials, and posing at me, you're going to take the first plane out of here for safety. Precisely. You're going to leave me here, and when Escobar's gang catches up with me, I'm going to be executed in your stead. Oh, not necessarily. You are, I think, a clever man, Senor Morgan. Gracias. Perhaps you can avoid capture until I return from Cuba. Cuba? Yes, I shall leave the plane in Cuba. There I have many influential friends. There I shall reorganize my armies and one day return to Parana to liberate my people from the tyrant Ramon Escobar. One day return. And when will that one day be, senor? Who knows? A month? Six months? A year? Mm -hmm. And during that time I'm supposed to hang around here ducking the cops and the army who will stop at nothing to get a rope around my neck. If you're still alive when I return, senor, you will be sent back to your country a free man. Well, that's mighty white of you, chum. But I have other ideas. Uh, so? Yeah, so. Your flunkies have failed to frisk either one of us when they picked us up at the airport. All right. Did you ever see one of these before? Yes, yes, many times. That is a Colt forty-five automatic. Uh. A, a very effective weapon. Do you intend to shoot us all with it, senor? Only if you're stupid enough to try to stop us from getting out of here. Carol? Yes, Chuck? Go over and see where that door leads to. Uh, no one in this room will attempt to spoil your fun, senor. It is outside the room you will be stopped. I'll take that chance. It's open, Chuck. There's a hole outside and the stairs we came up. Good. Now stay where you are, all of you. One false move and you get it. Get out in the hall, Glamour Plus. As soon as I close the door, lock it. All right. I stepped quickly through the door, banged it shut. Carol turned the key. We spun toward the stairs, but we stopped. Five men were gathered at the head of the stairwell. Drop your gun, Jr. We had our choice of shooting it out or being shot ourselves, so I decided to shoot it out. At the moment, I couldn't think of any alternative. Drop to the floor, Glamour! <laughs> attempt to escape had failed completely. The last thing I remember was dropping to the floor beside Carol, thinking what a crummy way this was to die. 6,000 miles from home in a country about the size of Rhode Island, and no forest lawn where a guy could get a decent funeral. Then something hit me on the side of my head, and it was curtains. I woke up on the couch in the room where Carol and I had spent the first five minutes of our imprisonment. But despite that throbbing ache in my head, I thought I must surely be in heaven. For standing over me was an angel. I shut my eyes and opened them again. She was still there. She had raven black hair and eyes the color of midnight. And a skin that would shame the petals of a rose. The senor feels better? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like a million dollars. Drink these, please. What is it? It will stop the ache. I took the stuff and drank it. What did I have to lose? It tasted like the devil. But the ache had stopped in my head. Then I discovered two things. There was a bandage tied neatly around my head. And the angel with the rose petal skin was a girl who had been sitting at the table beside De Los Rios. Ah, so it's you. You feel better, see? Si? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Where's Glamopus? Glamopus? Carol Curtis, the girl who's with me. Oh, oh, she's quite safe. I will take you to her in a moment. Why not now? First, I have to make what in the United States, I believe you call the proposition. Uh-oh. I hope you didn't mention the glamour purse that you were going to say that to me. Let me explain, please. Huh? I am Conchita Cortez, the sister-in-law of Leopoldo de los Rios. Well, baby, I wouldn't brag about it. You must realize what a serious position you are in, Senor Morgan. Unless you permit me to help you escape, you will surely be captured and... Executed. Now, wait a minute. Let's take this once over lightly, chicken. Did you say that you would help us to escape? I did. What's the catch? The catch, as you call it, senor, is, is that you take me with you. What? I want to go to the United States. I must go to the United States. Oh, I see. And you figure this is your chance of getting out of the country, eh? It is more than that, senor. In North America is my fiancé. He waits for me there. A whole year he waits... We wish to get married. Hmm. Well, that figures. 
Now, about this plan of escape, sir. I know the city well. I have many friends and much jewelry to be used as gifts. Well, I'm still in the position of having nothing to lose, so okay, Conchita. It's a deal. This was beginning to seem like a bad nightmare, the awakening from which was becoming increasingly uncertain. Conchita snapped off the light and took hold of my hand. You do not mind? Hmm? Uh, uh, No, not to the contrary. Follow closely, please. Uh And do not make any sound. We went through a door and into another darkened room. Stopped a moment to listen. Far off, the machine gun began its angry chattering. It was a dull explosion, sounding like a grenade. In silence, we moved across the floor and Conchita opened a second door. Sudden light exploded out at us. I heard the sound of quick footsteps. And then Carol had her arms around my neck. Chuck, oh, Chuck. Take it easy, Glamour Puss. Everything's going to be all right. Oh, Chuck, I was afraid. Who's this? This, sweetheart, is Conchita Cortez, quite a kid. Yes. Yes, I see she is. You can drop the little boy's hand now, darling. <clears throat> He's not afraid anymore. Oh, I am so sorry. I, I did not intend... I, I was not thinking. Hmm. Lots of girls stop thinking when Chucky Boy hey, turns yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. And then listen, lay off Glamour Puss, will you? Conchita's going to get us out of this mess. She's also going back to the States with us. Oh, she is? I, I do not want to appear rude, but there's so little time. That machine gun fire I do not like. It means there is still resistance. All right, we're ready. It's any time you are, little one. Let's go. We stepped out into a cobbled alley, turned right, and headed for the lighted street. Near the mouth of the alley we stopped, a man had suddenly appeared around the corner. He was in uniform and carried a rifle. He stood peering into the alley's gloom. He started towards us, and Kachita said, Wait! Do not move! Her heels clicked away on the cobblestone. The soldier brought the gun down. But Kachita spoke to him softly, and he allowed her to approach. They stood a minute talking. Then we saw Conchita reach into her handbag. Chuck. Yeah? You called her little one. What? You called her little one back there in the room. Called her... At a time like this, you bring up a stupid... Listen, I called her little one because that's her name. Conchita means little one in Peranian. Oh, Chuck, I'm sorry. Well, you better be. Conchita returned, and she led us back to the street. The soldier had disappeared. As a matter of fact, there wasn't a soul in evidence anywhere. We crossed two intersections, then made a right turn, and the business district of Peola was before us. Looking as much like Sixth and Olive in L.A. as Sixth and Olive looks like Sixth and Olive. Only there weren't any people or traffic. I could feel Carol's hand begin trembling in mine. She was getting that same sense of eeriness. Suddenly, Conchita stopped, holding up her hand. Listen. Here's the patrol. They're coming this way. Quick. Beyond that building is an alley. In the alley is an automobile. We must hurry. We didn't have a chance. The patrol came around the corner and saw us. There was a shout of command. The soldiers broke ranks and ran towards us. Quick, into this building. Hard. Inside, both of you. Let me bolt the door. We were on the ground floor of an office building. There was a large plaque on the wall. I glanced at it, and then I did a take. Look! This is station PAR, the radio station from which I was going to do that broadcast. Chuck, if Pedro Falcon is here, he'll help us. Yeah. Pedro Falcon was taken prisoner yesterday. This station is now in the hands... You'll raise your hands, please, all of you. Senor Leopoldo de los Rios, you are the prisoner of Ramon Escobar, president of the Republic of Parana. You've heard the old American expression, out of the frying pan into the fire? Well, that was us. The man with the gun ordered us into a waiting room that had been converted into temporary headquarters for Ramon Escobar. The general himself, a short, swarthy man with a waxed mustache, sat behind a table that was big enough for a director's meeting at the AT&T. Inside of me, he leaped to his feet. Rios! So, you were unable to escape as you boasted, eh? Now, take it easy, General. I'm not Rios. My name is Morgan. I'm an American. Oh, you are not Leopoldo de los Rios, you eh? Oh, come, come, Leopoldo. Do you take me for a fool? He's telling the truth, General Escobar. 
this is not Leopoldo de los Rios. Oh, and I suppose you are not Conchita Cortez, Leopoldo's sister-in-law. Yes, that is true. I am Conchita Cortez. But you must believe me. This man is Senor Morgan, a citizen of the United States. I see. And who is the lovely creature standing beside him? I'm Carol Curtis, and you can tell us monkey face to let go my arm. Well, well, such a fiery spirit. Corporal! It was obvious we weren't getting anywhere with the general. Whether or not he believed I was Leopold de los Rios, he didn't seem to bother much. He had himself a couple of fine prisoners, and he was delighted. I was beginning to weigh my chances of getting hold of the corporal's rifle when something happened. Hi, Chuck. Hello, Carol. Happy, Happy. Happy. Now I've seen everything. How did you get here? Oh, Pappy, I was never more glad to see anyone in my oh, life. Oh, you can see Senor that. Mansfield, you know this... Leopoldo de los Rios? Well, Leopoldo, my foot, that's Chuck Morgan. He oh. works for me. The blonde girl is Carol Curtis, his secretary. Oh, this is de los Rios. His face is very familiar well, to Chuck's me. Chuck's face is familiar to me. Listen, General, does your friend de los Rios have a Yankee accent, or hadn't you noticed it? Well, this is something I had not thought of. Well, you better think of it beginning now. Come on, you two. We're getting out of here. Oh, okay, Pepe. Wait. The girl stays. Which girl? Conchita Cortez. She stays. She will remain as hostage. De Los Rios will not attempt to leave Parana so long as he thinks she is in danger. Now, just a minute, General. You're wrong again. Conchita goes with us. So? And why is it you say this? Because I made a deal with her. She agreed to help us escape if I promised to take her back to the United States with us. Escape? But she did not succeed in helping you escape, Senor. That's not the point. We made a deal. She tried to keep her part of it. I'm going to keep mine. And if I do not permit... You'll permit, General. First, because it was Conchita who contacted the American consulate, which in turn contacted me. And second, because if I'm not back at the consulate in 15 minutes, that broadcast I was telling you about is going on the air. There were short waves set up over there, and the American people are just waiting to hear the details of this revolution of yours. I see, I see. And a lot is going to depend upon the nature of those details. Your credit rating with the United States government, for one thing. I see. Perhaps this would be important to the future of Parana, eh? Well, it seems likely. You might as well count on Uncle Sam to get your country back onto its feet. Everyone else does. Yes, yes, this is most important. Most important indeed. Very well, it is a bargain. You will make the broadcast and explain to the people of the United States that the government of Parana is now... <laughs> Good old Pappy. And what a liar he was. There wasn't any short wave set up at the American consulate, but General Escobar didn't know that. However, I did make a brief talk from Station PAR, stating the facts of the revolution and refraining from any personal comment. Then the four of us were given safe escort to the airfield. That big four-motored Braniff airliner took off five minutes after we reached the field. Pappy squeezed himself into a seat beside the beautiful Conchita. Mm. Pappy's sure having himself a time, isn't he? <laughs> Look at that old boy. He's getting a boot out of being so close to South American beauty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what does that mean? So were you. So was I what? Getting a boot out of being so close to South American beauty. Ah, oh, now, glamour puss. I found out something. What? Conchita doesn't mean little one. Oh? You just made that up. Now, look, glamour puss, under the circumstances... And I found I... out something else, too. What? I found out what teo mu mucho means. Well, you found out what teo mu <laughs> What does it mean? Well? Well... Say it in English. <laughs> okay, Glamour Puss. I love you very much. Oh, Chuck. Stand by for crime. Chuck Morgan again. You know, being a newscaster on a radio station the size of KOP puts me in line to meet a lot of people. Statistics show that there are more than five million active criminals in the USA. These include the sneaking small-time petty thieves and the big-time operators who head up Murder Incorporated. They also include the racketeers, that group of sadistic, unscrupulous parasites who prey upon the weak, the innocent, the honest citizen. To my way of thinking, they're the worst the ones we can best get along without. Especially those who deal in human emotions. Which is why when I reached my office last Thursday and found Carol Curtis, my blonde secretary, entertaining a stranger, I listened to her story and really got burned up. 
Have you been to the police about this, Mrs. Ellis? Yes, but what can they do? This woman, this maid Dawson, she claims to be our baby's natural mother. She has a birth certificate to prove it. You see, Chuck, Mr. and Mrs. Ellis adopted Betsy when she was only seven months old. She's now six years. Naturally, they think of her as their own. Oh, she is our own, Miss Curtis. Why, we love her more than, than if I were her natural mother. What about the adoption agency? Well, they went out of business a year after we took Betsy. Yeah, it's a usual pattern. If you people who adopt youngsters would only investigate these so-called... Chuck, ag- Mrs. Ellis didn't come here to be lectured. I'm sorry. She knows she's wrong, but that doesn't alter things. She's in danger of losing her child, and she wants to know if there isn't something you can do to prevent it. Well, I don't know what. The police's hands are tied. What about this May Dawson, the child's natural mother? Well, she claims that after the child was born, she was unable to support it, so she left it with the adoption agency. <laughs> and she told them that as soon as she was able, she'd come and get the baby and pay them for having kept it. Yeah, that follows too. Oh, hello, Pappy, come in. This is Mrs. Clara Ellis. Mrs. Ellis, Pappy Mansfield, owner of KOP. How do you do? Mrs. Ellis believes she's been victimized by one of those adoption agencies, Pappy. Oh, one of those, huh? Yeah. She's going to lose her baby, Pappy, unless someone does something about it. And I think Chuck should do it. Chuck? What can Chuck do? Well, he can at least talk to that woman. Now, wait a minute. Glamour puss. Mrs. Ellis, have you said anything to this woman about money? I mean, did you offer her a sum as she allowed you to keep the youngster? No, uh, I was afraid to. My husband's a tool and die worker, Mr. Morgan. He makes a comfortable living, and we, we've saved $2,000 against Betsy's education. Yeah. If May Dawson took that 2000 then she'd want more. We'd be bled for the rest of our lives. And if she didn't take the 2000 then you'd have to assume that she was the child's natural mother. And you don't want to think that. Right, Mrs. Ellis? Yes, that's right. But whether she is or not, she hasn't any rightful claim to Betsy. Why, the woman hasn't seen the child since she was seven months old. Now, how could she Your possibly... Your mother instinct is getting the best of you, Glamour mm-hmm. Puss. You know, that money angle might give us the answer we're looking for. Now, just what do you think you're going to do? Yes, just what do you think you're going to do, I hope? Well, if the woman were offered some money, a sizable amount, and took it... It would prove the whole thing's a racket, and Mr. and Mrs. Ellis could keep their baby. And if she didn't, Chuck would be a sucker. How much money were you thinking of offering, Chuck? Oh, uh, say, uh, $20,000. Well, that's a good, neat figure. Mm. Now, just where are you going to get this tidy sum to offer the lady? Well, my Pappy, I'm surprised. You're going to provide it, of course. It wasn't an easy job selling Pappy on the idea he should risk $20,000 trying to expose what might or might not be one of the most vicious rackets in the books. He was only half convinced that May Dawson didn't have a legitimate claim, especially since Claire Ellis had no proof whatever that May Dawson wasn't little Betsy's natural mother. But, Pappy, that's what we want to find out. If it's a racket, then we want to know about it. Why? We're not in the racket-busting business, Chuck. We're running a radio station. Why should we... Because when you run a radio station or a newspaper or any other public service enterprise, it's supposed to be devoted to the best interests of the people who support it. And that's the public. My, my, just listen to Miss Curtis. Now, look, this is what I have in mind. Suppose I call her, Mrs. Dawson. I'll represent myself as Mrs. Ellis's attorney. I'll tell her the Ellis's are too upset to talk to her again. I'll hint around and finally offer them $20,000. Of my money. Oh, Chuck, I knew you'd do something. Mrs. Ellis, you have nothing to worry about from now on. Chuck will take care of everything. Now, wait a minute, Glamour Puss. Let's not get Mrs. Ellis's hopes up. I can't promise a thing. There's still a 50-50 chance that May Dawson is legitimate. If she is, there's nothing anybody can do. She won't take my baby, Mr. Morgan. I don't care who she is. She won't take my baby. I'll kill her first. I thought about this thing, the more I wondered if I weren't being a sucker. Even if, after talking to May Dawson, I became convinced she was pulling a racket, what could I do about it? The whole thing didn't make sense. Except that I kept thinking what a terrible tragedy it would be if Clark and Clara Ellis had their baby taken away from them. Or if Mrs. Ellis carried out her threat to commit murder. So it was with considerable misgivings that I rang the doorbell of an apartment in West Los Angeles which was where Mae Dawson had told Claire Ellis she was living. Yes? Hello. You Mrs. Dawson? Yes, I'm Mrs. Dawson, but if you're selling... No, I'm not selling anything, Mrs. Dawson. My name is Simpson. I'm an attorney employed by Mr. and Mrs. Clark Ellis. Oh. 
Oh, yes, Mr. Simpson, won't you come in? Thank you. Um, would you sit over here, please? Thank you very much. I I hardly know what to say about this, Mr. Simpson. I, I know exactly how the Ellis's feel, and I certainly don't blame them. Did I hear the bell? Oh, company, man? Oh, Arnold, I'm glad you stayed home today. This is Mr. Simpson. He's an attorney hired by the Ellis's. And it is him. How do you do? I can guess why you're here, Mr. Simpson. We both feel terrible about this, probably as bad as the Ellis's. But you are going through with it. Well, you see... Mr. Simpson, if you or the Ellis's could only see our side of the picture. You see, Arnold and I were married a year after I learned that the adoption agency had closed. Yeah. Our first baby died at three months. The doctor told me I couldn't have any more. It was the worst thing that ever happened to me. For a long while, I thought I'd never be normal again. Well... Didn't it occur to you and Mr. Dawson to adopt a child? We talked about it, but... Do you know how it feels to have a child of your own, Mr. Simpson, and lose it? No, no I'm afraid I don't. I'm, I'm not married. May took it hard, Mr. Simpson. I kept her under a doctor's care for about 15 months. Then one day I was going through some of her things, and I came across Betsy's birth certificate. Oh, you, uh, you didn't know about her first child then? Well, I knew she'd been married before, but she never told me about the baby. I was afraid of, of what he'd think of me for abandoning Betsy. And what did you think, Mr. Dawson? Well, it was quite a blow, but, well, I love my wife very much, Mr. Simpson. She was ill at the time, and I certainly wasn't going to condemn her for something that wasn't her fault. Yeah. How long was it after that that you decided to claim Betsy? Not until last week. I had no idea where Betsy was living or who her foster parents were. And then, quite by chance, I met Mr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison? Who's he? Mr. Harrison owned the adoption agency where I'd left Betsy. Oh. I reminded him that he'd promised to keep Betsy for six months before letting her go. And he reminded me that he had kept her for six months and one week. And then that he only let her go because he decided to close the agency. I see. And he told you where the Ellis's could be found? Yes, he did. Arnold and I talked it over, and... And then I decided to go see Betsy. I... I don't know what happened to me that day, only suddenly I simply had to have my baby. Well, I think I can understand how you felt, Mrs. Dawson, but I can also understand Mrs. Ellis's feelings, too. By the way, I, I wonder if I can see that birth certificate. Yes, of course. I'll get it for you. Thank you. Well, Dawson got the birth certificate without hesitation. I took it over to the window where I could get a good look at it. Now, I'm no expert on birth certificate, but this one looked okay to me. It had been recorded in a small town in Rhode Island, properly signed and sealed. Still, there was something. Something I couldn't put my finger on. Maybe it was because the Dawsons had been too willing to let me see the paper. While stalling for time, I turned the certificate over and back again, pretending to be studying it. But whatever it was that had hit me wouldn't gel. Well, it certainly looks okay. This is going to be rough on the Ellis's. Mrs. Dawson, about adopting another baby, I couldn't, have you... Mr. Simpson. I just couldn't, knowing that Betsy's my very own. Yes, it's true, but she's Mrs. Ellis's own, too. Well, there's something else to consider, too, Mr. Simpson. It's expensive adopting babies these days. Expensive? Well, I don't know much about this business, but I understand this well, is very... there's sim- always a certain amount of expense involved in such a procedure. There's legal work, physician's fees, adoption fees, why... A, dozen different items that all add up. Well, in that event, I'd like to make a suggestion. If it's finances that bothers you, I'm sure the Ellis's will no. be glad... Oh, it's no use, Mr. Simpson. I want my baby, and I mean to have her. But, darling, we can at least listen to Mr. Simpson's suggestion. What are we going to say, Mr. Simpson? Well, simply this. The Ellis's are willing to pay a sizable amount in order to be able to keep Betsy. Enough, in fact, to defray all the cost of adopting another baby and to secure the child's future. And your own, for a considerable period. And what would that amount be? Twenty thousand dollars. Twenty thousand? Oh, Arnold, no. I don't care how large the amount is. Can't you understand that it isn't money I want? It's my baby. I understand perfectly, my dear. But what could we do for Betsy? We're in rather poor circumstances, you know. And if we had our own baby with enough money to rear her properly, wouldn't it be best all around? Well, it is worth considering, Mrs. Dawson, and... Think of what you'd be doing for the Ellis's. I... I know. I, I know. But Betsy's mine, my very own, and it's she who I want. Oh, you're upset, darling. 
Believe me, I don't want you to think that I'm weighing money against your child. But there are so many other factors to consider. I tell you what, let's think it over and talk it over a little before we give Mr. Simpson our answer. There'll be no harm in that. Oh. All right. Fine. Now, is that satisfactory with you, Mr. Simpson? Say, uh, oh, well, uh, a day or maybe two or three days. Oh, of course. I'm sure the Dawsons will be agreeable. Here. I'll give you my phone number where I can be reached. So I scribbled my home number on a slip of paper and gave it to Arnold Dawson. Wondered if he'd check up the location and wondering also if he'd look up Attorney Simpson in the city directory. Then I remembered I hadn't given him my first name. There must be a hundred or more attorneys named Simpson in the L.A. area. But the way I had it figured, Arnold wouldn't bother to check anything. He wanted to get his hands on that 20 grand. Also, he wouldn't wait two or three days either. I was right. He called me that evening and said that he and his wife had decided to take the money and adopt another baby. Well, I got down to the office early the next morning and found Pappy and Carol waiting. I'd called Pappy the night before and told him what the score was and was therefore not surprised at the reception I got, which wasn't promising. Are you crazy, Chuck? Everything you've told us about your visit yesterday proves that the Dawsons aren't phony. Give me a for instance. Sure, I'll give you a for instance. Good. If they were working a racket, they'd ask for cash. And you told me last night they were willing to accept a check. I don't let him talk you out of it, Chucky boy. You keep out of this, Carol. I'm sorry. I'm not going to let him talk me out of it, Glamour Buzz. These two are phonies working the smelliest racket I've ever known. Be reasonable, Chuck. Agreeing to take a check They'd be dopes to ask for cash, Pappy. It'd be a dead giveaway. They're phonies. I can prove it. How? Number one, they were too willing, almost eager to have me examine that birth certificate. Is that your proof? Number two, they asked for two days and took two hours before accepting the offer. That a boy, Chuck. Uh, Carol, I've already told you. I'm not... sorry, Pappy, but Mrs. Ellis called me again last night and... I don't care if the Queen of Sheba called you last night. I'm not going to pour... 20,000 bucks down a rat hole just to hear the noise it'll make. Number three, I saw something on that birth certificate that definitely proves it was fake. Yeah, what was it? I don't know. Now, that's a good answer. You know what it sounds like? Sounds like Chuck Morgan trying to be cute. I'm not kidding, Pappy. The clue is on that birth certificate. I'm sure of it. But I've got to get my hands on the certificate and study it again. And the only way he can do that is to buy it with $20,000. Which means we'll expose the racket and have a whale of a story. And Mr. and Mrs. Ellis will be happy again. And my 20000 bucks will be gone. Pappy, I promise you it won't. If it is, you can take it out of my salary. Take it out of your salary? Why, that'll yeah, take Yeah, yeah, I know how many years it'll take. I should live so long. Will you stop being so hard to get along with and open up that checkbook, please? Well, uh, okay. But just remind me to shoot myself directly after lunch, will you? Hand me that pen. So Pappy wrote out the check for $20,000 with a trembling hand and an unhappy expression on his face, and I took it, and I got out of there before he changed his mind. I started for West L.A., and then suddenly I changed my mind. A thought had occurred to me, a very bright thought indeed, and instantly I felt better. I pulled up at the drugstore, phoned Carol, gave her some precise instructions. Then I phoned Bill Meggs at police headquarters and asked him if he could meet me for a round of golf at the Burnside Country Club. He could and did. I told him the whole story. It was at the ninth hole where there's a water hazard. Then I remembered what was on that birth certificate that made it a phony. I told Bill about it, too. He agreed I had a case. So Bill and I had lunch and we parted. It was 2.55 when I finally pushed the doorbell of the Dawson apartment. Oh, hello, Simpson. Come in. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Dawson's rather upset. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I I hope you're not going to change your mind, Mrs. Dawson. I... I don't know. Every time I think of my own baby... I... No, 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 stop. This makes me feel like a kidnapper. Perhaps if I talk to Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Ellis. Mrs. Dawson and I have made our decision, Mr. Simpson. Now, uh, let's get this over as quickly as possible. Brought the check, of course. Yes, yes, I have it right here. Excellent. Now, I've prepared a paper relinquishing any claims we have on Betsy. We've both signed it. Well, I'm not so much interested in such a paper as I am in that birth certificate. A birth certificate, Mr. Simpson? Of course. Without that, any claims you might make would be worthless. So I'm afraid I'll have to ask you for that certificate in exchange for this check. Uh, oh, y y yes, of course, I, I understand. And I may... Uh... Yes, I'll, I'll get it. 
So May went into the other room after the birth certificate. And sucker me didn't figure it out. She came back at a minute later. Here you are, Mr. Simpson. Which was when I made my mistake. I turned and... Arnold must have had a pair of brass knuckles hidden in his pocket. Nothing else could have hit me harder or knocked me cold or faster. Time passed. Or I suppose it did. I was in no condition to check. All I know is that when I could see again, there wasn't anything to look at except a crack of light which apparently came from beneath a door. Also, I was well trussed up, and the same old voodoo drum was beating its familiar tattoo inside my head. Then I heard a door open in the room beyond, and there was another sound, which was sweet, sweet music. Well, there's no one here, Pappy. No, and it looks like we're wasting our time. Well, let's get out of here. Wait a minute, Pappy. Listen. Hey, sounds like someone's in that closet. It's Chuck. Well, so it is. Well, fancy. Oh, fancy. Pappy, stop being funny. He's hurt. Here, here, Chucky boy, let me untie that gag. Mm. Pappy, loosen the ropes. Sure, sure. There. Chuck, what happened? Are you hurt? Don't touch my head, that's all. Just don't touch my head. Ah, uh, now, there you are, my boy. Yeah, you're as free as the wind again. Oh, thanks, Pappy. Did they get away? Who, the Dawsons? Yeah. Well, there's no one here but us, so they must have. Uh, you got the birth certificate, of course? No, but I remember what was on it that was phony. What was it? Before you answer that, there's just one question. Did they get the 20000 Yes, but don't worry. I'm not that dumb. What do you mean you're not that dumb? If they've got that check, what stopped them from cashing because it? Because I waited until almost 3 o'clock before getting here. They couldn't get to the bank in time. They'll have to wait until tomorrow morning to cash the check, and we'll be on hand to greet them. Well, you idiot. What do you, you mean, idiot? knuckle-headed idiot. No, wait a minute. Everything occurs to you but the right thing. Huh? This is Friday, and on Fridays, the Los Angeles banks are open all day. A quick call to Pappy's bank confirmed the fact that the Dawsons had been there and cashed the check, and a quick exit by me prevented Pappy from firing me on the spot. Twenty. 20,000 smackers. I began figuring how long it would take me to pay it back at the rate of 50 bucks a month, but lost track when I became 70 years old. After all, I'm no Einstein. Brother, I'd really pulled a boner this time. Well, I went back to the office prepared to face the wrath of Mr. Mansfield. But luckily, Pappy wasn't in. But good old Glamberpus was waiting for me with a kind word and a cheerful smile. Never mind, Chucky boy. Pappy will forget the whole thing as soon as he cools off. Yeah, yeah, but it's going to take more than my winning smile to cool him off $20,000 worth. Oh, fiddly-dee. You know Pappy. Sure, tomorrow I'm going to be saying it's been nice to have known Pappy. Oh, don't be silly. <laughs> silly, she Look, said. Look, I've got an idea that will make everyone feel better. Yeah, what's that? Well, in the disappointment of failure, all of us forgot the noble purpose of your venture. Please, darling, the don't Ellis's remind me. The will now be able to keep their little Betsy, and we haven't even told them. You know, you're right. Listen, give them a ring. Well, wouldn't it be better if we went out and told them in person? Huh? Well, after all, there'll be a good deal of satisfaction in seeing the expressions on their faces and hearing their thanks. $20,000 worth, maybe. Yeah. And also, it might be a good idea if you stayed out of Pappy's sight for a while. Oh, glamour puss, you're a genius. Let's go. So glamour puss and I headed for the address that Clara Ellis had given us. As we got near, I found myself looking forward to this experience. After all, I hadn't failed my purpose, not by a long shot. The Ellis's were going to keep their child, and by golly, that was worth 20 grand of anybody's money, even Pappy Mansfield. The Ellis's lived in a white stucco apartment house halfway up a hill on Melrose Avenue, east of Vermont. They had a ground floor apartment with an outside entrance. Carol rang the bell. Hello, Mrs. Ellis. Remember us? Why, uh... It's Mr. Morgan uh, and Miss Curtis. Yes. Uh, how's Betsy, Mrs. Ellis? Betsy? Oh, sh she's fine, just fine. Well, may we come in a minute? We've got some good news for you. Well, I... Uh, that is... Uh, could you make it some other time? Well, you don't understand, Mrs. Ellis. Our good news is about Betsy. You don't have to worry anymore. Oh. There was something wrong about this, something very wrong. Mrs. Ellis had suddenly lost her role of stricken mother and was either scared or mad. Why? I didn't have to spend much time trying to figure the answer to this one. The answer appeared behind Mrs. Ellis. The door to another room opened and two people appeared. One, a man carrying a suitcase. Clara, where's my... The man was Arnold Dawson and the woman, May Dawson. For about 
two seconds, all five of us stood frozen in a state of shock. And in that two seconds, a whole dirty picture was revealed to me as clear as a newly washed window. We'd been taken in by one of the smoothest rackets I'd ever come across. The Dawsons and Mrs. Ellis had conspired to extort $20,000 from Pappy Mansfield. There wasn't any little Betsy or stricken parents or long-seeking mother. It was all a gag. But it was the fact that they'd made a goat out of me that made me mad. I not only saw red, but all the other colors of the spectrum. It didn't make any difference that at that moment Dawson dropped his suitcase and reached for a gun. I went into that house like a charging bull. Out of my way, woman. Shut the door. All right, you two bit chiseler, you just missed your only chance. Make a sucker out of me, will you? It was over as quickly as that. Dawson was down and out, and I had his gun. The two females had been too scared to move, so now they didn't have a chance. Get Bill Meggs on the phone, Glamopus. If one of these stricken mothers makes a move, I'll blast her from here to Sunday. So that's how it was that a half hour later, Carol and I were driving back to KOP to bring the glad tidings to Pappy Mansfield. Pappy was alone in his office when Carol and I walked in. Hello, Pappy. Hello, Pappy. Oh, uh, um, hello. Uh, Chuck, uh, you and I have got to have a talk. But, Pappy, wait a now, minute. Now, wait a minute, Glamour, first. But... Let Pappy have his say. Go on, shoot Pappy. Well, I've been thinking about that $20,000. Yeah? I don't know, Chuck. I guess I was a little hasty. What? Well, after all, you did keep the Ellis's from losing their kid. Uh, uh, I mean, the, well, that was your intention, and I guess, well, I guess that's worth 20000 <laughs> Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, just a minute. Don't get the idea that I'm an easy mark. I'm not. One more dumb-headed deal like that. Happy, I love you. I not only love him, I'm going to kiss him to prove it. <laughs> now, look here, Carol, I'm an old sure, man. Yeah, uh, Pappy, and an old man shouldn't be pouring 20000 bucks down rattles just to hear the noise they make. So... Here's the bundle back again. What? Uh, hey, is is that real? Holy smoke, Chuck, what is this? It's your $20,000, Pappy, every dime. No. The whole thing was a frame, Pappy. There wasn't any little bet. Or stricken mothers. All three of them were in it together. Chuck and I went out to tell Mrs. Ellis she wasn't going to lose her daughter, and the Dawsons were there. So we called Bill Meggs, and I retrieved the doll. Oh, Chuck was wonderful. He licked them all. Well, yeah. and of course, two of them were women. <laughs> well, 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 I'll be... No kidding. Well, I'll be... No kidding. Well, now, come on, Pappy. You can think of something better to say than that. Sure I can. Well, I'll be... No kid. Say, Chuck. Yeah? I hate to admit this, but one of the reasons I didn't fire you was because I want to know how it was that you knew that birth certificate was phony. Yeah, how about that? Miss Curtis, Mr. Mansfield, under the circumstances, I'll be glad to tell you without undue delay. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Stop saying yeah, Glamour Pussy. It isn't lady like. Yeah. Yeah. When I read the birth certificate... I took it to the window to get a good look. I couldn't help noticing the watermark on the paper. It was dated 1950, which meant that the paper was manufactured that year. And since Betsy was supposed to be six years old, her birth certificate couldn't have been written on paper that wasn't made until three years after she was born, get it? Well, I'll be. No kidding. And so will I. No kidding. Yeah, no kidding. Come here, Glamour Puss. Uh -huh. Stand by for crime. Hi, Chuck Morgan again. You know, in a city the size of Los Angeles, where I work as a newscaster and radio station KOP, crimes occur so frequently, and law enforcement agencies operate with such a maximum amount of efficiency, that unless a crime has... An unusual angle or twist to it, it doesn't make particularly good copy from a news point of view. Well, we had one of those unusual angle crimes in L.A. about a month ago. It wasn't just one crime, it was a whole series of them. And what gave the twist was, oddly enough, lack of clues. No telltale cigarette stubs. No strand of hair or thread from a torn garment. Nothing. It was uncanny. I reasoned that if I could uncork the answer to this one, I'd really have a story that would make good copy. Well, it was on a Wednesday afternoon that I picked up Carol Curtis, my blonde secretary, at a downtown street corner. Carol had been going in for welfare work lately and had been attending a meeting. Hi, Glamour Puss. Hop in. Hi, Chuggy boy. 
Oh, Chuck, I've just had the most wonderful experience. That's all? I've been watching a demonstration by some disabled veterans. You know, boys who were wounded in Korea. Yeah? Glamopus, if I could crack this mystery crime deal, I'd have myself a real story. Sure. Oh, Chuck, you really should have been there. Gosh, it's amazing what they can do. One boy's name is Johnny Owens. He has two metal fingers for hands. Hmm. He can pick up a pencil and write, shave himself, tie his own tie, light a cigarette. Sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that bothers me and the police department is that each one of these crimes is worse than the one preceding it. If the mystery man keeps getting away with him, he's going to get cocky and murder someone just to make the cops look like monkeys. And we will be in the soup. Oh, gosh, I hope that doesn't happen. Yeah. Chuck, do you know what I think would be wonderful? What? If you interview Johnny Owens on the air, let him do his demonstration and you could describe it. Oh, it would give hope to so many other amputees. Yeah, sounds like a good idea. Look, I'm going to drop you off at the studio, then go down to headquarters and have a talk with Bill Meggs. Oh, I knew you'd feel that way about it. So I've already asked Johnny to come to your broadcast tonight. You what? Uh-huh. <laughs> you cute little rascal, you. You cute little rascal. <laughs> Five minutes later, we reached the studio. I put into a loading zone to let Carol out. And saw Pappy Mansfield, owner of KOP, coming out of the building. He looked concerned about something. Hey, Chuck. Chuck. Hey, wait a minute. Hi, Pappy. What's wrong? Get out to North Hollywood as fast as you can. There's been a murder. Bill Meggs is positive. It's your mystery criminal. Well, it had happened. Murder. The address Pappy gave me was a two-story house on Kling Street. When Carol and I... Of course, Glamorpus insisted on coming along. When we got there, it was late in the afternoon. A couple of squad cars were parked out front. And there was a usual crowd of curious people. The cop on guard at the front door waved us inside... We went up a flight of stairs and found Bill Meggs in a room at the end of the hall. Hello, Bill. Oh, hi, Chuck. Hello, Carol. Thought you two would be along. Hi, Bill. Does that finally happen, eh? Yep. This one's as bad as the others. Well, what makes you so sure it's the work of your mystery criminal? Same deal. No clues, nothing to go on. Driving me batty. Fingerprints? None. Uh, look, Chuck, take it easy on your broadcast tonight, will you? Yeah, don't worry about that. Fill me in, huh? Who's the girl? When did it happen? Name's Alice Carter. She's a stenographer for a law firm over on Lancashire. Uh -huh. Last night she was out on a date with her boyfriend. Got home late. Must have surprised the guy who murdered her. Well, what makes you think that? All her jewelry's missing. She'd recently inherited quite a lot of the stuff. The way I figured it is this. Alice came in quietly so as not to wake the other people in the house. Sneaked upstairs in her stocking feet and noiselessly opened the door. That's the reason she surprised the thief snitching her jewels. And that's the reason he killed her. That makes sense. How about her boyfriend? We've checked him. He's clean. Well, how about the other people of the house here? The place is owned by an old couple named Fairmont. They take in rumors to help the budget. There are three other girls besides Alice. None of them heard anything. None of them could think of a reason why anyone would want to murder Alice. Except that she had $10,000 worth of jewelry lying around. Carter, Carter. You know, Bill... I had an item on one of my broadcasts last week about an Alice Carter inheriting some family jewels. Quite a well-known family in San Francisco. That's right. Kid didn't have sense enough to stash him away in a safe deposit box. Huh. Want to see the body? Yeah, yeah. Let's have a look. If you don't mind, I'll stay here. Okay, Glenn, with us. Well, there she is. <laughs> Good-looking kid. When was the body discovered? Not till around noon. Mrs. Fairmont didn't come in to clean until then. I see. What are those marks on her throat? Could have been made by a pair of hands. Could have been a belt or a cord. Yeah. Anyway, she was strangled, which explains why she didn't get a chance to scream. You haven't uncovered anything that would give you a lead yet, Bill, huh? Well, nothing except the fact that whoever did this job must have been a fair to Midland second story man. Trouble is, second story men aren't usually murderers. That's true. Come on over here. Stick your head out that window and look around. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. Walnut tree and the vine against the house. Still, the guy would have had to have been pretty good to make it. How about footprints in the ground down below? There aren't any. Hmm. Well, it sounds like the work of our mystery man, all right. I suppose you've picked up all your suspects. The last two of them are down at headquarters now. I haven't much hope. Just a bunch of good, decent people like the murdered girl. 
I feel like a heel even questioning them. Well, a cop has to do a lot of things he doesn't like. So does a news reporter. Right now, I've got to go back and write a story about this for my 7 o'clock broadcast. Well, thanks for giving me the scoop on this, Bill, and don't worry about the way I'll handle it. I wanted to get away from there fast. Some time ago, I'd used an item about a second-story man named Benny Murdoch, a two-time loser. Two months ago, which is about the time the mystery crime man had begun his operations, Benny had been released. I knew where he lived, and I wanted to talk to him, just in the bare hope there might be some connection. Well, I did my 7 o'clock broadcast, gave Carol some work to do, and drove down to the address in Oxford Street where Benny Murdoch lived. It was a single-family frame house rather the worst for wear. A light showed in the rear window, so I walked around back and knocked on the door. What do you want? I want to talk to Benny's in. Who I say wants to see him? Chuck Morgan. Chuck? Well, so you're him. I don't know what you mean by that, but I'm Chuck Morgan. Is Benny home? Not to you, he ain't. On your way, you lousy squealer. Benny don't want no part of you. Hey! Get out of here. I'll call the cops. Why don't you, Bess? It'll save me the trouble. What do you mean by that, crack? How do you know my name? Benny mentioned your name several times when I interviewed him a couple of months ago. And you can take that crack any way you want to. Where's Benny? He ain't here. Where is he? None of your business. Okay, Bess, if that's the way you want to play. <laughs> Hello, Benny. Come on out and be sociable. Sure, Morgan. I was just going to do that anyhow. Sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Anything I can do for you? Benny, are you going to let this meathead get Take away? it easy, Bess. That ain't no way to treat a guest. Now, what's on your mind, Mr. Morgan? Just a couple of questions, Benny. Where were you last night when that girl out in North Hollywood was murdered? Well, how do you like that? Who does this guy Shut think up, is? Bess. I'll do the talking. You want to know where I was, Morgan? Yeah. Sure, I'll tell you. I was playing snooker over at Abe Berman's. You can prove that. Oh, come on, wait a minute. Abe Berman's joint was closed up two weeks ago. Eh, no kidding. Benny, are you nuts? You got an alibi. Tell the jerk. You let me handle this, Bess. All right, anything else you want to know, Morgan? Okay, Benny. So you hate my guts. We'll let it ride that way. However, get this through your head. I'm down here to do you a favor, nothing else. You're down here to do me a favor, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's one for the book. Well, just tell me about it, Morgan. I'm dying to hear the punchline. Sure, I'll tell you. The guy who murdered that girl was a second-story man. He was pretty good at his trade. Well, that's me, all right. There ain't no better second story man in the profession than Benny Murdoch. Benny, are you going screwy or something? Morgan here thinks you murdered the baby. Oh, let him. Let him think anything he wants. Got my reputation to think of. Somebody says they're a better second story man than me, they're crazy. I can prove it. Did you prove it last night, Benny? Don't answer him, Benny. Miss, I don't want to have to tell you again to shut your trap. Now, you get over there behind Mr. Morgan and don't speak to your spoke at. Now... Mr. Morgan, what was this favor you were saying you'd done for me? It isn't much. Sooner or later, Bill Meggs is going to remember that you're the best second-story man in the business, and he might come around asking questions. So? So. Unless you've got the answers, you better leave town. You see, Bess? That's Mr. Morgan's favor. He's giving me a tip. He's telling me to get out of town unless I got some answers. You're a fool if you listen to him. Well, maybe I am, maybe I ain't. Looks like Mr. Morgan's the right guy after all. He's given me plenty of time to take a powder if I ain't got the answers, huh? That's right, Benny. So I take it on the lamb. So then the cops figure I strangled that babe in North Hollywood whether I did or not. So they put out a dragnet and picked me up. Morgan, you got my everlasting gratitude for this favor you're doing me. Okay, Benny. How did you know the girl was strangled? You see, Bess, the guy's clever, too. How did I know the girl was strangled, he asks. He don't figure I listen to radio or read the newspapers, I guess. I didn't mention on my broadcast how that girl died. I wouldn't know about that, chum. I didn't listen to your broadcast. I listened to somebody else's. You know, Morgan, I'm kind of glad you dropped it on us tonight. You know why? No, tell me. Well, I never forgot how you helped send me up that last time. I used to while away the time and stir thinking what I'd do if I ever got things set up just right to pay you back. So you think you got things set up just right now, huh? You put your finger on it, pal. Things are set up just right now. Nobody asked you in here. You forced your way. You ain't no cop, and a man's got a right to protect his own home. You all set, Bess? All set, Benny. So now I know that Benny had been play-acting all the time. He was a mystery man in crime, and he wanted me to know it. 
because the knowledge wasn't going to do me any good. Bess was behind me. And Benny had suddenly produced an ugly-looking automatic. Don't move, Morgan. Stay right where you are. Bess, let him have it. Bess let me have it, all right. Something hit me on the side of the head and comets began zooming around the room. Far, far off, I heard Benny yell. Hit him again! This I'm enjoying! So Bess hit me again and I tumbled to the floor, still clinging to a shred of consciousness. Benny's leering face was above me. I saw his foot swing back and drive forward. And then a curtain of darkness closed down, obscuring everything. Eons of time later, I saw stars dancing around in an endless circle and heard distant sounds that were vaguely familiar. I closed my eyes and opened them again. The stars were still there. I realized they were real. I was lying on my back on the cold, cold ground looking up at the firmament. The sounds I'd been hearing were the normal sounds of traffic. I sat up and fell back again, conscious of pains and aches all over my body. After a while, I tried it again. This time, the world stopped spinning, and I managed to get out my lighter and look at my watch. 10.15. I'd been out cold for more than two hours. Benny had had his revenge with interest, and now I was going to have mine. I got to my feet and staggered toward a street light. A block away was a drugstore. Somehow I made it. The clerk stared at me pop-eyed as I swayed across the floor toward a phone booth. I found a dime and dropped it in the slot. Police headquarters. This is Chuck Morgan. I want to speak to Bill Meggs. Just a minute. Meggs speaking. Bill, this is Chuck. I've got your boy. He's Benny Murdoch, the second story man. He's practically confessed. Murdoch? Yeah. Chuck, you've missed the boat, but good. Murdoch was picked up last evening on a drunk charge and spent the night in a tank at Lincoln Heights. The way Benny Murdoch had played me for a sucker was something I didn't like to think about. Worse, there was nothing I could do about it, which didn't help my mood any. It didn't help it any further when I got back to the office and found Carol waiting there with a visitor. Oh, Chuck, I thought you'd never get here. Oh, what happened to your face? Nothing. Look, Glamorpus, I want you to dig up all the information you can oh, on a wait certain... wait a minute, ju- Chuck. First, I want you to meet Johnny Owens. Hi, son. Where's Pappy, Glamorpus? Hi, Mr. Morgan. Say, I'm glad to meet you. I never miss one of your broadcasts. They're swell. Thanks. Where's Pappy, Glamorpus? Oh, I don't know. Now, if you'll stop rummaging through that drawer, I think it might be a good idea if you and Johnny ran through your interview. What? What interview? Will you please pay attention? This is Johnny Owens, the boy I was telling you Johnny about. Johnny Owens? Who's Johnny Owens? It's the first time I ever heard his name. What does he do? Golly, I... I guess I'd better be going. You stay right where you are, Johnny. Oh, Chuck, you take this script and read it or I'll quit. Then quit. Oh, Chuck, please listen. Johnny's the amputee whose demonstration I saw this afternoon. Ampu... Oh, gee. I'm sorry, son. Well, that's better. Now, are you ready for a run-through? I can't do it tonight, Glamour Plus. It's impossible. There's a girl been murdered out in North Hollywood. If I talked about anything but that, I'd lose every listener I had. You know that. No, I don't know it. What Johnny has to say is more important to the American people than, well, just another murder. Look, folks, let me bow out of this one, will you? I didn't mean to cause so much trouble. Mr. Morgan knows what's best for his listeners. I'm sorry, Johnny. Please forgive me. Well, there's nothing to forgive you for. Well, I'll get along. Nice meeting you, Mr. Morgan. I'm sorry, son, but some other time, huh? Yeah, sure. Chuck Morgan, I should think you'd be ashamed of now, yourself. Now, look, Glamour, I Don't got... speak to me. I despise you. And I'm quitting as of right now. Good night. Well, this was great. This was wonderful. Besides feeling like a sucker, I now felt like a first-class heel. Well, I did my 11 o'clock broadcast... And I told my audience absolutely nothing more about the North Hollywood murder than they already knew. Well, after the broadcast, I drove out to Kling Street. With the help of the cop on guard, I examined the walnut tree and the vine outside the murder room window. It netted me nothing except a few marks made by the murderer in his efforts to scale the wall. I got back to my apartment about 1 a.m. and tried to get some sleep, but that didn't work either. Around daylight, I woke up in a cold sweat and phoned Carol. She didn't answer. 
I got dressed, drove over to her apartment, and spent ten minutes beating on her door. Then I drove out to her mother's place in Encino. She wasn't there either. At exactly noon, I got back to the office. <laughs> Glamour, puss. Hello, Chuck. I've been looking everywhere for you. Where the devil you been? Here. Here? What do you mean, here? Uh, I, I couldn't quit. You haven't hired anyone else, have you? I'm a plus. You're wonderful. Of course, I haven't hired anyone else. You know I couldn't get along without you. Oh, but I still think you're a heel and impolite, and, and I'm ashamed yes, of you. Yes, yes, and I don't blame you. I couldn't sleep last night for thinking about it. Oh, then you will interview Johnny? Sure, I will. Get him down here for a run through this afternoon if you want it. Oh, Chuck, do you mean it? Certainly. Oh, that's wonderful. And next time, remind me to listen to what my very beautiful secretary has to say. She's smarter than she looks. What? <laughs> Me. <laughs> well, at least I felt a little better. I took Glamorpus to lunch. And afterwards, she went out to get Johnny Owens. And I got Bill Meggs on the phone. I gave him my ideas on the subject and then went in to talk to Pappy. At 2.30 p.m., Carol called to say she'd located Johnny, and the two of them would meet me at my office at 3. At 3 straight up, they arrived. Hello, Chuck. Here's Johnny. Hi, Carol. Hello, Johnny. Hi, Mr. Morgan. Pappy, what are you doing here? Chuck asked me to sit in, Carol. Gosh, it's mighty decent of you to do this, Mr. Morgan. Bill, for heaven's sakes, what is this? Did all you people come in for a free demonstration before we went on the air? It amounts to that, glamour business. Johnny, this is Pappy Mansfield, owner of KOP. Hello, son. Nice meeting you, Mr. Mansfield. And Johnny, this is Bill Meggs. Hi, Mr. Meggs. Hi, Johnny. Johnny, Bill is from police headquarters. Poli oh, I see. Then you know. Yeah, yeah, I'm afraid we do. Chuck, what is it? What's wrong? You can't prove it. You can't prove a thing. I think we can, son. No, there weren't any clues. There were no fingerprints, nothing. No, there weren't any fingerprints. There wasn't even a smudge of a glove. That's... That's why we began thinking of people without fingers. Oh, Chuck. Chuck, it can't be true. I, I, I didn't mean to kill her. I didn't. She, she, she just stood there staring at my hooks. And uh, there was an awful look of horror on her face. She, she couldn't move or speak. She just kept staring at my hooks, and something snapped inside me. I just had to do it. I just had to show her that I could use those hooks like a normal person uses his hands. That's why you committed the robberies, isn't it, son? You wanted to show people you could do everything that anyone else could do. People always stared at me. Oh, sure, they'd watch my demonstrations, and they'd say it was great, but they wouldn't give me a job. They pitied me. They didn't have time, or they weren't willing to listen if there was anything else they had to do. Like you, Mr. Morgan, you didn't think it was important yesterday to have me on your broadcast. Well, I showed you. I showed you all. Johnny, you're right. I feel almost as much guilt in this as you do. It isn't you who murdered that girl out in North Hollywood, Johnny, any more than it's I. And a lot of other people who couldn't take the time to listen and understand. Now, wait a minute, Chuck. Let's take it easy. Murder's yeah, murder. Yeah, yeah, Bill, I know, no. I wish I didn't know. Johnny will have to pay his debt to society. But society's got a debt to pay to guys like Johnny Owens, and I'm going to... Johnny, don't do it. Stand back, all of you. I don't want to have to demonstrate on you how a guy with hooks can handle a gun. This is the end of the trail for me. I'm glad it's over. I've been trying to lick this thing ever since they shipped me out of Korea. I guess I chose the wrong way. I know it now, but maybe I'll have helped some other men who might be thinking along the same lines. Now, wait a minute, Johnny. Let me finish. It's... People like you, Mr. Morgan, who are in a position to do us a lot of good, remember that. I'll remember it, son. And, Miss Curtis, well, I've never met a nicer person. I wish they were more like her. She didn't offer sympathy or pity. She recognized that men like me are capable of doing the things any normal person can do that were self-reliant. Too bad I met her too late. You're lucky to have her, Mr. Morgan. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Johnny, Johnny. It's okay, Miss Curtis. Don't you feel bad about me. I'm doing what I know is right. So I'll let you all take it from here. So long, everyone. Pappy, stop him! Well, Johnny Owens is dead. He blew his brains out. 
with us standing there watching him and not being able to do anything. Maybe it's best, I don't know. Maybe it would have been better if he died in Korea. No, that wouldn't have been any good. Some of those boys had to come back to show us poor, smug dopes how unthinking and self-satisfied we are. It's too bad Alice Carter had to be a guinea pig. But that's life, I guess. Or death. Well, whichever way you figure it, the whole deal was a sorry mess. Pappy Mansfield stuck around my office while I dictated the substance of my 7 o'clock broadcast to Carol. There were some questions that Pappy wanted answered. There must have been something besides the fact that there were no fingerprints to cause you to suspect the boy, Chuck. Yeah, Pappy, there was. The marks on Alice Carter's throat to begin with. They might have passed for thumb marks or marks made by a belt or a cord, but there were two sets of them. A fact that meant nothing to me until I saw Johnny's metal fingers. Anything else? Yeah. I went out to the Kling Street house. I looked at the walnut tree and the vine on the side of the building. There were similar marks on both. Who else but a soldier, trained to lick the most hazardous obstacle course, could scale that wall so easily? I see. Ah, well, that's the way things go. Oh, by the way, Chuck. Yeah. In your 7 o'clock broadcast, you don't have no, to No, don't worry, it. Pappy, don't worry. I know how to handle it. Good. Well, I'll be getting back to my office. Don't take it too hard, Chuck. We won't, Pappy. So long, Pappy. He's nice, Chuck. Yeah. Yeah, he's swell. We haven't got much time. It's after 6. Yeah. I think I'll ad-lib this one, Glamopus. Just make a few notes. Okay, Chuck. You know, honey, self-respect is more important to a man than anything else. He can lose most anything else, even his arms, and lick the handicap. If he can hold his head up and look at his fellow man on an equal footing. In the case of Johnny Owens, that was almost wholly the responsibility of his fellow man, wasn't it? Yeah, it sure was, Clavopus. How blind can people be? We thought we were doing our duty by watching Johnny do his demonstration and complimenting him. And then pitying him. We forced him to prove he was our equal. Ah, honey, we owe so much to those boys. So big a debt. Do you think we'll ever open our eyes and realize that we've got to help? You're in a position to help, Chuck. More than anyone. That's the last thing Johnny said. Yeah. He said something else, too, Glamourpus. Yes, Chuck? Tonight after the broadcast, when I drive you home, and every night, remind me to tell you what a very swell person you are. That I love you very much. <laughs> oh, Chuck. Stand by for crime. Hi, Chuck Morgan again. You know, being a newscaster on a station like KLP is quite a responsibility. No matter whether you're liked or disliked, whether you're agreed with or disagreed with, you, you feel a sense of duty especially when you know your listening audience is extensive. That's why when this tip came in about that accidental death, I thought I couldn't pass it up. It wouldn't be fair to the people who paid me or the people who listened to me. The tip said that the accidental death wasn't accidental at all, but murder. It occurred at a remote section town on the Southern Express Railroad. If I drive up there, I get some interesting copy from my broadcast. Well, it so happened that Carol Curtis, my blonde secretary, and I had nothing better planned for the weekend, so we wound up the old jalopy and headed out into the desert. You know, darling, I think it's a wonderful idea going to Las Vegas for the weekend. You do? Yes. I have a new gown I'll wear at dinner tonight. It's a strapless black taffeta with gold embroidery. Think you'll like it? Mm. Chuck Morgan, you haven't heard a word I've said. What was that, Glamourpus? I said, do you think... What are we stopping here for? That signboard over there. Can you read it? Signboard? Hmm. Why, yes. It says squalling Indian. For heaven's sakes, what does that mean? Well, maybe it means there's an Indian over there who keeps squalling. Come on, we better get started. Oh, wait a minute, Chuck. Hmm? You're taking the wrong road. Las Vegas is up that way. Who cares about Las Vegas when there's a squalling Indian over the hill? Chuck Morgan, you turn this car around right now. You promised me we were going to Las Vegas. No, I believe my exact words were, and I quote, Glamour Puss, let's drive out into the desert this weekend, up toward Las Vegas. Unquote. Why, you, you fiend, you tricked me. Mm -hmm. You know I've always wanted to go to Las Vegas. Stop this car at once and let me out of here. 
What about my new dress? You don't know what it means to a girl to buy a new dress and then have no place to wear it. You stop this car at once and let me out. Well, what are you doing now? Stopping the car. What for? We're a million miles out in the desert and it's so hot I can hardly breathe. The least you can do is keep moving. <laughs> Glamour, Puss. You said you wanted me to stop the car so you could get out. What? I said that? Mm. Don't be silly. You know something, Glamour, Puss? What? You're really pretty good looking when you're mad. Oh, is that so? Well, let me tell you something. There are plenty of men who would... <laughs> what was that? Sounded like a shot. Yeah, there's a puff of smoke up there in the hill. Probably a hundred. Oh. Chuck, he's shooting at us. Yeah, our tires anyway. Glamour Puss, you're really going to get your wish. You ever work a jack handle before? Of course not. There's a first for everything. Out you go. I didn't want to alarm Carol, so I acted as though it were regular routine for me to have my tires plugged full of holes by unknown snipers. Carol sat in the shade of the car and made sarcastic remarks about my integrity while I sweated with a tire iron. And finally dislodged the bullet that had deflated the inner tube. It looked to me like a 30-30 special, which proved nothing. Well, I got the spare in place, and we headed down the road toward Squalling Indian. An hour later, we came to our destination. It was the most desolate-looking place I've ever seen. A cluster of yellow painted buildings, partly shaded by two cottonwood trees. The double tracks of the Southern Express ran by the front door. Well, this is just great. This is simply dandy. Shall I change to my new strapless gown with a gold embroidery now, or Glamour, shall I... Glamour, will you do me one small favor? What? Shut up. Why, the idea... Oh, quit it, I'm here on serious business, and if you... Here comes someone. Uh, hello there. Looking for anyone special? We're looking for anyone. <laughs> I know how you feel. Pretty desolate-looking place, isn't it? Yes. Come on inside. It isn't much hotter, and I can at least offer you a cold drink. Oh, that sounds good to me. How about you, Carol? Yes, sure. I can hardly wait. My name's Jim Gainsley. I'm the signal maintainer. Oh, here we are. Hi, honey. We got visitors. Oh, how wonderful. Visitors are always welcome here. Oh, this is Betty, my wife. Hello, Betty. Nice to know you. This is Carol Curtis, and I'm... You're Chuck Morgan, the news commentator. I'd know that voice anywhere. By golly, that's right. You are Chuck Morgan. How about that? Well, I didn't think my broadcast were heard this far away. Oh, we don't get you around here, but I used to live in L.A. Oh. Jim and I have only been here six months. Don't you find it terribly lonesome? Oh, Jim and I are never lonesome if we're together. It isn't as bad as you think. There's another family living in that house over there. Ted and Jane Maynard. Ted's the boss of the work gang. Oh. Hey, but how about that cold drink I promised? Great. And I think I'd better explain to you why we happened to drop in on you so unexpectedly. Well, sit down and make yourself comfortable first. All right. Now you're here, we want to encourage you to stay as long as possible. That's very nice of you. Uh, uh, here's that cold drink. Ah. Here you Carol? Are. Uh, Thanks. Take this one. Thank you. By the way, uh... That man that was killed up this way last week. Oh, that was a real tragedy. Uh, either of you or the Maynards got to talk to him? Uh, no, uh, none of us even saw the chap till it was over. And then, well, there wasn't much left to identify. Mm. No one ever found out who he was? No. I understand that an inquiry was conducted, but nothing came of it. Where did the accident happen? In the cut, about half a mile up the track. Apparently, the man had been walking along the tracks, heard the train, and climbed the embankment, then slipped and fell. There's a torn-out place at the top of the embankment that makes that theory almost a fact. Uh, what's your interest, Mr. Morgan? Well, it's remote. I had a friend who looked me up in L.A. two days before the accident. He's a geologist. Said he was coming up this way to look at some unusual rock formations he'd heard about. And you haven't heard from him since? No. Checked a couple of places without any luck. Oh, I'm probably borrowing trouble. Chances are he'll be calling me at the office tomorrow. Listen. It sounds like a train. Now, that just could be, Glamour Bus. There are a couple of tracks outside. <laughs> it's the Golden Streak Streamliner from L.A. to Chicago. Right on the nose, too. Phew. For a minute, I thought it was coming into the room. She's doing 90 when she passes here. And the same when it goes through the cut? Oh, a little better. There's a slight downgrade there. No wonder there was nothing left of the man who was hit. Mm. Uh, how about you two staying overnight with us? There's plenty of room, and when the sun goes down, it really gets cool. Sure, that's a great idea. We'd sure like your company. I'll help you carry your gear in. Chuck, you promised. Sorry, Glamour Puss. Thanks, we'll accept your offer. But there's something I want to say to you first. Oh, what's that? I don't think that man being killed was an accident at all. I think he was murdered. <laughs> Jim and 
Betty Ainsley weren't as startled by my murder theory as I thought they would be. They seemed more amused than anything. They were willing enough to go along with the gag, however, apparently feeling that to do so would assure them of our company overnight. Jim and I brought in our bags from the car. They gave Carol a room in their own cottage and assigned me another. Beyond me was a cottage occupied by the Ainsley's neighbors. I took off my hat, coat, tie, splashed some cold water over my face, and then strolled over towards the Maynards. Their cottage looked exactly like the one occupied by the Ainsleys, except that the low, drooping branches of a huge cottonwood shut it off from view of the rest of the buildings. I knocked and waited. Wasn't any response. So after a moment, I tried the latch. It opened. I went in. Anybody home? If anyone was home, they weren't admitting it. Standing in a corner near the bedroom door was a rifle. I crossed the room quickly, picked it up. Opened the breech and sniffed. The gun had been fired recently, and it was a 30-30 special. Drop that gun. What? <laughs> Wait a minute. You must be Ted Maynard. Never mind who I am. Drop that gun, I said. Sure, okay. Only don't go getting any ideas with that revolver you're holding until you find out who I am. Ted, who's this? I don't know. Some stumble bum thought he could get away with my rifle. Well, why don't you plug him? If you found him trying to steal something, you've a right to. Take it easy. I'm Chuck Morgan. My secretary and I are staying with your friends, the Ainsleys. Who told you they're our friends? They did. Well, aren't you? Now, how could you possibly live in a remote spot like this and not be friends with the only neighbors you have for miles? Try it sometime and you'll find out. Especially with two jerks like those Ainsleys. Oh. Well, Ted, what are you going to do about it? I don't know. I'm going to check with Jim and Betty Ainsley to find out if he's telling the truth, that's for sure. Let's flag down number nine and turn him over to the conductor for the sheriff at Vegas. Maybe the heat was giving me hallucinations, but it seemed to me that these two were creating a situation out of thin air for no apparent reason. They were nervous, on edge, desperate. But more important, they were scared and trying to cover it up. Maybe that's a good idea. Hand me that rope, Jane. Crazy though it seemed, they were planning to go ahead with their plan. Well, I hadn't driven away up here to be trussed up and dumped aboard a train on some phony charge of robbery. Oh, all right, Ted. I'll take that. Why, you... Let, let go of my wrist. Drop the gun. Ted! Ted! All right, all right. Now then, let's talk this over and see if we can't add up the score. What are you going to do? Push it off the embankment in front of the streamliner the way you did that poor devil last week? You won't get away with it this time. You were seen coming up here, you yes, know. Yes, I know. Seen by someone with a 30-30 special who plugged a hole in one of my tires. You can't prove that. Can't prove what? That it was a 30-30 special. I cannot only prove it. I can identify the gun it came from. I have the bullet in my pocket. Then, then if you can do that... Hey, hey, what's going on here? Thought I heard a commotion. You did. Your friends here accused me of trying to steal a rifle that belonged to them and threatened to flag down number nine and turn me over to the conductor. Oh, forget it, Mr. Morgan. Ted and Jane are just jumpy. Look, come on back to the house. Betty will have dinner ready in a few minutes. We'll have time for a couple of drinks. Yes, but what about Give these... Ted back his cap pistol and forget the whole thing. Later on this evening, he'll be over crying on your shoulder asking about news of the outside. Now, don't worry about it, Mr. Morgan. Everything's going to be all right. Maybe everything was all right as far as Jim Ainsley was concerned. But it wasn't all right for me. There was something cockeyed about this setup. It involved four people and a dead man. A dead man who'd been pushed in front of a train and ground into nothing. Who was he? What had he been doing out here in this remote settlement? And what connection did he have with these four people? Questions. Lots of questions. And so far, only one answer. I was sure the man had been murdered. I could prove it. But I couldn't prove who committed the murder nor who the murdered man was. It wasn't even a corpse to make things easier. The night fell, and it became cooler. We sat in the Ainsley's kitchen and ate dinner by the light of two oil lamps. Then I noticed a picture of Jim Ainsley on the wall, dressed in a naval uniform, and remarked about it. We in the Navy, Jim? Noticed your picture up there. Oh, the one on the bulkhead? Yeah. Uh, that's my brother, Mike. Most people make the same mistake. We do look a lot alike. Is he in the service now? No, he was killed in action off Korea. Oh, that's tough. Uh, it was tough losing Mike. It's all the family I had. 
We lived in Chicago. That's where I met Betty. She'd come on from L.A. with some kind of convention. You were married in Chicago? That's right. I had this chance to come out here, and Betty liked being near home, so I grabbed it. On our first weekend off, we're going to go to L.A. Jim's never met my folks. Oh, here's Ted and Jane. Hi, kids. Come on in. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, say, Mr. Morgan, uh, Jane and I want to apologize for our actions this afternoon. I guess you must think we're pretty stupid. Well, uh... uh we really wouldn't have put you aboard that train, even though you have submitted. See, Mr. Morgan, what did I tell you? How about a cup of coffee, kids? Oh, by the way, this is Carol Curtis, Mr. Morgan's secretary. I don't believe you've met her. Now, how do you do? Oh, how do you do? And now, how about the coffee? Oh, swell, swell. I like some. Smells <laughs> good to me. Me, too. Well, now I had the answers. This crazy pattern was beginning to straighten itself out. I knew who the dead man was and who had murdered him and why. All I had to do was prove it. The plan had already begun taking shape in my mind. I had to get back to Los Angeles, and I had to get back there fast. Because it was in Los Angeles that I could start the machine going that would bring one of these four people up to the bar of justice, charged with murder. Now, the conclusion of Stand By for Crime. Carol and I got back to Los Angeles shortly after 10 p.m. I left her at her apartment and drove over to KOP. Pappy Mansfield, owner and manager of the station, was still in his office. I told him where I'd been and what I wanted him to do. He wasn't much impressed. Oh, you're out of your mind, Chuck. The heat must have soaked through that thick skull of yours and softened up your brain. Now go on home and go to bed. Okay, Pappy, so you don't believe me. Then you don't mind if I sell the story elsewhere. Story? What story? You haven't got any story. I will have before the night's over if you'll give me some cooperation. But I tell you, Chuck, it's unreasonable. You can't prove there's been a murder without a body. Yes, I can, if the murderer confesses to his crime. Well, how about it? No. Okay. Then I'll peddle my wares somewhere else. Not while you're on my payroll, you don't. Then, as of now, I'm off your payroll. I quit. Hey, Chuck. Yeah? Come back here. I thought you'd see it my way. Oh, you did? Mm hmm Well, get this, smart boy. I'll make your telephone call for you, but the name of this radio station isn't going to be mentioned unless you come up with a real... Pappy and I had been through this sort of thing before. It was old routine. I'd threatened to quit or he'd threatened to fire me, and then we'd agree to go along together. So I knew I could depend upon him, and it was a comforting feeling. I got the information I wanted from the morgue in the KOP newsroom, and then headed back for the desert. It was after 2 o'clock in the morning when I reached Squalling Indian. There was a light in Jim Ainsley's cottage. Otherwise, the place looked deserted. That's you, Mr. Morgan. It's me, Jim. You began to think you weren't coming. Come on inside. Right. Yeah, where's Miss Curtis? She had enough, decided to stay in town. Your wife in bed? Oh, yes. And the Maynards? Well, they stayed till about midnight, hoping you'd be back. Ted said if he heard your car, he'd be over. Gosh, Mr. Morgan, what's it all about? Well, I got the information I wanted, and if things should... Oh, hello, Ted. Come on in. Mr. Morgan just got back. Yeah. I heard his car. So you brought your rifle along, Ted, expecting trouble? I intend to be prepared if there is any. Well, you can put the pea shooter away. You won't have any use for it. I'm keeping it. Suit yourself. Hey, yeah, that's funny. Must be trouble along the road someplace. Hello, Squalling Indian. Yeah, that's right. Who? Morgan? Yeah, he's here. It's for you, Mr. Morgan. Oh, thanks. Hello. Oh, hello, Pappy. What? Mm, I don't know. I suppose I could go up there and take a few measurements. Sure, sure, glad to. Call you back. Right. Okay, so long. That was Pappy Mansfield, owner and manager of Station KOP. He was oh, with... wait a minute. How could he be calling on that phone? It isn't even connected with outside lines. Pappy Mansfield, my friend, can do anything, if he thinks it's important enough. Well, gosh, Mr. Morgan, what's so important? What's he want you to do? I'm going up to the cut and take a few measurements. I think the information I'll be able to phone back to Pappy will be all that's needed to sew up this case. Oh, well, what case? Now, oh, look, Mr. Morgan, want me to go with you? I could run you up on my scooter. No, you two stay here. There might be another phone call. I won't be gone long. So 
So I started out alone, walking up the tracks. There was a crescent moon hanging on the horizon. This and a sky full of stars shed faint light, bringing out in grotesque relief the shape of the giant cactus and the yucca trees. Up ahead, the cut loomed vaguely, a slit on a ridge that gave a backbone to the desert where it slipped down into a salt sink. A cold wind whipped through the cut and penetrated the thinness of my jacket. Once I looked back, I saw that the lights in Jim Ainsley's cottage had been extinguished. Well, this was it. Either I had a crazy theory or I was going to turn up one of the best news stories of the year. I didn't expect the thing to happen when it did. I expected it to come from another direction and in another form. I reached the bottom slope of the embankment that formed the cut and turned off the tracks. When I heard a sound like the clanking of stone against metal, I whirled. There was a quick step behind me. Something squeezed through the air and then... All the stars in that beautiful sky crashed around my head and the crescent moon shot out of its orbit and left the world to darkness and to me. I don't know how long I lay there. But after a while, the moon got back into position and the stars returned to their velvet canopy one by one. I watched them for a while, thinking how beautiful they were, wishing that Carol Curtis were on hand to enjoy their splendor, too. Then it occurred to me that it was strange I didn't have to turn my head upward to see these stars. The answer was simple. I was already looking up. I was lying on my back. I tried to move and found I couldn't. That answer was just as simple. My hands and feet were tied. Worse than that, they were tied to the railroad track. No, it wasn't a bad movie. It wasn't a corny novel of 50 years ago. It was real. It was happening to me, Chuck Morgan, wise guy news commentator. And now came the payoff, the climax to this lousy drama. The train, the streamliner, rushing across the desert at 90 miles an hour. Its headlights stabbing into the sky. Its impersonal whistle blasting out. Shattering the desert stillness into a nightmare of sound. This couldn't be happening. I was watching one of those movies that used to give me goose pimples when I was a kid. In a minute, the audience would see that the train was on another track. I could feel the vibration of the onrushing demon in the rails. I saw it frantically. The raw edge of the rail flange began to rub the rope thin. I worked wildly, jerking my wrist back and forth, forgetting in this concentration for the moment the train, forgetting it until a beam of light flashed into my face, a red beam. I looked up. The signal tower, a hundred yards down the track, had turned red suddenly. The streamline was slowing down, coming to a stop. Suddenly, the ropes around my wrist parted. I untied my ankles, stood up, chafing my wrists. The streamliner's headlight showed me the man standing at the foot of the embankment. He had a rifle in the crook of his arm. You're not as lucky as you think, Morgan. They're still going to shovel up what's left of you after the train passes. Hello, Ainsley. I didn't think you'd come up with anything so corny as tying me to the rails. Why didn't you drill me with the rifle you stole from Ted Maynard and called it a day? Because I don't like corpses hanging around. They talk too much. Oh, of course. I should have remembered. Before I knock you off, suppose you tell me how much you know. Gladly. Anything to stall for time until the train crew gets up here. The train crew ain't coming up here. She only stopped because I got the signals crossed. You'll be underway again in a minute. I'm not too good at this sort of thing. Naturally not. You're better at signaling from the deck of a battleship. So you do know, huh? Yes. I've known for quite a while. You're Jim Ainsley's twin brother, Mike. You were married to Betty before you went to Korea. After you were reported missing, Betty married Jim. You came back, found your wife married to your brother, and killed him. It was Jim who was hit by the streamliner last week. Hello, Pappy. Look for no trip, Ainsley, but it always works out. Take my gun. Chuck Morgan. Over here, Pappy. Chuck, are you all right? Glamour, puss. Take a look at those stars. Aren't they beautiful? You 
probably guessed it was Pappy Mansfield who was responsible for the streamliner stopping its squalling in then, not the fact that Ainsley loused up the signals. Pappy never did trust me when he thought I was getting myself into a jam. Carol and I left squalling in then in the cold light of an early dawn, heading for the main highway. Naturally, Carol was full of questions, but this time I had all the answers. Let's begin at the beginning, Chucky boy. What made you suspicious in the first place? Why, the fact that Jim, or rather Mike Ainsley, said he recognized my voice. Didn't he? No, how could he? He lived in Chicago all his life. My voice couldn't reach that far. Betty had heard me in L.A., but her husband picked her up too quickly on it. Oh, but how did you know that Jim was Mike? Well, Jim, or Mike... Offered to help us bring in our gear from the car. The word gear in place of luggage is strictly a a Navy term. And then there was the picture of the sailor boy on the wall. That's right. Which Mike called a bulkhead. Navy again. Well, well, well. Now, who shot the hole in our tire? Ted Maynard. You see, Ted and Jane knew, or at least suspected, that Jim was a murderer. They were scared stiff. They knew if the Ainsleys realized their suspicions, the same thing would happen to them that happened to Jim. Well, how about Betty? Betty had to go along with the gag, too. Although, I think she did it by choice. She really loved her first husband, huh? Hmm, that's right. So when Ted saw us heading this way, he shot a hole in our tire, hoping we'd find out he did it and have him arrested and taken away from there. Glamour, puss. You have an astute mind. Oops. Here we are, back on the main highway. But, Chuck, why are you turning right? L.A.'s back that way. Glamour, puss. Las Vegas is this way. You're still going to have a chance to wear that black strapless taffeta with the gold embroidery. Oh, Chuck. What's wrong? What's the matter? I left it in L.A. Presenting Joel McRae as Jace Pearson in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, authentic stories from their official files. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tonight's transcribed case, dead or alive. At exactly 9.13 a.m. on Wednesday, April 16, 1947, the French freighter Grand Camp, carrying a highly explosive cargo of ammonium nitrate fertilizer, blew up in the harbor of Texas City, Texas. It was the first in a chain of explosions as chemical plants, tin smelters, and oil refineries disappeared in blasts and flame. Shortly after 1 a.m. the next morning, the major chain reaction was set off. The explosions rocking the city of Galveston, ten miles across the bay, where excited crowds gathered in the streets watching the raging, flame-pierced sky. X-ray, X-ray, Texas City death toll, 300, hundreds more missing, scores of bodies unidentified. Paper, mister. Yeah, give me one. Here. Read about it, unidentified dead toll, still bothered. Where are the names, Vance? Where's the list of the dead? Well, they only got a few of them identified. Well, is Ralph's name there? Wait a minute. No, no, he's probably all right. Oh. A working square like him would be. But he worked at one of the refineries. They're burning. Stop blubbering. You want to attract attention to me? No. No, Vance, no. But he is my brother. i got to worry about him, too, don't I? Yeah, yeah. Come on. Over here, into this doorway. Look at that blaze over there across the bay. What a spot to clean up. Money, jewelry must be laying around the streets. Just but wait. Vance, can't you crazy? There'll be police there. Rangers, you're in enough trouble now. Yeah. Yeah, Lil, you're right. But I'm getting out of it now, for good. And that place over there is going to do it. 
Maybe your brother Ralph is one of the dead they haven't identified. You gotta go there, baby. If he is, you'll have to identify him. If he is there, in with the ones they don't know. There's nothing you can do to help him. But you can help me. Vince, what do you mean? Well, if you find him there, baby, you can identify the body and say it's mine. Vince! You want me in the clear, don't you, baby? They won't be chasing after me if they think I'm dead, don't you see? But my own brother! What are you asking me to do? I'm asking you to do as you're told. If you want to walk out of me, go ahead. But if you don't, you're going to want me to keep on running for the rest of my life? <laughs> well, let him get me and send me to Huntsville for 10 to 20? Oh, I don't want anything to happen to you, Vance. You know that. Well, then show me, baby. Show me. You can't help Ralph if he's over there, but you can't help me, don't you see? I'll get out of here tonight, and I'll let you know when to meet me. Maybe at that resort place we passed near Lake Blue Water. We'll be free, baby. You and me, free from there on. But how? What will we do for money? Uh, that'll be taken care of, too. There's a safe in Landstone. I've been itching to get at it for a long time. One last box job, baby, and enough to see us through. Uh, now, go ahead, right now. And remember, if you find your brother, he ain't Ralph Brenner. He's me, Vance Young. And come back, pack up, and stay put till you hear from me. From then on, it's gravy. Nobody ever arrests a dead man. By Friday morning, April 18th, more than 200 bodies, many still unidentified, were laid out in the Texas City High School gymnasium. Texas Rangers, including Ranger Jace Pearson, were on hand to help distraught relatives make identification. You're sure your husband isn't in any of the other places where bodies are being held? No. No, Ranger. Mm. He may be all right. Lots of men have been so busy helping others, he, he may be one of those. Oh, if only he isn't here. Let's hope he isn't. The embalmers are still working on more bodies over at McGar's garage. Mm. It's the only place handy. Keep your hopes up, but don't hope too much for a while. I, I'll be all right. Might as well start looking through this next row now. They're, they're pretty bad cases. Recognize anything on this one? No. This? No. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry, ma'am. Are you sure? That ring on his finger. I gave it to him a long time ago. Yeah, I know. It isn't easy, but try and get a grip. I'm all right, Ranger. You better give me the name for the tag. His name is... Uh, Vance. My husband, Vance Young. Vance Young. The name burned in my mind like a branding iron. There was no time to ask her, and yet I had to ask. It was part of my job. I waited until we got out into the street and... There's some information I have to get from you, Mrs. Young, about your husband. All right. Did he... Did he have a criminal record? Uh, huh? Oh, hello, Kurtz. Captain Simpson wants us. Where is he? The mobile unit? Let's go. Well, I'll be glad when this assignment is over. I hope we never see another one like it. Yeah, I've helped with five identifications today. You stand there with somebody and see their life fall apart because of a freak accident. The woman who just left you, she finds somebody? Yeah, her husband. Kurtz, it was Vance Young. Vance Young? The knob knocker? Yeah. Looks like the explosion ended his case for our files. Don't you think we better check the body for prints and marks? Oh, you got it too badly. She identified him by a ring. Unidentified bodies give a knob knocker like Young a big chance to disappear. I thought of that too. Except for one thing. That woman's grief was real. She wasn't faking it. A week passed. A week of horror and nightmares. Till the fires in Texas City were controlled and stopped. And men with tight lips and grim courage started to rebuild the ruins. Most of us rangers went back to regular duty in our regular areas. Then one day, while Bud Kurtz and I had just finished a routine job and were driving back to headquarters, a call came through via short wave. KTXA to Unit 10. KTXA to Unit 10. 
Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead, KTXA. Unit 10, proceed immediately to Landstone, Texas, Arthur County. Safe of mercantile store burglarized there at 4 a.m. today. Crime reported by owner when store opened at 9.30 a.m. this date. Any lead on responsible subject? Subject unidentified but known to be one man working alone, according to information given by Watchman. Watchman was overpowered, being treated at Landstone Emergency Hospital. Units 10 and 6 proceeding to Landstone will keep KTXA informed. Unit 10, 10 4. Assignment Authority, Captain Stinson, KTXA Austin. Landstone, about 40 miles, Jace. Yeah. Knob knocking job, huh? Yeah. At least, though, there's one safe specialist we can eliminate right from scratch on this one. Who? Vance Young. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot about him. Dead men don't rob safes, do they? We reached the Landstone Mercantile store at 11.15, and Sheriff Joe Pastroni showed us through. Uh, These back rooms are used for storage. He came in through the back, went through that door over there to the general office. That's where the safe is. How'd he get into the building? Forced the watchman to let him in. Watchman patrols this whole area, door shaker. Has keys to get into all the stores if he sees anything that looks funny. And then he must have met the safe cracker outside. Yeah, I guess so. Watchman was pretty dazed this morning. But the doc is patching him up at the hospital. Deputy will drive him back here as soon as his head's fixed. Now, as you can see, been over everything for fingerprints. You find any? Sure, hundreds. They probably all belong to employees of the store. Best bet is to check the prints on the safe first. Already did that. Only two sets. Owner of the store and the bookkeeper. Well, that won't tell us anything, Jace, unless one of them robbed the store. Mm, That isn't likely. Better have a look at the safe now, Sheriff. Sure thing. Our last office back here. What make is the safe, Sheriff? It's a Will's Atlas, new model. That's a tough box, Jace. Steel and wrought iron plates and more alarm wires and the marionette show. Yeah, but a good safe cracker could divert the alarm circuit without tripping it. And the box is a cinch because he's got the wire holes to start working on. Here we are. You figured it, Jace. Back plate blown clean out. Yeah, and didn't even have to drill. Small nitro charges in the wire holes, and it was as good as having the combination. Here's where he jumped the alarm circuit. Need hookup, all right. You take the pictures of all this, Sheriff? Yeah, I can pick up a set of my office if you like. Thanks. Oh, Winky. Howdy, Sheriff. Rangers. I've been waiting for you. Uh, this is a watchman. How's your head? Well, Ashman ain't going to help it any, I'll tell you that. You going to get the fella? We'll be able to answer that better when the fingerprints are checked. Fingerprints? He ain't going to find any he left. He's wearing gloves. The figure, Chase. Yeah. Tell me, Winky... Would you recognize the man if you saw him again? Could you pick out his picture? Yeah. If I had his picture took with a sack over his head, I could. That ain't likely. You mean his face was covered? Had a sack over his head, like I told you. Holes for the eyes. He ain't gonna catch him by no fingerprints or pictures. Maybe you ain't gonna catch him at all. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Winky. Uh, Sheriff, would you mind going down to your office for prints of the pictures of the scene here? I'd like them sent on to my headquarters for an M.O. check. I sure. Take care of it right away. Uh, uh, what kind of check is an M.O. check, Ranger? It means modus operandi, Winky. All criminals have definite methods and habits. They're repeated on each job they do. Forms a pattern. Well, there's sure a pattern here, all right, Jace. Method of entry, where that circuit was jumped, sack mask, nitro charge, and the wire holes. Yeah, and it fits three men. Three safe crackers we've followed before. Yeah, there's Bert Larkin. He's still doing time in Folsom for a job he pulled on the coast. Yeah. And the other two are Jack Fontaine and Vance Young. Yeah, but Young is dead. That leaves us Fontaine. You, you mean you know who did it well, without nothing to tell you? Mm, there's plenty to tell us. The modus operandi can be almost as good as a fingerprint or a signature. I'll be winged. Maybe that fellow's going to pay off for slugging me after all. And for hurting my arm when he grabbed me in the alley there. How'd he grab you? Show me. Go ahead, show me. It, on you? Well, well, uh, let's see. He whipped my arm up behind me like this. Then he jabbed a thumb up behind my ear like this. <laughs> sure hurts, don't it? <laughs> sure does. Well, you can let go now. Judo still fits Fontaine, Jason. 
Yeah. Or Vance Young. He used it, too, on other jobs. When did he slug you? Uh, uh, after he, he made me open up the back door and let him in. You mean he sneaked up on you before you could draw your gun? Sneaked nothing. That's why I didn't get on to him at first. Heard him come walking through the alley toward me like he's taking a shortcut. You heard him? Yeah, it was dark. So I didn't see the mask until I lit a match. He asked for a light, see? Then he grabbed me. And he got me inside here and, and beat on me and kicked me. Chase, that doesn't sound like Fontaine. It wasn't Fontaine. He always sneaked a watchman from behind and they never heard him. He always wore sneakers. Well, then who... Vance Young. That match trick is Vance Young's. But Young is dead. Maybe yes, maybe no. But I know one thing. I'm going to find out. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. And now, we continue with tonight's case, Dead or Alive, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. I headed for Texas City in Galveston. Kurtz and I had no way to move until we knew for certain whether Vance Young was dead or alive. As we drove, I put through a request for headquarters to dig up some information. We were still on the road when KTXA came up with the answers. KTXA to Unit 10. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead, KTXA. Have information you requested. Woman who identified body of Vance Young in Texas City gave name as Lillian Young, residing at 410 Harbor Lane, Galveston. Deceased was wearing ring used in identification. Has subject Lillian Young claimed ring? No claim has been filed yet. Ring still being held at property claims in Texas City. Unit 10 also requested check on place where body identified as Vance Young was originally found. Body was among those recovered from debris of amalgamated refinery plant 7. Unit 10 believes identification may have been falsified. Possibility Vance Young still alive. Units 10 and 6 continuing investigation. May be tied in with robbery in Landstone, Texas. Proceed. Keep KTXA informed. Authority, Captain Stinson. Unit 10, 10 4. KTXA, Austin. You get that address, Kurtz? Yeah. 410 Harbor Lane, Galveston. If we're right, she may have cleared out by now, but we've got to try it. What do you want me to do? I'll drop you at Texas City. Get that ring and check every living person who worked at Amalgamated. See if any of them remember that ring and the man who wore it. Right. I better call KTXA okay, again and have that marriage record that traced. Find out when and where that woman married Young. What her maiden name was, everything we can get. To be in Texas City in a couple of minutes, I can start the check from there and bring the information to you where we meet. The Harbor Lane address in Galveston. I found the rooming house Lillian and Vance Young had lived in, but I was too late. Lillian Young had checked out the day before. The landlord showed me the room. They, uh, they lived here. Five, six months, all told. You get to know the husband very well? I'll tell you the truth, Ranger. I hardly ever saw him. Only time he ever left the place was at night. His wife said his eyes got hurt in the war or something. The, the sunlight bothered him. When did you see him last? When they moved out? No, no. He, he wasn't with her then. Last I saw him was, uh... Oh, he went out about a week ago. Night of the big blast over at Texas City. Cracked the wall plaster here. Are you sure you didn't see him after that? Oh, I'm positive. I, I don't think he ever did come back. Didn't even hear no talking from the room. Just just her. Crying an awful lot. I see. Did she decide to leave kind of sudden? Oh, like a jackrabbit hearing a hound dog. Left for work yesterday morning. Came steaming back about an hour later. Give me the keys, pack up, and left. Came back from work. You know where she worked? Yeah, yeah. She was a waitress. The uh, uh, Bayshore Diner. Bayshore Diner. Thanks. Hey, 
So she up and quit on me just like that yesterday morning. Right smack in the middle of the breakfast rush, too. Because the postman come in and gave her a special delivery letter. Who was it from? Who was it from? With 20 orders of ham and in the fire, I got time to read a mail? All I know is she leaves me the serving, the dishes, and the cleaning oh, and everything. Oh, stop beefing, Chuck. That little old gal had trouble. Yeah, yeah, you should talk. All you got to do is drive one cab. You don't have the serving and the dishes and the cleaning and everything. Why don't you find yourself a little old chaplain to hear your troubles and give me some coffee? Come on. Okay, okay. Maybe you can tell a ranger more about Lil than I can. Hanging around her, making eyes at her all day. You took her out when she left here. Is that right, driver? Did she leave here with you? Well, she hired my cab, if that's what you mean. Where'd you take her? Well, I took her home. Waited while she packed some things, then rushed her to the bus depot. She said somebody in her family was sick and she had to go help them right away. I guess that's what the letter was about. I was sitting there having my breakfast like I always do, and I... Yeah, I, yeah, I... I understand. But what about the bus depot? You know what bus she caught? The northbound toward San Antonio. Cut it mighty fine, too. Got there just about a minute before the bus pulled out. Would have made it a lot easier if she didn't make me come dashing back about a mile after we left here. Back here to the diner? No, back to the laundry down the street. Guess she had some stuff in there. Although, she didn't bring a bundle out with her. And then on top of that, she says she can't pay me. Not that I'd mind, except for the ten extra blocks back to the laundry. I could have put the flag back up as she told me beforehand. You say the laundry's right down the street? Yeah, about half a block. Thanks. I'll walk down. Hey, Jace! Hi, Kurtz. The fellow at the room house told me you came down here. Yeah, find out anything on that ring? Plenty. A couple of men who worked at Amalgamator recognized it. Belonged to a plant man named Ralph Brenner. Then it wasn't Young's. No. I got that rundown on Young's wife. Her maiden name was Lillian Brenner. The guy she identified was her brother, not her husband. Then that's why she was broken up. I knew that part wasn't an act. Come on. Where are we going? We're going into the laundry business. Yeah, she was real upset because the things wasn't ready, but you know how it was, Ranger. We was almost ten days behind because of Texas City. They was even using our delivery trucks for emergency over there. Some of our men left the job to help out. Yeah, yeah, sure, but uh, what did she leave here? Waitress uniforms? Oh, land, no. Diner up there has a regular uniform service. All she ever left here was men's shirts. Probably Vance's shirts, Chase. Yeah. Uh, real good shirts, too, Ranger. The kind you don't have to starch at all. And real fancy colors, too. Dude wouldn't want to be found dead in some of them. Did she say she'd be back to pick them up? Oh, no. She, she asked me to send them to her, COD. Said she needed the money she had on her for traveling. Shit's like that, you'd think her and a man was living off the top of the hog, but... Sure, she... sure, but uh, did she give you an address? Oh, yeah, I got it right here in this book. Hmm. Um, right here. She, she wrote it down herself. General delivery... Lake Blue Water. Uh, the shirts are ready now. I'm going to mail them out tonight when I leave. We'll save you the trouble. Wrap them up, and we'll deliver them for you. Kurtz and I headed for Lake Blue Water, towing our horses in the trailer, ready to follow Vance Young no matter which way he moved. It was dark as we drove into the town. The clock on the courthouse was just striking nine. Not many people on the streets, Jace. Looks like everything's closed up for the night, except for the moving the drugstore. Better find a place and turn in. Yeah, I think we ought to drive out of town, camp someplace off the lakeshore, walk the horses out for a while. I thought we were going to plant that laundry bundle at the post office in the morning, watch for a pickup. We are. Well, why not pasture the horses at the edge of town, find accommodations right here? If we stay in town overnight, it may start some talk. Talk drifts. We don't want to tip our hands. Well, I guess you're right. Well, let's get out to the lake and find a campsite. Uh, funny thing about Young's wife remembering his shirts. Guess it's force of habit for a woman. Strong thing, habit. His safe-cracking habits told us he was still alive. And now maybe her habits are going to make him wish he was dead again. <laughs> took the road for the lake, past the summer cottages skirting the shore on one side of it. Then as we rounded a curve and passed a house in a group of resort cabins, I spotted something. Hey, 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 Jace, what's the matter? I saw something. Wait till I back up. Headlights 
picked it up as we came around this curve. There. Look at those. All I see is the back of a few cabins, some wash on the line. Look at those two shirts on the end of the line. <laughs> Look like a couple of rainbows, even in this light. Hey. That's the kind of color scheme Vance Young goes in for. Shirts we have in the laundry bundle are just like those. Lights on in a few of the cabins. Yeah, I'm going to leave the car here while we have a look at those shirts. Horse trail will make too much of a racket if we drive in. Yeah, no chance of being taken for tourists with that on the back. Better cut the motor and douse the headlights. Yeah. What was the laundry mark on those shirts we've got? 410 mark. That was the number of their house in Galveston. Come on. Let's see if we can find it on that line. And close the car doors easy. Right, right. Take one of them down so we can get a better look at it. Yeah. What's the matter? Yeah, clothes pin stuck. There, I got it now. Hold it low to the ground. I'll cut my hand over the flashlight. Good. There it is. 410. These belong to our boy, all right. Quite a few cabins, Chase. He's in one of them. That's all we have to know. Come on. Start with this end cabin and go right on down the line. We better be ready for anything. Here's the first stop. Dark, Chase. Yeah, you have to feel your way around. Seem to be anybody living here. Ah, this one's empty. Now let's move All on. All right, you. What? Hey, uh, put that flash out before I fire. No, no. no. Oh, Rangers, huh? I'll put it out. That's better. Who are you? Uh, name's uh, Ed Bullock. I own these cabins. Uh, just walking back from the boat dock with a couple of guests. Saw you sneaking in the dark. You, uh, you looking for a place to stay? No. We're looking for a couple named Young. Oh, well, that's funny. It was Mr. Young who spotted your shadows. Hey, Mr. Young. Was that Young just with you? Yeah. Oh. Uh, him and his wife was right behind me when I flashed light in here. They spotted us, Jace. Yeah. Come on. Hey, hit my boat. Somebody started my boat. Is that the only boat you got down there? Only one with a motor. There's a canoe. We're not going to reach him, Jace. They'll head across the lake. How far is it, Bullock? A mile and a half. Kurtz, grab your horse from the trailer. You can beat him around to the far side if you ride hard. When you get there, flash your light. That'll keep him from trying the shore over there. Right. What about you? I'm taking the canoe. And hurry! We'll get him! Uh, uh, Ranger, I better go up back to the office. My wife... You can uh... faint later, Mr. Bullock. Right now, I need you. Yeah, I'm going out in the canoe. Flash your light from this shore. They'll think I'm here and they won't dare land on either side. But make sure you don't turn the light on me in this canoe. All right, Bullock. Turn your light on as soon as I get out in the open water. I paddled the canoe toward the center of the lake. Kurtz beat the youngs around to the opposite shore, and I could still hear their motor when I saw the beam of Kurtz's light. The youngs saw it, too. The beam wasn't strong enough to reach them. But I heard the boat in a turn, and the motor came back toward me for a moment. Then it went dead on the dark water. What just you stop the motor for, Vance? Shut up. They're waiting for us on each shore. But their lights don't reach us. Thanks, we gotta get out of will here. Will you shut up and let me think? There's a little wind, the boat will drift to the far end of the lake. But that's so slow. Well, what do you want me to do? I can't swim like you can. Well, why can't you use the oars? Because the oar lock squeaks, stupid. They'd hear them. Yeah, there's only two of them. They can't cover the whole shore. Gee, Vance, it's so dark. And I... Hey, I hear something. What? Something in the water. You're crazy. Can't you see the lights on the shore? Well, thanks, I do hear something. I see it. It's a canoe. What? Don't move, Young. I'm coming into your boat. What? You? I'll drain you with this oar. Look out! The ah, ah, ah. Ah. <laughs> Help! Help! Let go of me. Let go! Oh. Hey, have you, have you got him? He, he can't swim. Where he's going, it won't matter. Grab on the canoe and kick for shore. I got a nice dry shirt waiting for him. Convicted of robbing a safe in the mercantile store, Vance Young, on the basis of his previous record, was sentenced to life imprisonment at Huntsville.
This is Joel McRae. Many of our listeners, particularly in Texas, recall these cases we've been dramatizing, and some listeners have sent in questions about the Rangers. Yes, it's true. There are only 50 Texas Rangers. And to show you how busy these Rangers are, from 1946 to 1948, the Rangers handled nearly 17,000 cases. With Texas as big as it is, that means they cover about four times greater area per man than any other police officer in the world. Next week, we'll have another authentic story I believe you'll enjoy very much. Like the others, it's based on their official files, adding further glory to the Rangers. Hope you'll be listening. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Your Saturday hour of fun begins in four weeks. You will hear Judy Canova and this young man. Hello, everybody. This is Dennis Day. On October 7th, I'll be starting a new season on the air. There'll be fun for all, lots of music and laughs. So join us for our opening show October 7th, over your favorite NBC station. Yes, beginning October 7th, hear Dennis Day, then Judy Canova, in an hour of fun on NBC. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Transcribed. Presenting Joel McRae as Jace Pearson... In Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers. Authentic stories from their official files. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Living Death. It is 2 a.m. on the morning of October 3rd, 1948. A man stands in the brush on the American side of the Rio Grande, watching another man wading rapidly across the river from the Mexican side. Come on, come on, hurry up. Senor Green! Senor Green, where are you? Over here. And shut up. Oh. I almost fallen. Never over. mind. You crazy wearing a white sombrero with that moon? What is the harm, Senor Green? Nobody see the ego but you. Don't be too sure of that. Somebody followed me down here. I don't know whether I shook him or not. The border patrol? No. Hijacker, maybe. You got the package? Oh, see. Right here. 20 ounces. Okay, here's your money. 200 an ounce. $4,000. Oh, gracias. We'll be another shipment next week. Yeah, I know. I'll meet you here again on the 12th. Same time. And be a little more... You all right, amigo? Someone does follow you? Quiet. Son came from over there. He's moving this way. You'll have to crawl through that clearing first, and the moon's right on it. You going to use a gun? What do you think I got it for? Keep quiet. There he is, coming into the moonlight. Yeah, and he doesn't see us. Just like a sitting duck. You hit him, senor? Yeah. But it looks like I didn't hit him good enough. Yeah, that's better. Grab his leg. Senor, Grab I his don't... leg and get him out of this clearing into the brush. The longer it takes to find him, the better. Uh, see. Uh, senor Green, <laughs> we shouldn't have met this place again. You will not be safe. All right, drop him here. <clears throat> no, we can't use this place again. It'll be too high. I must get back across the river. Where do we meet next time? Next time, use our old crossing. Nearly heat us. 
I'll get lost. Fast! The body of the slain man was discovered, but for two months there was no clue to point to his killer. And then suddenly another man was shot to death on the streets of a small town in West Texas, and Captain Stinson of the Texas Rangers radioed Ranger Jace Pearson to meet him at the county morgue. Bodies on this slab, Jace. Shot right through the heart, eh, Captain? Yeah. And here's our ballistics report. Forty-five caliber slug. Look at the markings on this photo of it. Uh-huh. All right. Now look at this ballistics photo. This is a report on the slug they took out of the man who was killed near the border two months ago. Yeah, I see what you mean. Both slugs came from the same gun. Mm-hmm. Autopsy report on this man completed yet? It's being typed up. We'll have it in a minute. Clyde Mooney's waiting for it. Mooney? Oh, is he here? Yeah, I sent for both of you. Mooney worked on the border killing. Since it's tied up with his second killing, I thought you'd better tackle it together. Suits me fine. You got some special reason for wanting to see the autopsy report, Jace? Yeah. Look at the body. Marks on the left forearm. Look like the kind we usually find on drug addicts. Well, we'll know in a second. Now, here's Clyde now. Howdy, Captain. Hi, Jace. Howdy, Clyde. Good to see you, boy. Heard you talking as I come in, Jace. You hit it all right. Here's the autopsy report. Man was a drug addict. Yeah, he's probably just as well off dead then. Bullet ties this one right up with your border case, Clyde. Guess we're both after the same killer. Yeah. I've been hunting wetbacks for two months trying to find the man who was toting the gun those slugs came from. Anything else you boys want to see here? No, Captain. No, Captain. Well, let's get out of here, then. Any identification on this man we just saw, Captain? Not a thing. He was dressed like a hobo. Doesn't fit any of the descriptions on missing persons reports, either. Might help a lot if we knew who he was. Because I can't see this killing as a job done by a wetback. Why not, Jason? It was somebody sneaking across the border. Tracks weren't clear by the time the body was found down there, but there were tracks. Both your cars in back near mine? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Jace, go ahead with your theory. Well, a wetback sneaking into the country to earn a few dollars working is usually too poor to own a gun, unless he's carrying something across with him. You thinking of those hypo marks, Jace? It adds up to me. Narcotic smuggling. Might be. Man who was killed in my territory could have been shot because he spotted somebody crossing with the stuff. Well, that's possible. But how about the dead man we just left? He wasn't shot near the border. It looked like he was down and out. Had the habit, but not the price. Might have tried to get some narcotics by threatening to expose the peddler. I'll buy that, Jace. How about you, Clyde? Best bet I've had so far. All right, Jace. Where are you planning on starting? Back along the border. What, my area? No. Killing was made that spot too hot for them. They'll go back to some old crossing that's cooled off. I know a few, and you probably know a few. Well, yeah. Place west of Laredo. Then there's uh, Devil's River. That's been quiet lately. Yeah, and the Castellon area and the Big Bend, up through Lajitas and Redford, it's a big border. Yeah, so the sooner we get started, the more of it we can cover. If you're dragging a double trailer, Jay. Suppose I load my horse in with charcoal. We'll use one car. Good. Let's go. Mooney and I covered the old smuggler crossings one by one. Weeks passed, and we hadn't found anything by the time we reached the Big Bend. We were riding the river near Lajitas. Getting kind of late, Jace. We ought to make camp turn in. Yeah. Might as well quit this spot tomorrow. Move on toward Redford. There's a good campsite ahead. Clearing near that clump of honey mesquite. <laughs> You've got eyes like a cat. We can make radio contact when we get back to the car tomorrow. Cap may have something for us. Yeah. What was it he said he'd check on? Narcotic possession cases. Trying to pin down areas where the drug traffic seems to be the heaviest. Man who's smuggling narcotics must be picking up for a central distributor. Well, it could be just a small operator. A well, small operator's business wouldn't warrant the risk of crossing the border. Whoever makes the pickup is working for a boss. Well, why couldn't he be the distributor making his own pickup? A oh, big boy would play it safe. Stick somebody else's neck out, not his own. Ah, here we are. Ooh, ooh, Charlie. Ooh, boy. Yeah. <sighs> You want to get the bedrolls off, Jace? I'll strike a fire, get some chuck cooking. No. No, let's skip the fire and eat cold. Why? We're moving out of here tomorrow. I'd like to watch one more night. It's too quiet here. 
Haven't been reports of any trouble in this section in almost three years. We haven't even spotted a wetback trail. Okay, no fire. Might as well let the horses drink before we hobble them. Come on, Charco. Come on, boy. I want to rub Charco's legs down tonight. Leche Gia's been cutting him up. Yeah, I got a few nasty scratches myself. Had a boy. Drink up. You looking for something over there, Jace? Yeah. Let the horses go for a second. Come here. Bring a flashlight. What is it? Slight depressions in this mud bank. Just barely saw them. Flash the light. Yeah. They were tracks, all right. Not much left, though. Something else here. A piece of paper half buried. Must have been stepped on. Hmm, brown. Looks like that brown stickum paper they use to seal packages. Oh, no. this is the kind of paper a bank uses to wrap money. Look, there are traces of blue on here from an ink stamp. Yeah, can you read it? No, maybe the lab at Austin can. Anybody who tore a band from a packet of money in this spot must have been counting it. Yeah, this isn't exactly a business neighborhood. Let's stake out, boy. We found some kind of a crossing, and it may be the one we're looking for. We didn't dare move out of the area. We took turns sleeping and keeping the horses out of sight as much as possible. At night, we crept out along the river, moving slowly under cover. Five nights now, Jace. Maybe they won't cross again in the same spots. I know. A mile above or below us, and we'd never even see them. We found tracks in a couple of places along here. They might... Oh, one of our horses thought we had something for a minute. Clyde, that isn't one of ours. It's coming from the wrong direction. Put your ear to the ground. I don't have to. I can hear him coming now. It can't be our horses. They're hobbled on the one we hear is moving free. Come on. Don't show yourself on the riverside. That's where his contact will come from. Coming now, there's something moving in the water out there. It's a few hundred yards down. Our horses would have to be up the other way. We'll have to try it on foot. We haven't time to go back and get mounted. If they make a fast pass, we'll never get there in time anyhow. We'll have to risk a little noise. That moving horse will cover our approach until he stops. Step it up. The contact is across to this side by now. I can't see him out there anymore. Wait. Wait. The horse is stopping, too. Diego? Oh, here, senor. Come on, give me the stuff. Here's the money. Well, they're not wasting any time, Jace. No. Let's go. Hold hey, on. Get going, Diego. Run. Get up, boy. I'll get the one in the river, Jake. Stop that horse. Come out of that water. You get him, Clyde? He, he shot at close range, Jace. I had to kill him. We've got to leave him and get after that rider. Let's get to the horses. All right. Only we've been 50 yards closer to him back there, Jace. He went over the ridge up ahead. We can pick up his trail up there. I could swear I hit him when I fired. I hope you did. Narcotic traffic's the filthiest thing on earth. Oh, here's the ridge, Jace. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, oh Charco. Oh, boy. Yeah. Look where we have to track. Uh, Mesquite and greasewood. Oh. Ground as hard as rock. Won't be much of a trail here, Jace. It'll take us hours to cut back and forth looking for soft spots. Yeah, no time for that. Get off. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's going to be too bad if I didn't hit him. A blood trail's our only chance. Yeah. They'll find another contact for narcotics across the border. Sure they will. Unless we get to the man we're after. He's the only one who can lead us to the ring on this side of the border. And we've got to get to him before he gets rid of that package. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Today marks our first Sunday broadcast. And we sincerely hope that all our old friends who listen to us on Saturday night will be with us at this new Sunday time. Also, 
We extend a cordial welcome to our new listeners and hope that you'll be with us every Sunday at this time. Now we continue with tonight's case, Living Death, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We combed the ground for a blood trail, and we found it. Not much, but enough to follow. It led through the mesquite and greasewood, but the rider knew the country. He'd been weaving through the roughest spots. He's a smart one, Jace. Yeah, slowing us down all the way. Got a good hour on us by now. And an hour is too long. He's probably just using that horse to get to a car someplace. We can't waste any more time trail cutting them. No. He must have headed for cover someplace to take care of that wound. General direction seems to be northeast. We'll have to gamble on it. Okay. Let's ride. Get up, Charlie. After two miles, we reached a road and picked up the trail again. We had horse tracks to follow now, and they led to a dilapidated barn near a rundown ranch house. He was here, all right, Clyde. Blood in the hay and his torn cloth ripped a piece off his shirt to make a bandage. He knew this spot and headed right for it. Must have been here before. Yeah. But we're still way behind him. Yeah. Main road's only a mile or so from here. He's gotten to his car by now. The ranch house is dark. Well, let's wake him up. He might have seen something or heard something. Leave the horses here. Okay. This place sure has gone to seed, Jason. Yeah, it's a big house. It's falling apart. Fences sagging, no stock. Must have been a nice ranch once, though. Uh, isn't anymore. Man gets his living from the earth, you'd think he'd take better care of it. Here's the house. Open up. Hey, wake up in there. Who is it? Texas Rangers, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you. Just a minute. There was an electric power line to the house, but when she opened the door, she was carrying a candle. The inside of the house was almost barren. What do you want? We're looking for a rider who came through here tonight. He stopped in your barn. You see or hear anything? No, I didn't. You rent out a horse to anybody? (laughs) A horse? Range, if I had a horse, I'd have sold him for food for my kids. Uh, Sorry we have to bother you, ma'am. It's all right. What difference does it make? You know anybody around who... Ma'am. Would you mind holding your candle over the mantle of this fireplace? Why? Jace. That picture. That picture was a photograph of a man. The face was younger, full and healthier than when we'd seen it last. But there was no doubt about who it had been. Jace, that's a picture of the man we saw with the cap, the body, and the morgue. The mo- <laughs> Take it easy, ma'am. Take it easy. Mama, I'm sorry. When? When did you see him? Oh, he can't be, Daddy. He can't be. I'm afraid he is, ma'am. And you'll help us a lot if you'll tell us who he was. Jack Prentice. My husband. Oh, my poor kid. Oh, why didn't you report him missing? Because he left me two years ago. He'd sold and lost everything we owned. He was sick, half crazy, acting like a madman. I don't know why I didn't do anything. He'd never been like that before. You got any idea at all what started it? A friend of his. Jack was all right. He was a good husband and father till he took up with Virgil Green. Then he spent more time with him than he did with us. He must have been gambling or something. We had a good place here. Then it was all gone. This isn't going to be easy to take, ma'am. Your husband wasn't a gambler. He was a drug addict. Oh, oh, why didn't he tell me? I begged him to go to a doctor, but he wouldn't. When did you see him last? I told you, two years ago. When Virgil Green left him, Jack left right after him. You seen this Virgil Green since then? No. You know where Green went after he left here? No, but it must have been Chino. I got a couple of letters from Jack came from there. And then he stopped writing. Not even a word to his kid. Ma'am, 
I hate to leave you like this, but we'll see if we can get you some help later on. Nothing can help anymore. Not for me. But I'd beg for my kids. Uh, you won't have to. You'll hear from us. Come on, Clyde. We gotta get the boy who gunned her husband, Jace. We gotta get more than one. We gotta get them all. The whole ring. There'll be a hundred more like her husband. Dying slower and worse than he did. You think this Virgil Green is the link? It must be. Fits the cards we've been playing. Jack Prentice couldn't raise money to buy from Green. Threatened to expose him and Green killed him. Then he killed the man near the border, too. Gotta try to pick up Green at Chino. He knew this place. It's a fair bet he's the man we've been chasing. Get up, Charcoal. Oh, boy. Taking him is gonna be a pleasure. We can't take him. Not until we find out if he still has that package. We better knock on these ponies until we get to our car. Uh, Get up, Charcoal. Oh, yeah. Got to the car, but before we headed for Chino, I put in a phone call to Captain Stinson. All right, Jace. I'll have a ranger plane pick up that bank wrapper and send it to the lab. It may be a bank in Chino. Well, that fits with a few other things. My checkup shows a heavy drug traffic in and around the Chino area, and the town where Prentice was killed is only 60 miles from Chino. Good. That narrows it down. Uh, see if you can dig up a Chino address on Virgil Green while we're driving up there. He's only two hours ahead of us. If we can burn up road, we may reach there almost as soon as he does. Let you know by radio, Jeez. I'll head for Chino myself. Thanks, Captain. We'll see you there. We were less than an hour out of Chino when our short wave came through with Green's address. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead. Address of subject Virgil Green is Greendale Ranch, State Highway 39, 14 miles west of Chino. Got it. Any report from lab on bank money wrapper? Stamp on money wrapper restored by Austin Lab. Money and packet came from Chino State Bank, Corner Main, and Crockett in Chino. 10 4, Unit 10, clear. KDXA, Austin. That's all we need, Jace. Yeah. We can get Green in sight before he unloads that package. It was dark when we reached the Greendale Ranch outside of Chino. We'd made up time on Green's head start because we saw a car and horse trailer pull into the ranch just ahead of us. A man got out of the car and limped up to the house, and he was carrying a package. Walks like a man's been shot in the leg, Jace. Yeah. Don't turn in after him. Go on past the ranch. Okay. Where do you want to stop? Where we can watch the house and keep the car shielded. Well, there was some heavy brush on the other side of the road just across from Green's place. All right. Turn around and go back. We'll keep an eye on him from there. We kept a watch on Green's house all night, but nobody showed to pick up the package. The next morning, Green came out and got into his car. We followed him into Chino. He's pulling into a parking space up near the next corner, Jace. Yeah, slow down. He's getting out. He's got the package, all right, sticking out of his pocket. Park here, quick. He's going into that building on the corner. Come on, before we lose him. Hey, a street sign, Main and Crockett. And he went in there, Jace. Chino State Bank. That's where the money wrapper came from. Don't go in. Just walk around the corner. We can look through the bank windows. There he is, Jace. Last counter, the rear of the bank. Safe deposit boxes. Going through the rail into the vault. Must have a box he's going to plant the stuff in. We going to grab him? No. Wait he comes out. But he won't have it on him then. We got enough on him. We can pick him up any time. You gotta stay with that package until we know who gets it next. Hey, he wasn't in there long. He's coming out. The yeah, package isn't in his pocket now. All right, get out of sight, there. Yeah. He was in there just long enough to open up the box and drop it. Yeah, you've seen the package now. Drift around to the front of the bank. See that nobody leaves that vault with it unless you follow him. Okay, where are you going? 
to meet the captain and get a court order to open that vault. We got the order. Then we waited until the bank closed and the employees were out. We got the president of the bank at his home and took him back to open the vault. Narcotics, eh? Most distressing, gentlemen. Oh, come in, please. All right. Which box is Green's? 421, right here. Want to open it for us? Why, of course. What? Say. It's, oh. it's empty. Now, couldn't you have made a mistake, Ranger? No. Clyde, are you sure that package wasn't taken out? Positive, Jace. I watched every single person went in or out till the bank closed. Our order covers the rest of these boxes, doesn't it, Captain? Yes. All right. Let's open them all. We found what we were after, but not the way we expected to find it. The stuff was there, all right, but it had been split up into smaller quantities. Owners of these boxes must be names you have on your list of dope peddlers then, Captain. I'll check that on the bank records. Yeah, but how'd this stuff get split up? Green wasn't in here long enough to do it. No, he couldn't have done it. Miss Key would only give him access to his own box. They have to be done by somebody with a set of duplicate keys. Somebody working here. Well, that's impossible. Only the head cashier and I have duplicate keys. Were you in the vault after the bank closed? No, sir. I haven't been in here all day. That's the truth, Jace. I could see him through the window. And then the head cashier's our boy. He's the distributor. And a pretty clever distribution scheme, too. No direct contact, and he has access to the vault after the guard has left. If he's handled those packets, there'll be fingerprints on them. What's his name and where does he live? His name is August Weber. He's got a big ranch over near Estrella on Highway 39. And I know how he got it now. He said he was making money on investments. Investments? He meant a black market in human souls. Come on, Clyde. Let's get him and Virgil Green. We found the house. An elaborate building on a fine ranch. There was another car in the driveway when we pulled up. Hey, Jace. That car in front of the place. Yeah, we're in luck. It's the car Virgil Green was driving. Light around the side of the house by that French door. Maybe they didn't hear us drive in. Good. Let's slip up on that side of the porch and find out. Might be able to take him easy. Uh, don't count on it. Cold-blooded killer like Green. He'd keep on killing as long as he has a gun. <laughs> We slipped up to the French door. It was locked and we couldn't see through it. But their voices drifted out through an open window. I'm telling you, Weber, my leg is infected. I gotta see a doctor. Have him report a bullet wound. You want me to die? I could put a bullet in you, too. Well, let me know when you want to try. I've done a little killing myself, Green. Only I've been smarter about it. Nobody's caught me yet. All right, Clyde. Let's kick a hole in this door. All right. Don't move. Ranger. Don't reach. Uh, Clyde, you hurt that? My, my side. You, you're hit too, Jace. Blood on your head. Yeah, just a neck. Come on. I'll get you to a hospital. How about... How about them? Leave them for the coroner. They're both dead. The gun found beside the body of Virgil Green proved to be the murder weapon the Rangers had been seeking. Narcotics peddlers having safe deposit boxes at the Chino State Bank were rounded up, and they admitted they had been supplied by August Weber. They were tried and sentenced. The traffic in living death was halted. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. A friend of mine returned recently from a visit to Texas. While he was there, he'd seen a Texas ranger, and he asked his host, a rancher, what the requirements were for a man who wanted to be a ranger. 
The host looked thoughtful for a moment and said, Well, I'd say if a man could ride like a Mexican, trail like an Indian, shoot like a Tennessean, and fight like the devil, he might have a chance to get in. <laughs> well, I hope you'll be with us again next week. Same time, same station. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Barney Phillips, Larry Dobkin, Byron Kane, Ken Harvey, and Lillian Byam. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, hanging by a thread. At 9.15 on the morning of May 5th, 1947, the telephone rang in the sheriff's office in the little town of Finney, Texas. Sheriff Hanson answered it. Sheriff's office, Hanson speaking. Sheriff, this is George Hawks. How are you, George? What can I do for you? Nothing now. Nobody can. Uh, how's that? I just called to tell you I'm going to kill myself. What did you say? You heard me. It'll take you 20 minutes to get out to my place. By that time, I'll be dead. Now, now, wait a, wait a minute, George. What? Hello? Hello? George? Uh, operator? Operator? Yes, sir? Oh, this is the sheriff. That caller just came in here. Where was it from? One moment, Sheriff. Uh, if this is someone's idea of a practical Hello, joke... Hello, I'll... Sheriff. Yes, yes? Yeah. That call was placed from 317 out on Gum Creek Road, the residence of Mr. George Hall. <laughs> Sheriff raced out to the Hawks Ranch and found George Hawks dead, hanging in the barn. Then he made another discovery which prompted him to put in a call to the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case and drove to the Hawks Ranch to meet Sheriff Hanson. Jace, am I glad to see you. Howdy, Sheriff. It's been a long time. Yeah, a month of Sundays. Now, I hope I didn't call you down here for nothing, Jace, but this looks mighty fishy to me. So I want you to take a look at the body. Hasn't been taken down yet? No, I put in a call to the coroner, but he was out somewhere. I left a message for him to come out here as soon as they could locate him. How'd you find out about the body, Sheriff? I got a phone call, Jace, about 9.15. Said it was George Hawks and he was going to kill himself. I thought maybe it was some joker, so I traced the call. And? It came from here all right. So I drove out fast as I could, but George was dead. Hanging by the neck in the barn. No pulse. Body's still warm. Sheriff, I know you didn't call me down here to investigate a routine suicide. What's the catch? Well, I'm getting all that. Come on the barn. 
This is just the way he was when I found him. You notice that's a wire he's hanging from, not a rope. Yeah. Cut off the clothesline, probably. Yeah. How do you know? Guest, I saw the clothesline had been cut, part of a dragon on the ground in the yard. <laughs> you rangers don't miss much, do you? Not if we can help it, Sheriff. Well, I want to show you something I found. Look at this, right under the body. Mm, it's an oil drum. Right. And the exact position I found it in, on its side. Now, you'll notice, Jace, that it's the only thing near enough that George could have stood on while he put the wire around his neck. And here's the rim marks where it stood on the straw before it was tipped over. Yeah, only he didn't stand on it. Look at this end of the drum, thick with dust. Hmm. Now, look at the other end. Dusty, too. Jace is not a sign of a footprint on either end of this oil drum. You're right, Sheriff. He couldn't have climbed up in the loft and jumped, or that wire would have taken his head off. Yeah, that's what I figured, and that's why I called you. What about fingerprints? Oh, well, couldn't find any, just a few smears. What does it spell to you, Jace? Just one word. And an unpleasant one. Murder. I got my camera out of the car and took pictures of the body. And we took down the broken clothesline and nosed around for more evidence. The sheriff went up to look over the house while I combed the barn. How'd you make out up at the house, Sheriff? Nothing, Chase. Absolutely nothing. No note from George... Everything tidy, no sign of a struggle. Funny nobody's around. Who would be ordinarily? His wife, Millie, and one of the hands. He had two men working for him last I heard. How are you coming, Jason? I found a couple of things, but not the thing I want. What's that? The tool that was used to cut the wire he's hanging on. All I found in the barn here was this pair of rusty pliers. Well, couldn't they have been used to cut it? No, Sheriff, they wouldn't cut butter. Beside, the cut's too clean. How about footprints? No luck yet. But I think I've found what the killer stood on to string the body up. What? The stepladder. I found it under the tool bench. Been used lately. Marks in the dust where it had been dragged out and then pushed back. Well, what are you fixing to do, Jace? Going up the ladder and take a look at the beam where the wire's looped over. Here, here, I'd better hold it for you. It's pretty rickety. Thanks. Find something? I think so. What is it, Jace? Look at this. Stuck on a splinter where the wire went over the beam. It's a piece of black thread. Yeah, black wool thread. <laughs> well, are you a string saver, Jace? In a case like this, yes. Let's take a look outside. Mm -hmm. What about a motive, Sheriff? For suicide or murder? Either. Well, can't think of a one offhand. George was a pretty normal guy, happily married. Didn't have any enemies that I know. How about those two hands you mentioned? Well, this new one, Brad Johnson, been working for George about six months. Only met him a couple of times. Seemed to be all right, in a quiet sort of way. And the other? <laughs> Old Tom, oh, he's okay. Drinks a lot. George used to fire him regular and then take him back when he sobered up. There's no good footprints in the yard here. Nope. Ground's packed pretty hard. Oh, Sheriff, hmm? car coming up the house. Is that the corner? That? Uh, well, no, that looks like... Well, sure, that's George Hawk's car. That's Millie driving it. Mrs. Hawks. Come on. We'll have to tell her, Sheriff. This is the only part of the job I really hate. Yeah, I know, Jace. Sheriff, what are you doing out this way? And... Oh, morning, Mrs. Hawks. This is Ranger Pearson. Howdy, ma'am. Ranger? What's happened? What's the matter? I'm sorry to have to tell you, Millie, but George... Something happened to George? Yes. He's dead. Oh, no. <laughs> Come on, oh, Mrs. No. Hawks. We'll take you to the house. <laughs> believe he'd do it. Mrs. Hawks, when did you last see your husband? Just a few hours ago at breakfast. How did he appear at breakfast? I mean, was anything wrong? Was he upset about anything? Well, 
Yes, there was a big fight at breakfast. I've never seen George get so mad. A fight? Between you and your husband? Well, all four of us went on it. Old Tom and Brad was there, too. They're the hired hands. How did it start? I cooked breakfast for the four of us, like I always do. Old Tom was late, so we'd started to eat. When we were about through, old Tom came staggering in. He was half drunk. Again, huh? Yes, Sheriff, again. Then he and George had this big row, and George fired him for being drunk. Go on. Old Tom was fighting mad. He gets mean when he's been drinking. He started making all kinds of wild accusations. What kind of accusations, Mrs. Hawks? Lies, Ranger. All of them lies. He said he wouldn't have been drunk if Brad hadn't bought liquor for him. Brad? Well, that's what he claimed. Said Brad got him drunk on purpose, so he... Oh, it was awful. So he could what? Well, it's a lie, Ranger. What did he say, Mrs. Hawks? Well, old Tom said to Brad, I wouldn't be drunk if you didn't buy me this stuff. You're always trying to get me out of the way so I won't see you... So I won't see you playing up to the boss's wife. Then what happened? Well, Tom left. and My husband started swearing and threatening Brad, accusing him of what Tom said. Brad said it was lying, and George threw some money in his face and told him to get off the place that he was fired, too. What did Brad do? I thought for a minute he was going to hit George, but he didn't. He went outside, and a few minutes later, I heard his car start, and he drove away. By this time, George was in a terrible rage. He even threatened to kill me. So I grabbed the car keys and ran. Did he ask you where you were going? Yes, he did, Ranger. I told him I was going in town to see Mr. Harris, the lawyer, to see about getting a divorce. What time did you leave? About 8.30. Ranger, you said you found him hanging in the barn... If it was suicide, why are you asking me all these questions? Because I don't think it was suicide, Mrs. Hawks. I think it was murder. (laughs) After the coroner and the doctor arrived, the sheriff borrowed a horse from the corral, I got charcoal out of the trailer, and we headed for Tom's shack up in the hills. There it is, Jace. Just around those rocks. At Tom's horse, Sheriff? Grazing out back? Yep. He's around someplace. Up, Charcoal. Yes. Yeah. I just can't see old Tom as a killer, Jace. He ain't the type. Huntsville's full of them, Sheriff. Killers who aren't the type. Oh, 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 oh Charcoal. Oh, oh, boy. Let's try the front door. Okay. All right, Tom. Open up. He's not here, Jace. I can see through the window. Shack's empty. <laughs> what the... Somebody's shooting close by. Maybe Tom. That shot came from back up in that draw. Come on, Sheriff. There he is. Back by that clump of trees. Is that Tom? Sure is. Hey, he's running toward the trees. Hold it, Tom. There we are. I'll put one over his head. Ah. Yeah, he's starving. See what he's wearing, Jace? Yeah. Black sweater. Now, what's all the commotion? All right, Tom. Throw down that rifle. Sure. Sure, Ranger. But, uh... What for? Why didn't you stop when I told you to? Well, to tell the truth, Ranger, I didn't hear you. I'm kind of deaf. I heard you shot, though. Yeah, that's right, Jace. He's hard of hearing. What's that, Sheriff? Oh, never mind. Why did you shoot at us, Tom? Shoot at you? Why, I never did no such thing. What were you doing, then? Ain't no law against a man killing himself a rabbit for supper. All right. Get his rifle, Sheriff. Let's go. Huh? Where to? To your shack first. We're going to have a long talk about George Hawks. I tell you, Ranger, I didn't know George was dead until you told me a minute ago. Uh, What call would I have to kill him? If he was killed, he was my friend. You don't seem very clear about what happened this morning, Tom. Well, I... I was a bit foggy. I had me a couple of nips. But I do remember George getting mad and firing me. What happened after that? Well, I took a few more out of the bottle in my saddlebag. I don't remember much after that. I must have rode up here and fell asleep. Woke up a while ago. I was hungry and I went out to get me a rabbit. Tell me, Tom. Do you often draw a blank when you've been drinking? Do, do I what, Ranger? Have a blank space. Do things you don't remember anything about later. Oh, I suppose I have once or two. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't do it. I couldn't have killed George. He was my friend. These your wire cutters on the table, Tom? Oh, yeah, they are. I'll take them. And I think you'd better come along to town with us. You are listening. 
listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson at our new Sunday time. We hope that our many friends who have listened to us at the earlier hour will continue to be with us each Sunday. And for those of you who are hearing our program for the first time, we extend a warm and cordial welcome and invite you to be with us each Sunday from now on. And now we continue with tonight's case, Hanging by a Thread, an authentic story from the piles of the Texas Rangers. The finger was pointing straight at Tom. When we got back to the Hawks Ranch, there was a man in the back lot feeding the hogs. It was Brad Johnson, the third witness at the breakfast fight. While the sheriff took Tom into town, I got Brad's version of what happened. And then he threw the money in my face, Ranger. Thirty dollars. Told me I was fired. I wanted to hit him, but I didn't. Then what, Brad? Then I got my duffel bag, threw it in my car, and drove off. Where'd you go? To Finney. Drove around town for a few minutes, and then I went to the White Spot Cafe and had a cup of coffee. What time was this? When I was in the cafe? Oh, about 9.30, I guess. Why'd you come back here? Well, somebody in town said that George had killed herself and that the coroner was on his way out here. So? Well, I figured if it was true, there wouldn't be anybody to do the chores. We fired old Tom, too. And Mrs. Hawks always treated me so friendly. Well, so I come out to do what I could. Yeah, very nice of you. Tell me, Brad, is there anything between you and Mrs. Hawks? No, sir. That's a lie, Ranger. Never even spoke to each other except at mealtimes or say good morning. What are you planning to do now? Well, I don't know. Have Mrs. Hawks till she can get somebody, I reckon. I see. Well, I gotta be moseying along. Oh, uh, don't leave town without letting me know. Oh, I I won't, Ranger. I'll be around. got the evidence off to Austin and then went to the White Spot Cafe. Brad had been seen there at 9.30, and Mrs. Hawks had been with her lawyer half an hour before. I radioed headquarters that I was staying over in Finney, and about 9 that night, I got a phone call. Hello? Jace, Captain Stinson. I've got the report on that stuff you sent in today. You got a pencil? Sure have, Captain. Shoot. On that black wool sweater, the thread you sent in the envelope matched all right. It's definitely off the sweater. How about the wire cutters? I'm afraid I got a disappointment for you there, Jase. They couldn't get a match. I'm afraid the murder wire wasn't cut with the tool you sent. Are you sure, Captain? The boys in the lab are. They made sample cuts with every millimeter of those blades and couldn't match up a single one with a murder wire. Oh. What kind of a fix does that put you in, Jase? Oh, I'm not sure. Well, thanks, Captain. I'll keep in touch with you. All right, Jase. Good luck. going to need more than luck. Things were really getting tangled up. It was about 4 a.m. when I finally dozed off trying to dope it out. Then at 8.30, I met the sheriff in his office. Well, you look like you've been through the ring, Jace. Hotel bed's too hard for you. No, but I didn't get much sleep trying to figure this Hawks thing out. Looks like we'll have to let old Tom go, Sheriff. Why? What's up? The lab says Tom's cutters didn't cut that wire. They didn't? No. Of course, old Tom could have used other cutters, but in his stupor, I doubt if he'd be that clever. Uh, well, I hate to complicate things more than they are, Jason. What do you mean? Karna called a little while ago. He sent in his report over with one of my deputies. Should have been here by now. His verdict is suicide. Suicide? Oh, that doesn't make sense. No, apparently it does to him. We'll know when the report gets here. Yeah. George Hawks, deceased. Climbed up a stepladder, put a wire around his neck, and then placed the ladder neatly under a workbench 12 feet away. Mm-hmm. My dusty oil drum snoring things up, Jason. Huh? Considerable. Hello, Sheriff. Mm. Howdy, Ranger. Hi. Morning, Joe. Did you get it? Yep. I had to wait while the coroner signed it. Here it is. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Anything more I can do, Sheriff? Uh, no, not right now. Well, I'll go get me some breakfast then. Yeah, let's see. No marks of violence on the victim's body. Autopsy disclosed no brain injury. Death probably caused by strangulation. Coroner's conclusion, suicide. Signed, G. Parker Coroner. Hmm? There it is, Jace. It couldn't be. Now, here's something from the doctor. I examined the body at 11.30 a.m. 
It was my opinion that death occurred approximately three hours previously. I'm in... Hey, wait a minute, Sheriff. Well, what is it? That'd make it about 8.30 when George died. What time did you say he called you? At 9.15. Great suffering! Sheriff, are you sure it was George who called? Well, now that you mention it, I, I'm not sure. I said he was George. Well, could it have been somebody else? Yeah, I suppose so. It's beginning to piece together, Sheriff. Whoever it was could have killed George, then called you and tried to sound like him. To establish an alibi. Exactly. And then pop up someplace else a few minutes later. Like the White Spot Cafe. I'll call you later. Well, where are you going, Chase? Back to the Hawks Ranch. When I pulled up to the ranch, Brad Johnson was running water into the big trough near the barn. Well, hi, Ranger. What brings you out this way? I want to talk to Mrs. Hawks. We're releasing Tom. Coroner's report came in a few minutes ago. Suicide. Is she around? Why, sure, she's up in the house. Okay. Oh, I... I just happened to think. Charcoal, my horse here in the trailer, hasn't had a square meal since I left headquarters yesterday. Is there some hay around that I could give him? Why, sure, Ranger. Some fresh bale just inside the barn there helps sell. Thanks. I'd be glad to pay for it. No, no, forget it. I'm sure Mrs. Hawks wouldn't mind. Oh, uh... Have you got something to open one with? Why, sure. Here. Here's my cutters. I took the cutters into the barn and made some cuts on a wire sample. After I gave the cutters back to Brad and fed charcoal, I spoke briefly with Mrs. Hawks, and then I tore out for the lab in Austin. By one o'clock, I got the results. Here it is, Jace. Take a look. The wire's matched, Johnny. See for yourself. That dual microscope never lied to me yet. The left one's the murder wire. The one on the right is one of the samples you brought in. That's it. Well, look at those striations. It's a perfect match. Thanks, Johnny. Take care of this stuff. Got to get back to Finney pronto. Oh, will you do me a favor? Sure, Jace. Call the sheriff at Finney. Tell him I'm on my way and I got something hot. I'll be there in two hours. Well, Jace, you sure made good time. What did you find out? We got positive proof the murder wire was cut with Brad Johnson's cutters. Brad's? You going to pick him up? Not right yet, Sheriff. Why not? We only know that Brad's cutters were used. We don't know he used them. We got to be sure. What are your plans, Jace? I've been thinking. Those stories that Mrs. Hawks and Brad told me, they were alike, all right. Too much alike. What do you mean? A couple of times they used the exact phrases. Mm -hmm. What about Tom and the black thread? We'll keep an eye on him, but I think he's clean. He could have caught his sleeve on that beam doing anything. Pitching hay or anything. Yeah, he could have. Well, uh, what do we do now? We gotta catch him alone. Brad and Mrs. Hawks. When they don't know anybody's around, we got to hear what they say to each other. Maybe after the funeral. It's this afternoon, four o'clock. You know where it's being held, Sheriff? Sure, out of the ranch. It'll be a graveside ceremony. Where's the cemetery? Clear over on the other side of town from the Hawks' place. Yeah, it'll take them a while to get over there and back. Sheriff, while they're at the cemetery... You and I go into the ranch and fix up a little surprise. There. And I'll be all right for that one behind the window shade. Why three microphones, Jace? Wouldn't one do? Not if they wander around the house while they're talking, Sheriff. I want to hear everything. Yeah, but how do you know that Brad and Mrs. Hawks will talk? How do you know they'll even come into the house? I don't know, Sheriff. I'm guessing. And my guess is that after the funeral's over, somebody's going to let his hair down. Hey, it's almost five, Jace. They'll be coming back soon. I'm finished in here, Sheriff. Now all we have to do is string the wire to the stake out. Come on. We'd hidden my car in a lane down the road and set up our equipment in a clump of trees close to the house. Three neighbors' cars drove up, then Brad's. We watched him as he fed the stock. About sundown, the last of the guests left the house. There go the last of them, Sheriff. Can you see Brad? He's been in the barn the last few minutes. Hmm. There he is, Jace, heading for the house. Good. Put on your earphones, Sheriff. I want you to hear this, too. There he goes, up on the porch. Yeah. Shh. Oh, take 
me away with you, Brad and I. Well, tonight. Billy, I can't do that. You know it. Why not? Why can't you? Well, the plan, baby. We've got to follow the plan. Now, look, if we went away together now, there'd never be no time. We've got to let it go. Brad, I can't spend another night in this house. Not alone. I can keep seeing his face. You holding him. That look of his when I put the pillow over his face. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I told you to shut up. Look, you, I put a lot of hard work on us. Our alibi's got him clear off the trail, and I'm not going to let him get back on, you hear? All right, Sheriff. I've heard enough. Let's take him. You cover the back, Sheriff. I'll take the front. Okay, Jase. All right, in there. Open up. Ranger Pearson, open up. What do you want? You know what I want, Brad Johnson. Well, he's not here. I know different. Okay, Sheriff, let's search the house. All right, Jase. I don't know what this is all about. You'll find out. Men in the kitchen, Jase. All right, Sheriff, work this way. Ranger, what's the meaning of this? He's not in the back of the house, Jase. Maybe he's... What was that? He was upstairs, Sheriff. Sounds like he jumped from up there. Come on. Don't see him. He didn't run for his car. Couldn't have gone far. Maybe he hit for the highway. That's... What's that? Chickens in the barn. Something scared them, and I think I know what. Come on. If we play this right, we've got them trapped. I know you're in there, Brad. Come on out. All right. Dark is pitching there, Jason. Turn on your flashlight, Sheriff. Take the other side. I'll look behind those. Things. Okay. Hey! What is it, Sheriff? Pitchfork! Threw it from the loft! Hit me! You hurt bad? Don't think so. My shoulder. Here, give me your flashlight, Sheriff. All right, Brad. I'm coming up. No! No, don't come up. I'm coming down. Come on where we can see you, then. With your hands up. Jace, he's jumping! Oh! Oh! Jace, you all right? Yeah. Yeah, I... Fell on his back, hit his head when I hit him. Is he dead? No. No, Sheriff, he's not dead. But I can't say he won't be, though, when the state gets through with him. After Mildred Hawks turned state's witness, Brad Johnson confessed to the murder of his employer. For her part in the crime, Mildred Hawks received a sentence of 50 years in a women's prison at Huntsville. Johnson's sentence, death in the electric chair. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. While most of the mail that comes to us here at Tales of the Texas Rangers is written by grown-ups, the youngsters have their questions, too. Tonight, I'd like to read you a postcard from a boy in Newark, New Jersey. It says, Dear Mr. McRae, I am nine years old. Me and my friend Tony was talking about being Texas Rangers when we grow up. How do you go about getting that job? Your friend, Tommy Cook. Well, Tommy, a lot of people have asked us that same question recently, and I guess maybe it's high time for us to tell them. First, a ranger has to serve at least ten years as an outstanding police officer. Then he may compete with others for the job. If he's selected, he works under the wing of a ranger captain for at least six months, and then he's put out in the field with other seasoned rangers for a year and a half. By this time, he is, or he isn't, a true Texas Ranger. And Tommy, your card's being sent to Colonel Homer Garrison, Jr., chief of the Texas Rangers. Good luck. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Trent. 
Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Byron Kane, Betty Lou Gerson, Jeff Corey, and Wally Mayer. This story was transcribed and adapted by Andrew McBroom, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. You will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... Then something very odd happened. Half of Dr. Marlowe came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitching while his left hand remained stiff. Half of him came alive. Only half. Theater 5 presents Terror from Beyond. What? Did someone... Remember! Try and remember! Sir, you will not remember. Do you understand? When we are gone, it will be gone. As if it had never happened. And you will not remember. But you've got to remember, John! You've got to! The whole future of mankind, of life on Earth, depends on it. You've got to. I sat up in bed, listening. The surf was pounding at the foot of the cliff. But that was all. Had I really heard something or just imagined it? I didn't know. All I knew was I was in a cold sweat... But that wasn't surprising after what had happened. The deaths and... Deaths? But they'd been accidents. Maybe if I went back over it from the beginning... That's right, John! Start back at the beginning! Then maybe you'll remember! And you've got to! You've got to! When was the beginning? When I arrived at the base, I suppose... Went to the administration building for that first briefing session with Dr. Marlowe and Roy. Oh, it's good to see you again, John. It's good to see you, Doctor. Great to have you aboard, John. Did you mind our doing this? Pulling strings to have you signed up here for a while? Are you kidding? You said it was something interesting. We think it is. As interesting and important as any space work that's being done anywhere today. I know. We'll be putting a man on the moon in a few years, but... If we're to go on from there, one of the things we should know is what we're likely to find. In other words, whether there's intelligent life anywhere in the solar system. Mm -hmm. That's why I hated leaving the old project. You haven't. (laughs) This is still part of the old project. Uh, Remember what our problem was on Van Gogh? Of course. A radio telescope can pick up any message from out there that might be beamed at us, but it's sometimes very difficult to tell precisely where it's coming from. Exactly. Well, we're using a technique here that'll take care of that. A light beam, rather than radio waves. You mean a laser? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we discussed that. We've already hit the moon with a beam no bigger than a pencil, but suppose you do establish a contact, how do you get your feedback, your response? Well, we believe we've solved that problem, uh, theoretically at least. But we needed an electronics specialist to work on it with us. That's why we requested you. When do we start? Right away. Uh, By the way, you're sharing a cottage with Roy. Now, why don't you go on down there with him? Drop your luggage, we'll get to work. The work. I remember that. Weeks of it. Finally, the big night. The night of our first test. It was clear and cool. The ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs as if it were waiting... All the stars sharp and clear like signposts on the road to the infinite. Dr. Marlowe at the computer, Roy and I at the center console. T-minus two. Check. 
By the way, Doctor, I meant to ask you before, what made you pick Damus as our first target? Well, it was a few weeks after you left the project. We got a message from there. No. Well, there was some question about it, John. First, as to whether it was really was a coherent message, and second, as to whether it was from Damus. The British got a fix on it, too. And it was on the hydrogen wavelength, the one we always said anyone out there would use. That's true. And even though we never got another one, I thought it was worth exploring further. Of course. But that's fantastic. Yes, it's an exciting prospect. But it's also a rather frightening one. Why do you say that? We're reaching out, John. We're getting close to the secret of matter. The origin of life. The mystery of the universe. Sometimes I become a little afraid. Afraid that we may stumble onto something that's too much, too big for us. T-minus ten seconds. Check. Power on. Give me a reading, John. Vector nine. Eighteen point two and steady. Time. How long to contact? Three minutes, 28 seconds. We sat there tensely, watching our instruments on the clock. Then... There it is, the feedback. We've done it. The trick now will be to maintain contact. Oh, wait a minute. What's that? It sounds like a pattern. Listen. Even numbers. Now, odd numbers. Great Scott, do you think we've got something? Follow it. Follow it. Start with an even series. We started following the pattern, and we got nothing. We kept at it all night, most of the next day. Still nothing. Wait. The next night, it's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. It was about two in the morning. I padded out along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on. I went in. And there was Dr. Marlowe. He was sitting at the control panel, and he was strange. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. Dr. Marlowe? Dr. Marlowe, what is it? What are you doing? Dr. Marlowe! Then, something very odd happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched while his left one remained stiff. And then... What? Oh, oh hello, John. Is uh, anything the matter, Doctor? No. Why should anything... Hey... What am I doing here? Doctor, have you ever walked in your sleep before? Not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Rather disturbing dreams, but... John, did you change this beam frequency? No, Doctor. You must have done it in your sleep. Should I switch it back? No. Cut the power, but leave it. I'd like to look at it again in the morning. Do some thinking about it. Somehow, neither of us mentioned it the next day. We just went on with our work, collecting data, trying for another contact, if it had been a contact. And that night, yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant. The generators woke me again. I looked at my watch. It was almost three o'clock, and for some reason, I was terrified. The door of Roy's room was open. As I went by, I saw that his bed was empty. Then I was walking along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on again. I looked in through the window. Dr. Marlowe was at the panel as he'd been the night before with that same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. Dr. Marlowe. Dr. Marlowe, what is it? Is anything wrong? He's asleep. Walking in his sleep. Better get John. He started toward the door. Then, apparently deciding he'd better not leave the generators on, he turned and went toward the master switch. And as he did, Dr. Marlowe moved. 
His face still dead, expressionless, he got up, took a heavy wrench, and followed Roy. Then, just as Roy put out a hand to throw the switch, he hit him. I saw Roy's body crumple to the floor. I stood there, frozen, unable to move. Dr. Marlowe looked down at him for a moment with no sign of emotion on his face. Then, like a zombie, he went over to the workbench again, picked up an odd assortment of tools, and returned to Roy's body. He bent over him, looking at him as if he were a laboratory specimen. And as I realized what he was going to do, my paralysis left me. I shouted and started for the door, but just before I reached it, I tripped, hit my head, and that was the last I knew. not sure how long I was out, but when I came to, I was lying in front of the door and a dark shape was bending over me. John, what happened? Keep away from me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. And where? When? Just now, in the control room, to Roy. What do you mean? I just came up here from my cottage. I had a bad dream, came out to get some air, and I found you lying here. But I tell you, I saw you, and... And what? I must have imagined it, dreamed it, because... I thought I saw you kill him. We looked everywhere, but there was no sign of Roy. Then we hurried back to the control building and searched it again. He's not here either, John. No. Must be in my mind. Of course, if it had really happened, there'd be something, if not his body, at least his blood. Where, John? Where would it be? Right here, in front of the master switch. But there's nothing. No. No. Except that the floor is wet. Looks as if it's been scrubbed. Hey, you're right. John, did you change the beam frequency this way? No, Doctor. You must have done it just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No, no. Tell me what you thought you saw happen tonight, whether you believe it or not. Well, you were sitting at the control panel with your eyes open, but as if you were asleep. Yes, The generators were on, and the beam frequency was set the way it is now. Roy was speaking to you, but you didn't answer him. Then when he started to cut the power, you picked up a wrench and hit him. I hit Roy? But that's not the worst of it. After that, you picked up some tools and bent over him as if... Well, as as if he were a laboratory animal. Telling you about it now, I know the whole thing's mad. It's impossible. I wonder... You mean it could have happened some way? Without your knowing it? In the old project. And in this one. We've been listening for messages from out of space. Trying to determine whether intelligent life exists anywhere in our galaxy. John, if it did exist, what form would it take? Well, it wouldn't necessarily look like us with two arms and legs. Exactly. And suppose it existed in a totally different form. In the form of electrical energy. Electrical energy? Why not? Isn't that the way the brain functions? Giving off electromagnetic waves? And what do we know about Deimos? Suppose... Suppose living beings existed there. In the form of complex electrical charges. And a channel were suddenly opened between it and the Earth. Our laser beam. You mean they could travel down and take hold of someone? You? I'm speculating, John. Of course, even if it's true, we don't know if these entities are malevolent, dangerous or not. When they killed, made you kill Roy? Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with their base. As for the rest, well, they'd be very interested in the human body, particularly the brain. They'd want to examine it, study it. Do you realize what you're saying, suggesting, Doctor? Intelligences from outer space, another world... The taking over of a man's body by forces that we... Yes, John, I know what I'm saying. And while I'm only hypothesizing, I don't really believe it's possible. Do you own a gun? Yes. So happens I do. Well, start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, don't hesitate. Shoot. And shoot to kill. I didn't go back to sleep that night, and I was convinced that I would never sleep again. 
Because it would be then that it would be easiest for them to... No, no, I can't think about it. I won't, even now. I felt a little better in the morning. I went over to have another talk with Dr. Marlowe. But he wasn't at his cottage. He wasn't anywhere on the base. And no one seemed to know where he was. Then I called Colonel Gately at headquarters. No one there knew anything about Dr. Marlowe or Roy. But by that time, something had happened to me. It had all become blurred, like an old nightmare that you know was frightening, but whose details you can't remember. About a week later, the colonel called me and asked me to meet him at the police station in the town nearby. You knew Swanson pretty well, didn't you, Parker? Yes, of course. Some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. We'd like you to look at it. Oh? All right. Brace yourself. Here. Good Lord. I... I can't be certain, but... I'm fairly sure it's Roy. How did he die? We'll have to wait for the coroner's report, but my guess is that he fell off the cliff. And Dr. Marlowe? Nothing new on him yet, but if they were together, his body may turn up soon, too. He was a better prophet than he knew, because Dr. Marlowe came back that very night. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep, but the sound of the generators woke me. I took my gun, went to the control building. The lights were on. I opened the door... And there was Dr. Marlowe. He was standing near the console, his face thin and drawn, and his eyes blank. And when he spoke, his voice was hardly human, as if someone was speaking through him. It is unfortunate that you awaken, Parker, and even more unfortunate that you came in here. What do you mean, Doctor? Where have you been, and why are you talking so strangely? We have been looking over your planet, studying it and its life, particularly you so-called humans. We have found it very interesting. And now we are ready to go. Go? Go where? Wait. You said we. Dr. Marlowe, have they... You will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... Her voice, that horrible voice, broke off. And Dr. Marlowe swayed as if he were about to fall. I grabbed him, held on to him. And then his eyes changed, came alive. And when he spoke again, it was with his own voice. John, John for heaven's sake, help me. What? They got me. They took me that night. Took me all over the country, looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain, John. And now they're going to take me with them. Take you back to where they come from. Not my body. They're not interested in that. But the essential me. And in heaven's name, shoot, John. Shoot me! And now, we are ready. Look here. At his eyes. Look closely. Yes. Like that. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you will not remember what has happened. You will remember nothing. Do you understand? Because someday, we may come back. I stood there, frozen, holding Marlowe. Suddenly, he broke my grip, pushed me away. Walking stiffly and mechanically, he went to the door, opened it, and went out along the duck boards to the edge of the cliff. Then, without hesitating, he stepped over the edge and disappeared. Now do you remember, John? It's all true! They exist! And they've got me here! Not only that, but they may return to Earth again for others! And... John, they're coming back now. They're coming. Do something. When I woke up about a half hour ago, I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. 
I remember some of what I'd written. But other parts, like Roy's murder and Dr. Marlowe's death, I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No, no, I can't think about that. In any case, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I was mad. There's only one thing to do. Tear it up. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Theater 5 has presented Terror from Beyond. Written by Robert Newman and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Robert Dryden, Ralph Camargo, and Gilbert Mack. Audio engineers, Marty Folia and Bill Sandreuter. Sound technicians, Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music composed by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. This is Fred Foy speaking. It's a terrible thing to wake up from a nightmare. But suppose you have a nightmare you can't wake up from because you aren't asleep. It happens to me in this story on Theater 5. A story called Just What It Is. A nightmare. Inside now, call no. the police. Come on no. now. Let me go. Help. Judy. Let me go, I said. Help somebody. Help. Judy, what do you want? Do you want the whole neighborhood to think? You're hurting me. Let me go. Please let me go. Hey, Help. what's going on here? Oh. But Judy. Why, Mr. Evans. Help you. He tore my dress. Judy, what kind of nonsense is this? I don't know what's going on here. Somebody was attacking Judy. I heard her screams and I came running. To, too late to catch the fellow or even see him. But sure, T, sure. He um, got clean away, I suppose. Well, I didn't chase after him. I was only trying to help Judy. And, well, now she's carrying on as if... Look, she's upset, of course. And, oh, of course. And she's been drinking. You can say that again. He tore my dress. Now, Judy... And we're going to put a stop to this right now. I'm going to call the police. Uh, it uh, sounds like somebody already has teach. Uh, I mean, Mr. Evans. Good. Uh, not good, man. Bad. What? Now, uh, Sergeant, if you let me explain this from the beginning, I name can... Charles Evans. Address three seventeen East Andover. Now, as I was saying, occupation. Sergeant, History teacher at Coolidge High. Now, Sergeant... You... Married? No. Age? Sergeant, I... 34. Okay. Now, your story isn't... You... It is not my story. It's the truth. Now, this young lady here... Do you know her? Well, of course I know her. She's one of my students. This boy, too. Her parents know she was out with you. She was not out with me. Now, Sergeant, are you going to listen to what I have to say or not? The kid said she was out with you. I can't believe it. Does she have any reason to lie? Well, it must be the shark. Whoever attacked her muster up considerably. I can see that. And she's been drinking. 
She says you got her drinking. Oh, she's out of her mind. Sergeant, have I been drinking? You don't look that way, but that don't prove anything. You ever been in trouble before? No. And I'm not in trouble now. Well, I'd say you were. Sergeant, can't you get Judy in here? Let me talk to her. Now, she's had time to calm down, and I'm sure she can straighten this out. She probably doesn't have any real idea of what she said when the officer brought us in. She was hysterical and in a state of shock. Okay. Send the girl in. The boy, too. Cigarette? No, thanks. Well, don't smoke either. I didn't say that. Oh, come in. Come in. Now, young man. Uh, Philip Talmage, sir. Okay. Well, sit there. And, uh, young lady. Judy McIntyre. Mr. Evans, I'm terribly sorry. I really am. Oh, thanks goodness. Now we can make some sense out of this. I'm sorry this had to happen. I, I know you didn't mean to. I mean, well, gosh, I, I suppose I never thought of you as a man. I mean, well, uh, <laughs> history is such a dry subject, isn't it? And, well, I, I just didn't know you'd turn out to be so sexy. Judy, what in the name of heaven are you talking about? Sergeant, I came home and I... From where? Well, from doing some work in my office at the school. Anybody see you there? I don't know. I, not that I know of. Now, listen. I came home. I got out of the car. I heard a girl scream out and cry for help. I ran over, and when I got there, she was alone, still screaming and crying out and looking the way you see her now. I, I tried to calm her down... I asked her if she was all right. Did she know who it was that attacked her? She said she didn't. And then she began crying on again. Now, I was trying to quiet her down when Phil came here running up. Now, that is the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Uh, <clears throat> maybe you ought to give him the benefit of the doubt, Sergeant. Doubt? Well, uh, the way you tell it, maybe that's the way it happened. I don't know. I only know what I saw. Judy was sure putting up a big struggle. Now, why would she be doing that if Teach, uh, I mean, Mr. Evans, was only trying to help her? I mean, it doesn't make sense, does it? None of this makes sense. Now, Judy, I want you to think back very carefully over what really happened to you tonight. Now, this ain't the classroom, Mr. Evans. Judy, suppose you tell me what happened, and I want the truth now. Oh, Sergeant, I I'm really sorry. I really am. I mean, I didn't have any idea anybody would make such a fuss. Can't we just forget it? Forget it? You claim a man attacks you, beats you up, tears your clothes half off you, and you want to forget it? Well, maybe it was partly my fault. I, I mean, well, I don't want to sound conceited, but, well, <laughs> the fellows all say I'm tough, you know, cool, you know, with it. And, well, maybe I said something or... Looked at him some way, and, well, he, he got the wrong idea. And then, well, he, he got himself so worked up, he couldn't help it. I mean, well, everybody understands that kind of thing, don't they? Sure. I mean, not that it was right what he did, but, well, I've always admired him so as a teacher, and couldn't we just forget it? Judy, in the name of heaven... No, we can't just forget it. You're a minor. Evans... I'm not going to book you on any charges just yet, but uh, I hope you'll agree to remain in voluntary custody. Sergeant, I... Well, all right, if you say so. Hmm. You kids will stay here until your parents come. And uh, when they get here, I want to see them. Judy. Oh, Mr. Evans, I, I'm sorry. I really am. Judy, why are you doing this to me? Why? Oh, Mr. Evans, I... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's the matter with me. I guess I'm so tired. Judy, I... Why? Did you say why? Why would she do a thing like that? Why? Well, your attorney, that's what I've got to figure out if I'm going to help you. Wouldn't she give any explanation? Wouldn't or couldn't. She was hysterical, giggling anyway. I could have... Oh, I could have wrung her neck. 
Well, can you think of any reason why? No. And I've racked my brains trying to. There must be some reason that doesn't make any sense otherwise. It certainly wouldn't make sense to a judge. Jim, how do you think it looks for me? I don't know, Charlie. It's their word, Phil's and Judy's, against yours. And Judy's appearance. It would help if we had a witness, but we don't. At least we don't so far, and I'm still working on it. That and anybody who might have seen Judy earlier in the evening. What about her parents? <laughs> Just what you might expect. All they know is that she was out. They didn't know who with. They said they thought she was probably at the library. Probably. And I guess they're pretty upset. Huh? Actually, I don't think they'll press any charges. I get the feeling they're pretty leery about anything Judy might do or say. But in any case, we've got to know what's behind all this. Well, maybe she's protecting somebody. Somebody who attacked her? Well, herself, then. Maybe the fella didn't attack her. Maybe she let him on a little, and then when things went too far, she got scared and started screaming for help to, well, to make it look like an attack. Well, then why accuse you? Why not the fella she was with? I don't know. Maybe he's her boyfriend. I've checked that. Her only boyfriend is her steady, Phil. Phil? Yeah. Didn't you know? No. Well, I guess that knocks that. He couldn't have been fooling around with her without getting messed up himself, and he wasn't. Funny he happened to be so close at hand, isn't it? He doesn't live anywhere near there. Yeah, I... Well, I, I didn't realize... Exactly. That's why the most important thing for us to figure out is why. I don't get you. Well, hasn't it occurred to you that this whole business might have been staged for your benefit? But why? That's exactly what I mean. Why? Some grudge, maybe. What kind of a student is she? Mm, fair. Not good, not bad. No problem of failing? No. No run-in of any kind in class? I mean, embarrassing her in front of the class, say, because she didn't know an answer? No. I've never had any trouble at all with her like that way. Or Phil either. Ah. Does she have a crush on you? I've never gotten that impression. It could be that. And if she felt you slighted her or were laughing at her and she wanted to get back at you... No, I, I don't think so, Jim. She isn't the type. She's always with a flock of boys, steady or not. Uh -huh. Now, definitely not the shy, sensitive, adoring type. No, I don't think it's that. Well, it's got to be something. She surely wouldn't just do this thing for no reason at all. It doesn't make sense. That's what I keep thinking over and over. It doesn't make sense. Well, charges or no charges, Charlie. I'm afraid you're in for a tough rap. Will you have some coffee, Mr. Evans? No, thank you, Mrs. Carter. Very well. Then let's get down to business. I'm sure you know why you're here. I have a fair idea, yes. I understand you were acquitted of the charges against you. There were no charges, Mrs. Carter. Technically, no. I realized the charges were dropped. Yes, for lack of sufficient evidence, among other things. But, of course, the story is all over town. Well, I don't hear all the gossip myself, but uh, I suppose so. It was uh, most unfortunate, I'm sure. I'm afraid we don't always abide by our own conviction that a man is innocent till proved guilty. Well, be that as it may, you understand that officially I have no authority regarding your contract with the high school. Yes, I understand. But as president of the Parents' Association, I do wield a certain amount of influence, shall we say. In other words, the Parents' Association could, if we deemed it suitable... Bring pressure to bear on the school to buy up your contract. Yes. And uh, you deem it suitable? Don't put words in my mouth, Mr. Evans. I beg your pardon. I will admit I've given a good deal of thought to the matter. It's true that you are, legally at least, innocent. Still, in any situation involving our children, we have to be very careful. I'm sure that if you had a child... You're not married, I understand. No. I think you might well give that some thought. Still, that is beside the point for the moment. But if you had a child, I'm sure you would want that child under the influence of a teacher who is above suspicion. Mrs. Carter, if you asked me to come here so you could give me an analysis of my character... There is no need to be rude, Mr. Evans. 
I understand you have been through a rather trying experience. To put it mildly. So I will overlook that rudeness. I've asked you here, Mr. Evans, because of a remarkable experience I had this morning. Judy McIntyre came to see me. Judy? Judy came to see you? And she had some rather remarkable things to say to me. You mean she told you the truth? Several truths, Mr. Evans. I was so impressed by what she had to say. I asked her to be here this afternoon so you could hear for yourself. I think you'll be impressed, too. I hope so. I'll ask her to come in now. You may come in now, Judy. Mr. Evans is most anxious to hear what you have to say. Hello, Judy. Hello, Mr. Evans. I... I really don't know how to begin. Just begin the way you did this morning. There's nothing to be nervous about. Well, I... Well, like I said to Mrs. Carter this morning, I... I feel so bad about everything and all. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, Judy. I'm sure that eventually we could straighten this thing out. Well, I, well, I, I figured maybe Mr. Williams, the principal, might think that you shouldn't go on teaching here. And if, well, if he fired you, you'd really be in a jam. I mean, who else would want to hire you? Even with the shortage of teachers and all. And like I said to Mrs. Carter, you're really a marvelous, I, I mean, marvelous teacher. And, and you contribute so much to the school. Thank and, you. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I, I mean, well, it's true. And anyhow, I told Mrs. Carter that I thought they should let you stay on. Because, well, look at it this way, Mr. Evans. Wouldn't it really be better to stay here and just, well, just live this thing down than to try to go somewhere else when probably nowhere else would <laughs> have you? What? Well, I mean, since it would probably be on your record and all. Or at least people would know. Judy. I mean, well, anybody can make a mistake. But if a person didn't mean to do it, then I think people should be fair about it and give him a chance to prove he didn't mean it. Judy, in the name of heaven, what are you trying to do to me? Mr. Evans, there is no need to shout. No need to shout? I think Judy is being most perceptive and most generous. And I, for one, find it refreshing indeed to see one of our teenage youngsters not behaving like the monsters they are so often pictured, but like the responsible young citizens we hope and know they are. Mrs. Carter, this responsible young citizen you see before you has for no reason I have been able to fathom falsely accused me of assaulting her. She has wrecked my career and ruined my reputation. And you expect me to get on my knees and thank her for her generosity? <laughs> Mr. Evans, nobody expects that. You must be insane. Or a little monster. Mr. Evans, I expect you to think before you speak. As I said before, I know you've been through a trying experience. But I strongly suggest that you pull yourself together. Judy is trying to help you. We are all trying to help you. I think it's time you started trying to help yourself. And that's the end of it? I sincerely hope it will be. And now, if you have nothing more to say, Mr. Evans? No, nothing. Then I think we may consider the matter settled. <laughs> I really don't think people should see you with me. I, here in school, I mean. <laughs> I mean. Judy, why? Why? Just, just tell me that. Listen, we shouldn't be talking right here in the hall, Mr. Evans. You should know better. Have I ever done anything to you? Offended you in some way? <laughs> Mr. Evans, of course not. Don't be a star. Why? See, Mr. Evans, I don't know. Does there have to be a why? Look, look, I gotta go now. The guys are waiting for me. And like I said, I, I don't think you and me are just the coolest combo right now. <laughs> Will you stop this insane giggling and give me a straight answer? Uh, I don't have any answer. <laughs> we were just looking for something crazy to do. Well, <laughs> we did it. <laughs> just like that? Well, yeah. Why me? Oh, Mr. Evans. <laughs> I know it doesn't sound as funny to you, but that's just what we said. Why, Mr. Evans? And then we said, why not? And that explains it. Well, sure. I mean, it wasn't anything personal, oh. honest. Judy, do you have any idea what you've done to me? Well, yeah, but I fixed everything up for you, didn't I? I, I mean, you don't have to thank me or anything. It was just the least I could do. You could tell the truth. 
Mr. Evans, honest, you're the most. If I told the truth now, who would believe me? I mean, people would still think there must be something funny going on. They'd never believe we did this whole bit for no reason at all. I mean, I mean, it doesn't make sense. That's what's so funny about it. I mean, really funny that the truth doesn't make any sense at all. Now, Judy, you're the one that doesn't make any sense. The truth makes a lot of sense. And your boyfriend, Phil, just told the truth. My lawyer had a hunch and put Phil on the spot. He told everything. I was just giving you one last chance to tell the truth before you tell it to a judge. Presented Nightmare, written by Francis Rickett and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Rosemary Rice, Stan Watts, George Baxter, Lorraine McMartin, Peter Fernandez, and George Petrie. Audio engineer, Bill Sandreuter. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. has been an ABC Radio Network production. Theater 5 presents Five Strangers. Look at it out there. Just look at it. I beg your pardon. Are you speaking to me? Uh, Oh, uh, no. I'm sorry. It's it's, it's this rotten weather. Mm. I've been here at the airport for nine hours waiting for it to lift. Yes, I saw you when I arrived. Look, uh, haven't I seen or met you somewhere before? Of course. (laughs) Baines Cosmetics. You're Deborah Baines. That's right. Yes, I remember now about the newspaper story. It uh, concerns your new line in cosmetics, right? Well, it's a little more than that. You see, I've been negotiating with another leading cosmetics firm for, um... Well, I really shouldn't be discussing it. Oh, I understand perfectly. But it, uh, it must be pretty important. Oh, it's extremely important. In fact... A great deal depends upon my arriving in Chicago before 9.30 in the morning. Well, that makes two of us, Miss Baines. My deadline is 10 o'clock. After that, things are sure to get pretty sticky. If this fog doesn't lift soon, I don't like our chances. Can't we do anything about it? I'm afraid not. Uh, uh, By the way, my name is Monroe. Stephen Monroe. Oh, not Stephen Monroe Enterprises. Uh-huh. Well, now it's my turn to be impressed. I've heard quite a lot about you, Mr. Monroe. Uh, don't you believe more than half of it? <laughs> Which half? Well, the half I hope they believe. They? 
Yeah, the two over there on the bench. The old man and the, um, the lady. <laughs> Did you say lady? Yes. She does seem a bit overpainted, doesn't she? With Baines Cosmetics, I trust. <laughs> People like them are very important to us, Miss Baines. They buy your cosmetics and my... Um... Schemes? I prefer to say, by my dreams. Oh, come now. Shouldn't you say pipe dreams? Now, I don't mean that in a nasty way, Mr. Monroe, but you must admit that most of the companies you float have a way of suddenly going bankrupt. True, but on the other hand, you must also admit that everything I do is completely legitimate. Ah, tricky, but legitimate. We both have to skirt corners a little bit, don't we, Miss Baines? Do we? As an example, let's take your deal with Antoine Laboratory Products. Since the consummation of that deal, Antoine's stock has gone down to precisely nothing, but Bain's stock has doubled in value. I salute you on that one. Thank you. And I imagine that if you keep your appointment in Chicago, Bain's stock will soon show another raise. Well, I'm not in business to lose money. No, nor I. You know, when you think about it, we're very much alike. I think I'll accept that as a compliment, Mr. Monroe. <laughs> I'm pleased that you do. Uh, however, I wonder what the public, represented by those two people over there, I wonder what they'd think if they knew the truth about us. Ah, there's the rub. I'm quite sure we won't let them learn. Ah, you're so right. The way I see it, Miss Baines, there are two kinds of people in this world. Mm -hmm. The winners and the losers. Our two friends over there are the losers. Well, yet you must admit they have a certain amount of determination. Well, why do you say that? Well, there are only the four of us left in here in the waiting room. And a few hours ago, there were scores of people. I wonder where it is that they're so anxious to go. And why. You know, one thing is certain. What's that? They're not together. I haven't seen them speak to each other yet. Oh, but they will, Mr. Monroe. The losers of this world need company. They have a kind of herd instinct that ultimately brings them together. This waiting, it, uh, it is not so nice, yeah? <laughs> I can think of better things to do. Oh, no doubt. Let me see. Oh, I have been here now for more than three hours. Mm, beautiful looking watch. Oh, thank you. You know, at one time, people took great pride in owning pocket watches like this. Entirely handmade, carefully and lovingly made. Yeah, but now, when everybody's life is actually old by time, people buy watches that come out of machines like Frankfurters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, many of the watches are very, very good, but uh, it is not the same. Are you a watchmaker? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, ever since I am a young man in Europe. Uh, but now I am an American citizen for 35 years. Yeah. Thirty-five years, but I do not lose the way of speaking or even sometimes of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must excuse me. I introduce myself. I am Felix Crumb. And I'm Sally. Sally Dowd. It is a pleasure to meet you, Sally. I hope you do not mind my talking to you like this. No, not in the least. Talk away, Mr. Cram. <laughs> uh, good. Helps to pass away the time, yeah? Oh, yes. <laughs> ah, time. Time has been my whole life. Uh, that is why I wish to fly to Chicago. There's a watchmaker's convention tomorrow. There are not many of us left to keep the old ways, but we do our best. Yeah, I'm sure you do. How nice of you to say that. How very nice. Uh, but now we talk about you, yeah? Oh, well... There isn't very much to talk about, Mr. Cram. What? No, no, that I do not believe. No, no. You are a most pretty woman, a nice person. We all have something to say, loved ones to think about, to tell others about. Nope, you're drawing a blank this time. Blank? Loved ones to talk about. They're not in stock at the moment. You have no family? That's right. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not mean to... No, no, to... It's, it's all right. 
Uh, don't let it keep you from taking out your photographs. Huh? <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> Just a guess, Mr. Graham. Well, I would like to show you one photograph. Here. This, this oh. is a picture of my family. Yes, very nice family, Mr. Cram. We get together a few times a year. This photograph was taken during the last family gathering at Christmas time. Uh, Sally? Yes? You look so tired. I was born tired. It is not of my business, but where are you going? Well, I'm trying to go to Chicago. You have work there? Well, I... No, 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 do not answer. I am an inquisitive old man who asks far too many questions. I'll tell you something, Mr. Cram. You know, it's a nice change to have someone interested enough in me to, to ask questions. I am sure that many people are interested in you. Yeah, but for the wrong reasons. You see, Mr. Cram, I'm what you might call a, an entertainer. You, you you sing? Well, I I dance, you might say. Oh, that must be very exciting, that kind of life. Have you been on TV, Sally? <laughs> I don't do that kind of dancing. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, the fog seems thicker, if anything. I have never seen such a fog. It's like smoke from a fire. <laughs> I had known about this fog, I'd have taken a train this afternoon. Yeah, well, it's too late for that now. There must be some way to get there. You know, if I don't arrive in Chicago by 9.30 in the morning, I stand to lose a fortune. What about me? I've planned this move for months. I'd have been there yesterday if it hadn't been for a sudden business deal. Ladies and gentlemen. Listen. The latest weather report predicts widespread fog conditions to prevail over the eastern and central portions of the country for at least the next seven hours. Oh. oh. High winds are expected to reach the Chicago area by mid-morning. These winds from the west will undoubtedly disperse the fog. And Chicago... Mid-morning? But it might just as well be next September. The weather report could be wrong. Well, let's face it, Miss Baines, we've had it. Well, I am not going to give up. Neither am I. But all we can do is sit and wait and hope for a miracle. I'd give almost anything to get to Chicago. How much is that in cash, lady? What? I said, how much is that in cash? I don't see how my business concerns you. Well, the point is it could. You see, I represent Toger's Independent Air Service. Maybe you've heard our motto. We fly anywhere. If the price is right. <laughs> I've never heard of your company, Toga. Well, usually we carry only freight. Do you have an aircraft available for a flight to Chicago? That's why I'm here, Monroe. Oh, you know me, eh? Of you. How do you get a clearance in this fog? I don't need a clearance. I operate from a field about ten miles from here. And you'd be willing to fly even in this weather? Well, if you don't mind flying in a DC-3. Are you a qualified pilot? <laughs> now, look, I was listening to you two. I know how badly you want to get to Chicago. All right, I can fly you there. The rest now is entirely up to you. How much do you want for the trip, Mr. Tover? Well, a few minutes ago, you said you'd give almost anything. I'd still like to know how much that amounts to in cash. Well, I'm willing to give you $500. Uh, right now, I'm bartering with the lady, Monroe. I'm sorry, but five hundred is not enough. Make it a thousand, you got a deal. I have no choice. I'll pay you the thousand dollars. Fine. I'll have you in Chicago before nine in the morning. Well, how about me? Well, how about you? Well, I'll throw in $500. I'll tell you what, Monroe. You just wave that 500 bucks in the air and see if it'll fly you to Chicago. Now, see here. As far as I'm concerned, Monroe, you can walk. All right. All right, Toger. $1,000. Now you can fly. Um, pardon me? Yeah? I'd like to get to Chicago, too, but $1,000 Uh. Is... How much do you have? You'd laugh if I told you. Is it more than 50? Yes. Well, 
That's my price, 50. What? You're charging her only $50? Uh, that's the tourist rate. You're first class. But don't get me wrong, Monroe. When I say first class, I'm talking about the rate. Uh, by the way, uh, I collect my fares in advance. I don't like your attitude, Toger. Now... Well, there's nothing at all that I like about you. Now just pick up your luggage and shut up before I change my mind about taking you. Mr. Toger, what about my friend here, Mr. Cram? He'd like to come along, too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have room for me, too, Mr. Toga? Do you have $50? Yes. Then let's go. Uh huh. What is it? Uh, do you mind if I come forward? No, come on. Matter of fact, I can use the company. Yeah, sit down. Oh, right there. Be thanks. my co pilot. Uh, there's uh, coffee in that thermos. Help yourself. You can finish it. Oh, thanks. Mmm. <clears throat> Hot coffee. Yeah. Hey, uh, you must be cold in that thin outfit you're wearing. Well, it's not the cold as much as it was the company back there. Oh? Yeah, Mr. Cram went to sleep. I was left with the other two. The con man and the cosmetics lady, huh? Oh, I knew about Deborah Baines, of course. She's always in the papers. But he's new to me. Uh, he isn't to me. My father invested money in one of Monroe's companies. The company folded. It was a setup from start to finish. My father had one major failing. Yeah? He trusted people. And you don't. <laughs> well, you noticed that I collected my fares before we took off. What I noticed mostly was how you enjoyed taking Monroe's money. Yeah, yeah. It was exactly $1,000 that my father invested in his company. Yeah, but you charged Deborah Baines $1,000, too. Well, that was for associating with Monroe. Oh. <laughs> Soupy out there, isn't it? Couldn't get any soupier. How are we doing? Better than I expected. Say, hey, uh... You must be pretty anxious to get to Chicago to fly through this stuff in an old DC-3. Oh, I've got a job waiting for me. Oh? At the Paradise Club. Oh. Ah, you've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. What kind of a job? Dancer. Uh-huh. <laughs> Maybe I should have said strip teaser. Well, that's dancing. <laughs> you must be joking. There are worse ways to make a living. Yeah, I know. Believe me, I know. Say, uh, that old fellow back there. Oh, Mr. Cram? Yeah. He likes you. I mean, in a nice kind of a way. And I figure he's a pretty good judge of character. <laughs> well, it's a new line. Funny thing is, I, I think I mean it. Hey, you're making a pass at me. Of course. A serious pass. As a matter of fact, I'm going to watch your debut at the Paradox. And I promise you... Not once will I ask what a nice girl like you is doing in a place like that. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Toger, it's cold back there. You have any blankets? No. Nope. Well, shouldn't this plane be heated? Well, cargo doesn't need heating. What's in that thermos bottle? Well, there was some coffee, Mr. Monroe, but I finished it. <sighs> Where are we, Toger? 9,000 feet above the ground, halfway to Chicago. Now, why don't you just go back where you belong? Well, she's here, isn't she? At my invitation. I wonder why. Well, listen, you stink. It's me. all right, Mr. Toger. I don't mind. I grew up on talk like that. Runs off my back like water on my stuff. Hey, what's, what's that? Huh? Well, it's just the uh, starboard engine. I'll have to feather the prop. Don't worry. One engine will do the job. Hey, that engine's on fire. It's burning. What? Listen, both of you, get back with the others. Lie down on the floor. Brace yourselves against something. I'm taking her down. Cram. M Mr. Cram, are, uh, are you all right? Uh, yes, Sally, I, I think so. Miss Baines? Monroe? We're still in one piece, Toga. No thanks to you. All right. Mr. Toga, over there. Yeah, yeah, I see it. A light. All right, everybody. All right. Come on. Come on. Hello. 
Hello, anybody in there? Oh, for heaven's sake, try the door. It's yeah, freezing on. cold. All right. Oh. What, a, what a strange place. It's absolutely bare. Empty. Just the door and one window. Mr. Cram, hmm? I, are you sure you're all right? Yes, just a little tired, maybe. Well, wh- why don't you sit down and rest, huh? No, my dear. I think I will stand here by the window with Mr. Toga. Uh, stay with us, Sally. All right. Here. Hold my hand. Yes. Oh, a touching sight. Well, enjoy yourself while you can, Toger, because you're in real trouble. That aeroplane of yours should have been condemned. We were fools to let you talk us into that flight. I didn't have to talk you into anything. You practically begged to come aboard. I don't think a judge and jury will be concerned about that. You mark my words, Toger. You're in real Mr. trouble. Mr. Monroe, I'm frightened. Now, there's nothing to be afraid of, Miss Baines. All we have to do is wait for a search party to find us. But... The light. The light? What are you talking about? This room. It's illuminated. Well, of course it is. But there's no lamp or bulb. Where's... Where's the light coming from? Well, I, and I, uh, there's also the crash, Monroe. We plowed straight into that mountain. Now, just look at us. No injuries. Our clothing isn't even soiled. We were spared by a miracle, Toger, but it'll take more than a miracle to keep you out of jail when I'm finished with you. Right now, Monroe, you're the least of my worries. Have a look out there. Eh? Yeah, there. Right through the window. You can see the flames, can't you? Well, there are men out there. Yeah. (laughs) Well, we're we're safe. Look again. Go on, Monroe. Look. They... They seem to be carrying s- something from the wreckage. Five stretchers. One for each of us. I'm scared. So am I. Hold on tight. Well, wh- 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 what does this mean? It means we're dead, you fool. We're dead. We're dead. Yeah. And the question now is... What happens next? Theater 5 has presented Five Strangers, written by Don Herring, produced and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Augusta Dabney, Court Benson, Evelyn Juster, Robert Dryden, and William Redfield. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Ted Bell. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Theater 5 presents The Hunters.
Yes, Ken? Have you seen that board cleaning oil? It's right here beside your knapsack. Oh. Oh, gee, thanks. I must have left it there when I cleaned my rifle last night. Sleeping bag ready? Sure is. Boy, I hope he gets here soon. It's a long drive up to Canyon City. Well, you know what your father's like. Yeah. Don't be too disappointed, Ken. What do you mean? Well, I... I mean, if he shouldn't get here at all. Oh, but he's never let me down on a hunting trip, Mom. No, that's true. Other things, maybe, but never a hunting trip. Besides, this is a big one, way up in the mountains. Not just rabbits and stuff like that. This is for real hunting. He told me that on the phone. There he is. Hiya, Kenny boy. How's the big white hunter? Are you ready for mountain lion? He says that. I'm, I'm ready for anything. Uh, hello, Bert. Hello, Bill. Get your gear, Sahib. It's a two-day drive before we see the whites of their savage eyes. I left my coat upstairs. How you been, Ruth? Fine. You? Never better. The steam of your breath spells October out there. Have you noticed? I'm sure you'll both enjoy it. You, uh, you getting along all right? Yes, thank you. I, uh, I guess you're wondering why I let him go with you. In a way. Well, I don't know, Bill. Somehow, you, you seem to get a hold of yourself when you're out hunting with him. Of course, he's never done this big game thing before. And you're worried about how responsible I'll be. If you make me say it, Yes. I haven't had a drink for a month. Good. But you don't think it counts. Okay, Dad. I've got everything. Jacket, rifle, knapsack, sleeping bag. Give him a jarro. Here we come. <laughs> Tired? Hmm? Oh, no. You think a lot, don't you? You always told me I should. What about? Lots of things. Death and immortality. Who cares about that stuff? Ken, you don't resent me, do you? Oh, you know. No, I don't. First thing you got to remember, Dad, we used to be together. Now we're not. It's different. I guess so. Remember when we first went hunting? Oh, like rabbits and stuff. I don't run it down. It was fun. It was kid stuff. Well, now you're a big game man, huh? Well, you said I was. <laughs> I meant it. You know why? Why? Because I respect you. You, um... You think you'll ever come back home? You'd have to ask your mother. Dad? Yeah? When did all that stuff start? Oh, I don't know, Ken. A war, maybe. I drank a lot overseas. It was pretty hard to take where I was. Guys dying? Yeah, yeah, guys dying. Guys you knew? Guys I knew. I, uh, I guess I'll take a little nap, okay? Yeah, there's a pillow right there. I'll get up soon. Now, that's a bunch of la di da you keep handing him. Guys dying, your tortured spirit. <laughs> the most torture you went through was wondering where you could promote a court. Why don't you get off my back? He's a smart kid. He knows what you've done to him and his mother. He hates your guts, and why not? So here you are, the two of you, way off in nowhere. You think you can take a week of this without a drink? Ah, you have a bottle hidden in your knapsack. What are you trying to prove that you can do without it? <laughs> You're getting the shakes already. All right, all right. Leave me alone. There we are. Plenty of tent for two men, huh? Hey, Dad, catch. What? Knapsack. Hey, wait. Huh? What's the matter? Uh, nothing, nothing. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I, uh, I, I packed a jar of pickles. I don't know where. You want me to find him? 
No, 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 it's all right. No, no. Get, get, get your sleeping bag ready. Oh, boy. Smell that air, huh? You like it, don't you, Cap? Are they really out there? Elk and deer and, and all that stuff? They sure are. Bear and mountain lion and all that stuff, too. If you really feel like playing for keeps. Yeah, we'll get some shut-eye and strike out about dawn, okay? We really going for mountain lion? You feel up to it, don't you? If you say so, just tell me when. You're 16, Ken. Almost a man. You're a hunter, too. I watched you turn into one. That's why I've got confidence in you. I guess I wouldn't have known anything without you. Confidence is a big thing, Ken. When men are climbing mountains strapped to each other, they've, they've got to have confidence, haven't they? Boy, yeah. Boy, you got to believe in a guy to do that. Well, we're not climbing mountains that way, but there's self-confidence, too, isn't there? I guess so. You know, I've been thinking... Maybe when we get up in the morning, maybe we'll go separate ways. Alone? Well, you're a hunter. There's twice the chance of a kill. Well, sure. Well, I've got confidence in you. How do you feel? Well, I know how to track, and I know how to pick out a bearing. What's your bearing on this camp right now in the dark? I watched it on the way up. If I go north, Jackson's Peak is over there. Would you know how close or how far? Sure. You said I'm a hunter. I could keep it in sight. <laughs> we'll talk about it in the morning. Dad? Yeah? You're pretty good out here. Good night, Ken. Good night. Pretty good out here. Well, I guess it's something anyway. Better than being nobody anywhere. When he was a baby, we didn't have problems like this. Even later, when he was seven. Oh, I was the guy then. But I knew I was sick. Why didn't I do something? Now he's almost a man. Hunting is a good thing for him. There's a kind of... A kind of honor about it, an ethic, almost a mystique. What are you holding on to? What? What are you holding on to inside the knapsack? Well, the bottle, of course. Okay. Good night. devil is he what's that sitting over there on the rock now what the devil right did he have to do that this bottle was in my knapsack under my head you had to go fishing around like a thief in the night and drag it out what right and where the devil is he can can now wait wait don't start yelling maybe he just went off for wood Maybe he put the bottle there looking for something else in your knapsack. He's got no right to go off sore because of a bottle of liquor. Now, wait. Hold it. You told him he could go. But not sore, not angry, not hating me. What right did he have? The boy's got to learn some respect for me. I'll teach him respect. Wait, wait. You're all off. He's gone the way you told him to go. The bottle's got nothing to do with it. You said you'd go separate ways, and that's all he's done. But why does he have to worry me this way? Well, one drink will be all right. No, hold it. You can't drink with him out there alone. What if you have to go out and find him? <laughs> worry, worry, worry. Where is he? Ken, is that you? Ah, oh, pheasant. Six hours now. Should have come back for lunch. 
That kid will drive me crazy. Those ridges are treacherous. One misstep and... Suppose he wounded something big. A bear, a mountain lion. He could get himself clawed to death. A kid like that takes chances, especially the way he may be feeling. Why did he have to pull that bottle out and set it up like an advertisement of what he knew? Everybody knows something about somebody. Is he something special because he knows? He's some kind of judge? I don't need a judge. I don't even know if he's lost or run away. What am I supposed to do? He told me he could take a bearing on Jackson's Peak. But the air up here does peculiar things to distances. You don't know where you are. Oh, what I need is a drink. Where the devil is he? Ken! Ken! No, don't do that. If you scare off the game, you'll lose face with him as a hunter. It's about the only thing you've got left. What was that? Ken! Oh, all right, I'll follow the sound. Here's my rifle. Thank heaven you know something about this. Now, wait a minute. There are hunters all over these mountains. That didn't have to be Ken. Well, look for him anyway. And leave the camp? If he comes back and there's nobody here, we'd really be lost from each other. All right, don't panic. Don't panic. Write him a note. Tell him to stay put when he gets here. Don't tip that you're worried. Just say you went out for game. Tell him to wait. Now, where will I put it? Under the bottle on the rock. Oh, good idea. Show him it hasn't been opened. Casual. Just where he left it. Show him it's a question of faith. Teach him faith. Uh-oh, you've got nerves. You going out there without a drink? This is a bad situation. I know, I know. But lately I don't know what a drink's going to do. I can get swagged on a thimbleful. Maybe I'd never get to him. All right, all right. Put the bottle in your knapsack. And what are you going to do with the note? Take it on a twig. Drive it into the ground. There it is. A little white flag. You can't miss it. Now get going. Find him. Ken? Ken? Kenny! It's night. He doesn't know big game at night. A lion could leap off a bluff and... Ken! Ken! What's that? A campfire. Hurry. The Viking is set up somewhere. Let me stew. Pulling that bottle out that way. What did you want me to do? Drive me crazy? Has he got a right to be some kind of avenging angel? We're going to have a long talk. Ken? What's the matter, Mac? What? Looking for somebody? Oh, it's my, my boy. I I thought this was his camp. Is he with you? Oh, we got no kids. Just me and Joe. Huh? The rest are out after elf. Hiya, Mac. Why? Oh, I, I, I don't know. I, do you mind if I sit down? My boy, 16. At dawn this morning, he went off. He said he could bear on Jackson's Peak, but I haven't seen him since. It's 12 hours now, 12 hours. I've, I've got to find him, you know. I've got, sure, I've Mac, got... sure. Take it easy. <laughs> Look, we've got nine guys in this party. Game they can always hunt. We'll find the kid. Oh, would you? Would you help me? Would you? Sure. But besides, the ranger's got a helicopter. Please, please, they, they've got to find him. They've got to. You're a wreck, fella. What you need is a nice drink. Yeah, yeah, maybe. No service. Just a bottle. Oh, thanks. Well, what's the matter? Uh, uh, maybe I better not. Whatever you say. I've, I've got to find him. Sure, Mac. Don't worry. These are nice guys. Really nice. Besides, you've got your own bottle. <laughs> Joe, you 
you go on up the canyon. Okay. We'll search at the bottom of the trail here. We fell off the ridge. No, don't say that. Please, don't. Sorry. All night long. Where is he? Well, it's light enough for the helicopter now. That thing gets around. They've got to find him. They've got to. He's he's all I've got. He's my boy. Try. (laughs) Try to get hold of yourself. I'll be down by the creek if you need me. Yeah, sure. Sure. If he's dead, I'll never get hold of myself. Never again. Oh, brother, if you ever needed a drink. Why does that thing keep beating up there? It's like some nightmare played over and over. Stop it. Stop it. It's like the machine guns at Lingayan when everybody got mowed down. What a day that was. Blood everywhere. Oh, shut up. What? If you're gonna drink, then drink. But stop using that cheap excuse of the war. Go on, get drunk if you have to. There are plenty of other guys searching for Ken. You'll never be missed. All right. All right, just enough to get a hold of myself. Oh, baby, how I need you. Oh, wait a minute. What do you mean, other guys? Nobody else can find him. That's your job. Yours and his. You've got to find each other and nobody else can help. You understand? Only you. Only you. Only you. Only me, eh? Only me? All right. There. Can't. Can't. Ken? Is that you, Ken? No, I'm, I'm sorry, Mac. I just came up to your camp to see if he showed up. No. Oh, the search party's quit, hasn't it? Well, they, they've they called off the helicopter. And the hunters? Look, you're just killing yourself with worry. Why not? Ah, this is no good. Now, here, take a drink of this. It'll help you get hold of yourself. Yeah, I guess you're right. If he's gone, there's not much else that matters. Thanks. Now, take a good slug of it. Here, look. I'll leave the bottle. I'll go and find Marty. He's right. Go on. Take a good one. Cop out. It's what you've always done. He was just a boy. Wipe it out. A life for a drink. This is the best you can do for him. Wipe it out. Thanks. Just the same. I think I'll make some coffee. What was that? Dad? Ken! Oh, boy. Oh, Ken. Ken, my uh, boy, my boy, where have you been? Where have you been? Uh, about everywhere, I guess. Oh, Ken. Oh, boy, gee, I, I'm tired. Am I glad to see you? You, you know, I must have walked a hundred miles. Yeah, sit down, sit down, sit down by the fire. Okay. Tell me, what happened? What happened? Well, well like I told you, I, I, I was taking my bearing from Jackson's Peak, but uh-huh. when the sun started to come up, the peak got kind of lost. And well? I, I kept following where I thought it was, but... Well, I was bearing on the pass all the time. Oh, gee, it must be 40 miles away. And all the time I kept thinking I was coming back. Oh, gee, Dad, I'm sorry. It's all right. It's all right, boy. You're here. Yeah. I I, I just went out to think about some things. I I didn't mean to stay so long. Okay, okay. You, uh, you get your thinking done? Yeah. yeah well, well, so did I. From now on... We're going to have some rules, some big rules. Boy, I guess we need them. And for the rest of the trip, nobody gets out of sight, you understand? Nobody goes off alone. Uh Uh-huh. Nobody wonders where the other guy is. We're going to know all the time where we are. We're going to know where we are together, you understand? All the time. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. You want some coffee? Okay. Presented The Hunters, written by Richard McCracken, 
Produced and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, George Petrie, Fran Carlin, Peter Fernandez, Jack Hurdle, and Marco Daniels. Audio engineers, Neil Paltz and Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Hello, creeps. This is Private Z, once again raising the curtain in the Mystery Theater. Well, tonight we have another adventure of the Thin Man for you, a rough-and-tumble little opus called The Case of the Moon Murder. It all started one moonlight night with Nick and Nora Charles walking home from the movies. They were strolling along the Central Park side of Fifth Avenue when suddenly Nick stopped. Well, well, that's queer. It certainly is. I mean those two men fixing the gutter over there. Let's go over, baby. Nick, are you going to give up me on a park bench just to become a a sidewalk superintendent? No, darling, but I, I was doing some sidewalk engineering at that spot this afternoon. I watched them dig that hole. Oh, then you're afraid these fellows can't get along without you. They had the whole thing finished this afternoon. Very satisfactorily, too. It was all ready to put the paving on. Why should they dig it up again? Maybe the night shift didn't like the hole the day shift dug. Or maybe the men just have nothing to do. Come on, darling, let's find a bench. That's right, pal. Scram. Am I disturbing you? Yeah, don't you know better than to stare at geniuses at work? I'm sorry, I didn't know you were a temperamental artist. Go on, beat it. I will not. You don't look like such a good ditch digger to me. Go on, roll your hoop or I'll paste you one. Why, Nicky, tell him I'm no hoop, I'm your wife. Listen, you Toscanini of the shovel. I'm a taxpayer and I can watch you fill up a hole if I want to. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Nick, he hit you. Thanks for telling me, dear. I'd never have guessed. A big gorilla. Sock him back. Oh, darling. I don't know how I'd ever get along without your advice. Oh, God! For you, darling, right on the button. Why, Nicky's running away, and so's his pal. I knew they were cowards. We showed them. They're running to that parked car. Well, make them come back, dear. They didn't finish their hole. Uh, It's too late now. They're driving away. What? What are you picking up there, Nick? A gentle bridge. Must have knocked it out of his mouth. Look down there, baby. Hmm? In the hole they were filling in. What? What? It's a man's hand. Yeah. I'm going to clear some of that dirt away. They were burying someone in the gutter on Fifth Avenue. Yeah, that's right, baby. New York is the only city in the world where people would see that and mind their own business. Well, who is he? Well, his wallet identifies him as Patsy Tonelli. There's a curious quarter moon insignia in his lapel. I think I'll take it. It may mean something. What did he die of? Lead poisoning of the brain. You see them? Bullet holes. Yep. Murder. Don't you get it? They were going to bury him here, and in the morning the street would be sealed over and paved, and no one would discover the body. Have you any idea who killed him? Any clues? No, baby. Just a page torn from a memo pad I found in his pocket. It says, Ellsworth Gilton, 941 East 57th Street. Oh, I wish I'd had a good look at the guy I socked. I couldn't see him well in the dark. Hey, Nora, duck. Why? That car racing down the street. They're holding guns out the window. Watch it. Ah! Wait down. Oh. Are you all right, darling? Yes, dear. Well, they're gone now. Why'd you scream? Uh, I I just wanted to see if I was in good screaming voice. That car looked like the same one those two ditch diggers used to get away in. Oh, Nick, there's a cab. Now, let's hope it's empty. I want to get out of here. Hey, taxi! Taxi, bud? Yes, sir. 
Get in, dear. Where to, bud? Home. 60 Park Drive. Nick, aren't you going to investigate this? Let's mind our own business and play safe. I'll phone Inspector Gallagher from our house. Darling, look behind you. It's the huh? same car that shot at us. We're being followed. Yeah. Well, that means we can't go home. They'll find out who we are, and I'm sure they'll want to bump us off. Okay, baby. The only way to be safe now is to tackle this. Well, what'll we do? As soon as we can shake that car, we're going to see Ellsworth Gale. Driver. Oh, driver. Yeah? Take us to East 57th Street, near Lexington. Okay. Gosh, on a night like this, you'd think something exciting would happen. But nothing ever happens around here. These streets are so dead. You don't know how dead they are, pal. <laughs> Ellsworth Gailton's apartment is 18B. That must be down the hall. Come on, baby. Nick, are you sure we lost that car that was following us? Uh, not too sure. After I got out of that drugstore where I phoned Gallagher, I thought I saw someone following us here. Oh, this is 18B. I'll ring. Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to see Mr. Gailton, Mr. Ellsworth Gailton. And whom shall I say is calling... Mr. and Mrs. Nick Charles. Come in, please. Will you wait here, please? I'll tell Mr. Gailton. Mmm, we have butler and everything. It looks as though Mr. Gailton's having a party. Oh, this is no party, baby. It's a slick gambling joint. Don't you see? Over there. They're playing roulette. There's a poker game. In that corner. Dice. Oh, can I play, Nick? <laughs> On a night with a full moon? Oh, don't be silly, baby. If you'll come this way, please. Mr. Gailton will see you in his office. Okay. Mr. Gailton, Mr. and Mrs. Charles. All right, Sam. Come in, Mr. and Mrs. Charles. Well, how do you do? How do you do? Mr. Charles, you've never been here before? No. Who sponsored you? Patsy Tonelli. Tonelli. I don't believe he ever mentioned you. In fact, I know he didn't. You a friend of his? Yeah. You ever see this before? Mm hmm. Well, it looks like some kind of insignia. Quarter moon. That's right, Mr. Gailton. You'll never guess where we found it. Of course. Patsy used to wear this. Hey, how'd you get this? Now, look, Patsy's my friend. Has anything happened to him? Yes. Well, tell me I'll do anything in the world for Patsy. Where is he? The last time I saw him, he was lying in a hole someone dug on Fifth Avenue. Patsy? He couldn't get up. He found it hard to walk when he was dead. Oh, was he murdered? Well, he had two bullet holes in his head. Uh -huh. It's the Moon Mummers. The, the who? The Moon Mummers. It's a crazy cult that Patsy joined. That's why he wore that insignia. Tell me, is there a full moon tonight? Oh, yes, a beauty. Uh, they always kill under a full moon. What's going on out there? Okay, Tootsies. This is a stick-up. Reach for the ceiling. Nicky, darling, a masked hold-up man. Aren't you being a little corny? Shut up. My pal's got everybody in the rest of the joint covered. So don't try any tricks. Gilton, go out of this room. Go on, out the door. All right, all right, but don't shoot. Hey, you. What are you doing there? Why ain't you got your hands up? Because I have got them up. I don't like you. Oh, that's because you're a man. All the girls like him. I don't like you either. I think I'm going to let you both have it just to show them others we mean business. Oh, go. Clean out the door. Did, did any of his bullets hit you? No, no, they went wild. Well, well, why are you locking us in here? It's safer, baby. Uh, hey, look. Yes. There's a central fuse box in this room. We're in luck. I'm going to turn out every light in this apartment. There. Well, why'd you do that? With all that dough in there and those gunmen loose, there should be a nice riot to take their minds off of us. Ah! Yeah, there it starts. Now we got to get out of here, Nicky. Well, there's a ledge outside this window. We can crawl to the neighboring apartment. Get going, honey. We haven't any time. All right, dear. Oh, 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 this ledge is narrow. How high up are we? Eighteen stories. Move along, baby. Eighteen stories? But, Nora, hold on. Oh. What's the matter with you? You nearly slipped. I started to faint. Remind me to finish it later. You scared, baby? Me? Scared? Not at all, dear. Keep going, baby. All right. I'm... I'm coming to that open window. Shall I... I... I knock before I go in? No, dear. Just write and ask for an invitation. Go in before I start slipping again. All right. Yeah. Uh, there. Well, come in, Nicky. All right. There. It's very dark in here. I know. 
But I can make out someone sleeping on that bed. You can see him there in the moonlight. Yeah. Uh, who's there? Oh, it's just us. Did we wake you? Yes, I... I was sound asleep. I'm sorry to disturb you. You're very pretty. Uh, so are you. Now you just close your eyes, put your head on the pillow, and I'll tuck you in. All right. How'd you get in here? Oh, we just slid in on a couple of moonbeams. Really? Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Uh Uh-huh. Anything can happen on the night of a full moon. So I've been told. So I've been told. How do we get out of here? The door's over that way. Thank you. (sighs) Good night. Good night, dream girl. Well, Nick, where do we go from here? We're going to see Big Ears Benny. There are a couple of angles on this case I'm not sure about. Isn't it queer, darling? That man didn't seem the least bit disturbed by our coming in his window. He seemed pleased by it. Well, baby, if you walked in on a moonbeam while I was sleeping, I'd be pleased by it, too. Oh, why, Nicky, the moon's got you, Looney, too. Yeah, but I think that man's going to decide any minute that he wasn't dreaming. Help! Uh, what did I tell you? <laughs> Let's beat it fast. Good evening. Hello. I'm Nick Charles. This is my wife, Nora. How do you do? Mm-hmm. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. Is uh, Big Ears Benny at home? Mm-mm. Oh, gee, what a gorgeous coat. Where'd you get it? A man boucher. Oh, what's that, a saloon? Well, it's a sort of um, clothes saloon. Oh. <laughs> Who are you? Well, Mrs. Big Ears. Oh, gee, that's a gorgeous hunk of material. Even feels gorgeous. Uh-huh. Expensive, huh? I uh, don't want to interfere, girls, but uh, where is Big Ears Benny? He's spending the night in jail. Oh, you had an argument? Nah, once a month they lock him up. Oh, gee, your dress is pretty, too. Thank you. So is yours. Yeah. (laughs) Only two centuries and a half. I had to squeeze the dough out of Benny like he was a wet mop through a ringer. (laughs) Uh, Would you mind telling me why Benny's in jail? Well, tonight they got a full moon playing in the sky. Every time they got a full moon, they arrest Benny. On what charge? They run out of charges. He just goes down to the jail instead of coming home. Uh, what jail? The one at police headquarters? No, they don't bother to take him there anymore. He checks in at the local precinct on the corner. Oh, well, thank you, Mrs. Big Ears, Benny. Mm-hmm. And uh, good night. Come, Nora. we better go now. All right, dear. Oh, gee, Nora, I simply adore your clothes. Why, thank you, Mrs. Big Ears. Next time I do a strip tease, I'll uh, invite you over. Hey, it's Benny, Mr. and Mrs. Charles. Go right over. You can talk to him through the bar. Yeah, thanks, Sergeant. Come, dear. Hello, Mr. Big Ears. Nora and Nick. Hey, it's nice to see you again. Are they locking you up on a of days of full moon, too? <laughs> no, not yet, Miss Benny. We just came to see you. Well, they gave you a very nice cell. Oh, I always get it to look sweet every time I stop here. What's on your mind, Nick? What do you know about a guy named Ellsworth Galton? Uh, you're talking in my deaf ear, Nick. Does this $10 bill help your hearing? Oh, it it makes me hear music, Nora. And when I hear music, I feel like singing. Galton is ambitious to become the number one rat in this town. What else does he handle besides gambling? Anything he can muscle into. He's got a mom? Yeah. He's got a permanent want ad out for evil-minded personalities. Who's Patsy Tonelli? Uh, I'll need a little more music. Will, uh, another ten help? Oh, considerably. Tonelli is a torpedo who was imported from St. Louis. He specialized in murder and torture. No one knows who imported him or who he's working for. Does this insignia mean anything to you? Uh, I'm straining my singing voice, Nick. Goggle with this ten spot. Oh, that's a big help. That their quarter moon pin is the insignia of the Moon Mummers, a wacky outfit that's really a racket. What kind? Oh, it's got something to do with the moon. A guy named Tamar Luna and his wife Laura Luna run it. 
They work out of a brownstone house at 999 East 89th Street. I'm not sure, but it smells like blackmail to me. Well, why should Tonelli be wearing this pin when he was killed? He was a member of that there cult, maybe. And do they ever murder any members of their own cult? Maybe. Them people is nuts. But it takes plenty of murdering to rub out a torpedo like Tonelli. Thanks a lot, Big Ears. Well, baby, we're going to drop in on Mr. and Mrs. Lunar. Uh, just a second, Nick. Uh, you got some influence with the cops? Uh, yes, Benny. Why? Can't you tell them that the full moon doesn't have any effect on me? I'm perfectly normal. You certainly are, Big Ears. I'm the most normal aeroplane that ever lived. Watch me fly. Mm. <laughs> there is someone at the door, Tamar. I'll answer it. Good evening. Welcome to the mansion of the moon, madame. Why, thank you. Are you Tamar Lunar? I am Tamar Lunar. Uh, well, you're just the one I want to see. Have you been having trouble with your moon, madame? How do you know? Tamar can tell. This is Laura Lunar. Greeting. May all your moons be cloudless. Why, thank you. That's a very pretty thought. Why have you come here? Well, you see, I have a slight case of lunacy. I mean, I, I, I want to join your society. And who told you about our society? Uh, Patsy Tonelli. You know him? Oh, yes. He was a quarter moon. He was? But never real. He is on his way to becoming a half moon. Well, what happens after he becomes a half moon? He becomes a full moon. And then? Oh, no, oh, no. Don't tell me. Let me guess. He becomes the man in the moon. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wrong. Well, don't get sore. How did you know Quarter Moon Patsy Tonelli? Oh, just socially. I used to know him in St. Louis. Truly. Uh, truly. By the way, where is Patsy? If you are joining the Moon Mummers, you mustn't be interested in men of this earth. Are there any other kind? There are Moon Men. Where? On the moon. You can love only one of them. Well, aren't there any around here? Yes, my husband. Oh, that, that character? He's the only living moon man on this earth. Well, how do you do? Laura, my dear, do you think she has the qualities to become a member of our society? She is very pretty in an earthly sort of way. Thank you. She has a figure that... Uh, Earth man at mine. You know, I've got a feeling I'm going to like it here. Laura, shall I test her? Go right ahead, Tomorrow. Well, what are you going to do? You will find out, my dear. First, I must see if you can love me. Uh, mm -hmm. Put your arms around me. Oh, but won't your wife mind? Mind? I will criticize you if you fail to show some enthusiasm. You certainly aren't like the Earth Wives. <laughs> what do they know on this juvenile Earth? It's only a few billion years old. But on the moon. Go on, Tama. Now, I am going to kiss you. Uh, no. Yes. Oh! Look, my dear, she has no love in her heart. I got love all over, but not for you, moon face. I'm... No, 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 no don't! <laughs> Tie her up, Laura. Don't oh. worry, Jerko. I'll tie her up like a salami. And don't you try to move our drill. There's a gun. Yes, where's oh. Tonelli? Come on. We know something happened to him. You better start talking. I don't know where he is. Oh. The next one won't miss. Oh. You had better start remembering things. What happened to him? He's dead. He's been murdered. Who are you? What's your racket? I, I'm just trying to find out who murdered him. That's all. Did Gilton send you? Gilton? You know what I'm talking about. Start speaking. I don't know anymore. Okay, here's where you go. Tommy, look out. Find you tonight. What? What? Oh. Nikki. Hello, baby. Oh. I sneaked in the back just as I told you I would. Get up, Lunar. I got your gun. Uh, but, but be, be, be careful. Don't shoot that gun. It's loaded. I know it, pal. You're both so anxious to squeeze information out of people with a gun, I'm going to see how you like it for yourself. Who killed Tonelli? We don't know. What connection did he have with you? Uh, none whatsoever. Oh, no, no. Where am I bleeding? Nowhere. But that won't happen the next time. 
Where does Tonelli fit into this picture? We hired him. Laura, keep, keep quiet. You won't be quiet long. I'm going to call the police. I have nothing to hide from the police. Nora, come. Where do you think you're going? Oh, we're just going to disappear. Nick, they're going up in the air. They're going back to the moon. They're gone. Oh, nuts. Do you suppose we can call it moon key shines? <laughs> <laughs> it's some stage trick, baby. These cult headquarters are always full of them. But, but they went right up in the air through the roof. Well, it's done with wires and a trap door in this dimly lit room, honey. They must have got away by this time. Come on, we're going to take a quick look around here, and then we're going home. Have you got the key to our apartment? Yeah, here it is, baby. Boy, it'll be good to get home. I'll open the door. Excuse me, bud, do you have a match? Why, yes, right here. Oh! Oh! Nick, is that a nice thing to do? You knocked him out for no reason at all. I knocked him out because he whistled when he talked. What? Remember? That hold-up guy at the gambling joint who tried to kill us. He whistled when he talked, too. Oh. Oh, why? Bridge work? <laughs> yes, you guessed it, baby. And look, that dental bridge I found beside that excavation on Fifth Avenue fits right in this guy's mouth. You see? What are you going to do with him, dear? Drag him into the house and make him comfortable. This case is in the bag. <laughs> Hello, Charles. Oh, Mr. Galton. I've been waiting for you. I brought a few of my men along. I thought we might need them for this job. You certainly will. There's the man we found trying to bury your friend Patsy Tonelli on Fifth Avenue. We tried to get him to tell us who killed him, but he won't talk. I'll make him talk. Hello, Goofer. Hiya, boss. Boss? Yes, you poor saps. You played right into my hands. Well, you... You mean you killed Tonelli? Yeah, I had the pleasure of doing it personally. No. Yes. But why? I told Tom Aluna I wanted a cut of that blackmailing racket he ran with his wife. So what does a dope do? He hires Tonelli to bump me off. And you killed him first? Sure. Oh, uh, you realize I'm telling you this only because you're going to die, Charles. Oh, but Nat. <laughs> oh, cheer up, Mrs. Charles. We all got to kick off sometimes. Just think, you know when. Oh, no, Mr. Galton. You're the one who's going to know when and very soon. Okay, Gallagher. Oh, all right, sir, guys. You're all covered by the cops, boys. There's a dozen of them. Now, don't start any trouble, fellas. My wife just cleaned up all the blood stains in our living room. <laughs> So, Mr. Genius, give me the rest of the details. I knew that holdup in Gilden's joint was a fake. It was an attempt to kill us. Well, how'd you know? Let's sit on that bench. Because Goofer got in so easily, and he forgot to frisk Gilden for a gun when he ordered him out of the room. Then when Goofer turned up here, you connected him with Gilden. Yeah, that's right. Mm. I knew that Tamar Lunar and his wife were innocent of the murder because they tried to torture information out of you. The police caught them? Yeah. Yeah, they were nabbed in Grand Central... They found enough material in their moon mansion to send them up for a long time on blackmail charges. Oh. Oh, Nikki, darling. I don't think Central Park ever looked so lovely at night. <laughs> Put your arm around me. Well, what's the matter? Afraid of a moon burn? Mm -mm, I'm chilly. <laughs> I fell for that line once before. What happened? Nearly wrecked my life. I married the girl. Oh, is that why you can't do it now? Well, of course, baby. I'd have to marry you. Since I'm already married, well, that would be bigamy. Oh, I don't mind if you're a bigamist, dear, as long as I'm both your wife.
there's nothing like a few murders to keep your married life a happy one. Just ask Nick and Nora. It's time once again to close the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. So until next time, this is Private Z saying good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. American Broadcasting Company presents Treasury Agent. The United States Treasury, the largest law enforcement agency in the world, consisting of... The United States Secret Service. We protect the President of the United States at all times and protect the money of the United States from counterfeiting. United States Revenue Intelligence. We have jurisdiction over tax fraud and evasion. United States Bureau of Narcotics. United States Internal Revenue, Border Patrol. United States Alcoholics Tax Unit. Fraudulent violations of internal revenue. These law enforcement agencies of the United States Treasury constitute the largest and mightiest law enforcement agency in the world. 64% of all criminals in federal penitentiaries apprehended in peacetime are there because the United States Treasury caught them and put them there. And now, Elmer Lincoln Irie, former chief coordinator of all the aforementioned Treasury departments for the past ten years. Elmer Irie, who many have called the world's greatest detective, the man who personally planned the smashing of the Al Capone gang, the placing of the treasury notes which solved the Lindbergh kidnapping, and hundreds more. So listen to what Elma Irie has to say. The cases which will be portrayed are based on the general modus operandi of the United States Treasury agents, operating here and all over the world. The United States Treasury has over 3,000 highly trained agents. Yet the public knows very little concerning these agents, Protect your money, protect the borders of your country, protect you from fraud, narcotics, and misrepresentation. Many of the biggest and most powerful criminals in this country have been brought to justice by the patient work of our highly trained Treasury agents. Our case tonight starts in a small southwestern town. A stout, heavy-jowled man of about 60 was walking up the dingy corridor of the local hotel. Colonel Cephas. Hello, my dear. I thought you were still in Washington. It is difficult to know about me, isn't it, my dear? Uh, You want to come in? I never go into a woman's hotel room. There might be bad publicity. Step into the hall. You must have left a trail from Washington down here with those peanut shucks. Want some? No, I'm fed up with seeing you eat peanuts. Who is this young man, Culver, you telegraphed me about? He's just a very sincere person. You should see him sway a camp meeting. Sure it's not personal? Just like you to come down here and spy. (laughs) What's this new song he wrote? Don't tread on me. The camp meetings go wild. Don't tread on me, huh? Mm -hmm. That ought to start up a lot of hate. I mean, uh, patriotism. Look, Culver will be leading the meeting tonight. I recommended him because the sucker really believes what he preaches. How are the dues coming in? We've got 10,000 new members. Forget I was here. I'll watch a new protege tonight. 
I think guess possibilities, I'll wire to bring him to Washington. Then you're going right back? One never knows my plans. Oh, here, I've eaten all the peanuts. Take the bag of shucks and throw it away. <laughs> it's all I ever get from you now, shucks and leavings. <laughs> You'll hear from me by wire, my dear. Come out, Culver. What was the idea of shoving me in the closet? If somebody had come in, it might have looked bad. Oh, but I'm innocent. You'll be late for the meeting, Culver. Now, stir them up good tonight. Get the camp meeting into a frenzy. Maybe if you do well, I can take you back to Washington. I sure will try it. Going to Washington, Culver. All I want, Miss Mona, is to meet Colonel Seifer. Somebody on the train will hear. Nobody knows the Colonel is backing our meeting. He must be a real patriotic man. He's got 14 flags in his office. 14? Mm -hmm. He rich? Rich and powerful. Well, where are we going to stay? At one of his big estates up the Potomac River. Uh, you work for him? For a long time. I take charge of the different societies we start up and all the speakers we send out. Oh, I'll speak. I'd rather speak than anything in the world. Why should we let foreigners take our Not jobs? Not loud, Culver. People are looking. Wait till we get to Washington. Good and pure. Oh, this is the biggest house I ever saw. If there wasn't so many foreigners in this country, every American could have a mansion like this. It's late. You'll want to go to bed. You know, you look real pretty tonight, Miss Mona. Don't say things like that. I'm ten years older than you are. Oh, I, I didn't mean to upset you. The Colonel is waiting in his living room. I've got to leave. Oh, the things in this bedroom must be worth a fortune. Good night. Good night, Miss Mona. I, only I wish you wouldn't hurry. Come in, Mona. Well, Colonel... I suppose you had a good time sitting there at your desk, listening to every word. You look real pretty tonight, Miss Moon. I knew you'd pick on that. Don't you feel a little ashamed to have a hidden microphone in every room in the house? Sometimes interesting to know what your guests say after they go to their rooms. <laughs> Want some peanuts? No. Not the shucks either. The protege really is a fanatic, isn't he? All our other speakers are fakes. They know we start up the groups for profit. I just thought it might be a good business to have one speaker who really believes what he preaches. Listen. Hmm. He is going to bed. Just dropped his shoe. Tell me more about your trip, Mona. Sixteen new groups, 14,000 new members... Five dollars a month dues. 
What did you base the Western meetings on? Race hatred. Include religious hatred also. They pay their dues better. Hmm. Funny he hasn't dropped his other shoe. Ah. There it goes. I should hear the water running in a few minutes. I suppose the canary singing makes you feel good and pure, even though you are eavesdropping on a person going to bed. <laughs> Always understanding, aren't you, my dear? Colonel, you've made yourself rich selling hate. But I've got a new idea. Yes? Why couldn't we organize groups on the side and instead of selling hate, sell love? <laughs> That funny, eh? The Blue America Group tried that. They sold $8 million worth of hate in three years. Then they tried to organize other groups and sell love. They couldn't sell $1 worth of love. All right. I choke. Hate is like a loaf of bread. You can carve off slices and sell it. Hate? is the easiest thing in the world to sell. You can get ignorant people to hate anything. And hate brings money. think of that report of the Un-American Activities Committee on Colonel Cephas. Now, Chief Austin, you could have knocked me over with a feather. The colonel's supposed to be a very patriotic man. Oh, naturally. He conducts all his activities under the guise of patriotism. But Colonel Cephas isn't really a treasury case, Chief Austin. Well, just the same, we're going after him on tax evasion. And, uh, I'm assigning you. Uh, me? Why, I say this is a... An awfully big case, Chief Austin. You're going to face him and fight. That ten to one, this is Moss of the Un-American Committee. Chief Austin speaking. This is Moss, Austin. Put Lincoln on that Colonel Cephas case, will you? Why, Put I... Joe Lincoln on him. That's the greatest Treasury agent who ever lived. Nobody ever got away from Lincoln yet. I realize how you feel, Moss, but our plan Promise is... you'll put him on? I can't talk right now. Why not? I can't explain. You'll never get the Colonel unless you put Joe Lincoln on Oh, now, listen, Moss. Don't embarrass me. I'll, I'll call you back. All right, but remember what I told you. Well, Jones, it's a big assignment. Biggest of the year. Well, I, I was just thinking. Most of my work is figures. There's so much detective work. Get in some way as Colonel Cephas' bookkeeper. Uh, ye yes, sir. The but... whole department will be back of you. Yeah, but the colonel doesn't have a big organization. To get in as a bookkeeper. Too big a job for you? Sometimes, Chief, I wish you were married to my mother-in-law. to grab my pocketbook. Good. I can't thank you enough. Well, there's a restaurant right here. Let's go and have a cup of coffee and relax, huh? Thank you. I wouldn't mind at all. Come on, then. It's right here. Yeah, see, there's a booth over there that's empty. I, uh, I don't know as I really should be doing this. Uh, you move in first, huh? Okay. Uh, there now. Boy meets girl. <laughs> I'm almost glad the man tried to rob me. Yeah. Who are you? Mona. Mona what? Mona Warren. Who are you? Jones. I never heard the name before. <laughs> no. My mother made it up. What's your first name? Keith. 
Well, I guess we're acquainted. Yeah. I guess the waitresses are all busy right now. Um, hey, what do you do? Well, I'm sort of associated with uh, Colonel Cephas. Who, the Colonel Cephas? Mm-hmm. Gee, he's a big shot, all right. What do you do? Well, I'm a bookkeeper looking for a job. You don't suppose you could get me a job with Colonel Cephas, do you? Why, I don't know. Well, I'm a good bookkeeper. Would you ask him for me? Sure. And you'll try hard? I'll do what I can. He does most of his work from one of his estates. Yeah. And you'd be there? Sure. I'd like that. I don't think I'll wait to get something to eat. Why not? We just came in. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not hungry. Well, what are you afraid of? Nothing. Well, uh, here, let me write out my telephone number and address. All right, but please hurry. Okay, but why so jittery? Is the fellow trying to hold you up and make you jittery? No, only... Well, I'm afraid to be seen with you. Okay, I, I don't know what it's all about. Oh, are you married? No. Well, that's beyond me. But if you're truly upset... Here, try and get me that job, won't you? I promise. Now, you've got to let me go. If I can get him to hire you, I'll call you. If I can't, just forget you ever saw me. What's the matter, Colonel Cephas? Just thinking, my dear. Some peanuts? No. I'm uh, expecting a guest tonight, Mona. Put him in the brew room. Who? I doubt if you know him. Oh, for heaven's sake, stop sitting there like a baboon and eating those peanuts, will you? <laughs> You're not the same old Mona, are you? Cut it out, Jay, will you? You know what I gave up to come and work with you. Seventeen years I've given you the best of my life. I was in love with you. I've done your dirty work for years, and this is all I get. Don't you think the bird sings better on that new type of seed? Oh, what's the use? That's the only thing I haven't done for you. Eat bird seed and sing. Eat peanuts and scratch myself. <laughs> You'd uh, get ran to the door, my yeah. Tweet, tweet. You. Why, yes. What are you doing here? I thought you must have gotten me the job. Why, uh, uh, come in. Uh, yes. Would you uh, uh, wait here a minute? I I'll go and speak to the colonel. Why, sure. Why, why didn't you tell me who was coming? Don't you like surprises? Why did you do this? What are you up to? I've been thinking for a couple of days over the experience you had the other night. Yeah? How you went into the restaurant with the young man who saved you from the pocketbook snatcher. How we told you he was a bookkeeper and needed a job. But I asked you and you said you didn't want a bookkeeper. The more I thought of it, my dear, the more suspicious I became. So I had the young man investigated. He happens to be a United States Treasury agent. A treasury agent? Evidently, we're under investigation. But then why did you hire him? We're going to be under investigation by a treasury agent. I prefer to have him under my eye. So I can feed him what I want him to know. Oh, yes, but our books, are they all right? You'd be surprised to know what I'm prepared for. Show him to the blue room, Mona. And I suppose you have your microphone connected to that room? Yeah, surely. Mona. Mona, come here. What's the matter, Colonel? Trouble? The past week, that bookkeeper Jones has been getting acquainted with Culver. What of it? He's up in Culver's room now, putting that radical up to something. But what? Listen. Yeah, you're right, Jones. You're right. You shouldn't wait just to go out to the trips, Culver. Make your speeches right here in Washington. Where? The street corners anywhere. You 
This country isn't a fit place for Americans to live anymore. We Americans are being downtrodden by foreigners, jobs taken. That's the stuff. Don't hold back. I wouldn't hold back if they shot me. I'll shout it from every rooftop in Washington. That's your protege, Mona. He's a crackpot. If he makes those speeches here in Washington, he'll get himself arrested. And it'll be plastered all over the Washington papers he's associated with me. Why is Jones egging him on? It's a trick to smoke me out into the open. We can't fire Culver. He talked too much. Day after tomorrow, you're to start on a new trip. Culver goes with you. What's the purpose? Start up new groups. The real purpose. When the situation is right... Get Culver started, but there'll be a small riot. In that riot, serious accidents can take place, and nothing can be proved. Hmm. That's a large order. It happened once before when you became a widow, so you could be with me. Shut up! Build up new societies. Get members. And see that an accident happens to Culver, and some camp meeting gets into a frenzy. I'm on. Mona? Mona? It's three in the morning. What's the matter? Any accidents yet? No, but maybe tomorrow. Come back quick. Come back? Yes. Bring Culver with you. What's happened? Plenty. I'll take the first train in the morning. And come right to my Westover estate. You should be here by late tomorrow evening. Came right from the train, Colonel. What's the matter? Sit down, Mona. Of course, you know we're in this together, my dear. If you soften enough to put it that way, it must be bad. Mona, I pretended to swallow Joan's story. He is a treasury agent, isn't he? Yes. I thought by pretending I didn't know it, taking him on as our bookkeeper would be a good way to handle him, but... Has he gotten anything on us? Why the gun in your drawer? Don't be dramatic. It's merely for a great emergency. Look at these papers. Huh? Look at all these figures on them. But these are photostats. I didn't want to touch the real papers. Jones has them hidden in his room. He's evidently just compiling the figures. He hasn't used them as yet. I... I don't understand. Each one of these figures is the serial number of dollar or five dollar bills. What bill? Use your head. Haven't we set it up so when the members of the societies pay dues in cash, it goes to banks under different names so we don't pay income tax? Oh. Then these bills are the serial numbers of the bills paid to us for dues. If that treasury agent can trace those bills to the different banks where they were deposited, which means the penitentiary. Oh, no, Jay. Oh, yes, Mona. Exactly that. We're in time. You're leaving on another trip in the morning, and I'm sending Jones along. To get what you planned for Culver. Precisely. I'll ring for Jones now. One more thing. Ever hear of a very famous treasury agent by the name of Joe Lincoln? Of course. Well, our bookkeeper is none other than the famous little giant killer, Lincoln. Jones is Lincoln, the famous treasury agent? And I paid plenty for that information. Oh, no wonder we're on the spot. You want me, Colonel Cephas? Yes, sir. Come in. 
Uh, Jones? I was, uh, was waiting outside. It's a beautiful night out tonight. Have some peanuts, Jones. No, thank you. Jones? Hmm? Miss Moner and Culver are starting on another trip in the morning. To organize a few other patriotic groups. I almost wish I could go along. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> that's strange. I was just going to suggest it. Oh, I see. A short trip. It'll give you a better idea how we operate. I see. That little canary is a jewel of happiness. Colonel, don't you think it's about time we stop kidding around? What do you mean? You know who I am. Oh. Huh. I don't understand. Well, you know I'm a treasury agent. You knew it even when you hired me. Mm. This is very interesting, Jones. Tell me more. Well, when I was egging Culver on to give us fanatic speeches here in Washington, you had a microphone on the wall and you heard me. I, uh, I think I'll go to my room for a you minute. You sit where you are, Miss Mona. I'm very shocked at what you're saying, Jones. Hey, you shouldn't be. You had a microphone listening to what I said. Didn't it occur to you that I might use the same device? Here comes Culver. And uh, when he comes in, don't try to stir up his fanaticism into physical force against me. Come in, Culver. Huh? Oh. Ah, that's a great song, you know, Colonel. Oh, hello, Jones. Oh, say, why is everybody so serious? Jones resents our patriotism. Oh, he does, huh? In fact, his real name isn't Jones. It's Treasury Agent Joe Lincoln. You didn't think I knew that one, did you, Jones? You're mistaken, Colonel. Treasury Agent Joe Lincoln is standing right beside you. <gasps> what do you mean? The man you call Culver is really Joe Lincoln, my boss. Why, is you... this true, Culver? I'm afraid it is, Colonel. And I knew the only way to really get you was to get the serial numbers of those bills paid in for dues. That's why I got in with your organization as a radical speaker. So I'd be on the spot and could list the serial numbers of the bills as your members turned them in. The Treasury Department has been tracing those bills and has traced them to 64 banks under 64 phony names. I... I can't speak. I've got some smelling salts in my drawer and... Oh, my finger! Sorry, I had to kick that drawer closed. No, my fingers are broken. That isn't all that'll be broken oh. if you reach for a gun again. Oh. Oh. Miss Mona, you and the Colonel are under arrest by the United States Treasury. Now back to Elmer Lincoln Irie, Chief Coordinator of the Law Enforcement Agencies of the United States Treasury for over ten years. Mr. Irie. Colonel Cephas and the woman known as Mona were convicted in the federal court, and both are serving a long time for tax evasion. The Treasury has found that many of the societies organized to hate other groups in this country have been created for personal, selfish gain. And the originators have amassed great fortunes for themselves. Not the only way to smash these hate groups is to get their leaders for tax evasion. And our Treasury agents will continue to investigate them and prosecute. But this is only one type of case our 3,000 Treasury agents are working on tonight. And on this series, you will hear some very extraordinary cases. For instance, next week... The two gang leaders are sitting in a car talking. Five bodyguards of one are on one side of the street. The five bodyguards of the other are on the opposite side. Indication, sir, he chiseled the government out of $16 million. Quiet, quiet. He's hearing strange voices, just like Capone did when we closed in. Next week, you will hear how our Treasury agents closed in on the persons we have just referred to. The United States Treasury... Is your representative, and 24 hours a day, it is working to protect you. Next week, same time, 
same station, Pleasure Reagent. Elma Irie was impersonated. Leading roles were played by Santos Ortega and Everett Sloan. Music under the direction of Bernie Green. Jack McCarthy speaking. Treasury Agent is another Phillips H. Lord production. Wanted. Wanted for armed robbery. This is the program that brings you for the first time on the air... A nationwide manhunt in action. The actual facts to date of a man wanted. From the record, hear the -the on-the-spot reports of the people involved. Nothing is withheld. No one is protected. Here are the dramatic eyewitness accounts of a man wanted. Wanted for armed robbery. And now, Alan Hind, America's foremost recorder of the criminal scene. Good evening. Tonight and every week at this same time, you and I are going on a manhunt. We're going to trace the career of a wanted man through the actual eyewitnesses involved, through innocent bystanders, through the friends and relatives of victims, and through the police officers who have worked and who are now working on the case. The voices you will hear are those of actual people involved, speaking to you from actual locales involved. They are putting themselves on the spot to give you first-hand information about a man who is wanted. A few weeks ago, one of the most daring daylight robberies in the annals of modern crime crashed into the headlines. The criminals were no strangers to the police. Their leader is wanted, and has been wanted, off and on, for 20 years. Today, he is the hottest fugitive in this country, and believe me, you may be his next victim. So listen, here are the facts. The date, October 29th, 1930. The location, M. Rosenthal and Son, the jewelry shop on Broadway in the Capitol Theater building, the heart of New York City. The voices you hear next are those of the actual people who, through no fault of their own, are involved in the case of FBI number 241884. First, a 68-year-old man. I was a porter for M. Rosenthal and Son. One morning, a postal messenger came to the door with a telegram for my firm. I went to the door, received the telegram. He handed me a paper saying, sign here, please. I took the paper, signed it, handed back to him. At the same time, he pushed a gun in my stomach and says, back, back. I back, back. He came in and he said, stand still. My partner will be in in just a moment. A few seconds later, his partner came in a smartly dressed businessman with a fall overcoat, a gray hat, gray kid gloves, and a black bag. Then they put me in behind the showcase. He took out a box of picture wire, placed it around my left leg, and started to play it out. In the meantime, the messenger said, just do what you're told, and you will not be hurt. We know what we came in here for, and we're going to get it. They played the wire so I could walk across the floor, allowing me room enough to come from there to the door, with the businessman holding the other end of the wire. They asked me what time the employees came in, and I said, around 9 o'clock. The first employee to show in was Mr. Charles F. Hayes. My name is Charles Hayes. On the morning I arrived at the store, I was greeted by the porter. And suddenly a gun was stuck in my back, and I was asked to sit down, and my hands were tied with a wire, awaiting the arrival of Mr. Fox, who had the combination of the safe. I'm Julius Fox, a salesman at Rosenthal's. When I arrived, I was greeted by a postal telegraph messenger. He told me this was a stick-up. He says, just be quiet, and we won't harm you. He then told me to go to the safe to open it. I went to the safe... But being that I very seldom use the combination, I told the porter I don't remember it. So they then tied me up, and they told uh, the porter to call Mr. Rosenthal at home to get the combination. My name is Joe Rosenthal. I was awakened early one morning by the phone ringing, and when I answered it, my porter was on the phone asking me for the combination of the safe. I was so disgusted with the idea of their having to call me for that that I gave it to him twice. I then went in to have my breakfast, 
And something dawned on me rather strangely, and I called back on the phone. And when I did, the police were already there, and my salesman informed me that we were robbed of $130,000. This is Captain McVeigh the New York City Police Department, Main Office Squad. We received a call of a robbery in M. Rosenthal and Sons Jewelry Store. Went down to investigate. and Found out it was a well-planned job. Number one, there was gloves worn because there was no fingerprints. Two, they had known all about the burglar alarm system in the store, which they avoided. Three, of the two safes was in there, they know which one to go to. But we had a good description of both men. The job was to find two unidentified men in a city of seven million. Police reasoned these men were experienced operators. So they searched the files looking for jobs done in a similar pattern. They came up with eight. Eight jobs, one pattern, no solution. That was lead number one, and it pointed nowhere. The second lead came from the postal telegraph uniform worn by one of the crooks. My name is Anthony Lanzell. I'm with the Eves Costume Company. We furnish costumes for all occasions, masquerade and so on. A man came in one day and asked for a messenger boy's uniform. So I found a, uh, a postal messenger's uniform, and I packed it up for him, and he paid me $10 the rental of the uniform, and $15 deposit. He handed me a card marked J.R. Hancock, the Waverly School of Drama, 507 Fifth Avenue. Mr. J.R. Hancock at 507 Fifth Avenue was a mailing address. Dead end? No. Mr. J.R. Hancock had appeared at that office just once when he rented it, and he had been in the company of an unforgettable red-haired young lady. Note, New York is full of blondes and brunettes, but redheads are scarce. Armed with descriptions of two men and a redhead, detectives spread out covering greater New York. Then, a real break. I don't know if this will help you, mister, but two postal telegraph messengers were stopped by a man who wanted to borrow their uniforms. He sounds like the man you're looking for. Interesting thing, both of the boys were stopped on West End Avenue. Matter of fact, the 500 block. The 500 block of West End Avenue was staked out. Object, one redhead. Days of legwork, thousands of questions, and a few answers. Yeah, I seen a redhead who looked like her somewhere around here. Why, the girl you mean lives three houses down from here. Well, you'll find it a night at Child's Restaurant over on 73rd Street. Uh, my name is John Vialli. I was relief manager at Child's Restaurant at 75th Street and Broadway. That evening, about 7 p.m., a pretty red-headed girl came in with a dark-haired young man who seemed to be a little nervous. About 10 minutes later, two detectives came out from the service entrance and tapped him on his shoulder and said, come along with me, and that's all I know about. That arrested man was Willie Sutton. William Sutton, a name familiar to the police. They looked up his record. Arrested five times. The first two charges were dismissed due to youth as dependent. Third arrest, homicide, Sutton was acquitted. The fourth charge, burglary, sentenced five to ten years, paroled after serving four. On his most recent arrest, he was picked up for possession of burglary tools. For that, he spent one day in the city jail. Now William Sutton was booked for the Rosenthal robbery and placed in the lineup. The witnesses were called in and... Sure, that's the fellow in the postal uniform. Yep, that's the one that held the gun. Absolutely, he's the man. Identification confirmed. In short order, police picked up Sutton's accomplice in Buffalo and he confessed. They got the book. Thirty years in Sing Sing. Now Sutton was safely behind bars. But he formed a prison partnership with a hulking burglar named John Egan. On December 12, 1932, prison officials announced... Convicts William Sutton and John Egan are wanted by this institution for jailbreak. William Sutton and John Egan had crashed out of the escape-proof wing of Sing Sing. Now Sutton had priority attention of police departments throughout the nation. Police began developing information... Soon they got a line on Egan, and they found him. Egan was murdered. Somebody had filled him full of lead. Sutton was suspected, but with Egan's death, 
Sutton's trail came to an end. Then Sutton made his whereabouts known. New York City. On the morning of July 9th, 1933, the 110th Street branch of a corn exchange bank was robbed of $23,835. One of the hold-up men was disguised as a captain of police. January 15th, 1934, the West Philadelphia branch of the Corn Exchange Bank was robbed of $21,000. The bandits timed the job to avoid all burglar alarms. Two bank heists, and in both, the unmistakable Sutton trademark was evident. Out of the New York and Philly jobs, police had one clue. A piece of paper found on the floor of the Corn Exchange Bank. This is Captain John J. Hanlon, Philadelphia Police Department. In making the investigation... We found a small portion of an automobile registration card. It was not much to go by other than it contained several words of handwriting. The card was then sent to the Automobile Registration Bureau where the writing was compared with 28,000 cards in the files of the Automobile Bureau. And as a result of the check made, we learned that the card belonged to Ed Wilson, from which we learned his automobile license number. Ed Wilson. That name had a familiar ring to New York police. They checked. Wilson, small-time hoodlum, robber, gun punk. Where did he fit in? Was he one of the two men with Sutton on the New York and Philly jobs? Police got a line on Wilson, and according to our reconstruction of the facts. Ed Wilson. Sure, he's around town. She won't find him with his wife and family. He's laying low. Hiding out in the Yonkers. I heard tell of him driving into New York on Sunday night with that girl. Sure, Wilson and Nina were planning on a big time. They were headed for Broadway. But on 262nd Street, a squad car spotted his license plate and tailed him into town. The police tried to force Wilson to the curb. The dope got panicky and tried to knock off five cops. At Broadway and 240th Street, New York City, detectives Frank Phillips and Daniel Shee in self-defense fired, wounding one Ed Wilson in both eyes. No further resistance was offered. Wilson thought he was dying and was willing to talk. Taken in for questioning, he admitted his part in the New York and Philly jobs. He implicated Sutton and one Joseph Perlongo. He didn't know where Sutton was, but he did give police Perlongo's Brooklyn address. Uh, my name is Detective James E. Sheehy. I was attached to the West 47th Street Station House in New York City. The boys raided the Perlongo apartment. Perlongo was brought in. He wouldn't talk. But as a result of the search of his apartment, a letter was found, which letter was uh, received from uh, Richard Courtney. This handwriting, after analysis, proved to be the handwriting of William Sutton. In the upper right-hand corner of this letter was found an address, 47th and Chester Avenues in Philadelphia. Our department notified the Philadelphia police. Detective John J. Kelly, shield number 1667, Detective Headquarters, Philadelphia. Upon our arrival at the apartment house at 47th and Chester Avenue, it was found that Mr. and Mrs. Richard Courtney, who in reality were Mr. and Mrs. Willie Sutton, were absent. Our commanding officer detailed a squad of detectives, including myself, to continue the surveillance from the adjoining apartment. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, the Suttons were observed to return. That was the signal for our descent upon their apartment. It was well that we had a concentrated force of men. Upon bursting into the apartment, it was found to be a veritable arsenal of weapons. Three pistols, a submachine gun, a sawed-off shotgun, and a vast quantity of ammunition was found. In addition, concealed in Sutton trunk, was found the uniform of a captain of New York City police, and in addition, the uniform of the United States mailman. For recreational purposes, no doubt, there was also found, among Willie's effects, a large, expensive set of golf clubs. Willie, the actor, confessed to the Philadelphia bank job because he felt Pennsylvania would be easier on him than New York. He went to court looking for a light sentence. According to the court record, Judge Harry S. McDevitt ruled, I will see that you are sentenced 
to spend the rest of your life in prison where you belong. I've been criticized by spineless men and weak-minded women for imposing the maximum sentence on such men as you. My answer to that criticism is that I will give you every day the law allows. Total sentence, 25 to 50 years of solitary confinement at Eastern State Penitentiary. This is Warden Burke of the Eastern Penitentiary in Philadelphia. I think you can hear the prison band playing now. We have here at this institution a population of 1,100. I spent a day at Alcatraz Prison. At that time, they had a population of 268. Out of the population of the Eastern State Penitentiary, we have at least 400 just as dangerous and as vicious as they have at Alcatraz. And amongst them at one time was Willie Sutton, who has since left us. Now, Willie Sutton, while an inmate at the prison, never gave us any trouble. But at the same time, we knew Willie Sutton's mind, at least we knew that Willie Sutton's mind was working and working to one end, and that was to leave us, other than the right way. And I mean by the right way is going out the gate. Uh, my name is Officer John Craig. I'm in charge of the 7th Gallery, where William Sutton formerly locked. In this cell, the floor was formerly made covered with wood. And uh, one morning while making the inspection, I noticed the floorboard had been loose. When discovering uh, this, I opened it, and underneath found a plaster pirate's head uh, made up identically like Willie Sutton. The head was covered with hair, which was no doubt uh, uh, gathered from the various barber shops, and the head was painted and was a very good likeness of William Sutton. I also found a uh, arm under there, three crude bombs, a bunch of keys, and a revolver carved from a piece of wood. Of course, we took uh, sent out for Willie Sutton and placed him under arrest, and of course, this broke up the attempted at escape. But later on, another attempt was made by him, which was uh, discovered by Officer Brown. This is Officer Brown, guard East State Penitentiary. One morning, I missed 11 men from my section. I went to the back of the block, and there in the cell, I saw a form in bed, which I thought was phony. Entering the cell, I ripped the covers from the bed. There was a phony body and a head made of plaster. And knowing the work of Willie Sutton, I knew this was the break. Looking around the cell, I saw a coat hanging on the wall. It looked out of place. This coat I ripped from the wall and found a large hole leading to a tunnel. I went down in the tunnel and I found it was a narrow, slimy mud pit. These men had to crawl on their hands and knees on their backs and anyway to wiggle out of that hole, which was 97 feet long. At the end of the tunnel, underneath the wall, was a pit of water, eight feet across with a high tension line of, with electric lights dangling in the water. There was three inches of airspace separating the water and the wall. These men had to crawl and slide through this water to get their freedom on the other side of that wall. I then made my report to Major Tease. Major Tease, Deputy Warden of the Eastern State Penitentiary. I received a report that there had been an escape made. I immediately notified the Philadelphia Police and the State Police. Within 25 minutes, we had Willie Sutton captured. Within a week, we had the entire group back into the prison. We found that Willie Sutton was too familiar with the Eastern State Penitentiary. We then had him transferred to the Philadelphia County Prison at Holmesburg. Escape-proof Holmesburg. <laughs> Slick Willie had been transferred because here was one penitentiary where he would be helpless. Holmesburg hadn't had an escape in 50 years. Two years later, on the 10th of February, Sutton and four others crashed out. Again, Sutton was wanted. This time, police flooded the country with wanted bulletins. Lead after lead developed, but no payoff. Then on March 9, 1950, in Sunnyside, Long Island, at 8.30 a.m., the New York police got their first definite lead on William Sutton. My name is James Weston, a vault custodian for the Manufacturers Trust Company at 4711 Queens Boulevard. The morning of March the 9th, I came to work at 8.30 as I opened the door, I was rushed from the back. I thought it was somebody kidding, 
and I wrestled with him. He then stuck a gun in my ribs, ordered me to get inside, saying, we're desperate. I then realized it was serious. I got inside. He then went back and admitted the other two, locked the door. They then chained me with a chain around my ankle to the grill of the radiator inside the door. Ordered me to admit all employees as they came to the door, saying it'd be too bad if anybody turned away not to use any signs. I did this for an hour and a quarter till all employees were admitted. I work at Sunnyside. I thought it was rather unusual when the floor, the, uh, floor custodian was at the door. As a rule, he's never at the door. I always have to ring the bell, and then I stay there and say, what's the idea of making me wait? So that's my usual routine with him, you know. I thought it was rather peculiar this morning. So as I as he opened the door, you know, that was his routine, to open the door. He he had no alternative. He had to open it. Uh, and no sooner I uh, entered the uh, vestibule, see, we have a vestibule going into the bank, I was grabbed by my arm like this, see. And what I had thought is probably it was the auditor. See, we had the auditor there. There were a couple of months before, and they were coming in, and uh, some, something new has been added, you know. So I got inside, and I saw all these chairs lined up facing towards the wall of the cages. So I thought, that was rather funny. Uh, not thinking any more of it, you know. I, I was sat down in the chair, and I sat there. So I was wondering why everybody was shaking, you know. I, it didn't enter my mind that uh, what was transpiring during this here, uh, you know, during my coming in. So I sat there and I uh, watched everybody, and I saw them shake, their hands shaking, you know, of the other girls, not the boys, but the girls. So as I had turned my head this way, I was sitting this way, and I turned my head, and the the uh, the fellow that was in back of us doing all the directing, I noticed his hand was like this, and he had a, a revolver in it. So immediately at, when I saw that, I... It entered my mind what was transpiring, and the assistant manager and teller number one had already opened the vault. My name is James Brady. I'm the head teller manufacturer's trust company, Sunnyside Office. Mr. Sands and I were ordered to open up the safe, which I have part of the dual control. The bandit warned us that nobody had anything to lose but the insurance company. Inside the vault, I was ordered to give him nothing but the green stuff, which amounts to $63,933 and 29 cents. Once again, a polite little man with a gun left the Sutton trademark. So once again, police dug into official files for a photograph of Willie the actor. And once again, Slick Willie was identified. Based on the facts you've heard tonight and or other pertinent material, the grand jury of the county of Queens by this indictment accused William Sutton of the crime of robbery in the first degree committed as follows... The defendant in the county of Queens, on or about March 9, 1950, unlawfully took certain property to wit United States currency owned by the manufacturer's trust company. It is not our function here to determine the guilt or innocence of a man, nor do we intend to. But by this indictment, this formal charge by society, William Sutton is wanted. <laughs> Here again is Alan Hind. You can put the finger on Willie Sutton. All right. What are the facts about this character? What does he look like? How does he dress? What are his habits? These we will give you. But first, where does a hot can of corn like Sutton hide out? My name is John Quigley. I'm employed in the Farm Colony Hospital, Staten Island, New York, as a plumber. Uh, in picking up a paper a couple of weeks ago... I discovered a photograph of a chap that was an old bedmate of mine at the name of Edward Lynch. Edward Lynch worked in the farm colony for two and a half years, and a very fine upright chap he was. A prisoner who wallowed away at any time to lend a hand. And imagine to my great surprise to discover this photograph to be a photograph of one Willie Sutton, a bank robber. John Quigley lived with the man alleged to be Willie Sutton for two and a half years, and he never got wise. This could happen to anybody. It could happen to you. Willie the actor might be your next-door neighbor. You might be his next victim. 
How can you recognize him? Listen to your local announcer. On page 16 of today's New York Daily Mirror, you will find a picture of William Sutton. Page 16 of today's New York Daily Mirror. If you know of or have any information which can lead the police to the hideout of William Sutton, do these three things. First, be sure of your facts. Don't accuse an innocent man. Second, dial operator and say, I want the police. Third, give your name and address clearly. Remember, page 16, today's New York Daily Mirror. And now back to Alan Hines. If you should spot Sutton, don't go near him. He is branded by the FBI as highly dangerous, probably ready to shoot to kill. Now study Sutton's picture. Remember that face. Sutton is 48 years old, height 5 feet 8 inches. He's a mild-looking, mild-mannered man. Hair dark brown, possibly gray. Eyes blue, complexion medium. The end of his little finger is scarred and deformed. Sutton may be wearing any number of disguises. What kind of a man is William Sutton? Listen to a voice from the underworld. Willie Sutton, he's some actor. This guy is crazy about his brown wavy hair. And he's a very neat dresser. This guy can walk into a joint, lay 125 bucks on the line for a suit, then rig a flower in his lapel, and on top of it, wear dark-tinted horn-rimmed glasses. And boy, can this guy eat. He can walk into a ballpark, lay five to ten frankfurters away in one shot. But this guy is hot. He can't be seen at ballparks. And he's nuts about the Dodgers. So you'll probably find him at television bars where he thinks nobody can know him. And let me tell you another thing about this guy who's pushing 48. He's got some twist. He's crazy about young, stupid, pretty broads. The younger they are, the better he likes them. Those are the complete facts on William Sutton. Police know the Sutton pattern, and they've studied their man. They suspect him of several other jobs, including the $1,500,000 Brinks robbery in Boston. But to this date, they have absolutely no leads as to his present whereabouts. Ladies and gentlemen, Willie Sutton must be brought to justice. Sutton has become, in these past 20 years, a legend, a dangerous legend. Willie the actor, clever, smart, too smart for the cops, too smart for any mere honest citizen. Willie the actor is slick, slick Willie. That's the legend. Well, let's examine the facts. Just how slick is slick Willie Sutton? He spent almost 20 of the last 27 years in prison. With all his bank robbing, he's averaged less than $75 a week. He's lived like a hunted rat in constant danger of being shot down or stabbed in the back. That's slick? Not in my book. But Sutton is dangerous. So keep on the lookout. You, Mr. Average Citizen, you're a lot slicker, and you can put Sutton back where he belongs. Now this is Alan Hines saying there is no time like now to wipe out crime. <laughs> Be with us next week when you will hear the eyewitness accounts of Edward Sadowski. Wanted. Wanted for murder. All material heard on tonight's program was factual. From the record, the voices of the late Captain McVeigh and the late Joseph Rosenthal were impersonated. Alan Hines' latest study in crime can be read in this month's issue of True, the magazine for men. Tonight's report was written by P.L. Mayer. Music was by Morris Pomorski. The narrator was Fred Collins. Wanted was directed by Walter McGraw, supervised for NBC by James Kovac, and produced by McGraw Associates. This is for audition purposes only. Good morning, Mr. Hampton. Good morning. Mr. Ramgo is expecting me. I know, sir. Will you please come this way? Nice and cool in here, out of the street. Yes, it is very cool in here. Mr. Ramgo is in his office. Mr. Hampton to see you, sir. Good morning, Mr. Hampton. 
This is a great pleasure. Good morning, Mr. Ramgoa. I had heard that you were in Bombay. <laughs> the news gets around, eh? When it concerns an eminent lover of precious stones such as yourself, naturally we hear <laughs> of it. Very nicely put. I always love coming to Bombay. I'm on my way home to London, catching this afternoon's plane. And uh, of what service can I be to you, Mr. Hampton? I'd like you to look at this. I bought it yesterday. Thank you. I know you're the one jeweler in Bombay who can identify it. The black ruby. That's what I hoped you'd say. A cabochon ruby. Weight, 202 carats. Color, almost violet. I know all about it. I handled it once. There is no other ruby like it in all the world. I backed my hunch. I knew I'd got a bargain. It depends what you mean by a bargain, sir. I would not buy it at any price. Money is not everything, even to a jeweler. Mr. Hampton, do not keep it. But what's wrong? What you don't mean... Get rid of it. No matter what the cost, give it away. It is not called the black ruby for nothing. It will bring you disaster and death. BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The Black Ruby. What's that noise? Sounds as if something's gone wrong. One of the engines. What? Oh, I can't see anything out of this window. Well, I've known enough to know something's up. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Rawlinson speaking to you. I have to report that we have an emergency. One of the engines has just cut out. Now a second has let us down. Oh, ah, I knew it was something. What the devil's going to happen, eh? Well, we'll soon know. We also have what we term a runaway propeller, and we have come too far over the Indian Ocean to turn back, so I intend to ditch. Oh, oh, no. oh, no. oh, I hope there are no sharks down there. Oh, I, oh, I can't swim. Oh, I can't swim. There is no cause for alarm. A ship is below us. We are in radio contact with her, and she is aware of our plight. Please put on your life jacket, fasten your safety belt, and follow the instructions of the stewardess. Don't panic, and good luck. Good morning. Oh, good morning. You're Mr. Hampton? Yes. Dr. Morell's expecting me. Yes, I know. Mr. Hampton, come in. Uh, what are you staring at? Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I was just... What? Oh, I can't help wondering what it must be like to, to have gone through what you did and, and find yourself back in London alive. Feels pretty good, Miss Rail. Oh, I'm so sorry if it annoyed you. Uh, will you come... Mr. Hampton, but what you're telling me is merely the after effects of shock. Uh, your wife must have been profoundly affected when she heard about the airplane. No, it wasn't until after she knew about the Black Ruby. Now, she's convinced, Dr. Morell, this hoodoo threatens our lives. And, of course, she's got the aircraft to support it. And your wife is adamant that you get rid of it? It's ludicrous to believe an inanimate object can possibly influence anyone's life. I fear that superstition dies hard. I don't have to tell you how many people agree with your wife. The jeweler I took it to in Bombay to okay it told me he wouldn't handle it at any price. Warned me it would bring death and disaster. I haven't told my wife that or about the other chap. Who was that? The man I bought it from. Now, he came to my hotel just before I left and confessed he hadn't told me about its evil reputation. I privately decided he wanted to get it back for another customer who was offering more than I'd pay. Mm, possibly, you have no reason to believe that there is any other motive behind your wife's objection to its remaining in your possession? Uh, Sonia is a bit neurotic, has been for some time. Before this present matter? Yes, she's been very nervy, full of silly fears. 
Uh, to what do you attribute her state of mind? Well, I'm a rich man. Perhaps that's the trouble with Sonia. I mean, she's got everything she could want, money and security. The two are not necessarily synonymous. Uh, for example, uh, the fact that you yourself are wealthy enough to be able to follow your bent uh, may be a reason for your wife to feel insecure. I don't understand. Uh, you travel in quest of precious stones uh, such as this ruby. Yes, I do. Uh, does your wife accompany you on these journeys? Oh, Sonia hates traveling. She, she's not particularly interested in precious stones. Consequently, your marriage suffers from long absences away from her. Uh, you appear independent of her, and a situation is created in which the seeds of insecurity are sown in your wife's mind. I, I hadn't looked at it that way before, but it's become much graver the past few days since I got back. Sonia's deadly serious about this, and I'm afraid she might do something drastic. Has your wife any special interests uh, with which to occupy her mind? Oh, she does plenty of entertaining. I mean, lots of friends. Too many, unfortunately. What is so unfortunate about making friends? Well, she is an extremely attractive woman, Doctor. Plenty of men always around her. I see. I mean, one chap she's got in tow now. Well, I, I don't mean there's anything to it, but he's a bit of a no-good. Doctor, I was wondering, I don't know how to get Sonia to come and consult you as a patient. I understand. Uh, but I'm giving a little dinner party the day after tomorrow. I'd like you to come and meet her. I don't know if you're interested in precious stones. I should like to meet your wife. Fine. I'm very grateful to you. I'll confirm with Miss Frail if I'm free that evening. Uh, she's in the laboratory. Uh, Miss Frail? Coming, Doctor. Oh, oh, yes. What is it? Let it test you. I nearly knocked it down. I shouldn't do that, my dear Miss Frail. Uh, we don't want to be annihilated by poisonous gas. Oh, you don't mean, Doctor. <laughs> oh, no, it's all right, Miss Frail. <laughs> I was merely joking. Oh. oh, you made my heart turn over. As if I would leave anything of that nature there while you were about. Oh. <laughs> Have I any evening engagement the day after tomorrow? I, I don't think so, Doctor. I'll just check. Are you interested in precious stones, Miss Frail? Oh, they're very pretty, yes, but... I've never owned any, except a brooch my grandmother gave me, which I'm afraid I lost. Oh, I'm sorry. You wouldn't be if you'd seen the brooch. Yes, it, it was rather hideous. I was wondering if you'd care to come to dinner with Dr. Morell. You might like to see this ruby I've been telling him about. Oh, I'd love to. Uh, no, no, we've, uh, we've no engagement, Doctor, that evening. Good. I'd expect you both. I'll show you up. There you are, driver. Thank you, sir. Sonia, you there? I'm just coming down. Can I give you a sherry? No, thanks. Sure? Yes, quite sure. Well, I'll go and give myself one. By the way, I've asked Dr. Morell to our little dinner party. Oh, yes? And Miss Frey, the secretary, is coming too. I wish you weren't asking anyone at all. Why, Sonia? You know why. And you know why you're asking the others. Just to show off that horrible ruby. Oh, Sonia, my dear, do Oh, try. you can laugh at my but fears. But I'm not laughing. It's only that I want to reassure you. You can do that by getting rid of it. I won't feel safe until you do. But, Sonia... Even if you have to give it away. If, if you loved me, if I really meant anything to you, you'd do as I asked. Uh, what's that? The ceiling. The chandelier. Look out! Quick! <laughs> It's all right, Sonia. You're all right. Oh, it might have killed us. It might have killed us. It must have been too heavy for the ceiling. It's the ruby. The black ruby. You look so lovely, Sonia. Oh, pretty dear. You always say that to me. Well, I always mean it. That's what's so marvelous about you. It doesn't matter if I see you for lunch or if we go racing or... Oh, well, I like you are now. In that heavenly dress, you always look wonderful. I'm glad you liked my dress. It's the first time out. I uh, hope you didn't mind my nipping in before the others arrived. It was a chance to see you alone. No, of course not. Will you have some more sherry? Mm, yes, thanks. Uh, what's this about this Dr. Morell coming? Oh, I suppose Guy thinks I need a psychiatrist. You know, this fuss I'm making about his ruby. Doesn't trust your wifely intuition. Oh. Let's not talk about it. I know something terrible is going to happen, but it's 
It's no good. Well, I want to talk about it, Sonia. I want to try and help you. But if Guy won't get rid of it, what can you do? Well, I, I don't know exactly, but at least you know I'm sympathetic. You're awfully kind, Aubrey. How can I help it? You know I'd do anything for you. You shouldn't talk like that. I, I can't bear to think of you worrying, Sonia. Supposing something did happen, I agree with you. This thing may have some ghastly hoodoo on it. Surely the chandelier yesterday oh, wasn't... Oh, that was terrible. We might easily have been killed. If I were your husband, I wouldn't hesitate. Hello, Aubrey. Uh, oh, hello, Guy. The others haven't arrived yet, Sonia, my dear? No. I was a little early, I'm afraid. Uh, my watch was fast. Got a drink, I think? Yes, thank you. What wouldn't you hesitate about if you were Sonia's husband? Uh, huh? Weren't you saying something when I came in? Yes, I, I was telling him about the chandelier crashing down. Yes, it sounds a darn near thing. It was horrible. But I can't attribute it to anything supernatural. I mean, if that's what Sonia's trying to make you believe. You seem pretty sure of that. Do you believe in the evil eye? I don't know that I believe in it. I like to keep an open mind. Well, as I've tried to explain to Sonia, the blessed chandelier might have fallen at any time. The fool who put it up screws into the laughing plaster yes. instead of beams it should have Oh, that, that sounds like Bill and Helen. Oh, hello, Sonia. Hello. Hello, guys. Nice to see you, Helen. Hello, Bill. Hello, Hi. Helen, darling. How nice of you to come. Hello, Bill. Oh, good evening, Sonia. Oh, hello, Guy. Good evening, Aubrey. Hello there. Hello, Helen. Why, it's dear Aubrey. <laughs> well, I hope it won't be too stodgy an evening for you. Stodgy? What's stodgy about a whacking great ruby? Ah, when are we going to see it, Guy? Well, I'm going to keep you in suspense for a bit. Must we see it at all? Share it for you, Helen? Oh, thank you, Guy. Well, you use the cocktail, won't you, Bill? Oh, thanks. What's the matter, Helen, darling? Oh, it's, it's nothing. What is it? Oh, it's re nothing, really. I wasn't sure that we ought to have come. Oh, do shut up, Bill. I'm perfectly all right. Not back some sherry. Come on, it'll do you good. Ah, oh, here's Miss Frail and Dr. Morell. Good evening, Mr. Hampton. Now, let me introduce everybody. Now, this is my wife. How good of you both to come. How do you do? How do you good do? Good evening. Mr. and Mrs. Reynolds, Dr. Morell, Miss Frail. Good evening. How do you do? Good evening. Good evening. And this is Mr. Aubrey Green. Oh, hello there. It's all right, Sonia. I hadn't forgotten. Well, how do you do, Mr. Green? Oh. Good evening. Oh. Uh, what about a drink, Miss Frail? A sherry or a cocktail? Uh, thank you. I'd like a sherry. Doctor? Uh, I would like some sherry. You know, this is a, a very great thrill for us, Dr. Morell, the famous criminologist in person. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Well, I suppose you're used to being asked about crooks and crimes, eh, Doctor? Uh, the subject seems to arouse a certain amount of interest. It must be fascinating. And uh, what about you, Miss Frail? How does this life of excitement agree with you? Oh, one grows used to it, you know. I fear Miss Frail is growing increasingly blase. But I expect <laughs> it all becomes routine, coping with criminals and misfits. Even murderers don't come off a conveyor belt, Mrs. Hampton. Each is an individual human being. You know, I bet you're always being asked the old jackpot question, Dr. Morell. Why are you so interested in a lot of thugs and killers? Yes, it's a question that often comes up. And uh, what's the answer, Doctor? There, but for the grace of God, do I. Uh, you mean anybody might be a criminal, whoever he is, according to the way he's brought up? In other words, environment makes the murderer. Precisely. Well, uh, shall we go in and have dinner? <laughs> Jolly good idea. I'm starving. Well, come along then, everybody. This brandy, Guy. Glad you like it. Oh. What's the matter, Aubrey? Were you hoping he'd ask you to have some more? Yes, I was, rather. Oh, don't be silly, Guy. Of course you can have some more. Of course, my dear Aubrey. <laughs> thank you. How about you, Dr. Morell? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, would you like some more coffee, Miss Frail? Yes, just a little bit. Bill, another spot of brandy? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. I'd like some more coffee. Here you are, Helen. Oh, thanks. I say, isn't it about time the big moment arrived? Ah, yes, the ruby. Oh, I'm longing to see it. Are you, Miss Frail? It sounds fabulous. Guy, you're not really going to show it around. At least there's no enormous chandelier hanging over our oh, head. Please, I wish you wouldn't. Oh, he must now, Sonia. That'd be like asking us here under false pretenses. Don't you agree, Dr. Morell? I should be interested to see it. Dr. Morell, you say it's a lot of nonsense that it can affect the lives of my husband or me. On the contrary, I would say that it has obviously made a great impact upon you. Well, it would certainly affect my bank manager's view of me if I owned the thing. It's funny, but... I've never been mad about jewelry. I don't know why. Oh, very convenient for your boyfriend, Miss Frail. To you, Dr. Morell, I suppose I'm being foolish and hysterical, believing that merely by its presence here, the ruby can cause something dreadful to happen. Uh, there have been many jewels which have supposedly exerted a baleful influence over their owners. Uh, rubies, particularly. Uh, perhaps because of their blood-like color. 
And they originate uh, from the mysterious... The yes. Orloff Ruby, for instance, and the Great Mogul. Uh, despite these legends uh, that have grown up about them, however, examination of the facts fails to support the notion that either good or evil follow in their wake. Obviously, they, they attract violence because of their value. And to possess them, people have gone to extreme lengths. Even murder. Oh, so it's not the Ruby, it's those who want it who cause the trouble, eh? But what about that dreadful plane crash? If Guy hadn't had the ruby on him, it would never have happened. And the chandelier yesterday. Uh, the accidents you mentioned both have logical explanations. Well, let's look at this wicked old jewel anyway. Come on, Guy, I'll take a chance. Yes, looking at it can't do any harm, surely. I think you're mad. Sonia, please. Oh, do show it, old chap. Right. Here it is. Have you had it in your pocket all the time? Yes, in this little case. So that's why you spilled the soup. Open the case, Guy. There you are. Oh, oh, sir. It's oh, absolutely boy, marvelous. It's wonderful. It's such a fantastic color. Almost. Well, more violet than red. Well, that's why it's called the black ruby, because it's so dark. Uh, one reason, yes. It's because of its black history. Because of the death and tragedy it's brought. Oh, may I hold it, Mr. Hampton? Of course. Look, I I'll take it out of its case. Thank you. Uh, don't drop it, Miss Frail. Oh, of course I won't, Doctor. Oh, it's just like having something alive there in one's hand. Almost as if it's breathing. Uh, breathing fire, eh, Dr. Morell? Very impressive. Now, after you, Miss Frail, is there any chance I'll ever get of holding so much money in the hollow of my hand? There you are, Mr. Green. Thank you. Oh, yes, it certainly is out of this world. What's its weight, Guy? 202 carats. How old would it be? It's been in one Maharaja's family for 300 years. Uh, have you still got it, Aubrey? Helen would like to see it, wouldn't you, Helen? Hey, uh, Helen, uh, Helen, what's wrong? Uh, what's the matter, Mrs. Reynolds? She's faint. Helen, darling. Yeah, Dr. Morell, quick. If somebody would open a window... It's got a bit of stuff in here, yeah, yes. Yeah. I'll open it. Oh, oh, that's better. Lovely, cool air. Is she all right, Doctor? There's nothing to worry uh, about. Uh, oh, look. Uh, she's coming round. Oh, uh, what happened? Oh, it's all right, darling. Not all to right. worry, my dear. You're among uh, friends now. I suddenly felt everything went... Black. Just a slight fainting attack. I've never done anything like this before. Well, I thought you weren't looking so good before we oh. came. Feeling better? I think I'd like to rest. Oh, yes, yes. I'll, I'll take you home. Yes, please. I, I'm so sorry, Sonia. Do forgive me, Guy. Well, of course. So sorry it happened. I, I'll get a taxi right away. There's plenty other corner. Would you like me to come along with you, Bill? Oh, I don't think uh, it's necessary. No, I, no trouble at all. Just in case you need a hand. Can you stand up all right, Mrs. Reynolds? Uh, yes. Now, hang on to me. I'll get and see if Guy's got a taxi. Uh, is there anything I should give her, Doctor? Uh, just rest. I'm sure she'll be perfectly recovered by morning. I feel all right. Really, I Taxi's do. here, Bill. Oh, thank you, Aubrey. Oh, come on, darling. The taxi's here. Well, uh, good night, Doctor. Good night, Miss Fayle. Good night. Good night. I'm sure Mrs. Reynolds will soon be better. Oh, good night, Sonia. I'm so sorry about do, all this. Do forgive me for breaking up the party. Good night, Helen. I'll phone you in the morning. And now I suppose, Dr. Morell, you still think that horrible ruby can't affect people. Well, where did Mr. Hampton put it? Oh, oh, it's there in the case. My answer remains the same as before, Mrs. Hampton. Uh, you cannot blame its presence for the room's overheated temperature, uh, which contributed towards the fainting attack. Oh, poor thing. She did go out suddenly. Sorry about that, Dr. Morell, Miss Rail. Is Helen all right? Yes, she's gone home with Bill and Aubrey. Aubrey? Yes, Helen. I see. He thought Helen might need his help. Oh, oh, well. But, Guy, for the last time before anything really terrible happens, will you get rid of it? By the way, where is it? Oh, it's in its little case. Oh, did, did you put it there? No, I thought you did. What is it? Guy! It isn't here. The ruby's gone. <laughs> Is it, Doctor? The Reynolds house. Wait for us, driver. Okay, sir. Come along, Miss Frail. Oh, I can't think why all this mad rush, Dr. Murray. No, Miss Frail. No, I mean, well, where's the doorbell? Oh, oh, you've rung it. I mean, well, if Mr. Reynolds took it or his wife, well, they must have come back home, so, so they're bound to be there. Uh, oh, Hello, Dr. Morell. Hello, Mr. Green. I was just going. How's Mrs. Reynolds? I thought I'd come along to see that all was well. Helen's much better. She'll be quite fit tomorrow. Oh, I'm so glad. She's upstairs with her husband. You were about to leave? 
Yes, I was. I heard the bell, you see. We've got a taxi. Perhaps we could give you a lift. No, I I don't suppose I'm going your way. Oh, no. Perhaps you're not. In any case, I'd sooner walk, you know, get some fresh air. All I wonder if you'd be good enough to mention to Mrs. Reynolds that I'm here. Uh, Yes, of course. Who's there already? Oh, that's Bill coming down now. Oh. Oh, it's you, Dr. Morell. And Miss Rail. How's your wife? Uh, Helen. Well, I... I, I wasn't expecting you, Doctor. No, I, I called in case Mrs. Reynolds wanted any further attention. No, she's all right. That is... What is it, Bill? You look a little pale yourself. It's the shock, I suppose. And now you turning up, Dr. Morrell. Oh, we didn't mean to bother you. Oh, no, no, of course not. It's not that. It's only that... Well, since you're here, Doctor, you might as well know. Your wife isn't really ill? She's not ill, Miss Frail. She's... Look at that, Dr. Morell. Quite interesting. The black ruby. But how did... Where did that come from? Well, you see, Doctor, I've had a bit of a business setback. Oh, it'll work out all right, but Helen was somehow scared that I'd had it. Went on about not being able to face giving up everything. I tried to explain that we weren't going to end up in the gutter, that it'd work out, but... Well, there it was. Oh, I'm so sorry. Then, before we came out tonight, she started talking about this ruby. Some idea that if only it was ours, I'd be saved from ruin. I didn't think that she was serious. And then I realized that she was. That she had some idea of getting hold of it. Well, there really is the evil eye on that thing, isn't there? It's brought nothing but trouble. Thank you. Got something there. Here, Dr. Morell. You'd better take it. Thank you. Oh, oh, Doctor, don't touch it. I am convinced, Miss Frail, that I'm impervious to its baleful powers. I, I don't think it'll burn a hole in my pocket. Oh, oh, dear. She must have slipped it into the pocket of her dress, and then... You mean she pretended to pass out as a cover-up? Oh, I suppose so. Oh, she certainly acted the part very well. I wouldn't have dreamed she was faking it. I know. It, it isn't like her at all. Her faint wasn't pretense, but perfectly genuine. I should have thought that was apparent enough. I'm sure of it, poor thing. Well, perhaps it was a strain after she'd realized what she'd done. It could be. And what makes it worse, Doctor, is that when I found it, she pretended that she didn't know about it, that it must have got there by mistake, or... Or what? That I had stolen it. And uh, it was the shock of its discovery and her belief that you were responsible uh, which caused her to faint? Yes, I suppose so. Of course, it's ludicrous. I wasn't even sitting next to her. Oh, no, you were sitting next to me. Where is your wife? Oh, she's gone to bed. She won't speak to me until I've returned the ruby to Guy Hampton and admitted that I took it. And you propose doing that? Oh, what else would you expect me to do? Even if she'd admitted taking it herself. That reveals a very commendable side to your nature. Uh, but your self-sacrifice is hardly necessary. What do you mean? Uh, merely that by your action, you would be shielding the wrong person. Wrong person? It wasn't your wife who took the ruby. It wasn't Helen. Well, uh, then who? Who, oh, Dr. Moore? I, I, uh, that is, I... Are you absolutely gasping for that pressure, Mr. Green? Well, I, I only... Uh, didn't it occur to you, Mr. Reynolds, that Mr. Green's interest in your wife's welfare was a trifle overdone? What do you mean? What are you getting at, Dr. From the amount of attention you were giving Mrs. Hampton during dinner, I should have thought you made it apparent where your interest lay. Look here, Dr. Morelli. Added to which, it was Mrs. Reynolds to whom you sat next after dinner... It was you who slipped that ruby into her pocket. What? With the intention of recovering it from her subsequent time. I, 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 why, you rotten thief. When your wife detected its presence, Mr. Reynolds, she mistakenly believed you to have taken it and fainted from shock. Uh, that was why Mr. Green switched his attentions to her and insisted upon accompanying her home. That's true. You've never shown any interest in Helen before. It's always Sonia that you've chased. Uh, well, the idea of leaving her just to help me see my wife home is utterly phony. Well... Well, I, I suppose I'd better act the gentleman and admit it. You're bang on the target, Dr. Morell. I did take it. Oh, oh. Why? I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I'm i a bit broke, that's all. It, it was just a sudden impulse. A crazy idea. I can't say how deeply I regret it. You'd have let Helen take the blame. Oh, that was just bad luck. I meant to get it away from her in the taxi. Oh, what a swine you are. So, what are you going to do about it, Dr. Morell? Uh, that remains a matter for Mr. Hampton to decide. Uh, meanwhile... I'll leave him to your tender mercies, Mr. Reynolds, uh, whilst I return the ruby. I'll take care of him, all right. Come along, Miss Fail. Yes, Dr. Oh, Isn't the taxi driver going a bit fast, Doctor? Is he, Miss Fail? I hadn't noticed. Oh, oh well. 
What a horrid man that Mr. Green is, Dr. Morell. Do you think Mr. Hampton will put the police on to him? It's unlikely. I fancy he'll prefer to avoid any scandal that might result. Oh, oh, really? Does this taxi have to take the corners on two wheels? After all, we've got the precious ruby now. If it makes you nervous, Miss Frail, you might ask the driver to slacken speed a trifle. Yes, I think I will. Doctor, that car! Are you uninjured, Miss Frail? Yes, Doctor, I think so. Are you? You all right in here? Well, it isn't your fault if we are. That car, the way it come round that corner. Oh, I expect it couldn't be helped, driver. The ruby, Dr. Morell. It's the black ruby. I'm sure I'm very sorry. What are you talking about? Don't you see? The hoodoo. Really, Miss Frail? The evil eye. It's working. Oh, please, let's get it back to Mr. Hampton quick before both of us are killed or something dreadful. Do calm oh, yourself. It's the black ruby. Disaster and death. That's what it brings to anyone who has it. Disaster and death. How long is it my study, Dr. Morell? You've been very quick. Oh, not quick enough, Mr. Hampton, I can tell you. Oh, what do you mean? Here, sit down, Miss Frail. You, you look a bit shaken. Oh, not quick enough to get that horrible ruby back to you. What do you mean, you've got it? Of course, Dr. Morell's got it. He's brought it back with him. And it's marvellous, Doctor. Who, who taken it? As I suspected, when I observed uh, that uh, young man become suddenly solicitous towards Mrs. Reynolds. Aubrey Green. Yes, I noticed him change his interest to Helen. Why, thou rotten crook. Wait till I tell Sonia this. She's got to bed. She's pretty upset. I understand, Oh, Doctor, do please give it to him. Very well. It's frail. What is it? What's wrong, Doctor? I somehow fancy uh, you'll have a further item of news with which to acquaint your wife. Look. Oh, the ruby. Smashed to pieces. It must have happened in the taxi crash. Taxi crash? Yes, our taxi hit a car, or a car hit us. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thrown against the door. Well, it's all to do with the ruby. But that's just it. It can't be the black ruby at all. What? A genuine ruby is terribly hard to break. Precisely. That chap in Bombay I got it from. When he came round to my hotel after I'd seen the jeweler, he must have switched the real black ruby with a fake. No doubt that is what occurred. It, it isn't the black ruby after all. So there was no hoodoo, no evil eye on it. The aircraft, the chandelier. The taxi. Nothing to do with it. Perhaps uh, this will at any rate convince your wife uh, that the only injury anyone can suffer from the evil eye or hoodoo powers is that which they bring upon themselves for believing in such foolish superstition. adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character Dr. Morell and of course his secretary Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Guy Hampton, Norman Woolland, Sonia Hampton, Virginia Winter, Helen Reynolds, Louise Gainsborough, Bill Reynolds, Richard Bebb, Aubrey Green, Desmond Carrington, an airline captain and other parts, John Baker. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. <laughs>